Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now it's time to keep that weekly appointment with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. As usual, you're punctual to the minute. Naturally, when I have an appointment with my favorite doctor. Oh, well, draw up your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. Thank you. That's it. Yeah, all ready with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, Dr. Watson? Yes, my boy. I was going over my notes on the case before you arrived. I came across this old theater program. I think it'll interest you. Garrick Theater, Sir Basil Wentworth, in a revival of Martin Reeves' famous play, The Road is Narrow. The production that you and the great Sherlock Holmes attended, I'm sure. We certainly did, Mr. Bell, though at the time we had no idea that we were about to become involved in the tragic death of Martin Reeve. You've probably heard of him, haven't you, Mr. Bell? It seems to me I had to read him in school, Dr. Oh, Watson. He's rather out of fashion now, like so many other good things. But in the 1890s, apart from Lord Tennyson, there wasn't a more famous writer in England. Or a a more respected one. The story I'm going to tell you tonight, Mr. Bell, concerns the horrible circumstances surrounding his death. Sounds like a mighty intriguing Sherlock Holmes adventure. But before you begin, Dr. Watson, do you mind if I... You have your little talk? (laughs) No, of course not, Mr. Bell. (laughs) Men, well-groomed hair helps so much in giving a man that prosperous, successful appearance. And I'm sure you'll want to know why Kreml hair tonic is preferred among America's top flight executives. Kreml never plasters the hair down with sticky goo, which makes your hair and scalp feel so dirty. It never gives hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look. You see, Kreml is a very highly specialized hair tonic. It contains a unique and utterly different combination of hair grooming ingredients that's never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. That's why Kreml keeps unruly hair so neatly in place longer, with such a handsome, healthy-looking luster. What I especially like about Kreml is that after you use it, you can run your hand back over your hair, and your hair never feels sticky or dirty. No greasy film comes off on your hand. Yet Kreml keeps hair in perfect order from morning till night, always looking so healthy and handsome. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about the singular death of Martin Reed? Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure began late on a foggy evening many, many years ago. Sherlock Holmes and I had been to the Garrick Theater to see the revival of Martin Reed's play. And I remember that we decided to walk home to Baker Street. As we approached the old familiar door of 221B, our footsteps echoed hollowly in the deserted street, and the chimes of a neighboring church reminded us of the fact that it was midnight. A delightful evening, Watson. A good dinner, an excellent bottle of wine, and three hours of theatrical magic. Well, personally, I found the play rather depressing. Its theme is a morbid one, but the writing and construction are flawless. Yes, a magnificent play and well worth reviving. By the way, I noticed an item in the Times this morning concerning Martin Reed. He is dangerously ill. Oh, really? Well, he must be quite an old man. Eighty-two, to be precise. Well, is he as old as that? Curious career, Watson. His greatest success was written when he was a young man. In the past 50 years, he has never written anything to compare with tonight's play. No, I don't think he... Holmes, look up at our window. Hello. The gas is brightly lighted, whereas Mrs. Hudson invariably turns it low when we're out. And look at the silhouette on the blind. There's a man pacing up and down the room. Visit at midnight, Holmes. This looks ominous. Be careful now. It may be some sort of trap. I think not, Watson. If some desperado were lying in wait for me, I doubt whether he'd be stupid enough to turn up the gas to advertise his presence. Oh, just same. I wonder how he got in. Presumably through the front door. Mrs. Hudson has instructions to let a client wait in our rooms if his business seems urgent. Uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. At your service, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Manners. Harvey Manners. How do you do, Dr. Manners? This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, do? Doctor? Uh, I must apologize for being here at such an hour of night, Mr. Holmes, but my business is urgent. I'm sure it is, Doctor. I left Carlisle this morning, arriving at St. Pancras Station two hours ago. I came directly here, persuaded your housekeeper to let me wait for you. Then sit down, my dear doctor, and tell me what urgent business has brought you to London. Uh, Thank you. Well, Mr. Holmes... I've been acting in the capacity of personal physician for Martin Reeve, the playwright. Martin Reeve? What an extraordinary coincidence. We've just returned from seeing the revival of his play, The Road is Narrow. 
We were talking about him as we walked home. I understand the grand old man is dying. He is not in good shape, Mr. Holmes. His heart's in very bad condition. Auricular fibrillation, Dr. Watson. No, oh, then at his age, I imagine you don't hold out much hope. No, but I think with care, he might last a year or two. Uh, but uh, the reason I've come to you, Mr. Holmes, is that I'm convinced that although he's a dying man, someone is trying to murder him. To murder him? Good Lord. What reason do you have for saying that, Dr. Manners? Well, Mr. Holmes, I've been in almost daily attendance on Mr. Reeve. Last night, his coachman drove over to get me, saying that his master had suffered another bad attack. When I got to the house, I found that Mr. Reeve had received an, a severe shock. He was in a state of almost complete hysteria, and he kept insisting that he'd seen an apparition in his room a few hours earlier. What kind of an apparition? A ghost from his past, as he referred to it. I think that someone arranged for that apparition, that they knew of his heart condition, and also knew that a sudden fright could kill him. It's possible, Dr. Manners, and it would be one of the least detectable methods of murder. But who would want to kill a dying man? Who lives at the house with him, Dr. Manners? His daughter, Catherine, his brother, Silas, who's a drunken good-for-nothing, and his secretary, a fellow by the name of uh, Hugh Kingslake. Uh, do you know the condition of Mr. Reeves as well? Uh, no, but I do know he had dictated a new one a few days ago. Oh, a fact you. that might easily have provoked a crisis. Uh, Dr. Manners, you will say that Mr. Reeves spoke of seeing an apparition, a ghost from his past. Was he able to describe its appearance? Well, he, he was a little incoherent, but uh, he kept babbling something about blonde hair and blue eyes and a young man who'd come back from beyond the grave to haunt well, him. don't you think, uh, Dr. Manners, that these might simply be the delusions of an old and uh, a sick man? I didn't overlook that possibility, I assure you, Dr. Watson, even though Mr. Reeves' mental faculties are remarkably acute for his age. But last night, after I'd given him a sedative, I examined his room. I found these, Mr. Holmes. That's when I decided to come to you. Well, let's have a look at them. Hmm. They look like... Uh... Blonde hair. Yes, they are, Doctor. I found them on the bedclothes, and yet uh, no one in that house has blonde hair. Interesting. Very interesting. The hair is human, and yet the roots have minute particles of blue attached to them. Obviously, they're from a wig. Get out the timetable, Watson, will you? Yeah. We're going to Carlisle? On the earliest possible train. Though the grand old man of the English theatre is dying, we must do everything in our power to see that his death is not an unnatural one. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I'm Hugh Kingslake, Mr. Reeves' secretary. Oh, how, how do you do, do, you do, do sir? The accommodations at the hotel are satisfactory, I trust, gentlemen? Entirely, yes, thank well, you, Mr. Kingslake. Thank you. Good. Frankly, I'm most relieved that you're here. Mr. Reeve received a severe shock the night before last. I quite agree with Dr. Manners that someone deliberately induced that shock, knowing the serious condition of Mr. Reeve's heart. Have you any idea who that someone might be? Well, it's a little difficult for me to talk, Mr. Holmes. After all, I'm only an employee here, but, but I can't help feeling... Oh, oh, good morning, Mr. Reeve. Kingsley, who are these men? Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. Uh, Mr. Silas Reeve. How do you do, Mr. Oh, Reeve? Yeah. And what may I ask is the professional meddler Sherlock Holmes doing in my brother's house? I'm here at the request of Dr. Manners. Manners has no right to bring you here, sir. A lot of rubbish. All this talk about apparitions. Nonsense. Martin's in his second childhood. He's become a gibbering old fool. Personally, I wish he'd die and have done with well, it. Well, upon my soul... Never Father. mind your soul, my good doctor. Why don't you mind your own business and get out of the house? We don't want detectives here. Mr. Reeve, I've traveled some 200 miles to see your brother, and I have no intention of leaving this house without talking to him. And talk and the devil with you. And if my dear, distinguished brother tells you that I've been sponging on him for years, it's perfectly true. Uncle Sam! <laughs> Enter the beautiful Catherine to try and persuade her drunken old uncle to return to his room. No, Uncle Silas. I came to get Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Dr. Manor said that Daddy can see them now. Uh, shall I take them up, Miss Reeve? Uh, no, Mr. Kingslake. I will. And don't be deceived by the Mr. Kingslake. 
and the Miss Reeves, gentlemen. My dear niece and this young man here have a dark secret. A secret that is perfectly apparent to every member of this household. Uncle Cyrus. <laughs> They're in love. Delightful, isn't it? Uncle, you're intolerable. Will you lead the way, Miss Reeve? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. Don't forget to ask him about the play that made him so famous. You might learn some interesting facts. I must apologize for Uncle Silas, gentlemen. I'm afraid he's like this all the time these days. I quite understand this, Reeve. It must be very distressing for you, my dear. Oh, I'm used to it, Doctor. Here's Daddy's room. I won't come in with you. Too many people upset me. Come in. Please go in, gentlemen. I'll see you later. Ah, there you are. Uh, who is it, Manners? It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, Mr. Reeve. Ah, good. Good. You can leave us, Manners. Yes, Mr. Reeve. I, uh, I'll see you both later. Very well, Doctor. Uh, come. Sit on my bed. Yeah, that's it. Uh, how are you feeling, sir? Old. Old and ill. But I'm glad you're both here. Manners displayed unusual enterprise in persuading you to visit me. There's been a lot of nonsense printed about my impending death. Anyone would think a great man is dying. The author of The Road is Narrow is a great man, Mr. Reeve. He was a great man, Mr. Holmes. What do you mean, sir? The author of that play died 45 years ago. What? And yet, his ghost appeared in this room two nights ago. Mr. Reeve, are you saying that you didn't write The Road is Narrow? Yes, my boy, I am. And it's a secret that's been gnawing at me for years. Now that I'm on my deathbed, I'd like to clear my conscience. Then who did write the place up? A young friend of mine, by the name of Colin McGrath. I started life as a lawyer's clerk in Keswick, a few miles from here. Colin lived in the same village and we became great friends. One day, he gave me the manuscript of his play to look at. And I realized it was a work of a genius. Suddenly he died. And no one knew about the manuscript. You claimed it uh, as your own, sir? Yes. To my eternal shame, I did. Now, I want to make amends. Mr. Holmes, I want you to find out if any heirs of Colin McGrath still survive. Yes, they do. I'll give them half of my estate. Hmm. Mr. Reeve, does anyone else know of this, uh, fraud? Yes. Knowing that I hadn't long for this world, I confided the secret to three members of my household. And you're convinced that the apparition you saw the other night was that of the dead Colin McGrath? Uh, there was no mistaking him. The blue eyes, long golden hair... It was Colin, or his ghost, come to hunt me on my deathbed. This decision on your part to leave half of your estate to any heirs of the man you wronged, was that decision made uh, before you had this strange visitation the other night? Yes. Yes, it was. Did you mention it to any member of your family, sir? No. I did say something to Dr. Manners, and I didn't mention Colin McGrath's name. It's obvious that someone wished to frighten you, knew your secret, and disguised himself to resemble Colin McGrath. Yeah, it was Colin. Never forget his blue eyes. He was standing over there, in the chest of drawers. He, he looked at me. So, so reproachfully. So, did you sleep? Yes, Watson. And while he lies there, some member of this household continues to plot his death. We must work fast. Well, what are we going to do? Split forces. I shall remain here for a while and see what may be found out. I'll meet you at our hotel later and we'll compare notes. And what shall I do? Go to the village of Keswick. Colin McGrath lived and died there. See what you can find out about him, Watson. <laughs> Watson. 
Of course I remember Colin McGrath. Well, I should be very grateful for any information about him, madam. As postmistress, I imagine that very little village gossip has escaped you. <laughs> of course it hasn't. I remember the McGrath boy well. He was no good. Didn't he marry poor old Mrs. Northrop's granddaughter Susan and then go and desert her just to kill himself? And the poor girl was going to have a baby. No good on earth. That's what young McGrath was. And you can tell him I said so if you ever reached the place I'm sure he went to. Oh, I said, well, uh, ha they had a child, you say. Uh, what happened to it, madam? How should I know? I'm only the postmistress. You'd better go and see the vicar, young man. <laughs> It's a tragic story you've told me, Dr. Watson. But you remember Colin McGrath, sir? Oh, very well. And I always suspected something akin to genius in the boy. That he burned with too hard and gem-like a flame. Uh, as Walter Pater has said, he burned himself out, destroyed his life and poor Susan Northrips with it. She died of a broken heart less than a year after his death. And their child? There was no money, no one to look after the boy. He was sent to an orphanage in Liverpool. Then that child, if he's still alive, stands to inherit half of Martin Reeves' fortune. If only we can find him. Well, it's good to be back here at the hotel, Holmes. I've had an exhausting day. I trust you had better luck than I did. What did you find out? That Colin McGrath had a child, that his wife died shortly after the child's birth, and that the boy was sent to an orphanage in Liverpool. In Liverpool? Go on, Watson. Well, the vicar gave me this photograph where, where we are, of uh, Mrs. McGrath. It was, uh, was taken on their wedding day. Let me see it. But this is amazing, Watson. One of our problems is solved. Well, I'm best if I see how. Let me explain it to you. After you left, I had quite a long talk with the secretary, Hugh Kingslake. It transpired that he knew nothing of his parents. He had been raised in an orphanage, and the only memento he has is a picture of his mother. A picture that he carries in his watch. And that picture... Is a duplicate of this one. Great Scott, and the fellow calling himself Hugh Kingsley is really the Colin McGrath heir. Precisely. A fantastic situation indeed. Come on, old chap. Grab your hat and coat. We must drive over to Mr. Reeves and break the good news that the missing heir is a member of his own household. But we're still no nearer finding out who's been trying to frighten old Mr. Reeves. Surely that's obvious now, Watson. Come in. Dr. Manos, what's wrong? Uh, please, please come at once, both of you. It's Mr. Reeves. Hart? Yes, Dr. Watson. This evening, he had another visit from that apparition. I'm only afraid this time the devilish plan may work and that Martin Reeve won't live through the night. In a moment, we'll find out what Sherlock Holmes says is obvious. But first, more and more men today are beginning to realize they should take better care of the hair they've got. And when you buy a hair tonic, why not get your money's worth? Why not enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic? Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day long and always gives it such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never sticky or greasy. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A quick massage with Kreml stimulates circulation right in the surface of the scalp, leaving your scalp feeling so alive, so invigorated. At the same time, Kreml removes loose dandruff. It's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, Remember, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men, just as soon as possible, buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Let Kremel always keep your scalp feeling clean and refreshed. Your hair always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L. Kremel Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, this story certainly has me on the edge of my chair. What happened next? You drove over to Mr. Reeves' house, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Bell, we did. And as we went rattling down the country lanes, the flickering oil lamps on Dr. Manor's carriage lighting a shadowy path, I found it almost impossible to get a word out of Sherlock Holmes. Holmes, sometimes you're the most irritating man on earth. 
And what prompts that little tirade, Watson? You haven't opened your mouth since we left our hotel. Purposeless conversation is a waste of time. Not much further, is it, Dr. Manners? No, Mr. Holmes. We're nearly there. Well, I don't consider conversation purposes when it clarifies the problem, Holmes. You said it was obvious who had been frightening Mr. Reeve. I suppose I'm stupid, but I find it far from obvious. And yet the facts are clearly in front of your eyes. Eyes. That's it, Watson. Think about eyes. The, the blue eyes of the supposed ghost, eh? But the Reeves family have all got brown eyes. Apparently, it's a marked family characteristic. Quite, Watson. That fact should lead you to the obvious conclusion. Oh, you're always talking in riddles, Holmes. In the room. Here we are, Mr. Holmes. And Hugh Kingslake is standing at the front door. How is he, Mr. Kingslake? Better, Mr. Holmes. Seems to have rallied a bit. I'm glad you're all here. I'll drive my carriage round to the stables. Be back in a moment. Come in, gentlemen. With uh, Mr. Reeve so ill, it may seem a little inappropriate to announce my news. But uh, Catherine consented to marry me tonight. We're engaged. Oh, really? My congratulations. Thank yes, you, indeed. She's a charming girl. Oh, Catherine, darling. I've uh, told them our news. Oh, it must seem a terrible time to announce it, Mr. Holmes, with poor Daddy lying so ill upstairs. It's quite understandable, Miss Reeve. And uh, before we go up and see your father... I'd like you both to know that we have something in the nature of a wedding present for you. A wedding present? Yes. You're both familiar with the story of Colin McGrath, I understand? You mean that he was the true author of The Road is Narrow? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. Daddy told us all about it. And did you also know that Mr. Reeve is planning to leave half his estate to the heir of Mr. McGrath? I knew that, Dr. Watson. In uh, my capacity as secretary, I had occasion to draw up a rough draft of the new will a few days ago. Then I'm sure, Mr. Kingslake that you'll be very interested to know that today Dr. Watson and I discover that you are the son of Colin McGrath. That... that I am? You is the heir? Well, that doesn't seem possible. The fact is proven beyond a doubt, Miss Reeve. Then... then if Mr. Reeve makes the new will, I stand to inherit half the fortune. Yes, my boy, you do. That's what Mr. Holmes meant when he was talking about wedding presents. Yes, come here, somebody! That's Uncle Silas. He's upstairs with Daddy. What's wrong, Mr. Reeve? Fire. I knocked over a lamp in Martin's room. And Daddy's up there. The room's oh. ablaze. What? Come on, Watson. Well, the whole top landing's burning, Holmes. Can't go through this way. We can't, just can't stand here. Mr. Reeve will roast alive. I, I'm going after him. Come back, Kingsley. Come back. Come back. Great Scott, he went right through the flames, Holmes. Send one of the servants for the fire brigade. And tell the rest to bring buckets of water. And to bring them fast. <laughs> Dr. Watson, how is Hugh? Well, he's going to pull through, Miss Reeve. He's badly burned, but he'll be all right, won't he, Dr. Manners? Yes, yes, a few weeks in the hospital, and he'll be as good as new. And father? Well, uh, I am afraid he's dead, Catherine. Dead? Oh, poor daddy. Oh, my dear, he might have lived for a time, but the shock of the fire coming so close on top of the other one was too much for him. He died just as I took him from your fiancé's arms. So that by knocking over a lamp, I, I was responsible for my brother's death? Yes, Mr. Reeve. The credit is yours. In fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the local police might consider booking you on a charge of arson. Rubbish! It was an accident, and you can't prove otherwise. Possibly not. But there's one matter I can settle here and now. Two nights ago, someone in this house tried to murder Martin Reeve by posing as Colin McGrath. The same despicable action was repeated tonight. Well, one person that we can eliminate is Hugh Kingsley. He nearly gave his life just now, trying to save his employer. Then who was responsible, Mr. Holmes? A feature of the impersonation that especially struck your father, Miss Reeve, was the color of the eyes. He described them as a brilliant blue. Then that rules out Catherine and me, and we both have brown eyes. Precisely, Mr. Reeve. I have devoted some considerable study to the art of disguise. There are wigs and uh, methods of altering height and weight. But the color of the eyes cannot be altered. Watson, ten minutes ago you had the opportunity of examining Mr. Kinslake's eyes without the tinted glasses he's in the habit of wearing. Well, they did fall off when he stumbled back down the back stairs, but I can't say that I noticed the color of his eyes. They were blue, Watson. Brilliant blue, just as his father's were before him. You mean that young Kingslake was responsible? Yes, Mr. Reeve, I do. But that's ridiculous, Mr. Holmes. He just hurt himself severely in trying to save Father. True, Miss Reed. But surely his reason was obvious. He intended to marry you. And when he learned a few days ago that your father planned to will half his estate to the McGrath heir, 
he decided to try and kill him before that will could be put into effect. Oh, I see it all, Holmes. And then tonight, he realized that he was the heir. Precisely, Watson. And so it was to his great advantage to see that his employer stayed alive to execute that new will. That accounts for his bravery in the fire tonight. I can't believe it, I mean, Mr. Holmes. I can. I've always disliked you, and I'll have great pleasure in prosecuting him. It'd be hard to prove, Silas. After all, your brother did die a natural death. Yes, Dr. Manners. I fear that legally there's very little we can do to Mr. Kinslake. But when he recovers and realizes that he risked his life for nothing, I think he'll find his own punishment. The change in the will was not made. The estate will be divided between the family, and I doubt if Mr. Kinslake will now acquire any of it by marriage. No, of course he won't. I'll never see him again. Oh, quite right, my dear, quite right. What a despicable scheme. And to think that, that his father wrote one of the greatest plays of our century. I prefer to forget the fact, Watson. Emotional qualities are antagonistic to clear thinking. I assure you that the most winning woman I ever knew was hanged for poisoning three little children for their insurance money. And the most repellent man of my acquaintance is a philanthropist who has spent nearly a quarter of a million upon the London poor. And now, my dear chap, I think we should look up the next train back to London. Our work here is done. <laughs> moment we'll hear about next week's story. But first, girls, here's a sensational beauty tip from some of the world's most divinely beautiful girls. Powers models. Girls who are famous for their enchantingly lovely silken sheen hair. We glamour bathe our hair with cremel shampoo. And really, ladies, you'll be amazed how cremel shampoo brings out all your hair's natural sparkling beauty. It leaves hair shimmering with brilliant highlights that last for days. And you can always count on Cremel Shampoo to thoroughly cleanse your scalp and hair. It never leaves any dull, cloudy film. Then, too, the beneficial oil base helps keep hair from becoming dry and brittle. That's right. Cremel Shampoo leaves your hair so much softer, a silkier, a silkier hair with satin smoothness. Your hair holds a better wave, too. So, ladies... Buy a bottle of Cremel Shampoo at any drug counter and see how easy it is to have naturally lustrous hair, a vision of beauty. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. And remember, a bottle of Cremel Hair Tonic or a bottle of Cremel Shampoo makes a fine addition to that Christmas stocking. Well, Dr. Watson, I won't be seeing you before next Wednesday, so I'll, I'd like to wish you a very Merry Christmas. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Bell, and the same to you, my boy. I'd also like to take this opportunity of extending the season's greetings to all our listeners and all our friends. On behalf of our sponsors, on behalf of Mr. Conway and myself, and on behalf of Mr. McKnight, our director. So, Dr. Watson, we'll be meeting again next Saturday night. What new Sherlock Holmes adventure are you planning to tell us then? The strange story of a weird jungle music that was heard in the peaceful English countryside and of a diabolical plot that failed. I call it the Singer Affair... Of the white cockerel. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Sign of Four. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion. Help win the war against tuberculosis. Buy colorful Christmas seals and use them to dress up all your cards and packages. Buy the Christmas seals that help save lives today. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the singular affair of the white cockerel. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time to keep that weekly date with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. 
Let's join him, shall we? Ah, uh, come in, Mr. Bell. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, my boy. How are you feeling after your Christmas holiday? Remarkably well, thank you, Mr. Bell, considering how extremely hospitable my friends have been. <laughs> Just a twinge or two of gout to remind me that an old man should treat tawny port. With the respect that it deserves. I know just what you mean, Dr. Watson. Well, draw up your usual chair, my boy, and settle yourself down. Ah. That's it. All ready with tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure, Dr. Watson? Yes, Mr. Bell. And when I was going over my notes on the case just before you arrived, I came across its white feather. It played a prominent part in tonight's adventure. A white feather? That signifies cowardice, doesn't it? Yes, it can. It can, Mr. Bell. It can. But this is a very special feather. It was plucked from a white cockerel, and it helped Sherlock Holmes to foil one of the most diabolical plots that we ever encountered. But first, don't you want to have your, your usual word with our listeners? Thank you, Dr. Watson. <laughs> Men, if you want to stand out in the crowd, remember, well-groomed hair means a lot to a man's appearance. And I'm sure you'll want to know why so many of America's most prosperous and successful men use cremel hair tonic. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. It keeps hair neatly in place longer, too. Yet Kreml never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. Just make this test, men. After you apply Kreml, rub your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or on your hat band. Kreml always gives your hair such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. At the end of the day, your hair looks just as neatly groomed as when you combed it in the morning. Buy a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the story of the white cockerel? Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure took place after Sherlock Holmes had given up his regular practice and retired to his bee farm on the Sussex Downs. I was staying with him there for a few weeks' holiday, and I remember coming down to breakfast one morning to find my old friend, his pipe clenched between his teeth, squatting on a stool, examining the contents of a large metal box at his feet. As he threw back the lid, I could see that the box was half full of papers, papers tied up with red tape in separate packages. After sorting through them for, for a few moments, he turned to me and said... A box of secrets, my dear Watson. A box of deep, dark secrets. Are they the records of your early cases, Holmes? Huh? Yes, my boy. These were all done before my biographer had come to glorify me. I've often wished that I had the notes on them. So that you might transmute my little adventures into those rather florid stories of yours? My stories aren't florid. They're factual accounts of what happened. Oh, don't be hurt, my dear fellow. Oh, it's much early in the day. Well, Watson, perhaps someday the world will hear of these cases. They're not all successes, but there are some pretty little problems among them. I'm sure. For example, here's the record of the Tarleton murders. And here's the case of Bambury, the wine merchant. What happened to him? He died, Watson, under peculiarly horrible circumstances. Oh, really? That case was one of my failures, I'm afraid. Aha! This adventure was really a little recherché. It's a full account of Ricoletti of the club foot and his abominable wife. Yes, yes, I, I vaguely remember her dreadful woman. Ghosts from the past, Watson. Ghosts to remind me that my heyday's long oh, past. <laughs> rubbish. I'm quite sure that if a case were to present itself at this moment, you'd be totally unable to resist it. You're wrong, old chap. Look at this note. Derived just before you came downstairs. Mr. Manderby, the local squire, apparently needs my help. And yet, I assure you, I'm not in the least tempted to give it to him. Oh, may I see it? Certainly. Here. Let's have a look. Dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I need your help desperately. Have the goodness to call on me as soon as convenience permits. Continued theft of chickens may appear to be a small matter. <laughs> chickens, with gracious me. But I assure you that there are sinister forces at work. <laughs> Asking you to catch a chicken thief. Well, really, Holmes. Yes, Watson, chickens. Something of a come down, isn't it? Well, do you know this, Mr. Mandeville? No. But surely his handwriting gives you a clue to his character. Well, it's legible and regular. A man of business habits, I should say, and of some force of character. No, no, Watson. Oh, sorry? Look at his long letters. They hardly rise above the common herd. That D might be an A, and the L an E. 
Men of character always differentiate their long letters, however illegibly they may write. There's vacillation in his case and self-esteem in his capital. That's amazing, Holmes. Elementary, my dear Watson. And our long association together should remind you of the fact. I'm afraid you're getting rusty. Well, perhaps you're getting rusty too, Holmes. And since the sun is shining and this letter comes from a neighbor of yours, it might be rather interesting to... Uh... Call on Mr. Manderby. Exactly. I'd like to see if your analysis of his character matches the gentleman himself. In any case, Holmes... He may really be in trouble, you know. Watson, you're like an old war horse hearing a nearly forgotten bugle. Yeah, I dare say, Holmes. But even for stolen chickens, it's good to be in harness with you again. When that wistful tone creeps into your voice, I can't refuse you, Watson. Very well. Let's stroll across the downs and investigate the mystery of Mr. Mandeby's chickens. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, I'm glad you and your friend came here so promptly. It would seem to me, Mr. Manderby, that uh, your wisest course would have been to call in the local police. I did. And the idiots scoffed at me. Indeed, Mr. Manderby? Why? Well, they said if they had to track down all the chicken thieves in these parts, they'd have no time for their more important duties. I must admit that I can follow their reasoning, sir. Well, I can't, since they seem to spend most of their time playing skittles in the Star and Garter. The local sergeant appears to have been selected for his complete lack of grey matter. There isn't one iota of imagination. He's unable to see in what respect this differs from an ordinary chicken theft. Well, in what way does it differ, Mr. Bandover? Well, the chicken coops were broken into with considerable ingenuity. The thief could have taken uh, all he could carry. But he stole only one chicken. A white cockerel. A white cockerel... When did this take place? Uh, early last evening. Uh, that was when I uh, sent my note to you, Mr. Holmes. But in the early hours of this morning, a burglar broke into the house itself. And what was stolen this time? Again, the thief took only one object. My daughter's hairbrush. Does your daughter know of these thefts? No, no, I didn't tell her. The child's full enough of peculiar fancies as it is. A white cockerel and a hairbrush. Mr. Manderby... I came here against my better judgment, but thank heaven I did. Please let me talk to your daughter at once. Unless I'm very much mistaken, there's devil's work afoot. Uh, Alicia's uh, playing in the drawing room. I'll take you in. I think if you don't mind, Mr. Manderby that uh, we would prefer to see her alone. Rubbish. What could you possibly wish to say to my daughter that you couldn't say in front of me? Well, since my friend has been kind enough to help you, sir, I think you'd better let him conduct his investigation in his own manner. Oh, very, very, very well. All sounds unnecessarily mysterious to me. Uh, I, I'll be in my study. Pompous fellow. You were right in your analysis of his character, Holmes. Well, let's go in. Shh. Listen to the piano, Watson. What a weird tune. Yes. An odd, primitive melody to hear in the heart of the English countryside. Very curious. Come in. I'm sorry, Father. Oh, it isn't Father. Who are you, gentlemen? Miss Manderby, permit me to introduce myself. My name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Uh, how do you do, my dear? Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I knew you lived in the neighborhood... Why are you here? At your father's request. Oh, nothing's wrong, is it, Mr. Holmes? I'm not sure, Miss Manderby. That's why we've come to talk to you. Oh, may we sit down, my dear? Oh, yes, of course. Please forgive me. Thank you, Lord. You play the piano excellently, Miss Manderby. Have you ever thought of concert work? Concert work? Oh, no, sir. Papa would never allow it. He needs me here all the time. You don't see many people here at the house. No, Dr. Watson. Papa doesn't like me to cultivate any friends... He wishes me to devote all my attention to him. Extremely selfish and medieval point of view, it would seem to me. Oh, please, Mr. Holmes. You mustn't say anything against Papa. If he knew that we were talking about him, he'd be furious. Then uh, let me confine myself to you, Miss Manderby. Do you know of anyone in this neighborhood who might uh, wish you serious harm? Uh, no. No, I don't. I, uh, 
As I told you, I, I hardly know anyone. Then why, my dear young lady, are you so obviously terrified of your own shadow? Oh, please don't ask me that. I haven't even had the courage to tell Papa. Possibly not, my dear, but Mr. Holmes is here to help you and to protect you. That's why he insisted on our seeing you alone. Yes, Miss Mandeville. And uh, a trouble shared, you know? Very well, Mr. Holmes. I will tell you. I've got to tell someone. Last night I had a, a ghastly dream. I dreamed that I was in some foreign country, in the jungle. I was tied to a stone slab, and a group of natives danced around me, waving knives. And they were all wearing terrifying masks. Oh, my dear, it sounds like too much lobster for supper. <laughs> Quiet, Watson. Oh, sorry. Uh, please continue, Miss Mandabin. All the time I could hear a strange, haunting pipe playing in the background. It sounded like some sort of flute, and it was a drum beating out a slow, rhythmic beat. The same rhythm that you were playing on the piano as we came in? Why, yes. It's been haunting me ever since I awakened this morning. It goes like this. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, I awakened from the nightmare, but I could still hear the melody continuing. I went to the window, and in the moonlight, I saw a tall man walking below. Could you recognize him? No, Mr. Holmes. He was disappearing through the shrubbery, and his back was turned. But his hands were raised to his mouth, and I could hear the same melody being played on some kind of flute. It was awful, awful. You haven't told your father about it. No, Dr. Watson. He wouldn't have believed me. Papa's always accusing me of being fanciful. Oh, but I'm not. Really, I'm not. Miss Mandeby, I'm glad that you've told us this. Though I suggest that you continue to keep it a, a secret from your father. Very well, Mr. Holmes. Come on, Watson. All right, Holmes. Goodbye, my dear, and courage, Miss Mandeby. You have friends now. Good day, gentlemen. I thank you. Holmes. What the devil's all this about? When I can answer that question, Watson, the case will be solved. As it is, there's work to be done. Ah, oh, there you are, Holmes. Yes, Mr. Manderby, here we are. Yeah, I hope you find out what's wrong with the lassie. She uh, hasn't been herself today. A change from her normal self, where you are concerned, might be a benefit, sir. Yes, indeed. The poor girl seems completely terrified of you, sir. The problem of my daughter's relationship with her father is no possible concern of yours. I asked you here on a simple matter of detection. Detection, yes, but far from simple. I warn you, you are in serious danger of the loss of a great deal more than a white cockerel and a hairbrush. Be on your guard, Mr. Manderby. Dr. Watson and I must conduct a little investigation in the village. You may expect a call from us later in the day. <laughs> Well, Watson, here we are at Larches. Charming house, but I still don't see quite why we are here. Because my inquiries uncovered the fact that this is the only house in the neighborhood with relatively new tenants. When something extraordinary happens in the peaceful countryside, look first for a newcomer. The owner's name is Mr. George Shapley. Let's see what information the gentleman can give us. Listen to that, Holmes. Sounds like a flute. Yes, Watson. And the melody is the same that Miss Manderby played for us on the piano. And this house is only a stone's throw away from hers. Precisely. Yes, gentlemen. Mr. Shapley? Yes. My name is Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How are you, doctor? Uh, what can I do for you, gentlemen? I'm something of a student of music. We were walking past your house, and I heard what sounded like a flute playing a strange it melody. It seemed to come from the direction of the stables over there. Oh, that. <laughs> it's my manservant, Harker. He's a West Indian. Brought him over with me from Trinidad. He's quite a musician. <laughs> In an amateur sort of way, you know. I wonder if I might speak to him. Of course you can, Mr. Holmes. I'll walk you over there. Thank you. We were thinking of getting up a little entertainment in the village for the church ladies' bazaar. Perhaps your man would uh, consider contributing his services. You can ask him. He spends two or three hours a day out here practicing. Parker. Yes? Come here a minute. 
Yes, Mr. Pepper. These gentlemen heard you play and wondered if you'd like to do something for some, oh, <laughs> some village concert or other. Oh, that's flattering. We're organizing a musical soiree for the church ladies in a few weeks. Yes, sir, man, and we'd like you to play for us. Oh, I'm only an amateur, but I'd be very glad to help, gentlemen. That uh, instrument you were playing, it had an odd quality. Was it a flute? Oh, yes, sir, though I doubt if you've ever seen one like it. Look for yourself. Good Lord. Looks as if it's made of bone. It is, sir. From a human leg bone. Really? It's about 200 years old and originally came from Brazil. It's quite a collector's item. I'm sure it is. Tell me, Harker, since you're from the West Indies and uh, obviously a lover of music, I presume you're familiar with some of the primitive melodies indigenous to that part of the world. Some of the tribal chants, for instance. Oh, yes, sir. I know many of them. Perhaps you'd play some at the concert. I'd rather not, sir. Primitive chants are dangerous medicine when their evil powers are not appreciated or understood. I quite agree with you, Harker. Well, well, I'm much obliged to you, and uh, we shall count on you for the concert. Good day to you both. Come on, Watson. Uh, good, day. Good, day. Good, day. Good, day. good day. Good day, Dr. Watson. That servant's our man, Holmes. He lives within two houses of Miss Vanderbilt, and he plays the flute. Well, Watson, though I don't think the pattern is remotely as clear as you think, I'll agree that suspicion would seem to focus on the servant, Harker. I could even produce another clue that points to it. You could? I picked this object from his coat as he turned to you during the conversation. None of you noticed it. What is it? Look for yourself, Watson. Here. Great heavens! It's a feather from a white cockerel. <laughs> Holmes, I thought you said we were going back to Mr. Mandeville's house before the day is over. We are, Watson. Why are we back here at your bee farm? It's 8.30 in the evening now. We shall call on Mr. Mandeville before long. My investigations are complete. What luck did you have well, with yours? Well, as you told me, I made exhaustive inquiries in the village. With what results? I couldn't find out much about Mr. Shapley. Nobody knows anything about the man except that he has a foreign manservant and that he paid cash for his house and deposited a large sum of money in the local bank. Uh, what did you discover? I see that you've been up to your ears in reference books. Yes, Watson. Books concerning the peculiarly revolting ceremonies connected with voodooism. Voodooism? That's black magic. But flourishing in our English countryside, apparently. A white cockerel is the second finest sacrifice in voodoo magic associated with the West Indian child. That accounts for the first theft. How about this stolen hairbrush? In all such magic, the possession of intensely personal objects, particularly human hair is considered to give great supernatural powers over that person. Then it's obvious that West Indian servant is trying to get power over Miss Mandeby. Holmes, you spoke of a white cockerel being the second finest sacrifice. What is the first? A human sacrifice. The sacrifice of a young girl. Great Scott! And tomorrow night the moon is full. I think that tonight the girl should be safe, though of course we'll go over there at look, once. Look, 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 Holmes, the lights of a carriage are coming up your drawer, your driveway. And it's no social call, it's driving at a gallop. Come on, Watson. I have, uh, have nothing that's happened to Miss Mandeville already before we get her. Who is it? What's wrong? Uh, it's Robert Mandeville. What's happened, Mr. Mandeville? Alicia, my daughter, she's disappeared. The whole neighborhood's searching for her. For heaven's sake, both of you come at once. <laughs> We'll find out in a moment what Sherlock Holmes decides to do now. But first, men, why not start today and take better care of the hair you've got? Remember, one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of a highly specialized hair tonic like Cremel? Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why it keeps unruly hair neatly in place longer, with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet Cremel never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. It never leaves hair feeling sticky, gummy, or dirty. Your hair and scalp always look and feel so clean with Cremel. And if your hair is so dry it breaks and falls when you comb it, start using Cremel at once. Let it make your hair feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. Cremel is also fine to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes. 
A quick massage with creme will help stimulate the cutaneous circulation of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated your scalp feels. So for better groomed hair, a hygienic scalp, use Kreml daily. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, what happened next? You and the great Sherlock Holmes drove over to Mr. Manderby's house, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Bell, as fast as a pony and trap could carry us there. When we arrived, Manderby quickly led us to the shrubbery beneath his daughter's window. Yes, you... Uh... You can see how the fiend got into the house, Mr. Holmes. By climbing this trellis work. Hmm. Footprints in the earth leading toward it, but none leaving. And the man, whoever he was, must have left the house by some other exit. An amazing deduction, Watson. There's no need to be sarcastic. Holmes, we should go to the chapter's house at once. It's obvious that that's where the danger lies. Before saying that anything is obvious, Watson, I'd like your help in trying an experiment. Yes, of course, Holmes. Well, what is it? Try climbing that trellis for me, will you? you give me all the best jobs, don't you? Uh, let me hand, will you, Uncle? Here you are. Up you go. You know, Holmes, it, it seems to me you're wasting valuable time. Mr. Manderby, since you asked my help, I suggest you let me handle the case in my own way. Holmes, I, I don't think this trellis is going to hold my way. Bravo, Watson. Your test has been invaluable. What do you mean it's been invaluable? I think I've broken my back. I'm sure you'll survive. Come on, old chap. Get on your feet. We'll go over to Mr. Shapley's house at once. I only hope we're not too late to prevent a tragedy. Light coming from the stables, Holmes. Music, too. Listen. It's that West Indian playing his devilish chant again. Faster, Watson. Look, look, look. There's someone standing in the shadows by the harness room there. It's Mr. Shapley. Good evening, sir. Mr. Who? Dr. Watson. Thank heavens you're here. What's wrong, Mr. Shapley? Look in that empty store there. You can see through the broken plank in the wall. The one where the music's coming from. Good heavens. Look, Holmes. There's Miss Mandeville lying on the floor unconscious. Yes, with a dead white cockerel beside her and a fire smoldering in the corner. And to think that servant of mine's in there playing his filthy music. I don't see him. Mr. Holmes, I've got a revolver. I'm going in to get him. I think we'll come with you, Mr. Shaffer. No, no. It's my servant. I'll take care of him myself. Ask him, Watson. Give me that revolver. Give it to me, I say. What do you think you're doing, Mr. Yes, Holmes? Tell you not. You knocked the revolver right on his hand. Pick it up, Watson. I have a profound dislike for seeing murder committed under my very eyes. Murder? But the potential murder is Harker, the, the servant. Indeed. Sir. Then why is his unconscious body lying in the corner it there? It can't be. The music's still playing. That's his flute. Yes, and it's accompanied by a drum. A remarkable feat, even for a man not lying unconscious on the floor. The music is undoubtedly that of a gramophone. You're remarkably quiet, Mr. Harker. Of course he is. He's unconscious. My dear Watson, you're overlooking an important fact. It's a case of identity. The West Indian gentleman lying on the floor is the master, Mr. Shapley. This man is the servant, Harker. Let me... No, you don't. Let him go. I've got him, Holmes. Let go of me. You can't prove anything. I can and I will. You'll go to prison for this night's work. Watson, see what may be done to arrive at the house while I turn this man over to the police. How is Miss Manderby, Watson? She's, uh, she's going to be all right, Holmes. I took her home to her father's and left instructions for her, her care. How are you feeling, Chapley? Fine, thank you, Dr. Watson. But I'm waiting for Mr. Holmes to explain this nice happenings to me. Uh, so am I, as usual. Then let me analyze this singular affair and its uh, logical progression. I early concluded that you, Mr. Shapley, were the master, and the other man was the servant. Right, Mr. Holmes, but I didn't know how you knew it. Your speech and manner suggested nothing else. You reversed roles, I imagine, because it was an easier way to rent a house in the English countryside. That was the reason, Mr. Holmes. In my previous visits, I've discerned a certain prejudice against foreigners. That's a shocking thing, but I, I wouldn't doubt it, Mr. Shapley. You decided to live here... Your health, I suppose. No, Doctor. I came to the English countryside for peace. Peace to conclude my studies on the origin and history of West Indian native music. I see. I've been working in close conjunction with Professor Griffiths of the Brighton College of Anthropology. It was he who concerned me 
to make graphophone records my works with a view to recording them for musical archives. And your servant saw his advantage. When you decided to change identities, he realized that if he disposed of you, he would be able to continue in his false character as the supposed Mr. Shapley. He could have taken over your large bank balance and retired under yet a third name with the proceeds. And then he concocted this elaborate plot involving voodoo and native chants, knowing that his master would be suspect. Precisely. He drugged his master, placed him in the incriminating trap, and then planned to burst in just ahead of us and shoot him. But, Holmes, the white feather you found on Mr. Shapler's coat undoubtedly planted there. Mr. Holmes, I still don't see how you knew that my man was responsible. The first clue was the trellis. It's obvious that you never claim, climbed that. You're heavier than Dr. Watson, and it wouldn't support his weight. Your servant was a small, light man. Obviously, it was he. Well, I see it all now. And then, of course, when we heard the music while Mr. Shapley was still lying unconscious, it was obvious that the whole thing was a plot. Oh, what, a, what a shocking business. Yes, but I can't tell you how grateful I am to you, gentlemen. You saved my life. Mr. Holmes, I must insist on paying you a handsome fee. A fee? No, Mr. Shapley. I couldn't dream of accepting one. Some people in my country have been sufficiently inhospitable to a foreigner to make him believe it advisable to change places with his own servant. Presumably, this was done in order to obtain tolerance and peace. Surely the least I can do is to see that his stay on these shores is a tolerable one. <laughs> Girls, I imagine most of you are planning to go out to a party or a dance on New Year's Eve. Or perhaps just spend a quiet evening with friends. Naturally, you want your hair to look its best. So why not follow this beauty tip from those divinely beautiful Powers models? We wash our hair with Cremel Shampoo. This amazing beautifying shampoo has been especially developed to actually glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair. Revealing all its natural glossy luster. And so many women tell me how wonderful Cremel Shampoo is for washing children's hair. Well, you can readily see why. Because Cremel Shampoo is so mild and gentle on the hair. Its luxurious active foam removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Girls, if only you could see how Powers Models hair fairly radiates natural glossy highlights, I'm sure you'd want to try Cremel Shampoo right away. You can buy a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, Mr. Bell, next week I think I'll tell you a story I call the Darlington Substitution Case. It's a strange story of how Holmes saved a prominent British peer from scandal and disgrace by exercising the judgment of Solomon. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Mazarin Stone. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the Darlington substitution case. <laughs> ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Here we are once more in Dr. Watson's firelit study. The wind is howling outside, but inside the heavy red curtains have been drawn across the windows. And the only sound we can hear is the cheerful crackling of the logs in the fireplace. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. You don't know how lucky you are that you don't have to go out on a night like this. Yes, it's one of the advantages of having retired from active medical practice. You know the old adage, man works from sun to sun, but woman's work's never done. 
to base libel as far as doctors are concerned. You never know when Mr. Smith is going to acquire a black eye or Mrs. McTavish may decide to present an addition to the clan. <laughs> <laughs> never a dull moment, eh, Dr. Watson? Oh, dear me, no. That's one thing I've never complained of. If it wasn't a patient who disturbed what little routine I had, it was Sherlock Holmes. I remember one bitter February evening. It was the second winter after my marriage. I just settled down to my after-dinner pipe when the doorbell rang. It was a note from Holmes. It said, come at once if convenient. If inconvenient, come all the same. And you went, of course. Now, Mr. Bell, you'll hear all about that in good time. But uh, haven't you something to tell our listeners? Yes, Dr. Watson, I have. Men... Attractive, well-groomed hair does a great deal to give a man self-assurance, to say nothing of helping his appearance. And I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing more about this modern trend in hair grooming, which has become such a nationwide favorite among America's most successful men. It's called Cremel Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients which has never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. Yes, that's exactly why Cremel gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. And keeps it in place longer. Keeps every hair in perfect order from morning till night. Yet Kreml never gives hair that greasy, patent leather look. Kreml keeps hair looking mighty handsome with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet it always feels and looks clean on your hair and scalp. No other hair tonic keeps hair more handsomely groomed, yet it never looks greasy. So men, for better groomed hair, change to Kreml. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, when you received the mysterious message from Sherlock Holmes, you at once went round to Baker Street, I suppose. Yes, curiosity has always been my Achilles heel. Well, when I arrived at Baker Street, I found Holmes huddled in his armchair, his knees drawn up and his pipe in his mouth. He was sunk in a profound reverie. And I'd been in the room several moments before he became aware of my existence. Oh, so there you are, Watson, there you are. Obviously. I've been here for seven minutes, as a matter of fact. Unimportant, completely unimportant and uninteresting. Watson, have you ever speculated on the importance of the knowledge of dogs in detective work? Dogs? Well, naturally. Bloodhounds, sleuth hounds... No, no, I'm not interested in that phase of the subject. It's too obvious. There is another side, far more subtle. Oh, I suppose there is, but I'm dashed if I know... You it. recollect in the case you so sensationally wrote up as the adventure of the Copper Beaches? Yes, but the case was sensational. In that instance, it wasn't the dog. It was the fact that the master of the house was willing to pay a sizable sum to... Don't prattle, Watson, don't prattle. Prattle? I was about to point a moral. In the case of the Copper Beaches, I was able, by noting the actions of a rather vicious child, to draw some startling deductions as to the criminal instincts of its father, who was considered a thoroughly respectable citizen. Mm, of course, yes, I remember, but uh, what's that got to do with... My the... line of thought about dogs is analogous. Whoever saw a frisky dog in a gloomy family, or a sad dog in a happy one? Snarling people have snarling dogs. Dangerous people have dangerous dogs. Surely, Holmes, you didn't rout me out on a night like this to discuss the temperaments of dogs? Not in general, no. What interests me is why Professor Presbury's faithful wolfhound, Roy, endeavors to bite him. You mean Professor Presbury, the famous Camford's physiologist? Quite. The dog, until recently a most devoted animal, has attacked his master twice. Huh? What do you make of it? The dog is ill. Possibly. But he attacks no one else. Nor does he molest his master, save on very special occasions. Curious, Watson. Very curious. Ah, that must be Mr. Bennett, Professor Presbury's assistant. He is before his time. His appointment was 8.30. Come in, come in. Ah, good evening, Mr. Bennett. Good evening. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. I couldn't consider undertaking a case or solving an enigma without his invaluable aid. Oh, Holmes, really. Pay no attention to Mr. Bennett. He, he, he's pulling my leg again. Delighted to meet you, sir. Oh. I, I hope you'll forgive me arriving so early, Mr. Holmes, but Edith is so worried about her father, and naturally I... Uh, quite so. Uh, Edith, my dear Watson, is Professor Presbury's daughter, oh. to whom Mr. Bennett is engaged to be married. Am I right? Yes, Mr. Holmes, I have that honor. Oh, congratulations, young man, congratulations. Ideal state, matrimony. Watson, I... stop chattering. Oh, I was only going to say that I've only been... Married. Now then, Mr. Bennett, oh. Oh. I believe you gave me the salient points of the case in your letter, but I've not had the opportunity to relate them to Dr. Watson. So if you will be good enough to go over the matter again... Well, certainly, Mr. Holmes. The professor, as you may know, Dr. Watson, is a man of splendid reputation. Yes, indeed he is. A trifle positive, I... 
might even say combative, but there has never been a breath of scandal, at least until a month ago. Dear me, you tell me that old Presbyter has started to sow his wild oats at his age. <laughs> I always considered him the soul of respectability. Well, you see, early last fall he became attached to the daughter of Professor Morphy. It was not the reason courting of an elderly man, but rather the passionate frenzy of youth. Good gracious me. In short, his family considered the infatuation rather excessive? Exactly. And so I gathered that the young lady, although her father, Professor Morphy, favored the match. Mm, yes. Presbury is fairly well to do, I understand. Yes. About a month ago, Professor Presbury did something he's never done before. He left home without telling anyone he was going. A fortnight later, he returned rather travel-worn. Oh, had he been? Well, he refused to say. By chance, however, I received a letter from a friend of mine in Prague, saying he'd seen the professor at a distance. And now comes the remarkable part of the story. Oh? Yes, Dr. Watson. From that time on, a curious change came over the professor. Those around him had the inexplicable feeling he, that he was under some influence that darkened his better nature. Uh, you don't think that he was uh, hypnotized, possibly, or, or mentally unbalanced in some way? No, on the contrary. His lectures were more brilliant than ever. His mind was singularly alert. But there was something new about him, something, something sinister. His daughter tried again and again to penetrate the mask he had put on, but in vain. Extraordinary. He behaved to her almost as though she, she were a stranger. In fact, all of his friends and co-workers noticed a, a rather singular change of personality. And the incident of the letters, Mr. Bennett. Don't forget that. I was just coming to that. You see, Dr. Watson, the professor has never had any secrets from me. I handled every paper which came in to him and opened all his yes, letters. Yes, yes, of course, of course. Shortly after his return, all of this was changed. Certain letters began to arrive marked with an X under the stamp. These I was in no account to touch. What was the handwriting like? Decidedly illiterate. The envelopes had the EC mark. East Central, eh? Huh? Not exactly the portion of London one would expect the professor to be in touch with. The letters were curious enough, but... But not more curious than the little wooden box. Wooden box? Yes. One of those quaint carved things one associates with a, a visit to Germany. I discovered it one morning in the drawer of Professor Presbury's desk. He had sent me into his study in search of a cannula. I put it on my desk, Bennett. In front of the inkwell. It's not here, Professor Presbury. I I'll try the drawers. It's usually in the upper right. No, not here. Perhaps the left one. No. I say, Professor, what a curious box. I've never seen that in here before. What box? This one with the carving. You must have got it on your trip to Germany. What, what trip to Germany? Who said I was in Germany? Professor Pesbury, I, I didn't mean to... You sniveling little cat, you contemptible snooper. I, I what do you mean by poking about among my things? But Put sir, that box down. Let me explain. Put that box down, I say. Get out. Now get out of here. Get out before I break every bone in your body. Well, jolly chap, Professor. Sounds as if he were heading for an apoplectic fit. Do you remember the date of that outburst, Mr. Bennett? It was... December the 2nd. It was on that very day that Roy the Wolfhound made his first attack on the professor. Attack? Do you mean that the dog actually bit him? Well, he certainly tried to. When was the next attack? December the 11th and again on December the 20th. After that, we had to banish Roy to the stables. Singular, most singular. Those dates were new to me. There have been some even stranger developments since I wrote you, Mr. Holmes. Yes? What I speak of occurred the night before last. Uh, it was really a terrifying experience. Yes, yes, go on. I live with Professor Presbury, as you know, Mr. Holmes. I had retired rather early and was correcting the papers of a lecture I was to deliver in the morning. At 11.30, all was quiet, and I blew out my lamp and went to sleep. A, a little after midnight, I was a awakened by a curious shuffling and muttering in the corridor. It was followed by a series of dull knocks on what I took to be Edith's door. I heard her open the door. There was a gasp, and... Then she uttered a terrible scream. Help! Help! Edward, help! It's all right, darling. I'm coming. Oh. What's the matter? Don't look oh. so terrified. Oh, Edward. Edward, it was horrible. Like a nightmare. What was? Oh, oh. darling, don't tremble so. I'm here now. Tell me what frightened you. I thought I heard someone knocking at my door. I heard it too. 
I got up and opened the door, and there it was, leering up at me. It? What do you mean? Was it a man? I don't know. I only know it was something dark and crouching. I screamed and it hurried down the hall, not quite in its hands and knees, with its face sunk between its shoulders. How awful. You lock yourself in and I'll have a look. No. No, don't leave But me. darling, I... I uh... Do you hear anything? No. Nothing that... There it is again. In the ivy outside the window. As though someone were climbing up the wall. But that's impossible. The window's a good 20 feet from the ground. Nobody would dare. Look. On the windowsill. A hand. It's... It's drawing itself up. Here comes the head. Good heavens, what a horrible face. The eyes that leave. Oh, Edward. Edward. It's father. Ah! <laughs> Well, Watson, what do you make of that? The professor crawling about in this curious fashion. Lumbago, probably. I've known it to double a man up. Oh, rubbish, Watson. Did you ever hear of a man with lumbago scaling a 20-foot wall? Well, now that you mention it, no. Mr. Bennett, how did Professor Presbury explain his actions the next morning? He seemed to have no recollection of them. No recollection of them at all. When did you say this happened, Mr. Bennett? The night before last. The 4th of February, huh? That rather complicates matters. And uh, last night, did anything further happen? The only unusual thing I heard was Roy, barking furiously a, a little after midnight. Poor fellow, he's been chained down to the stable. I, I must confess, if anything else happened, neither Edith nor I would have known it. You see, we both had a feeling of impending danger and slept with our doors locked and the shutters barricaded. Very sensible procedure. I would suggest that you get Miss Presbury out of the house for a few days. Send her away until we can clear this matter up. I've already persuaded her to pay a visit to her aunt in Cambridge. Splendid. Now, as to the dates of these uh, seizures, you will say the first was December the 2nd, the next December the 11th, and the 3rd? Uh... Here's a list of the dates. When I first observed abnormality in the professor's behavior, I, I felt it my duty to obtain all possible data about the case. Excellent. Let's see. Yes. Yes, as I thought, the intervals are regular. Putting two and two together... Let us say that every nine days, the professor takes some strong drug, which has a passing but highly poisonous effect. He learned to take this drug while in Prague, and is now supplied by an intermediary who resides in the East Central District of London. Yes, yes, but the dog and the creeping man in the passage. Holmes, the thing's too fantastic to be explained by simple addiction to drugs. It's not simple, not in the least. But patience, Watson, patience, we've at least made a beginning. Our next step is to obtain an interview with the professor himself. Uh, what is the best time to catch him in, Mr. Bennett? When would he be free to see us? About 11 in the morning, Mr. Holmes. Good. You may expect us at that time tomorrow. Just a moment, we'll keep our appointment with the professor. But first, men... Remember, if you want your hair to look healthy and handsome, one of the first requisites is a hygienic scalp. And when you buy a hair tonic, be smart. Enjoy the extra advantages of a highly specialized hair tonic like Kreml. Kreml contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why it keeps unruly hair neatly in place longer, with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kreml never gives hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look. It never leaves hair feeling sticky or dirty. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kreml is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff. A quick massage with Kreml helps stimulate the cutaneous circulation of the scalp. Notice how alive your scalp feels, how it tingles. And if your hair is so dry it breaks off and falls, start using Kreml at once. Because Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling softer, more pliable, makes it look as if it had some body to it. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kreml daily for better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. 
Dr. Watson, what happened next in the strange case of Professor Presley? Well, early the next morning, found us near the town of Camford, approaching a large, rather gloomy house. This must be the house, Watson. Notice the ivy vines reaching up to the bedroom windows. See? Some of the leaves have been torn away. The vines look decidedly the worse for wear. Oh, surely no man could possibly climb up that way. No normal man, Watson. No normal man. But look, I fancy that is the professor peering at us from behind the curtains in that second window. Doesn't seem to be too well pleased at our presence. Mm, Fierce-looking chap. Tremendously vigorous for his age. I say, Holmes, do you, do you think we ought? Ought what? Well, I mean, what excuse are you going to give for our call? Assuming that Professor Presbury's memory is a trifle defective during his bad spells, uh, how is he to know that he didn't send for us himself? Well, isn't that rather skating on thin ice? Possibly, my dear Watson, possibly. Uh, oh, I must say, uh, I don't relish this interview at all. Shh! Someone's coming. It's Presbury himself. For heaven's sake, Watson, pull yourself together. You look as though you've been caught stealing sheep. Good morning. Professor Presbury, I believe? Yes. I'm Holmes, Sherlock Holmes, the detective. Oh, yes, I believe I've heard of you. Won't you come in? Uh, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Oh, all right. Come this way, gentlemen. To my study. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. What a charming room. Uh, delightful, eh, Holmes? Pray sit down, gentlemen. Now, what can I do for you? Why, that was the question I was about to put to you. To me, sir? Yes. Apropos of the communication you sent me. A letter? I sent you a letter? Uh, no. Not exactly a letter. A telegram, then? Have you got it with you? No, I can't say I have. No, I dare say not. Because I sent you no telegram. Impossible. Why, then, someone's been playing a practical joke on us both. That statement, Mr. Holmes, is highly questioned. Hmm? Really, Professor Presbury, I can only apologize for this needless intrusion and uh, hope that you will forgive me. But that is hardly enough, Mr. Holmes. What kind of fool do you take me for? Why, I... You know I didn't send for you. You can't get out of this so easily. I say, still, sir. I show you, you scoundrel. Oh, Put down that paper, wait, Professor. I shall... Consider your position. I... You can't afford a scandal. Oh, After all, shall... I'm rather well known. You cannot possibly afford to treat me with such disgust. Oh, I should think Thank not. You. Come on, Watson. The interview's closed. Good day, Professor. What a narrow escape. The professor was certainly in a dangerous mood. Yes, our learned friend's nerves are somewhat out of order. Highly inflammable temper. Maniacal, I should say. And yet his mind seemed perfectly clear. Too clear. That was my miscalculation. His memory is quite reliable, unfortunately. Strange. Very strange. I must say, Holmes, I'm a bit disappointed in you. All that trouble for nothing. Not quite for nothing. We have seen the gentleman and have gained a personal contact. We have also discovered the address of the intermediary in London. Have we? Well, how in thunder... The professor wrote to him this morning. I deciphered the name from the blotting pad on the professor's desk. I say... The gentleman's name is Dorak, and he lives in the commercial road. And now, Watson, I'm a busy man. We will drop this case until next Tuesday evening. Tuesday? But why Tuesday? On that date, if my calculations are correct, the professor should have another of his curious spells. We must be on hand to notice the developments and to prevent a catastrophe. Mr. Holmes, this isn't my idea of the way to spend a pleasant evening. Look at those clouds scudding across the moon. Yes. I told you to bring your greatcoat. I suspected it might be a trifle uh, drafty. Drafty? My legs are quite numb from crouching behind this gooseberry bush. Why did you have to pick this particular night? If the cycle of nine days holds good, we shall have the professor at his worst tonight. And moreover, I ascertained that he received a packet from the man Dorak this morning. Yes, we shall see. We shall see. Look, look, look. look. Someone has lit a light in the corner bedroom. And that must be the professor... So I was right in my calculations. Things are beginning to happen. I warned Bennett not to try to interfere with him, but to follow him at a safe distance. Safe? You don't think that he's uh, as dangerous as that, do you? I don't think so. I know it. What? Have you your revolver no. handy? Well, yes, but you don't think I should be obliged to, to, to use it? Huh? Oh, control your nerves, Watson. Well, I can hear your teeth chattering. It's not nerves. It's a cold. 
The professor's symptoms are particularly interesting. Hmm? Apart from these fits, he has more energy and vitality than ever. And then his knuckles. Did you notice his knuckles? No, I can't say that I did. Thick and horny. Quite unusual for a man. Very curious knuckles that can only be explained by the mode of progression observed in... The knuckles. But of course. And the dog. And the ivy. Why didn't I think of that before? Shh. Holmes, Holmes. Look, 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 look. He's opened the side door. There he is. Standing in the doorway. Leaning forward with his arms dangling. Of course. Of course. Now he's coming down the drive. Why, he's not walking. He's crouching. Running and skipping along on, on his hands and feet. Holmes, it's uncanny. It's, it's almost as if he were possessed by some strange, unnatural force. There he goes, round the corner of the house. Quick, Watson, we must follow him. Here comes Bennett. Oh, Mr. Holmes, have you seen him? Yes, he went this way. Come along. He's worse than usual tonight. I could hear him through my door, chattering and jabbering to himself. There he is. He's crouching at the foot of the ivy. Now he's climbing. Actually springing from vine to vine. His dressing gown flapping in the wind. How horrible. He looks like some huge bat glued against the side of the house. It's... It's uncanny. Now he's swinging himself over to that tree. He's coming down again. He's heading for the stables. Come along. We mustn't lose sight of him. We can't let him get away from us. The dog has caught sight of him. Oh, you'll kill him if you can get at him. No, the professor's staying out of reach. Look at him crouched on the ground like that. He's teasing the dog. He's throwing stones at it. Oh, this, this is inhuman. Quite, Watson, quite. Professor Presbury isn't human. Great heavens, Holmes, what do you mean? Look out. Well, his leash is broken. He's out of the professor. He'll kill him. Come on. He, he's got him by the throat. Drag him apart. Come on, drag Put him apart. Down. down, I say. I've got him by the collar. Watson, help me carry the professor into the house. His throat is badly mangled. <laughs> Come in, Watson. Come in. I've been looking over the professor's laboratory while you were treating his injuries. How is he coming along? Well, as well as can be expected. He pulled through, I fancy. The wound was dangerous to near the carotid artery. The hemorrhage was rather serious, but I say, what's that you got in your hand? The professor's little German box. Curious, isn't it? Yes, but it's open. You broke the lock. Really, Holmes, do you think that you ought to go... Probably not. But not being deterred by your scruples, I've gone ahead. The contents are quite enlightening, if your conscience will permit you to look. Two files, one empty and one nearly full. And a letter with a cross under the stamp. Yes, that's from our Mr. Dorak, the London intermediary. It contains another note that completely solves the mystery. Here it is. It's signed H. Lowenstein. H. Lowenstein? But I say, that's the Lowenstein. Obviously, Watson, obviously. I mean, it's Dr. Lowenstein, the famous Prague physician, who claims to have discovered a serum that will rejuvenate people. It's been tabooed, of course, by the medical profession because he refuses to reveal its source. And for a good reason. Here, read the letter. Let's have a look. Honored colleague, since your visit, I have thought much of your case. I beg you report fully to me on the results of my treatments. It is possible that the serum of anthropoid would have been better. I have, as I have explained, used black-faced languor. Because a specimen was accessible. The langur is, of course, a crawler and a climber, while anthropoid walks erect and is in every way nearer to man. But I say, Holmes, this is beastly. The langur is an ape. Quite. It is found on the slopes of the Himalayas and is the biggest and most human of the climbing monkeys. Then that serum explains the professor's recent peculiarities. He used it in an attempt to regain his youth. Yes, giving himself a dose at nine-day intervals with the curious results we've witnessed. It's dangerous to trick nature, Watson. When man tries to rise above it, he is liable to fall below it. Even the highest type of man may revert to the animal if he leaves the straight road of destiny. Curious story, Dr. Watson. But did Holmes manage to stop the treatment? Indeed. He wrote to Dr. Lowenstein and told him that he would be held criminally responsible if he continued to circulate his poisons. And that was the end of that. 
Why do you suppose the dog noticed the change in his master before anyone else did? His sense of smell told him. It was the monkey, not the professor, whom Roy attacked. Just as it was the monkey who teased the dog. It's fantastic. I didn't know such things were possible, Dr. Watson. Oh, dear me, yes. Both in detection and in medicine, things are apt to happen that it is difficult for the lay mind to believe. Between you and Mr. Holmes, you covered both fields. Yes, 221 Baker Street must have been an exciting place to reside when you both lived there. Yes, Mr. Bell, as you remarked a few minutes ago, we never had a dull moment. <laughs> Dr. Watson will be back in just a moment to tell you about next week's story. Here's some sensational information for our lady listeners. I'm sure we all know or have heard how divinely beautiful Powers models are. But did you know these famous beauties make up to $35,000 a year? <laughs> Which shows they have brains as well as beauty. <laughs> but seriously, Joe, what impresses me most is that Powers models can afford to spend a fortune on their hair. Yet when they wash it, they rely on inexpensive cremel shampoo. Which proves how wonderful cremel shampoo really is. Powers models were among the first to discover that no other shampoo leaves hair more shining bright with natural gloss and luster. But under no circumstances does cremel shampoo ever dry the hair. Cremel shampoo is not a drying detergent. Cremel shampoo is entirely different. And you know, after a cremel shampoo, the hair actually radiates natural, brilliant highlights. And cremel shampoo has a built-in oil base, which helps hair from becoming dry or brittle. It rinses out so easily and positively never, never leaves any dull, soapy film. So, ladies, always wash your hair with cremel shampoo. It leaves hair a vision of shining, sparkling beauty, yet in no way hurts its texture. K-R-E-M-L, cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now let me see. Next week. Uh, next week... I think I'll tell you a story about international intrigue in Paris and how, in a vile Apache den, I met a beautiful, glamorous spy and almost, uh... Almost what, Dr. Watson? Well, now, Mr. Bell, you'll have to wait next week to find out. I call this story The Adventure of the Scarlet Worm. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Creeping Man. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the Scarlet Worm. There are 80,000 patients in our veterans' hospitals. Your Red Cross contribution helps place the volunteer efforts of the community at their service. This is just one part of the Red Cross story. Give generously to the Red Cross. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Once again, it's Monday evening and time for our weekly visit with the good Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. From the hints you gave us last week about tonight's story, it sounded like quite a yarn. It took place in Paris, you said. Yes, my boy. It was in that colorful city of bright lights, lilting music, and beautiful women that Sherlock Holmes and I had one of the oddest adventures that ever happened to us in our long association. I call the case The Adventure of the Scarlet Worm. Sounds mighty intriguing, Dr. Watson. But first, men, if you want a successful, prosperous appearance, don't give your hair that cheap, greasy, plastered-down look. I've heard many men complain lately that the hairdressing they use is too greasy or too highly perfumed. That's why I urge you to try Cremel Hair Tonic. 
This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed all day long. Every hair in place. Cremel gives hair a rich, healthy-looking luster, too. Yet it never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you apply Cremel, just run your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. And how the ladies admire that natural, well-groomed look which Cremel always gives. Yes, Cremel gives your hair a handsome, clean-cut appearance. As if you had just combed it, and it keeps it that way all day long. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about your new Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of the Scarlet Worm? Well, Mr. Bell, though that singular affair took place in Paris, I suppose the story really began on an October evening in, in Baker Street, a long, long time ago. I'd been more than usually busy with my practice that day, and I returned to our lodging shortly after nine, I remember. As I entered the living room, Sherlock Holmes was seated at his side table, clad in his dressing gown and working hard over a chemical investigation. A large curved retort was boiling furiously in the bluish flame of a Bunsen burner. Finally, he brought a test tube containing a solution over to the table. In his right hand, he held a slip of litmus paper. You come at a crisis, Watson. If this litmus paper remains blue, all is well. If it turns red, it means a man's life. Good Lord Holmes, really? Aha. As I thought, it turns red. And now to send a telegram to Scotland Yard, and I need have no further connection with the case. Well, you didn't tell me that you were working on a new case, Holmes? It was a shoddy little affair, my dear Watson. An orthopedic shoemaker in Wapping became somewhat fretful with his wife. He added poison to her morning pot of tea and was stupid enough to leave a sample of the deadly brew. It was purely a routine matter. Let's forget it. You look tired, old chap. Yes, I'm home. Uh, busy day. Uh... I hope you won't be too tired to accompany me to Paris tomorrow. To Paris? Why? This afternoon I received a very rare visitor in these rooms. My brother Mycroft. All is not well at the foreign office. They need our help. Well, what's wrong, Holmes? An international spy ring is at work. In the past few months, important secrets have leaked out. Vital secrets that might bring this country to the verge of war. Good gracious me. Two of the foreign office's brightest young men have committed suicide rather than divulge how they betrayed their trust. Mycroft tells me he has reason to suspect a beautiful and dangerous young lady in Paris who inspired these men, uh, in these men, a loyalty even above patriotism. And they want you to try and trap her, is that it? No, Watson. They want us. Oh, oh us. Yes. Mycroft and I agreed that you would be perfect bait to use in such a trap. Bait? It sounds like a piece of cheese. Only metaphorically, Watson. You must agree that your imposing appearance, your open countenance and hearty manner would attract the attention of any female spy. Yes, I see what you mean. Perhaps you're right. In any case, we shall make you doubly desirable by entrusting you with uh, uh, certain invaluable naval secrets. Masterly, Holmes. Masterly. You will entrust me with utterly worthless documents, spread the story that they're valuable, and uh, wait for the woman to approach me. Precisely. I shall accompany you as a bodyguard, but uh, leave you largely to your own devices. Yes, Watson, I have high hopes of this trip to Paris. With you as the worm and me as the hook, I think we may snare this evil loveliness. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, you have shown me your credentials and explained your mission. We are aware of this firing. We are on constant watch. But I think you would have done better to have stayed in your own country. We of the Paris police are perfectly capable of handling such an affair ourselves, I assure you. Inspector Rigo, the fact remains that two foreign office men died here under sinister circumstances. Yeah, nasty business, you know. British officials. Monsieur, I myself investigated the deaths. They were both self-inflicted. We of the Deuxième Bureau cannot fathom the mind of a suicide. Quite. But I doubt if the deaths were coincidental. Surely there must be some connecting link between them, Inspector? The only facts I can give you, monsieur, are these. Both men frequented an American-owned gambling casino in Montmartre. The name of it, please? Slater's en room for Dane. The only other fact I can give you is that both the dead men were seen there in the company of a certain Mademoiselle Elvira. Ah, that must be the woman that Mycroft spoke of. Can you describe her, Inspector? Oh, what a woman. Although she is very young, princes have jeweled for her favors. Oh, really? <laughs> At the moment, a high official of the Bank de France lies in a prison cell because he appropriated funds that he lavished on her. She's a femme fatale, messieurs. 
but she is as elusive as the wind. Well, Watson, our first move is obvious. Tonight we shall visit Slater's Gambling Casino on the Rue Fontaine and try our luck. <laughs> I say, Holmes, this is all rather exciting, isn't it? Paris at night, and we're on our way to an American gambling casino in the hopes of meeting a beautiful young spy named Elvira. <laughs> Just like a novel. Quite. Incidentally, since the young lady apparently moves in high society, I think it would be wiser if we give you a more impressive name. A uh, fictitious title, perhaps. Well, how about the title I used once before? Sir William Norton. Splendid. Sir William Norton it shall be. And I trust that Sir William remembers the role he is to play. Yes, indeed, Holmes. If I do meet the young lady, I'm to appear very susceptible to her beauty. Uh, not too hard for you, I imagine. And... Uh... And I'm to drop dark hints about the valuable secret that I'm carrying. Precisely, Watson. And uh, if the lady proves as intrigued as I hope she will, you will follow the matter through to its uh, logical conclusion. Well, logical conclusion, Holmes. Yes, I don't quite know how to take that. Ah, here's the casino. Courage, Watson. And good luck. Good evening, I'm Sam Slater You gentlemen haven't been here before No, Mr. Slater My name is Sherlock Holmes And uh, this is Sir William Norton How, How do you do, do sir? Holmes? Sherlock Holmes, the detective? Not here drumming up business, I hope. Oh, no Just showing Sir William some of the sights of Paris Fine Then relax and enjoy yourself, gentlemen Forget your profession, Mr. Holmes In Paris at night, there's no crime <laughs> Or if there is, the police are conveniently blind to it Glad to have you Oh, nice place, Holmes. I think perhaps I'll take a little flat at the tables. Uh, pardon, monsieur. You wish to speak to me, sir? Uh, yes. I could not help but overhear Slater mention your name. It is a great honor to meet Sherlock Holmes. Uh, permit me to introduce myself. I am Andre Flandon. How do you do? And this is Sir William Norton. I flatter myself do? that uh, perhaps you have heard of me. My poetry has been published in England. Oh, poetry, oh, Lord. No, Monsieur Flandon, I'm afraid it's escaped me. You have not heard my verses? Etat, etat salon, ou salon j'ai mon cœur. <laughs> Charming, did you not think? Quite. Though the metaphor seems a little involved, if you don't mind my saying so. What do you think, Sir William? Well, as far as I'm concerned, there's only one language. That's English. <laughs> bon. Then I shall recite a poem of mine in English translation. Oh, must you? I say, Holmes, look at that stunning creature sitting by herself at the Chemin de Fur table. <laughs> She's smiling at me. Oh, you are fortunate, Sir William. That is Mademoiselle Elvira. Elvira? Oh, never heard of her. And now, gentlemen, in translation, my poem begins... A grave as the grave, August as August heat. Oh, so I think I'll try my luck at the tables over there. I'll see you later, Holmes. Much later, I hope, Sir William. Sir William Norton, is it not? Yes, it is. Oh, I can't think how you recognize me, Miss, uh, Madam... Uh... You may call me Elvira. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, Elvira? <laughs> uh, how do you know me? Sam Slater told me who you were. He knows that I have a certain penchant for distinguished Englishmen. That's extremely flattering. Perhaps you'd care to join me in a glass of champagne. Oh, yes, I would like that. Let's sit at this table. Yes, you are. Garçon, garçon. Oui, monsieur. Uh, de champagne. Uh, uh, bon champagne, too. Oui, monsieur. You are here in Paris on business? Uh, yeah? Yes, yes, I am. Important business. You see, I'm... Uh, well, I'm handling an extremely delicate and confidential matter for the British government. Oh, how very impressive. Then I suppose you will be too busy to let me show you some of the sides of Paris. Oh, no, I don't think so. All work, no play, you know. I, I'd be very flattered to escort you, madam. Oh, good. <laughs> then if we are to be friends, yes? I can't go on calling you Sir William. I think I shall call you Willie. Oh, Willie, no, 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 I like you, Willie. Oh, yes, sir, thank you. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Uh, open up, will you? Well, we must uh, drink a toast, will we? I propose one uh, to Willie, the man of mystery. Oh, thank you, my dear, and I shall drink to Elvira and to our better acquaintance. Mm. Good night, Willie. 
I shall see you tomorrow. Yes, rather. Uh, how about how about breakfast? Oh, it's nearly breakfast time now. Oh, really? Really? How about lunch? Yes, yes, of course, madam. But your important mission for the British government. Uh, when will you attend to that? Well, in a day or two, Elvira. Uh, good night, madam. Come here, Willie. Close it. Good night. What? You, you kiss me, you little darling. Thanks awfully. <laughs> You're doing splendidly, Watson. Splendidly. Keep it up. Oh, she's a sweet little thing, Holmes. It's hard to believe that she's a spy. I told her that I was here on a secret and confidential mission. I even told her that I was carrying important naval plans. She didn't seem particularly interested. Of course not. She is much too clever to use the clumsy approach. She'll work slowly. She'll wait until she thinks she's got you completely captivated before she goes after that secret. Oh, then I'm just to carry on the way I did last night. Yes, old chap. Oh, good. Wine her, dine her, send her flowers, buy her jewellery. Make her think you're head over heels in love with her. I suspect that you won't find the job too unpleasant. Oh, I'm sure I shall. <laughs> Three days now, Elvira. You've been showing me Paris, but uh, <laughs> this is the first time I've actually been in your flat. You like it, Willie? Yes, uh, very much. <laughs> I thought it would be much quieter here. At dinner, you said you were going to explain some of your important business to me. You were going to show me what a secret treaty looks like. Yes, I know I said that, but uh, Elvira, a pretty girl like you wouldn't be interested in, in such matters. Oh, but I would. You have the treaty with you? Yes, I have. Then please let me see it. Oh, please, Willie. Oh, I can't go through this masquerade any longer. Masquerade? What do you mean? Well, I've, I've been really fond of you in these last few days, Elvira. I can't let you walk into a trap. Trap? What are you talking about, Willie? I'm not Willie. I'm, I'm not Sir William Norton. My name's Watson. Dr. John H. Watson. My closest friend is the detective Sherlock Holmes. We came to Paris to try and trap you. Me? Oh, my dear girl, you're suspected of being mixed up in a spy ring. What? Well, that's why I pose as a, an important embassy from, from England. Trap! Are you doddering old fool? Oh, no, no, don't say that, don't say that. I'll teach you about trap. Elvira, put down that revolver. No, I'm going to. I'm, oh, I'm you're going. going to drop it, my dear. I can't do it. <laughs> I'm just a stupid, weak female, after all. I've grown fond of you, too. The bumbling old walrus. Oh, there, 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 there. You remind me of my father. He was such a sentimental old fool. Like you. Just as sweet. Oh, there, you're young. I know you don't really want to stay mixed up with a bunch of criminals. No, no, no. Now, now, look, look here. You tell Sherlock Holmes and me what you know about this firing, and we'll see that no harm comes to you, my dear. I have wanted to get out of it for months. It was rather glamorous and exciting at first, and they paid me well. But I hate them now. And yet when I told them I wanted to get away, they threatened me. Oh, we'll take care of you. Just tell us who's at the head of the organization. That I don't know. But I can tell you a lot about some of the members. That's splendid. Then slip on your coat and a funny little bonnet and, and we'll go over and talk to Sherlock Holmes. Oh, and have him see me looking like this. Oh, dear, I didn't read. Oh, no. You go and bring him here. By the time you get back, I'll be more presentable. All right, sir. Uh, I'll go and get him at once. <laughs> Watson, I'm occasionally astonished at the many facets to your character. Oh, thank you very much, Holmes. It's nice of you to say so. Your personal charm has apparently convinced a dangerous woman that crime does not pay. It's remarkable, if it's true. What do you mean, if it's true? Surely it must have occurred, even to a man burning with the zeal of one who has snatched a convert from the fiery flames, that this could be a trap for us to walk into. The delay, while the young lady makes herself presentable, would provide an excellent opportunity for her to summon her associates. Oh, upon my soul, Holmes, you're utterly cynical. I don't believe you have a heart. Possibly not, but I do have a head. Well, here's her place now. Stop, cabby, stop. Arete. Oh. 
I'll bet you a hundred pounds to a shilling that she's still waiting for us and alone. Long odds, Watson. Very long odds. Look, look, look. The concierge is sweeping up the steps. He'll be able to tell us if anyone's been here since I left. True. Uh, bonsoir. Bonsoir, monsieur. Vous parlez anglais? Yes, monsieur. Splendid fellow. Follows on there. Uh, look here, we were, we were calling on Mademoiselle Elvira. Has anyone been to see her in the last half an hour? Oui, monsieur. A man. She left with him only five minutes ago. Though I do not think she wished to go. You mean that she was taken away by force? Not exactly, monsieur. But I could swear on the sacre coeur that the man who accompanied her was holding a pistol to her back. You don't mean it. I uh, think she has been, uh, how you say, kidnapped. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Every man who takes pride in his appearance should know that handsome, healthy-looking hair needs a hygienic scalp. That's why when you buy a hair tonic, be sure to get your money's worth. Don't settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains an amazing combination of hair grooming ingredients, which is found in no other hair tonic. Cremel keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day and always gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never sticky or greasy. But men, Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Cremel leaves your scalp feeling alive and tingling. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff. It's simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry it breaks and falls when you comb it, Cremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men, buy a bottle of Cremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Let Cremel help keep your scalp hygienic. Your hair always looking handsome, always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, once again you left me on the edge of my chair. So when you went back to the girl's flat, she'd been kidnapped, hmm? What did you do next? Well, fortunately the concierge was able to give us a good description of the cab driver. And, with the aid of Inspector Rigo, we were able to find the man and question him. He'd driven the couple, he told us, to a vile apache den in the alleys of Montmartre. Uh, a club known as the Scarlet Worm. Holmes and I, accompanied by the French inspector, lost no time in taking a cab to the place. Monsieur, I should not permit you to visit Le Ver Écarlate, the scarlet worm, as you would say, without my protection. It is a cesspool of the underworld. Men have been known to enter there and make their exit by back door, head first into the sewer. Oh, Lord, they've taken that poor little girl there. Uh... Inspector Rigo, as I said, Mademoiselle Elvira told my friend that she does not know who is at the head of this organization. Have you any suspicions? Yes, but little else, my friend. One thing we are sure of, this man of mystery, the brain behind these criminals, is not French. Probably he is English. An Englishman, or so sure not. Ah. Le Ver et Carlat is waiting for us. Be on the alert, my friends, and keep close to me. I told you we didn't want to do it. Oh, no, there's Sam Slater, the man who, who owns the casino we went to the other night. Yes, and he seems to be involved in a violent argument. Yeah, a rattle like this? You don't know what you're doing, sir, but... Look up! You know what you in here? Stay in your own golden fish time. Who's the man that Slater's arguing with, Inspector? That is Chabert, the owner of this establishment. Oh, Slater's leaving. I wonder what he was doing in a place like this. Uh, come, we'll speak to Chabert and find out. Et bonsoir, Chabert. Uh, bonsoir. Ah, I am honored with a visit from the inspector, the detector. Que voulez-vous? Since when does a visitor from the deuxième bureau have to explain his business, Chabert? Tell me, why was Slater here? And why did you argue? Ah, sure. He comes here to try and hire some of my apache. He has trouble collecting his gambling debts. I spit on him and his high class victims. Let the kind stick to themselves. I'm not bothered if... Let's sit at the table, shall we? You might as well be as unobtrusive as possible. I shall rejoin you in a moment, monsieur. I wish to make some investigation. Watson, you seem to be a positive magnet towards the fair sex. Look at this uh, 
young lady heading for you. Oh, red hair, very, and a painted face. Not my type, I'm afraid. Bonsoir, monsieur. Voulez-vous m'offrir un impératif? Uh, run along, young lady, and don't sit there. Oh, no, no, Watson. Where's your chivalry? Please sit down, won't you? Merci, monsieur. Pretend you don't recognize yes, I me. I don't. Never saw you before in my life. Whereas I've been keeping silence, Mademoiselle Elvira. Elvira! The wig is excellent and the use of makeup superb, Mademoiselle. But I recognized you at once by the confirmation of your earlobes. Elvira, why are you disguised? Why did they bring you here? Shh. I cannot speak now. You must get me away at once. Be careful. I'm being watched. We can't leave by the front way. But I know a back staircase that leads from the cellar. But there may be trouble. You take her, Watson. I'll guard the retreat. When the music starts again, dance with her. When you get to the back of the hall, slip out. I'll join you at the hotel. Oh, look, 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 Holmes. Look who's coming to our table. It's that ghastly poet fellow we met at the casino. Andre Flandon. Pay no attention. I'll take care of him. Now, once again, I meet my friend Sherlock Holmes. I have a new poem that I've composed in your especial honor. Dance, Watson, and good luck. All right, you are, Holmes. Come along, my dear. Come along. Your friend, please. Au revoir. Now, I shall tell you my poem. It begins... Well, Vera, my dear, I can't tell you how relieved I am to find you all right. Shh. Don't look so serious. Pretend that I'm some girl that you don't know. Laugh. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's better. Now, dance me toward that door in the corner. There we are. <laughs> now, let's slip through it. I can't see a thing. Follow me. There are stone stairs here. Careful. Where do these lead? To an alley. Oh, careful. The stairs turn here. Look up, that's it. A light coming up the steps towards us. Shut up! You did not think you could live so easily, did you, Elvira? Uh, I've been waiting for you. Look out, he's got an eye! But he can't see without his lantern. Where's that path? Uh, run, Elvira, I'll follow you. Run, run, run! You will follow me! Oh, won't I? How'd you like that, you filthy swine? Watson, are you all right? Yes, Holmes, I'm quite all right. Then run, old chap. I'll take care of this end. See that the girl is safe. <laughs> Now that we're all safely back at the hotel, I can tell you, Holmes, that I hated leaving you in that filthy den. Inspector Rigo had a revolver. It's more efficient than a knife, eh, Inspector? It was a near thing, Monsieur Holmes. You fought bravely, and so did your recumbent friend on the sofa there. Andre Flandon, the poet. I wondered why you brought him back here. For a poet, he uses his fists with surprising skill. He must be hurt. He seems to be unconscious. I think he's suffering from the effects of a trifle too much absence. I hadn't the heart to leave him. Ah, there you are, Mademoiselle Elvira. You're feeling no ill effects, I hope? No, Mr. Holmes. Splendid. Then, now that we're all assembled, supposing you tell us your story. Who kidnapped you tonight? It was one of Chavez's men. They made me disguise myself and swear never to see either of you again, on pain of death. Instead of which, we came to see you. We knew that Travers was connected with the spies. Now he is safely under lock and key. But we still don't know who is at the head of this organization. Can you give us any clues, Mademoiselle? I... I think that the man you want was waiting in the cab that took me to the Scarlet Worm. But he was masked and he never spoke. Can't you recall anything that might give us a clue? Oh, one incident, if it means anything. Chavez's man said to him, We go to the Scarlet Worm, eh? That is good. You also, you make worms, no? And then he laughed. He said this in French, of course? Yes, yes, he did. Then the case is solved. I'm an idiot. I should have spotted it sooner. The man you want, Inspector, is lying asleep on the... Look out! He's not asleep. Watson, he's got a revolver. Oh, no, you don't. Oh! He's gone to sleep again. Really, Watson, you're in splendid form tonight. But, Monsieur Holmes, why do you say that man is the culprit? You yourself gave me the clue, Inspector, when you told me that the criminal was an Englishman posing as a Frenchman. But you only met the fellow on two occasions, and then not for more than a few minutes. It was long enough to realize that Flandre was really an Englishman. The first time we met him, he quoted a poem that he said was translated from the French. The translation was, Grave as the grave, August as August heat. The poem could not have been translated from the French because both of those puns are possible only in the English language. But how did my repeating the conversation in the cab give you a clue, Mr. Holmes? Because it was another pun. In French, the word for worms and for verses is the same. There, 
spelt V-R-S. I see it now. When the man in the cab said, you make worms, he also meant, you make verses. Precisely, Watson. And thereby pointed directly at the poet there. With Andre Flandin, or whatever his real name is, in prison, I'm sure Mycroft will have no more trouble with his spy ring. Ladies, of course you use a shampoo to wash your hair, but just a word of caution. There are many popular shampoos today which leave the hair lustrous but have a tendency to dry the hair. And that's why I advise you to always use Cremel shampoo. How right you are, Joe. Lovely Powers models were among the very first to discover the amazing, beautifying qualities of Cremel shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves hair with more brilliant, glossy, natural highlights. Yet under no circumstances does Cremel shampoo ever dry your hair. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Yes, after a Cremel shampoo, your hair actually radiates natural, brilliant luster. But Cremel shampoo is one shampoo you can buy today that has a beneficial built-in oil base, which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. So ladies, be smart. Always wash your hair with Cremel shampoo. It leaves hair a vision of shining beauty, yet in no way hurts the texture. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me think. Next week, what shall I tell you? Next week, I think I'll tell you the story of how Sherlock Holmes, by solving an ancient musical cipher, managed to save the estates and restore the fortunes of the Earl of Moultrie. I call it The Adventure of Moultrie Abbey. Tonight's newest Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Naval Treaty. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of Maltry Abbey. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once again, it's time to keep that pleasantest of all doctor's appointments, our weekly visit with our excellent host and incomparable storyteller, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Ah, uh, there you are, Mr. Bell, just in time to join me in a glass of port. The decanter's there on the sideboard. Help yourself and then settle down. Fine, Dr. Watson. I suppose you're already with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of Maltry Abbey, isn't it? Yes, my boy, and in many ways, I'm inclined to think it was one of the most singular adventures that Sherlock Holmes and I ever had. But before I begin the weird adventure of Maltry Abbey, haven't you, haven't you got a word for our listeners? Yes, Dr. Watson, I have. Men, neat-looking, well-groomed hair does so much to give a man that air of success, to say nothing of adding to his good looks. And I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing about this modern trend in hair grooming, which has become such a nationwide favorite. It's called Kremel Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Yes, that's exactly why Kremel gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look and keeps it in place longer, keeps every hair in perfect order from morning till night. Yet Kremel never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. Kremel keeps hair looking mighty handsome with a rich, healthy-looking luster. 
yet it always feels and looks so clean on your hair and scalp. Men, if you aren't already using a hair tonic, try Cremel. If you're using some other hairdressing, change to Cremel. Then see if your hair doesn't look better than it ever did before. Better groomed, better looking when you use Cremel. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the venerable bead and the adventure of Maltry Abbey? Well, Mr. Bell, that story began in Baker Street on the December afternoon many, many years ago. It was shortly after tea, I remember, when Sherlock Holmes, who'd been pacing up and down our room, suddenly stopped at the window and looked intently out at the street below him. After a few moments, my curiosity overcame me and I joined my old friend. Looking over his shoulder, I saw that on the pavement opposite there stood a young woman dressed in the height of Edwardian fashion. She wore a fur boar and a broad-brimmed hat, from under which she peeped up in a nervous, hesitating fashion at our windows, while her body oscillated backward and forward. Suddenly, with a plunge like the swimmer who leaves the bank, she hurried across the road and we heard the clang of our front door bell. Oh, took her a long enough time to, to make up her mind in the home. Yes, Watson. I've seen those symptoms before in women. Oscillation on the pavement generally means an affaire du coeur. She would like advice, but is not sure whether the matter is not too delicate for communication. Oh, she looked a pretty little thing. Perhaps some scoundrels jilted her. Oh, no, Watson. In such a case, the usual symptom is a broken bell wire. Here, I think we may deduce the young lady is not so much uh, angry as uh, grieved or perplexed. Why not meet her at the head of the stairs, old chap? Mm -hmm. I know Mrs. Hudson's rheumatism is bothering mm -hmm. her. Yes, of course I will. This way, young lady. It's all right, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Watson. Won't you come along in? Thank you, Dr. Watson. Uh, uh, this is my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? I'm Sybil Carter, and I need your help, Mr. Holmes. Then please be seated, Miss Carter. I presume it is Miss, since I see no ring on your wedding finger. Yes, it's Miss. Though that awful man, Jonathan Davis, would like to make it Mrs. Oh, I can quite understand any man wanting to... Oh, quiet, you? Watson. Oh, sorry. Oh, please tell me your problem, Miss Carter. Well, I can tell you in two words, gentlemen. Jonathan Davis wanted to marry me, and that was bad enough. But even to save the Maltry fortunes, I couldn't marry him. Now he wants Harold to leave the country and disappear. And when we think of the Abbey and the tenants, what can we do? I know that my brother's dead set against outside interference, but tonight is when we play the music. And if only you could be there. Well, that's, uh, that's considerably more than two words, Miss Carter. I'm afraid I can't make head or tail of any of them. Nor can I. Supposing you begin again and talk more slowly. Oh, <laughs> very well, Mr. Holmes. Uh, perhaps it'll be better if I ask questions. You mentioned your brother's title. May I ask what that title is? My brother's Harold Carter, the 14th Earl of Maltree, and the poorest. Confidentially, we're in a dreadful way financially. Harold invested in Canadian copper last year. The market dropped recently and we were nearly wiped out. That's when this awful Jonathan Devers came on the scene. And who is uh, Jonathan Devers? Oh, he's a cousin of ours from South Africa. He's a dreadful boar, but extremely wealthy. And he, he wants to marry you, sir? Yes, but even for the sake of the Abbey and the Maltry fortunes, I couldn't do that. Now he's offered Harold £50,000 in cash if you'll go abroad and pretend to disappear. You see, Jonathan Devers is next of male kin in line for the inheritance. So Mr. Devers is trying to bribe your brother to disappear so that uh, he may inherit the title and estates? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Hmm. In this particular matter, I fail to see how I can help you. Oh, but you can, Mr. Holmes. You see, the first Earl of Maltry, he was created by Henry VIII, you know, left a family motto. It's inscribed in our private chapel at the Abbey. It says, if the Maltrees be in need, seek the venerable Bede. A bead or some fellow who works in the parish, isn't he? Bead, Watson, not Beadle. Oh, oh Bede. Bede. Yes, spelt B-E-D-E. -E. Oh, Bede. Oh. The venerable Bede, if I'm not mistaken, was an 8th century monk who is revered not only as a saint, but as the first great English historian. Yes, Mr. Holmes. We have a statue of him in the chapel. And then we have a family custom that... <laughs> I know this may sound silly to you. Oh, don't worry, Miss Carter. I'm aware that some of these old, crusted superstitions often conceal surprising truths. Pray continue. Well, it's been passed down in the family that if ever the Maltrees were in trouble, they should play a very peculiar piece of music which he composed. A piece of music? What, a, what an odd idea. Extremely interesting. 
And uh, you're planning to play the music tonight, you say? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Heaven alone knows the Maltries couldn't be in worse trouble than they are now. And I want you to be there. Only Harold doesn't. So I thought, if you'd bring your violin, I could pretend that you would just come to hear the music. An excellent idea, Miss Carter. As I remember, Maltree Abbey is in Gloucestershire. Yes, Mr. Holmes, at Chipping Martin. And express leaves Paddington at 5.30. Perhaps we could travel together? Certainly. Mm, I'm sure it seems like a wild goose chase, Holmes. An eighth-century monk and strange music. Sounds like a lot of mumbo-jumbo to me. Where's your chivalry, Watson? In any case, shall you recall the singular affair of the Musgrave ritual? There's no telling what these old family customs may portend. So be a good fellow and pack your bag. There's no time to be lost. <laughs> I'll just have time to show you the chapel before dinner, gentlemen. Thank you, Lord Carter. And uh, after dinner, I shall be happy to gratify your musical curiosity, Mr. Holmes. But you mustn't regard my sister's visit today too seriously. Sybil's an overly emotional girl. And quite frankly, I wish that she hadn't approached you. I feel that Maltry Abbey is my duty. I'll find some way to save it. And my tenants. I uh, trust that the music will live up to its magical reputation. Well, this is the chapel. Mm, what a beautiful building. Must be very old. Or 16th century. The Abbey House was built nearly a hundred years later. 16th century. Uh, hold your lantern a little higher, Dr. Watson. Uh, that's it. Now, I, I want to show you a prize possession. There you are. Magnificent. Quite magnificent. This, I presume, is the statue of the Venerable Bede that uh, your sister spoke of. Yes, it's an excellent specimen of 16th century wood carving. Note particularly the delicate work on the beads of the rosary. Odd. Very odd indeed. What's odd, Holmes? The fact that the... How many times do I have to tell you to keep away from me, you filthy scum? Don't you take your whip to me, sir. I, I'm, I'm not doing nothing. Oh, what the devil's going on out there? Oh, come on. Come on. Don't you dare Take that. Oh, don't you lay your whip on me. Oh. Jonathan, what's the matter? Harold, I demand that you discharge this groom of yours. You can't whip me, Mr. Devers. I'll have your blood for this, I will. Well, what's he done, Jonathan? He's been following me. Twice today I bumped into him in the grounds. Not half an hour ago I was taking a walk by the bottom of the tarn, and I found him skulking behind me. Now I bump into him sneaking after me here. I say you must discharge him, Harold. But he was only hired today. Ah, I suppose you're right. Wilson, you may collect a week's wages and leave in the morning. I wasn't doing no harm. Just trying to deliver a telegram. That's why I came here. Is one of you gents, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am he. Then this telegram come for you. I was only trying to find you when this son of a South African slave well, driver comes in. Oh, I'll have your blood. Just see if I don't. That's enough, Wilson. Now, clear off. I'm sorry, Jonathan. Oh, by the way, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Mr. Jonathan Devers. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Devers? Ah, yes. Sybil told me that you were having distinguished company at your musical soiree tonight. Ah, oh, you gentlemen. Excuse me. We'll see you at dinner, no doubt. You see, bully. That poor devil of a groom was half his size. Mr. Devers mentioned that he was walking by the bottomless tarn half an hour ago. What, may I ask, is the bottomless tarn? Oh, it's a lake on the estate, just behind the gamekeeper's cottage. Well, there's a legend that it's fathomless. All I know is that some years ago, a prize heifer of mine was seen to fall in and drown. We dragged the lake, but no grappling hooks we could obtain touched the bottom. Interesting. Holmes, uh, the telegram that fellow brought you. Ah, oh, yes, the telegram. Uh, give me the lantern, Watson. Uh, uh, thanks. An extremely illuminating message. Read it for yourself, Lord Carter. It says nothing but my cousin's name, Jonathan Devers. And yet the message is quite eloquent. It is in answer to a query I made before leaving London. Who forced that market drop in Canadian copper which wiped out the Maltree fortunes? You mean that Jonathan deliberately smashed me, Holmes? It would seem obvious. Yes, it's perfectly clear that Devers covets the title and stop at nothing to get it. <sighs> Holmes, what am I going to do? What the devil am I going to do? We must wait until after dinner and hope that the musical composition may give us a solution to your unhappy problem. Well, 
Now that Sybil's played that rather dull piece of discordancy, I hope you're all satisfied. Naturally, the Maltry fortunes will be restored. Very funny, Jonathan. What do you make of it, Mr. Holmes? It's uh, curious. Very curious. Will you repeat that principal theme again, please, Miss Carter? Yes, of course. Thank you, Miss Carter. I think I begin to get a glimmering of the mysterious message. Yeah, blessed if I do. Sounds like a jumble of meaningless notes to no, me. Never mind, Dr. Watson. Your brilliant friend thinks that he saved the Maltry fortunes. In that case, Harold, I suppose you won't need to see Mr. Alexander in London tomorrow. Why, how did you know that? That your solicitor planned to start bankruptcy proceedings at the latest tomorrow? <laughs> I, too, have my investigators, Harold. They seem a bit more efficient than your great Sherlock Holmes. Good night, Sybil. Good night, gentlemen. <coughs> oh, there you are again. What are you doing, listening at the door, you filthy swine? I was just going to the kitchen. Oh! Uh, get to the tables where you belong. I see that groom again, Harold. I'll break his neck. See that he goes tonight. How dare he speak to you like that, Harold? He's not master here. Not yet, Sue. But I can't hold on to the place much longer, and he knows it. He's a thoroughly unpleasant scoundrel, if you ask me. Mr. Holmes, you said the music gave you some clue to the message? It did, Miss Carter. But uh, it requires thought and a certain amount of uh, musical experimentation. I doubt if this music room would welcome the consumption of an ounce or two of shag tobacco... I think, therefore, that Watson and I will retire to our own room. With the aid of a pipe and my violin, I shall give the matter undivided attention. And tomorrow... Tomorrow, we... Maltry Abbey will go into receivership. Not while Sherlock Holmes is on the case. Oh, thank you, Watson. A man of my uh, peculiar modesty needs your constant reassurance. <laughs> Sleep out. Then why not go to sleep, my dear chap? Well, how can I when you keep scraping away that wretched fiddle? Da 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 Lot of rubbish. Sit up half the night. We'll get you. Oh, yeah. I'm going to sleep. All trees are in need to seek the venerable bee. This music will solve the all trees' problems. You can't whip me, Mr. Devers. I'll have your blood for this, I will. Too bad that your solicitor is starting bankruptcy proceedings tomorrow. You must help us. You must. When the all trees are in need. Seek the venerable bee. I've got it. Watson, wake up, wake up. Uh, 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 what, uh, uh, what's up, Holmes? I've got the answer, Watson. I've solved the musical message. Before the night is through, I think we shall find the secret of Maltry Abbey. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and discover just what that secret is. Leading hair specialists in this country constantly advise us to take better care of the hair we've got. And men, don't forget that if you want your hair handsome and healthy looking, one of the first requirements is a hygienic scalp. And why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic? Cremel is a highly specialized hair tonic which gives you your money's worth. It contains a unique combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair preparation. It keeps hair attractively groomed at all times, looking so neat and orderly. But Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A Kreml massage stimulates circulation right in the surface of your scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. At the same time, Kreml removes dandruff flakes. And it's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Cremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer and more pliable. So men, take better care of the hair you've got. 
Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kreml daily for better groomed hair, for a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, I, I'm just as confused as I'm sure you must have been when Sherlock Holmes awakened you. What was the musical message? Supposing I tell you the story in its actual sequence, Mr. Bell? I quickly dressed, and in the moonlight, Holmes and I stealthily crept down the corridor to Lord Carter's room. A few moments later, the three of us, carrying lanterns, started down the staircase leading to the main hall. Holmes, as we went into Lord Carter's room, I'm sure that i certain that I saw another door down the corridor, half open, and, and then close. Which door was it? The last one on the right. Well, that's Jonathan Zeller's room. Well, I suppose he knows what we're up to, which I must confess is more than I do. Well, if I'm right, not even Devers can stop us now. You're being confined in mysterious homes. Will you tell me why we're heading for the chapel at two in the morning? In a few moments, I shall make the reason extremely clear to you, I hope. Well, yeah. here's the door. Look, 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 look. Through the stained glass windows over there. I swear there's someone with a lantern in the grounds outside. Our immediate problem is here, inside. Focus your lantern on the statue of the Venerable Bede, Watson. That's where the answer to the mortuary legend lies, I think. For heaven's sake, Holmes, I wish you'd be more explicit. Very well. Let me see if I can whistle those notes written in the musical theme. The notes are B E D E B E A D. These notes were followed by a rhythmically repeated series of the note D four times. Surely now the pattern becomes clear. Well, the notes B E D E obviously stand for Bede, the venerable Bede, and we're standing in front of a statue here now. But the second four notes are B E A D. You yourself pointed out the rosary on the venerable Bede statue, Lord Carter. The notes B E A D must refer to the beads of the rosary. That's why I became suspicious on first seeing the statue. The rosary did not come into use till almost five centuries after the Venerable Bede. Yet, his statue had one. Then, what does the repetition of the note D four times mean after the melody? I think it gives us the vital clue. D is the fourth letter in the alphabet, and it's repeated four times. Let's see what happens when we press the fourth bead on the Venerable Bede's rosary. So, I... George, I think you're on the right track, Holmes. You are. Look at that section of wall behind the front. It slid back. Come on. Let's see what it takes us to. There's a narrow stone staircase leading below. Well, I'll go first. Holmes, perhaps you have saved the Maltreat fortunes after all. I hope so, Lord Carter. I hope so. Watch your head, Watson. Oh, must have built these steps for pigments. Holmes, do you suppose we'll find any hidden treasure down here? I shall suppose nothing, Watson. In a few moments, there will be no need for conjecture. Holmes, I'm afraid we've drawn a blank. What's wrong, Lord Carter? Now look for yourself. Hmm. A deserted crypt? Nothing but a few cobwebby old relics. Yes. A crucifix, a Bible, a gutted candlestick on the table here. Oh, they may have some small intrinsic value, but nothing else. Oh, I was a fool to have any hopes. And I was expecting to find buried treasure. Wait a moment. Something, possibly the treasurer, has recently been removed from here. Well, what makes you say that, Holmes? The room is thick with dust, and yet there's a large rectangular space free from dust on the table, as though a heavy folio volume had recently been lying there. By George, you're right, Holmes. And look here on the floor. Fresh footprints. Yes, someone has recently anticipated our discovery. Well, it's not very hard to guess who that someone was. Jonathan Devers. Aha. Observe these curious marks on the floor by the table. Four round dots, rectangularly spaced. I should say that a Gladstone bag has been placed here. A bag that was undoubtedly used to remove the treasure. But why, Holmes? Why carry off a heavy book in a bag? Supposing that book were of priceless value, Watson. Suppose it were the heirloom of the Mortar family, and its discovery by the rightful owner might save the estate. Yes. And I'm sure that Devers is quite capable of stealing it. The question is, though, what would he do with it? Precisely. And to answer that question... I shall try and imagine myself in the shoes of Mr. Devers. I am a millionaire, and therefore I don't need the treasure. Too risky to sell it anyway. All I want to do is to keep it from the more trees, so I'll destroy it. But how? I have the time or the opportunity to burn it. Difficult with a heavy book in any case. 
so I'm looking for some place to dispose of it where it may never be recovered. A fathomless lick on this estate. That'd be the place, the bottomless tar. Of course. Remember the Devers told us earlier that he'd been walking by it this evening? Then let's go there as fast as we can. I can only pray that we're not too late. <laughs> Look, 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 there in the moonlight It's Jonathan Devers He's running towards the edge of the lake Yes, and he's carrying a Gladstone bag Which means that we can run faster than he can You have your revolver, Watson? Yes, yes, I have Don't hesitate to use it This devil's work must be stopped Come on, faster, faster Oh, we'll, we'll never catch him He's at the edge of the tower Drop that bag, Mr. Devers You're too late, my friend Drop it or I'll shoot I'll drop it in the bottomless town There <laughs> Uh, goodbye to the traitor of the Maltese. You devil. You've ruined me. I'll have the law on you for this. You're a common thief. I don't know how you'll prove it, Harold. That was my own Gladstone bag and I dropped it in the tarn. You don't even know what was inside it. But here comes the man who can tell us. Lord, it's Wilson, the groom fellow you discharged, Lord Carter. Well, what are you doing here, Wilson? What's that book you're carrying? I've just done what Mr. Sherlock Holmes told me to, sir. I was following Mr. Devers. When he put down the bag and went off to get his coat before coming out here... I thought there might be something valuable in it. I took out this book and I filled the bag with a few rocks. Wilson, I'll No, you skin. won't, Devers. Or you'll end up in the town where you belong. Let me see the book, Wilson. Here you are, Governor. Thank you. Hold the lantern a little higher, Watson. That's it. Aha. These faded pages are written in monkish Latin of the 8th century, and the hand is of the same period. Unless all my researches on the datings of documents are valueless, these may be... They must be... The original manuscripts of the Venerable Bede himself. Good Lord, then they're absolutely priceless. And that means that the Maltrees are saved. And you, Mr. Devers, will have the privilege of inspecting the interior of an English prison. Rubbish. What charge could you make? Common theft. Burglary. The proof would depend on the word of that filthy groom there. And who's going to believe the oath of a servant with a grudge over the word of a South African millionaire? I think it's high time that this uh, filthy groom disclosed his true identity. All right, Mr. Holmes. The gentleman, I'm Inspector Athelney Jones of Scotland Yard. And a great credit to the force you've been, my dear Jones. Yes, indeed, you certainly have. Your impersonation of a country groom was masterly, quite masterly. And now, uh, let's return to the house, shall we? It's nearly three in the morning, and I think we've had enough excitement for one night. <laughs> Very satisfactory case, Watson, don't you think? As we head back to London, I must confess to a certain glow of satisfaction. The fortunes of the Maltrees are restored, the villain foiled and in custody. And, uh, And Scotland Yard get the credit. You know that, of course, Holmes. Well, they deserve it. Athelney Jones is a very enterprising fellow. Yes, Watson, an immensely interesting case. You see, Maltry Abbey was, uh, from its name, one of the properties expropriated from the monks by Henry VIII, who created the earldom. Undoubtedly, the abbot had hidden the monastery's most valuable possession, the bead manuscript. Well, I suppose the first elders covered the hiding place and left the book there as a future security for the Maltry family. Exactly. Leaving the cryptic verse as a clue. If the Maltrees be in need, seek the venerable bead. Yes, I, I see it all now. You know, Holmes, to me the whole case was worth it when I saw that girl's face light up as we told her the good news. I fear that I'm less impressionable, old chap. For me, my retrospective pleasure in this case lies in the fact that an irreplaceable treasure has been saved and uh, that a monk who died 12 centuries ago will have been responsible for restoring the fortunes of a fine old family. Yes, Watson, I think that in many ways you might refer to this as uh, our most successful case. Dr. Watson will be back in just a moment to tell you about next week's story. Ladies, you've heard it said that a woman's hair is her crowning glory, and how true this is. That's why you ladies should take the very best care of your hair, especially in shampooing. I'm glad you brought that point up, Mr. Bell, because many popular shampoos have a tendency to dry the hair. Well, here's one shampoo that will never dry the hair. Never under any circumstances. And it's Cremel shampoo. Yes, Cremel shampoo is simply wonderful. 
It actually glamour bays each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Cremel shampoo whips up a luxurious active foam, even in the hardest water. You can use it as often as you wish over a long period of time, and it'll never dry your hair. In fact, Cremel shampoo has a built-in oil base, which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Remember, ladies, that divinely beautiful Powers models wash their hair with Cremel shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves their hair more shining bright yet never dries the hair. Why not try it? K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I shall tell you how Holmes managed to trap a fiendish murderer who had terrorized a pretty little English country village. I call it The Adventure of the Tolling Bell. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Case of Identity. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo. I'm inviting you to be with us next week at the same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure... Of the tolling bell. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time to keep our weekly date with the Dean of Storytellers, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting it. I am indeed, Mr. Bell. Good evening. You're punctual to the minute, as usual. This is one doctor's appointment I'll never be late for. Oh, that's very nice of you to say so, my boy. Uh, draw up your usual chair and settle down. Yeah. Ah, that's it. <laughs> Fire in the grape, the lights turned low, and a wind howling outside. It's a perfect setting for a Sherlock Holmes adventure. Which one is it going to be? Well, tonight I thought I'd tell you a most weird and macabre story. Concerns werewolves on the wild moors of Scotland and the strange happenings that took place in McKinnon Castle. Dear, dear, werewolves and haunted castles. My hair's beginning to stand on end already. Please get on with the story, Dr. In Watson. due time, Mr. Bell, but first, haven't you a little uh, business with our listeners? Business that also has to do with the hair? Business? <laughs> oh, no, Dr. Watson, this isn't business. It's a pleasure. But thanks for the reminder. And I know you men will thank me again and again for this hot tip. Try Kreml hair tonic. Just notice how Kreml makes stubborn hair so much easier to comb. How your hair falls in place just where you want it and stays that way all day long. Now be honest, men. Did your hair ever look better? You see, Kreml gives even dull, lifeless-looking hair a rich, attractive luster. It makes hair look so handsome and alive. Yet Kreml never glues hair down. It never leaves it looking or feeling greasy or dirty. Just try Kreml hair tonic once, and you'll readily see why it's such a nationwide favorite. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the werewolf? Well, Mr. Bell, the adventure began innocently enough on a slate gray November afternoon in Baker Street, just before the turn of the century. Holmes and I were seated comfortably on either side of a crackling fire, when shortly before tea time, there was a jangle on our doorbell... And a few minutes later, a young girl, whom Mrs. Hudson announced as Miss Victor, was standing before us. 
a young girl dressed in a wedding gown. She was in a great state of excitement, in fact, almost hysterical. Mr. Holmes, you must help me. There's no one else to whom I can turn. I, there, I don't know what there, to do. There, there, my dear. Compose yourself. <laughs> if you will just tell us the facts, Miss Victor. Well, at three o'clock this afternoon... I was to have been married to David McKinnon. Any relation to the heir to McKinnon's? The son and heir to the estate, Mr. Holmes. Oh, really? I think I met one of the family in a shooting party a few years ago. I remember distinctly... Some other time, Watson, please. Oh. Miss Victor's problem is immediate. Oh, sorry. Oh. You say uh, you were to have been married, Miss Victor. <laughs> what occurred to prevent the ceremony? David just... just didn't appear. Oh, it was dreadful, Mr. Holmes. I waited and waited, and finally I knew he wasn't coming... You've had no word from him since? No, none. I went to his hotel as soon as I left the church. And what did you discover? That that he'd received a visit from an elderly Scotsman this morning. And the porter said that immediately afterward they left together in a cab for St. Pancras Station. St. Pancras? Undoubtedly their destination was Scotland, Holmes. Huh? Quite. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you must find David for me. I know he's been kidnapped. Miss Victor, a man who is being kidnapped does not walk out of a hotel in broad daylight and order a cab. But something's happened to him. He wouldn't do a thing like this of his own volition. Are you quite sure that you didn't have some lover's quarrel, some little tiff in the last few days that might have made your fiancé uh, change his mind? Of course I'm sure, Dr. Watson. We've never had any misunderstanding. Only something dreadful could have made him leave. I shall do everything in my power to find out what it was, Miss Victor. Oh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, Watson, get me the railway guide. Oh, uh, there you are. It's on the table beside you. I knew you'd help me. I only hope you'll be successful. Ah. Now, Watson, if you'll pack a couple of bags and meet me at the station at 9.15 in time for the Scottish Express, I have a few simple inquiries to make. <laughs> You so long, Holmes. We almost missed the train. You're shockingly out of condition, Watson. Oh, well. A little sprint like that shouldn't leave you so winded. Well, never mind about my condition. Where have you been for the last four hours? Delving into the back issue files of the Times. Very instructive. You should try it sometime. Rubbish. There's nothing duller than yesterday's news. I doubt if you'd call the legend of the McKinnon family dull, Watson. On the contrary. Oh, so that's what you've been looking up. Yes. It's a history that goes back several hundred years of brawling and bloodshed. The founder of the clan was a 14th century Scottish warrior by the name of Wolfhound McKinnon. He is reputed to have been so incredibly vicious in battle that his enemies accused him of being a werewolf. A vampire? Oh, come now, home. <laughs> Merely repeating a 500-year-old legend. The point is that the present head of the clan, the father of the disappearing fiancé today, is known as Black Angus. He's a dominant, thoroughly hated man whose local reputation is as frightening in our day and age as his predecessors was five centuries oh, that's ago. That's all very interesting, Holmes, but I don't see why you should get so excited over a 500-year-old legend. Well, you see, Watson, I found another rather curious fact in the papers. Oh, huh? what was that? Several times during the last few months, sheepdogs have been found dead in the vicinity of McKinnon Castle with their throats torn out. Good heavens! <laughs> Thomas, you've lived in this village a good many years, I expect. All my life, sir. And this inn was my feathers before me. We're interested in some of the local beauty spots, particularly McKinnon Castle. McKinnon Castle is no beauty spot, sir. Oh, really? Devil's Castle, we call it. There isn't a one of us in the village that wouldn't have been glad to see the ground open up and swallow the place. I and every McKinnon who lives there. Gracious me. Why are the McKinnons so hated, Thomas? There are no men... They're monsters. And McKinnon thinks that because he owns the land, he owns the air among breathes, too. And Black Angus is the biggest, blackest devil of them all. Black Angus? You mean the present laird? Aye. And if he keeps up with his devil's work, he'll be the dead laird before long. Give me how bloodthirsty. What's been going on, Thomas? It's the sheepdog, sir. Hereabouts, a man sheepdog is his living. And yet six more have been killed in the past two weeks. And all of the poor wee beasties lying there on the moors with their throats torn out. How can you blame McKinnon for that? Surely some animal... Aye, sir. Aye. 
An animal that stands on two feet. What are you suggesting, Thomas? I'm suggesting nothing, sir. Except those dead dogs all had human teeth marks on their throats. Are you, are you insinuating that uh, Black Angus is, is a vampire? Oh, now, now, now. Really, my dear fellow. Oh, we've seen him at night, huh? when the moon was high, galloping across the moors on his big black horse. And the next morning, there's always been a dead sheepdog. You've seen him yourself? Well, well, no, sir. But there are those that have. There's no mistaking him with his big coat flapping and his hat pulled down over his eyes. What an extraordinary business. Interesting, very interesting. Do you see that gentleman that just came in, sitting by himself in the corner there, sir? The man in the grey overcoat? Aye. His name's Humphreys. He can tell you more about the McKinnons than I can. He's a cousin of the family. And even though he's related and lives at the castle, he's as nice a gentleman as you'd meet up with. Thank you for the information, Thomas. I think perhaps we'll go and have a chat with him. Come on, Watson. Right, sir. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Glad to be of service, gentlemen. Excuse me, Mr. Humphreys. Aye. May we take the liberty of introducing ourselves? I'm Sherlock Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Uh, how do you do, oh, Mr. Humphreys? Do you do? Oh, won't you uh, sit down? Thank you. Thomas tells me you are a cousin of the McKinnon family. I am. Uh, do you know them? We're particularly interested in one of them, Mr. Humphreys. Yes, in David McKinnon. Ah, David's a very fine boy. You knew he was to have been married in London yesterday? Ah, hey, I knew that. Did you also know that just before his wedding, he suddenly disappeared, Mr. Humphreys? Uh, gentlemen... May I ask the uh, reason for your interest in young David? That's a very fair question, sir. I have been asked by Miss Victor, David's fiancée, to try and find the young man. Oh, I see. Mm. It's a very unfortunate business. Mr. Humphreys, shortly before the wedding yesterday, David McKinnon had a visitor in his hotel. They left together, presumably to catch the express for Scotland. And poor Miss Victor was left stranded at the church. The dear little thing was, was heartbroken. Oh, she would be. Uh, uh, Mr. Holmes, uh, I wish I could help you in some way, but... Uh, you can, Mr. Humphrey. Well, how? By telling us what message you delivered to David at his hotel yesterday. But I... Oh, come now, Mr. Humphreys. The man seen to be leaving the hotel with David was wearing a grey raglan coat such as you are wearing. In addition, I observed as we sat down that you're reading yesterday's edition of the London Times. Even if you subscribed to it, it couldn't have reached you here in Scotland through the post this speedily. Amazing, home. Amazing. Elementary, isn't it, Mr. Humphreys? Well, I don't know about that, but uh, your deduction is correct. Yes. yes, Mr. Holmes, I did return with David from London yesterday. What was the message you were sent to give him, may I ask? The message that decided him not to go through with his marriage? I'm afraid I can't answer that question, Mr. Holmes. Uh, though I may tell you, it's a family secret of the gravest importance. Hmm. Well, in that case, our only recourse is to go to McKinnon Castle and pursue our inquiries there. Yeah, I imagine that would be best, gentlemen. But, uh, frankly, I doubt if you'll gain admittance. Angus is a willful man with a terrible temper and... When he knows you want to see David... We've he... handled terrible men before, haven't we, Watson? Yes, indeed. I remember that afternoon in Baker Street when Dr. Grimsby Royal picked up the poker and was Yes, about Watson. To... You can regale Mr. Humphreys with that some other oh, time. Well. But now I think we'd best be starting for the castle. Uh, uh, Mr. Holmes, if by any chance you do see Angus, I must ask you not to mention that you've talked to me. Uh, if he finds out, there might be trouble. All right, Mr. Humphreys. Come along, Watson. I wish they'd put some springs in this vehicle. It's worse than an Irish jaunting car. <laughs> if Thomas's directions are to be believed, we should see the castle when we get to the crest of this hill. This Black Angus seems to be quite a lovable character. Even Humphreys, his, his cousin, seems to be terrified of him. The man was positively shaking. Yes, I noticed that. Ah, that must be the castle now. I just... Forbidding-looking place, isn't it? Yes. Watson... Rain in your horse. Well, 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 well. What is it, Holmes? Look, 
Lying by the side of the road. Just a dead dog. Yes, a dead sheep dog. Come on. Uh, the dog's throat has been torn out. Yes. Uh, look here, Watson. Look at these marks on the throat. Good heavens, Holmes. They look like... They are the marks of human teeth. <laughs> Hey, gentlemen. Is the laird at home? I'm sorry, sir. But the laird will not see people we return an appointment. Uh, then will you please give him a message? But the two... Tell there... him that Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson have come here from London to see him. Yes, my good man. And, and tell him it's on a very important and confidential business. If you'll wait here in the hall, I'll give him the message, gentlemen. But he'll not see you. He'll no see. Oh, stupid old lad. Anyone think he owned the castle? Watson, have a look at these two portraits. <laughs> a couple of grim-looking characters. Give you the creeps. I think we may reasonably assume they're McKinnon ancestors. Do you notice something odd about them? Well, both the men are smiling. If you call that smiling, looks more like leering to me. <laughs> Whatever it is, it shows their teeth. Notice the abnormal length of the eye teeth? Oh, sure, yes. The teeth marks... On the dead sheep dog. Quite. Oh, who he is. Tell that man and shall not hold that I won't see him. The penis man won't leave feet and they throw them out. Black Angus seems to be living up to his name. I'm sorry, gentlemen, but the leer will not see you. He asks that you please leave at once. That's a bit of an understatement. You may tell him we're not leaving here until we've seen Mr. David McKinnon. I'm sorry, Just sir. Just a but... moment. I'm David McKinnon. You are splendid. We've come here on behalf of... I know why you're here, gentlemen. I must ask that you leave at once. But, Miss Victor, your fiancé... After all, you know Gentlemen, you... Gentlemen, you heard my father's message. Please go. As for Miss Victor, I have no interest in hearing anything concerning her. Good day. Come, Watson. I think perhaps our visit was ill-timed. This way, please, gentlemen. Let's get away from here. Unprincipled young Cather, David. I'd like to give him a good thrashing might be interesting to talk to David McKinnon when he's away from the influence of Black Angus. Oh, you're wasting your time, Holmes. A man's a bounder. Besides, they'll never let us in the house again. Try the front door, true. However, we can still try the back. Leave your hat and coat in the bushes here, old chap. Rumple up your hair, dirty your face, and adopt that delightful Scottish dialect of yours. For the moment, we will be plumbers. Plumbers? Well, how do we know they need plumbers? In an old castle like this, you can always be sure of one fact. Something must inevitably be wrong with the drains. They always need plumbers. But Holmes, do you think it's safe? I mean, if Black Angus discovers us, he may be dangerous. I'm afraid that's a chance we'll have to take. Come along, Watson, and try to look as much like a plumber as possible. <laughs> In just a moment, Dr. Watson will continue the story of Black Angus. But first, here's something which should certainly interest you men about Kreml hair tonic. Kreml is one of the greatest improvements ever made in the history of hair tonics. It's been especially developed to keep dry, unruly hair in perfect order all day long. Always looking its best with a nice, rich luster. Yet Kreml never gives hair that objectionable, greasy, patent leather look. <laughs> that kind of hair went out of style with handlebar mustaches. No, Kreml goes in for modern, handsome hair grooming. And it does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome. Kreml removes dandruff flakes. It also promptly relieves itching of dry scalp and leaves the scalp feeling so clean and alive. May I suggest that tomorrow, when you're out for your Sunday walk or drive, you stop and buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. It's spelled K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, did you and Sherlock Holmes manage to get into McKinnon Castle disguised as plumber? We did, Mr. Bell. Holmes is right about the drains. We were welcomed at the service entrance with open arms, figuratively speaking. Of course, we, we were shown down to the basement and left to our own devices. As soon as the coast was clear, I found myself following Sherlock Holmes as he stealthily mounted an, an old stone stairway. I must confess that my heart was in my mouth. 
This stairway should lead us up to the east wing, I'd say. And by the way, Watson, you make the most convincing plumber. Well, uh, I thought I was going to charge, you know. Quiet, <laughs> right, Watson. There's a light under that door. The door slightly ajar. Come here, Watson. We can see through the crack. There's a man seated in front of the dressing table, staring into the mirror. Candlelight's flickering, but I'll give you odds that's black angle. Oh, it's like this. Holmes, I don't like it. He meant... Holmes, he's got a revolver. He's raising it. Angus McKinnon, put down that revolver. Who the devil are you? My name is Sherlock Holmes. I told Bruce to throw you out. This time I'll do it myself, you praying. Mr. McKinnon, I know what you were thinking when you raised that revolver to your temple just now. And believe me, you're wrong. You can't possibly know. I think I do. You are convinced that you have been killing these sheepdogs. You have been so preoccupied with the legends of your great ancestor, Wolfhound McKinnon, that you think that your brain has snapped and that you've turned into a vampire. You're right, Mr. Holmes. But how you found out is beyond me. You know about the dogs? The sheep dogs with their throats torn out? Yes, we know about them. In fact, we found one as we were driving out about a mile from here. I know. They brought me the news not more than two hours ago. It won't happen again. You're convinced that you are responsible for these killings? What else can I think? All the evidence. The blood stains on my cloak. And I know those stains are not caused by human blood. You remember nothing? Nothing. But when I think of the heritage of the McKinnons, how can I doubt? Then that's the reason your son was recalled from London yesterday. It is. You suddenly had proof of what you thought to be your own morbid tendencies. And so you sent a message to your only son, warning him that he must not allow the woman he loved to marry into a family stained with madness. Holmes, you seem to understand my problem. But I will not discuss it with you. Go away, both of you. A McKinnon cannot go to his maker before strangers. Mr. McKinnon, give me your help in a few hours, Grace, and I'm convinced I can prove to you that you're the victim of a devilish plot. A plot? I don't understand. Oh, come now, Mr. McKinnon. In this year of Grace, it's a little hard to believe in vampires. But how can you disprove the evidence I've seen with my own eyes? The human teeth marks. It wouldn't be hard to conceive of an instrument that could simulate those marks, Mr. McKinnon. But who could think of such a fiendish plan? And what would be the motive? I have a suspicion. But what's more important at the immediate moment is to find the evidence. An instrument such as I've suggested would be damning proof. Therefore, it would be hidden in the most obscure hiding place in the castle. Now, what would be the most secret place? The cellars? Aye, we have extensive cellars. We'll search them. But another possibility occurs to me. In castles as old as this, there's often a secret room. Or, as they were sometimes called, a priest's hole. You're quite right, Mr. Holmes. We have such a hiding place here, though I haven't been in it for years. A narrow stairway leads down between the walls from an entrance behind that big cabinet. Splendid, Mr. McKinnon. You have a lantern? There, on the dressing table. I'll light it, Holmes. Thank you, Watson. I have a strong suspicion that the solution of the postponed wedding ceremony, as well as that of the mangled dogs, lies at the foot of that secret stairway. <laughs> Stuck a little place. That's stool with cobwebs. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Just walked into another one. Nobody's been down here recently, Holmes, I'd swear to that. Give me the lantern, Watson, will you? Uh, there you are, fella. Thanks. Uh-huh. Look here in the dust on the floor. Footprints. Footprints leading to that old chest in the, in the corner over there. Yes. Doesn't seem to be locked. <laughs> Look, Mr. McKinnon. See this devil's instrument? Oh, what is it? That looks like a metal trap. It is, with jaws of steel and a powerful spring. Oh, good heavens! And you can see the recent bloodstains on it. This fiendish instrument gives us the answer to those poor dead dogs. You mean that this was used to tear up their throats? Undoubtedly. And look, more devil's work. Great Scott, a human jawbone with the teeth intact. This must have been used to leave the prints of human teeth after the animals were dead. And to try and make me think that I was mad. The devil's... Oh, sorry. Oh, where are you? Somebody shot them. 
Somebody shot the lantern out of my hand. You're too inquisitive, Sherlock Holmes. Humphreys! Yes, Angus, your cousin, Humphreys. We've found you, Humphreys. I know what you and your meddling friends have found out, Angus. Thoughtful of you to put yourselves in my power. A priest dungeon will make a perfect coffin for the three of you. I'm going to lock and bolt this door at the head of the stairs. It's your only escape. I'm afraid death by suffocation and starvation won't be very pleasant, my friend. Humphreys, I'm coming back up those stairs. I'm going to get my hands on you. Your step, Angus, and I fire. Your devil, Humphreys, I warn you. Oh, Watson, where are you? I'm here, sir. Kill How is he? I'm all right, Holmes. I think the shot just grazed me. I'll strike a match. Yes. Just a flesh wound as far as I can see. Good. McKinnon, is there another exit from this room? There is, Mr. Holmes. Under that chest, the stone slides out. Gracious me, but Humphreys... Humphreys knows nothing about it. Some secrets of the McKinnon family are only entrusted to those bearing the family name. Thank heaven for that. And I'd suggest we get out of here as soon as possible. The air in here is getting stale already. Lean on me, Mr. McKinnon. That's it. How are you feeling? A little shaky, but I'm all right, Mr. Holmes. We're in places, are we? We've been following this little passage up and down, round and round. Right now, we're behind the wall of the library. The entrance is ahead of us, concealed by a tapestry. There's a faint crack of light. We're behind the tapestry. Someone's in the library. Boy, boy, I don't know how to say this. It's Humphreys. And my son, David. I was worried about those men from London. Sherlock Holmes should learn of the shame of the McKinnons. Hey, I'm afraid I've got shocking news for you. Your father has confessed that he has been killing the sheepdog. Father? He knows that he's mad. He, he left the castle just now with a pistol. He plans to kill himself. Kill himself? We must stop him. No, 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 my boy. Let him go. It's the best way. Oh, poor father. What can I do? There's only one honorable solution, David. Your branch of the family is corrupt, decayed. If your father dies and you disappear, the estate reverts to me, and we can save the McKinnon name with fresh blood. But, Uncle... You can go to the colonies and start life over with a new name. It's the only way. We've heard enough. Come on. Compress, you lion devil father. They said the... Drop that revolver, Humphrey. Drop it or I'll shoot. We overheard your conversation, Mr. Humphreys. Most enlightening. And we found this where you headed, you filthy beast. A human jawbone. You'd marked a dog's weight and tried to make me think that I'd done it the son. Then what he told me in London was nothing but a pack of lies. Of course. Mr. McKinnon, I suggest you send for the police. The police? What crime can they hold me for? A few sheepdogs killed and they can't prove I was responsible. There's... There's a, there's a mob of people outside the window. Mr. McKinnon, sir, excuse me. What is it, Bruce? It's a crowd of the villagers. They're in an ugly mood. They say you're responsible for the sheepdogs being killed on the moors. They're threatening to burn the castle. I'm afraid they're getting out of hand. Go back and tell them that in a few minutes I'll come out and explain the killing. Aye, sir, aye. But in a way too long. I'll go and talk to them, Father. They know me. Mr. Humphreys, possibly the law can do little to you. But the violence of mob rule may prove strikingly effective. Aye, I'll take this blackguard Humphreys out there. They'll know what to do with him. No, 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 you can't do that. You've got to keep me away from them. They tear me to pieces. Sign a written confession, Mr. Humphreys, and we'll protect you. I'll sign anything. Just keep me away from that mob. You suggested that my boy should go to the colonies. Put it in writing that you'll do just that yourself. Give me a pen. Here you are. And now, Watson, I think we still have time to catch the night express for London. I hope we'll have no difficulty in obtaining three tickets on such short notice. Three tickets? Of course. I'm certain young David McKinnon will be accompanying us. I fancy we may be attending a wedding within a very few days. And did you, Dr. Watson? Did I... did I what? Attend the wedding. <laughs> Indeed we did, Mr. Bell. As a matter of fact, Holmes acted as best man. It was a very charming affair. <laughs> I'm sure it was. And now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. What shall I tell you? 
Next week, I think I'll tell you a story called The Adventure of the Hungry Cat, in which Sherlock Holmes saves an innocent man from the gallows and brings to justice a particularly vicious and cold-blooded murderer. Now here's something which should interest you ladies. My wife has beautiful, natural highlights in her hair. And girls, I'll let you in on the secret of how she does it. I always wash my hair with cremel shampoo. It leaves my hair with a natural, glossy luster that lasts for days and days. Cremel shampoo actually brings out all the natural, glossy highlights that lie concealed in the hair. In addition, it has a beneficial oil base that helps keep hair from becoming dry or brittle. This famous hard water shampoo works like magic in every type of water. And girls, you'll love the way its rich, luxurious foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff flakes as well as the dirt. Don't forget, Cremel Shampoo is the same beautifying shampoo which those famous million-dollar powers models use. So why not glamour bathe your hair with beautifying Cremel Shampoo? Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Sussex Vampire. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures and Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the hungry cat. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once again, let's drop in on the famous colleague of Sherlock Holmes, our good friend, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. And a very good evening to you, Mr. Bell. I've almost given up hope of your coming tonight. I know it's pretty late, Dr. Watson, but I saw that your light was still on, so I thought I'd drop in. I'm glad that you did, Mr. Bell. Applying the methods of my friend Sherlock Holmes, I would venture a guess that you're on your way home from the theater. Amazing deduction, Dr. Watson. (laughs) I lament to Mr. Bell. Isn't that a theater program I see sticking out of your pocket? Of course. Oh, what was the play? (laughs) Hamlet. Very fine production, too. Have you seen it? No, not lately. But I think I can claim to be one of the very few men in this world to have seen a far older Hamlet than any that you saw performed tonight. An older Hamlet? I don't quite understand. Some 400 years older. You've heard me speak of Professor Moriarty? The arch-villain whom Sherlock Holmes considered his most worthy opponent? Precisely. I think that Professor Moriarty would cheerfully have given his right arm to possess the Hamlet to which I'm referring. At least he was quite willing to commit murder for it. I remember... Oh, but uh, here I am monopolizing the conversation when I knew uh, know that you've got something quite important to, uh, to tell our listeners. Yes, Dr. Watson, I'd like to tell our listeners about a modern trend in hair grooming that's in such great demand today by men who value their appearance. It's called Cremel Hair Tonic. Frankly, man, Kreml is the only hairdressing I've ever found that really makes my hair stay in place. An outstanding feature of Kreml is that it always keeps hair so neatly groomed, yet never gives it that cheap, greasy look. Kreml never leaves hair full of sticky goo. Your hair feels so soft and looks so natural. And men, don't tell me that you won't be mightily pleased when your wife or sweetheart remarks how attractive your hair always looks. How it feels so nice to touch. Never greasy or sticky. It's spelled K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about Professor Moriarty and the original Hamlet? I'm all ears. It all began in the most commonplace manner imaginable. I was walking down the street with Holmes in answer to a completely routine call from Scotland Yard. 
Hurry up, Watson. Don't lag. I must say, Holmes, that as a medical man, I heartily endorse this recent passion of yours for long, brisk walks. My dear Watson, the constant succession of dull cases with which we've recently been favoured leaves me with so much surplus energy that I can only sleep by exercising myself into a state of utter stuporous exhaustion. Look out! Oh, look out! Good heavens, that carriage! Oh, oh. Thank you, Doctor! Thank you, Holmes, doctor. did you see that? That carriage ran right over that old man. Poor devil. I'd better see what I'm going to do for him, Holmes. Well, that's your mate, Watson. Look out for the poor chap. I must be getting on to the yard. The poor man. Uh, move to one side, please. Move to one yeah, side, yeah, please. Away. I'm a doctor. Let the doctor, oh, let let the doctor let the through. Let the I'm all right, sir. I'm all right, thank you. Well, there are no bones broken, I'm going to say. Here, let me help you to stand up. Thank you, sir. Yes, I, I'm all right. Quite all right. Very kind of you to come to my assistance. Oh, not at all. I'm a doctor. At least I picked a good spot for my accident. I see there's a pub right across the way. I hope you'll at least let me have the pleasure of standing you a drink. It's the quickest fee I ever received. I'll lead the way, sir. <laughs> Two whiskies and sodas, miss. Right, sir. Allow me to introduce myself, sir. My name's Franklin Burley. Oh, and here's uh, here's my card, Mr. Burley. Not the Dr. Watson. Oh, you mean the little paper I wrote on the, the common cold in the last issue of the Lancet? I don't know I, about I, that, but aren't you Sherlock Holmes' colleague? Yes, I am. God sent you to me, Dr. Watson. Oh, really? I've been wanting to put my problem into competent hands. What do you mean? I didn't stumble in front of that carriage, Dr. Watson. I was pushed. Someone's been trying to murder me. No, 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 Mr. Burley, I... I... tell you, it's the truth. Two weeks ago, a wheel came off the carriage that I was driving. A most convenient accident. Last Wednesday, as I was passing St. George's in Hanover Square, an enormous balk of timber fell, missing me by less than a yard. Well, why on earth should anybody want to kill you? Here you are, James. Oh, thank you, thank you. Because I saw it, Dr. Watson. Saw what? I saw the ghost of the Burleys, which no man may see and live. Oh, no, 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 my dear fellow. After all... This is the 19th century. We are a very old family, the Burleys. Not nobility, but just as old, just as proud, and just as poor. My father left me two inheritances. The magnificent Burley Library, which has been in our family for over 300 years. And the Burley Ghost. Oh, you needn't look at me like that. I'd always scoff too, when I heard tales of the ghost. But a week ago, I saw it. In the library. Uh, Very well, Mr. Burley. Uh, May I ask whose ghost it's supposed to be? The original collection of books in the library was stolen from an abbey expropriated by Henry VIII. When the abbot resisted, he was killed, and it's his ghost that, according to legend, haunts the library. I don't suppose you could describe the ghost? That's where you're wrong, Dr. Watson. I saw it, or him, if you prefer, quite clearly. He was extremely tall, very thin... His forehead a high, pale curve, with his eyes two sunken pits of blackness. Gracious me. But most of all, I was struck by the slow, almost hypnotic, constant oscillation of his head from side to side in a manner which I can only describe as curiously and horribly reptilian. You and Mr. Holmes must help me, Dr. Watson. You must... Uh, I can see from your expression that you think I'm merely suffering from delusions, imagining persecutions that do not exist, but I tell you, my life is at stake. Mr. Burley, as a medical man, I'll admit that at least you believe you're telling the truth. Tell me, do you live alone? No, my son lives with me. A uh, good enough sort, though I could wish he had a bit more purpose in life. But his wife... What about his wife? When my son was in Salon running a tea plantation, he married a half-caste woman. She's utterly strange, a terrible creature. I more than half suspect she's behind everything that's happened. Rather a weird alliance, isn't it, between your ghost and your son's wife? All right, Mr. Burley, I'll speak to Holmes, if that's the only thing that'll set your mind at rest. It won't be the first time that he's driven a ghost back to its lair. <laughs> No, do stop scraping on that violin of yours, Holmes. I'm trying to tell you about this poor chap's delusions. I assure you, Watson, you've been receiving my closest attention. 
So your friend Mr. Burley suspects his son's half-caste wife. Go on. Well, that's all there is to it. I promised him that I'd tell you his story, although obviously the poor man is the victim of a persecution phobia. I wonder, Watson. I wonder. Oh, now, now, really, Holmes. There are certain definite points of interest. That description of the ghost, for instance. Tall, very thin, high forehead, with a constant oscillation of his head in a reptilian manner. Who does that remind you of, Watson? Remind me? Oh, I don't know. Could it be anyone but our friend Moriarty? Good heavens, you're right. And a library of the nature that you describe might well contain treasures worthy of the professor's highly selected interests. I tell you, Watson, it sounds precisely like Moriarty. The inspection of the library in his ghostly guise, followed by the realization that if he's to secure without suspicion the treasures he covets, their owner's death is necessary. Come, come, Watson. Stop lounging in your chair. Oh, but where are we off to? Mr. Burley said he was returning to an ancestral home at the seaside in Cornwall. Yes? We shall join him there. It's been too long since I've crossed swords with such a masterly adversary as Professor Moriarty. I tell you, Holmes, the sea breezes, the salt air... And the sun shining on the water make a man realize that life is worth living. Ah. If you don't stop admiring the surf instead of watching where you're putting your feet along the singularly aimless meanderings of this path, you won't have any life left to live. It's a good 200-foot drop to those extremely unpleasant-looking rocks below. Yes, I see what you mean. I say, Holmes, look down there. I never realized that those Cornish cliffs are... Simply riddled with caves. Which no doubt accounts for their popularity with smugglers in bygone days. That and their inaccessibility, except from the sea. Bart seems to buy just up there ahead of us. Of course, that fool of an innkeeper didn't tell us which fork to take. A problem, Watson, but not one incapable of solution. May I ask how you propose to solve it? Deductive reasoning, I suppose? <laughs> not at all. I shall merely inquire the proper direction from that boy who seems to be birds nesting behind those bushes. Oh, here, young fellow. Hi, my lad. Good morning, my boy. Oh, I'm not doing nothing. Oh, I shouldn't. Of course not. There's nothing to be frightened of. We simply want to know the way to Burley Manor. Eh? Hey? Uh, Burley Manor, my boy. To the right or to the left? Oh, you want Burley Manor, eh? Uh, that is the impression we're trying to convey. <laughs> Everybody knows where Burley Manor is. Well, we don't. <laughs> where is it? Straight along the path. That way. <laughs> Pathetic sight. When will our civilization advance sufficiently to produce a race free of such pitiable creatures as that? Oh, I don't know. The boy looks well fed and happy. Why, shouldn't he? Nothing to do but walk round barefoot and climb about the cliffs all day. Seems all a present life. I wouldn't mind being an idiot myself. Jackie! Jackie, where are you? If you are looking for that barefooted boy, madam, he went off towards the cliffs. Oh, if anyone wants me back for hours, he hunts birds' nests and eggs. Sells them for a few pennies. Very sound hobby. I used to do a little birds' nesting myself when I was a boy. I wanted him to run an errand for me, but it's no match. The boy told us that we should take this path to Burley Manor, but he seemed a trifle oh, wanting. Uh, if you're going to Burley Manor, I will be glad to show you the way. I'm Mrs. Stephen Burley. Good Lord, not the... Uh... <laughs> uh, your father-in-law invited us down to see his library, Mrs. Burley. May I introduce Dr. Watson? Uh, how do you do? My name is Sherlock Holmes. I'm very glad to know you both. Now, if you'll just follow me along the path... It's rather narrow, so I'm afraid we'll have to go in single file. Well, that's just attractive girl, eh, Holmes? Quite. Which makes me wonder all the more why she has evidently been weeping. <laughs> So that's Burley Manor. Impressive looking old place, I must say. They built them to last in those days. I suppose it is impressive. But is it a house which conveys to you an aura of happiness, Dr. Watson? Well, I can't say that I've ever Oh, there's Stephen now on the terrace. Lila, 
Lila, where the devil have you been? Oh, uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Glad to know you. Your father asked them down to see the library. The library? Oh, stacks of weird old books in there. Stuff's never been catalogued. Can't make any sense out of it myself. No, it's not my dish of tea either. <laughs> Felt like reading Hamlet one night. Found some old black letter thing I could barely spell my way through. And from the little I made out, it wasn't even the right form of the play. Really, Mr. Burley? How was that? Oh, it started out with some sort of a prologue. All about ghosts and revenge. Never saw that in Hamlet. Stephen, where is your father? I haven't seen him since I packed his lunch. Has he gone off to the cliffs already? You must have just missed him, Mr. Holmes. He often spends the day browsing about out there. Takes lunch along with him. And he's gone off alone? Which path did he take? The one toward the cliffs. But I don't... Come, Watson. There's not a moment to lose. Oh, found these bushes. I might as well try to hurry through a bramble hedge. I only pray we catch up to him in time. What was all that about, uh, about Hamlet, Holmes? Only that there is indeed a treasure here, Watson. And one fully worthy of Professor Moriarty's distinguished attention. Treasure? What sort? From Stephen's unseeing description, I deduce that the Burley Library must contain the Ur Hamlet. The Ur Hamlet? Uh, what's that? The original play ascribed to Thomas Kidd, upon which Shakespeare based his version. Not a single copy is known to exist in the entire world, Watson. It would be absolutely priceless. Oh, gracious me. I say, Holmes, look. Up there ahead. I just caught a glimpse of a man's back beyond those trees. It must be Burley. Good. Mr. Burley. Mr. Burley! The wind's blowing towards us. He, he can't hear you. Hurry up, Watson. We catch him beyond that bend in the path. Great heavens! How appalling! Why, the man's literally blown to bits. As I feared, Watson, we were just too late. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see if Sherlock Holmes really was too late. But men, it's never too late to help improve the appearance of your hair. If you're having trouble keeping your hair in place, if it's dry, lifeless looking, why not try Kremel hair tonic? Honestly, I think Kremel is by far one of the greatest hairdressings ever discovered. Kremel keeps hair in perfect order from morning until night with a nice, healthy looking luster. Yet Kremel never gives hair that cheap, greasy look. It never smothers hair down with sticky goo, which makes the hair and scalp feel so dirty. In addition, Kremel makes hair a cinch to comb. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes. It relieves itching of dry scalp and makes your scalp feel so clean and refreshed. Next time you get a haircut, ask your barber for an application of Kremel. In the meantime, buy a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. And now, Dr. Watson, what happened when you and Sherlock Holmes found that Mr. Burley had been the victim of an explosion on those Cornish cliffs? Holmes sent me back to the house. As soon as I had reported what had happened, I had it back to the cliffs where I found Holmes standing lost in meditation. His tall, gaunt form... Sinuated against the sea. Holmes, I've sent a servant from the house to fetch the police. Good man. Uh, what's that you've got there? A few barely identifiable fragments of the lunchbox Burley was carrying. From the marks of the explosion, it is obvious that the bomb was in it. I see. Great Scott, Holmes. The young Mrs. Burley said that she packed that lunchbox. Precisely. And you will observe these footprints leading away here in the softer ground at the edge of the path. Naked footprints. That barefoot boy, the, the idiot. He saw it happen, was frightened by the explosion, and ran away in a panic. You'll notice how smooth the footprints are? Smooth? Uh, never mind. There's little we can do now but await the police. And I doubt if it will be long before they arrest a murderer. <laughs> I should like to suggest, Superintendent Maddox, that you broaden the course of your inquiry... If you don't mind, Mr. Holmes, I'll conduct my questioning in my own way. 
Not at all, Superintendent. A little rude fellow. No, Mrs. Burley. It'll be a lot better for you if you help me instead of hindering me. I've been trying to answer your question, Superintendent. Although only a fool could fail to see where they're leading. Now, Lila, the Superintendent's only trying to find out the truth. Very well. I'm innocent. And if all you want is the truth, you shall have it. I hated my father-in-law and he hated me. Lila, don't say any more. And that isn't all. All the gossip you picked up from the servants this afternoon is true, Superintendent. My husband and I quarreled this morning. Quarreled bitterly. Stephen talked of divorce. His father's constant pressure has made him so confused that he no longer knows his own mind. That's not true, Lila. I still love you. So if that's what you wanted to know, Superintendent? Yes. I'm glad he said I hated him. I hated him. I think that'll be quite enough, Mrs. Burley. I shall have to take you with me to the chief constable. The charge is murder. Oh, you're crazy, Maddox. My wife didn't kill my father. The fact that she's told you all these things should be proof enough. I'm sorry, Mr. Burley. I've got to do my duty as I see it. Come along, Mrs. Burley. Very well. I'm ready. I'll come along with you, my dear. No, darling. Stay here and help Mr. Holmes in any way you can. That's the best way for you to help me. She's quite right, my boy. Now, come along, Mrs. Burley. Mr. Holmes, I'll offer you any sum you wish to clear my wife. Your father was my client. I already have a duty to find his murderer. And you think that Lila... I think the superintendent would have arrested her twice as quickly if he had known of the other possible motive. That in revenge she had conspired with Professor Moriarty against your father. Then you're leaving? You won't help me? There are loose ends to clear up, Mr. Burley. I must send Dr. Watson on an errand. As for myself, my first objective is to inspect the famous Burley Library... I brought you some sandwiches, Mr. Holmes. You've been in here for hours. I'm afraid I've rather lost track of time. Have you found what you wanted? I did not find it. And nothing could be more significant than its absence... There is no sign here, Mr. Burley, of the black letter Hamlet which you described. Well, that's funny. I distinctly remember that... Ah, oh, there you are, Holmes. Any luck, Watson? No, not a bit. I missed my supper and had a wild goose chase for my pain. You mean you couldn't find the half-witted boy? Checked every house in the village. He's nowhere about. I'm afraid he will never return. Dead? You mean you think that he saw too much? I mean, Watson, that the person who planted that bomb also murdered that poor boy. If you could have some lanterns at once, please, Mr. Burley. Of course. I think we'd better follow the tracks of those bare feet to their final destination. Here, Watson. Hold that lantern over my shoulder, close to the ground. This moonlight isn't quite strong enough to... Ah, that settles it. What is it? This overturned pedal. See? The underside is still moist and discolored. Someone has been here very recently. I must say, Mr. Holmes, I don't believe there's another man on earth who could have brought us to this spot in the dark by these minute indications you've discovered. Quite elementary, my dear Mr. Burley. At all events, our tracking's at an end. This path seems to lead right down the face of the cliff. If you call it a path, where the devil does it lead to? If you look over the edge of the cliff... Look over here. Careful. It's a 200-foot drop to those rocks below. You see a dark opening some 40 or 50 feet down? One of the caves. Precisely. And except for this extremely precipitous and presumably unknown path, a cave completely hidden and inaccessible save from below by way of the water. Come on. In here, it's slippery. Careful, Holmes. Look out for these rocks. Oh, blasted! I nearly wrecked my ankle. Look out! That boat is loose. Good heavens! I just missed me. What price the brisk sea breezes now, Watson? Oh, I wish we were back in Baker Street. Oh, there, the worst bit's over. Here's the cave. It's larger than it seemed from above. Hold that lantern high above your head, Mr. Burley. This cave extends back quite a distance, apparently. Ah, there's something white beside those rocks. Good gracious me, it's some sandwiches. Precisely. The remains of your father's lunch, Mr. Burley. But 
I don't understand. And How here, you... unless I'm greatly mistaken, in this pile of books, we shall find the missing hand Ah, yes, just as I thought. Follow me, Mr. Berlin. Keep that lantern high enough so that I may see what's ahead of us. What the dickens are you doing with a revolver in your hand, Holmes? I expect to find it of use at any moment, Watson. Ah, the end of our road. It's my father. It's Burley. He, he's asleep. But, but he's wearing Jackie's clothes. Precisely. Wake up, Mr. Burley. No, none of that. I've got you covered. What's the meaning of this? A very clever plot, Mr. Burley. You so hated your half-caste daughter-in-law that you determined to get rid of her before she could bear you a grandchild. Even to the lengths of framing her for your own murder. We said that only she could have tampered with a lunchbox. Obviously, we should have thought, Mr. Burley, only she and you could have done so. Good heavens, Holmes. Do you mean to say that my father... Under the pretext of some childish game, Burley, you exchanged clothes with that poor boy. We saw him walking along dressed in your clothes. No wonder he didn't answer when I called your name. You watched him as he was blown to bits by the bomb, and then you disappeared. You knew, Holmes, what we'd find here? The bare footprints were smooth, Watson, which would have told me at once that they were the prints of Franklin Burley's feet. The boy Jackie, who spent his days climbing the cliffs, would have had horny, calloused feet. When I realized that, everything fell into place. The ghost in the library. Pure invention. The accident, which doubtless was simply an accident, introduced Burley to you and suggested that I might prove an unimpeachable witness to his ostensible murder by his daughter-in-law. The story of the ghost was simply an ingenious device to pique my interest. All right, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. As long as you're so smart, answer this question. What can you prove? I'll admit I changed clothes with the idiot. I'll say it was just a game. Then he was killed by the trap that had been meant for me. I was panicked and ran away. Yes, panicked to the extent of bringing your most valuable books with you, Mr. Burley. The sale of which would be a great help in starting your new life. But there's more to it than that. How does the heir of an old but impoverished family do himself as well as you do? How does a country gentleman secure a well-made time bomb? And above all, how is it that you were able to describe Moriarty so precisely in order to tempt me? I know You're one of Moriarty's henchmen, aren't you? It's always been a trick of his to use the old smuggler's passages in these caves. Perhaps you're even counting on him to complete your plan. Look, Holmes, look, look. There's a motorboat coming in towards us. They're standing on the prow. That unmistakable thin figure. That oscillating head. It's Moriarty. Get down, Watson. Out of sight. Stand up early in the mouth of the cave. Let Moriarty see you in the light, but don't try to warn him. I assure you I won't hesitate to shoot you. You don't dare kill me. You want me as a witness. Moriarty! It's a trap! Sherlock Holmes is here! Moriarty's raising his rifle. He's... Oh! oh. He shot him, Holmes. Moriarty's shot Burley. Better luck next time. Oh. Good heavens! Moriarty has made certain that no one shall turn King's evidence against him. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't try to stand up, man. You're, you're badly hurt. I'm dying. But there'll be no dying words for me for you to use in court. <laughs> I see where you're looking. You want that Hamlet, don't you, Mr. Holmes? Every scholar, every museum in the world would... Oh, and it's it. mine. I'll never let it be seen. No one shall have it now. You least of all. I'm dying. And it's dying for me. Look out, Holmes. Burley, stop. <laughs> Good heavens, he... He's thrown himself into the sea. He hasn't a chance on those jagged rocks. Yes, and his body will be washed out to sea before we can get down there. Watson, an irreparable loss. Loss? A confounded murder like that? I was referring to the copy of Hamlet. I'm afraid it's the most shocking loss to English literature since half of Milton's papers were burned by his cook. <laughs> So Professor Moriarty once again got the better of Sherlock Holmes. Oh, no, honey, and did he escape capture, Mr. Bell? After all, Holmes solved the mystery and managed to save the reputation of the young and beautiful Mrs. Burley. That's true, Dr. Watson. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will tell us about next week's story. But first, ladies, Sherlock Holmes is tops at solving mysterious problems. But here's one hair problem which those beautiful powers models solve. And here it is. We discovered there's nothing better than cremel shampoo to bring out all the hair's natural glossy luster. Cremel shampoo actually keeps our hair shining bright for days. And cremel shampoo does such a marvelous cleaning job. Even in the hardest water, its rich active foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff flakes as well as the dirt. Cremel shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair to reveal all its glorious natural brilliance. 
Even after the first shampoo, your hair looks a vision of loveliness. And don't forget to mention how its beneficial oil base helps keep hair from becoming dry or brittle. Yes, I know. That's why my wife always uses cremel shampoo for our youngster's hair. In fact, everyone at our house uses cremel shampoo because it's so mild and gentle on the hair. You can buy a bottle at any drug counter. Just ask for cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, how about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes unmasked the sinister Dr. Punsonby, head of a boys' school, and thus saved the life of one of the pupils. I've always referred to this particularly bizarre adventure as a singular affair of the dying schoolboys. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell, speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the singular affair of the dying schoolboys. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once again, it's time to call on our old friend, that incomparable host and storyteller, Dr. Watson. He's waiting for us in his familiar study. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. I won't get up, if you don't mind. This change in the weather has given me a twinge or two of rheumatism, I'm afraid. No, I'm sorry to hear that, Dr. Watson. Uh, we old fossils can't expect to be as hale and hearty as you young fellows, you know. Uh, I don't know that I feel so young today, Dr. Watson. I stopped by the military academy this afternoon and saw my cousin there. He's 13 years old, and after an hour with him, I realized I'm really quite ancient. 13 years old? Oh, a fine age. He's happy at the school, Mr. Bell? Crazy about it. Yes, I'm sure that in this day and age, a boy almost looks forward to going to school. Conditions were far different in certain parts of England just before the turn of the century, I'm afraid. I'm thinking in particular of a school that Holmes and I had occasion to visit and of the frightened, unhappy youngsters who lived there in mortal terror of their lives. Oh, this has all the hallmarks of the beginning of a Sherlock Holmes adventure. It is, my boy. It's a story I call The Singular Affair of the Dying Schoolboys. But before I begin, haven't you a message for our listeners? Yes, I have. Folks, it looks as if we're in for plenty of excitement tonight with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. And men, I'll bet you'll be plenty excited about the great improvement in the appearance of your hair once you use Kremel hair tonic. Frankly, I've tried any number of hairdressings, but it took Kreml to really convince me that my hair can always be neat without having to plaster it down with grease or those sticky, gooey concoctions. And Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking attractive. It makes hair so much easier to comb and actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer, easier to manage. At the same time, Kreml removes embarrassing dandruff flakes. It relieves itching due to dry scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so clean, so alive. Man, what a treat. Now be sure to buy a bottle at any drug counter spelled K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the singular affair of the dying schoolboys? Well, Mr. Bell, that strange adventure began on a stormy September evening in Baker Street many, many years ago. All day long the wind had screamed and the rain had beaten against our windows. Shortly after dinner, there was the old familiar jangle on our front doorbell. And a few moments later, Mrs. Hudson ushered a distinguished visitor into the room. As he stood there in front of the flickering firelight, I could see that he was a good-looking man and also that he was in a state of considerable excitement. Now, Lord Manders, if you will just give us the facts. Well, Mr. Holmes, three years ago... I was a passenger on that ill-fated ship, the Sophie Anderson. She was wrecked in a gale, and I was the only survivor. 
I clung to a piece of broken spar and was washed ashore. And after that, for over two years, I lived alone on an island in the Indian Ocean. Naturally, when the Sophie Anderson foundered, I was believed to be dead. My young brother, Eric, who was next in line, inherited the estate under the guardianship of our uncle. There must have been quite a lot of confusion when you arrived home this year, Lord Manders. There was, Dr. Watson. But not for the reason you suppose. I landed in England to find that my brother had died last December. Oh, indeed, I'm very sorry. But... He died under very peculiar circumstances. That's why I've come to you, Mr. Holmes. What were those circumstances? My uncle sent Eric to a school on the Welsh Moors, not far from Cardiff. A school known as Punsonby Hall. He died in the school infirmary there. Supposedly of pneumonia. And you have some reason to believe it was not pneumonia? Nothing definite. I've been down to the school, but Dr. Punsonby, the owner, was too ill to see me. However, I did talk to a frightening woman there, who's the matron of the place, a Mrs. Arkwright. I became suspicious. So I stayed on and, for a few days, made some local inquiries. With what results? Punsonby Hall has a black name with the villagers, Mr. Holmes. Five boys have died there in the last two years under circumstances similar to my brother's. Good gracious me. I presume that you immediately had an accounting with your uncle? My uncle had settled another account before my return, Mr. Holmes. He died of a heart attack last February. But I am certain he was responsible for Eric's death. You see, he stood to inherit the estate. It may sound incredible, but I believe Eric was murdered at Punsonby Hall. Murdered in a boys' school? Oh, come, 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 sir. Such things can't happen in this 19th century of ours. But they can, Watson, and do, unfortunately. You don't mean it. I do. A private school situated in a desolate spot and operated by an unprincipled scoundrel could provide excellent and profitable opportunities for removing unwanted relatives. What a ghastly thought. Mr. Holmes, I know that Eric's dead and nothing can bring him to life again. But I can try and avenge his death and bring his murderer to justice. You will help me, won't you? Yes, Lord Manders, I will. If these shocking occurrences have been taking place, we may be able at least to prevent further tragedies. Watson, suppose we join Lord Manders on the West of England Express tonight and tomorrow see what can be done to penetrate the black clouds that surround Punsonby Hall. We're walking in the wrong direction, Mr. Holmes. The school's behind us. And before going there, I thought we might profitably pay a visit here in the village to Llewellyn Coffin. Oh, who's he? The local undertaker. An undertaker named Coffin? <laughs> that's, that's very funny, isn't it? Coffin, undertaker. <laughs> Quite. But try and control your amusement, will you, Watson? Oh, sorry, Albert. Here's his establishment now. Good day, gentlemen. Mr. Coffin? Yes, sir. That's my name, Coffin. We're strangers in these parts, and we're in search of information. I'm hoping, Mr. Coffin, that you'll be able to help us. What I can do, sir, I will, and do it gladly. I understand that you've had an unusually large proportion of business from Punsonby Hall in the past two years. Five boys died, didn't they? Five boys it was. Mr. Coffin, we've heard some strange stories in the village. Yes, stories that make us wonder if those deaths were from natural causes. Gentlemen, I'm a simple man, look you. A man who plies his trade but cannot afford to ask questions. What goes on at Punsonby Hall, and I'll not say strange things haven't happened there, is none of my business. Then let me appeal to your sympathies. My young brother died at Punsonby Hall last December. You must have buried him. Your brother? Well, now look you, that makes it different. But you'll not say anything up at the hall, sir. Dr. Punsonby's a savage man. Don't worry on that score, Mr. Coffin. What do you have to know him, sir? All the five boys were supposed to have had pneumonia, I understand. That's what the medical report said. Who signed those reports? Dr. Punsonby himself. He's a regular medical doctor, look you. How very convenient. No questions had to be asked. Mr. Coffin, when you prepared those bodies for burial, did you notice anything unusual about them? Anything to make you think their deaths were possibly not caused by pneumonia? No, sir. Think now. Think, uh... Uh, well... Now that you mention it, there was one thing I was after noticing. Oh, what was that, my good man? The boys had a strange look on their faces as they lay there. As if something had frightened the wits out of them just before they died. That's very odd. The face of anyone dying from pneumonia would be in repose. Did you notice anything else, Mr. Coffin? Any other peculiarity? Well, there was one thing, sir, that gave me to thinking. All the boys had marks on them. 
mm, stretch marks they were on their necks or shoulders. Perhaps they were bites. Rem remember Dr. Rylett of Stoke Moran Holmes? Uh, did these marks look like the bites of a snake, Mr. Coffin? No, that they weren't. Look, you, I know a snake bite when I see one. Didn't these marks make you suspicious? That they did, sir. And when I saw them on the boys, I took my courage in my hands and asked Dr. Ponsonby. And what did he say? Inoculation marks. He said that he had tried to save them with some newfangled medicine. No autopsy was held on the boys? No, sir. Dr. Ponsonby is the only doctor in these parts, look you. He gave the certificates. Who was to ask any questions? Exactly. Come on, Watson, Lord Manders. This has been a very promising start. Thank you, Mr. Coffin. You've been most helpful. It was a pleasure to talk to you, gentlemen. But please don't be after repeating what I said. Well, Mr. Holmes, I think you'll agree my suspicions were well grounded. Yes. And we'll lose no time investigating this matter. I think we may work faster if we divide our forces. I shall return to the inn and compose a telegram that I shall ask you to send for me, Lord Manders. Of course, Mr. Holmes. Aren't you going to punch the hall, Holmes? Not immediately. However, you, my dear Watson, can be my advance guard. Me? Yes. I think that your open countenance, combined with that delightful Scottish accent you sometimes assume, plus an appropriate name, should lull Dr. Punsonby into believing that he has another wealthy customer who needs his very specialized services. Well, Holmes, I'll, uh, I'll do my best. Just the same, I'll be very relieved when you get on the scene. <laughs> I'm Mrs. Arkwright, the school matron. Whom did you wish to see? I want to have a word with Dr. Ponsonby. My name is Angus McLaughlin, and I'm most anxious to send my young cousin here. Oh? Aye, he needs discipline. And I'm told that you dinner pamper a young lad here. Please come in. I'm sure Dr. Ponsonby will see you. Thank you, Mrs. Arkwright. Help me. Go in, please. Dr. Punsonby? Yes, uh, please sit down, won't you? Uh, thank you, sir. My name is Angus McLaughlin. I've travelled all the way from Aberdeen to see you. I was told that at your school you at least know how to uh, discipline a lad. Well, Mr. McLaughlin, <laughs> in our modest way, we endeavour to inculcate our students with a sense of responsibility. Aye, aye, aye. I was about to have a glass of wine. Perhaps you'd care to join me? That's very really kind of you, Dr. Bunsen. I'd like to. You uh, wish to send a relative here, Mr. McLaughlin? Aye, sir. Uh, a young cousin of mine, if you'll, if you'll take him. Uh, here's your wine, Mr. McLaughlin. Uh, thank you, sir. And to your very good health. Ah, uh, that's very good. <laughs> Tell me more about your cousin, sir. Before I accept a new student, I like to know as much about him as possible. Well, I'll be quite frank with you. He's 13 years old and he's a young devil, and an inconvenient young devil, too. You see, Dr. Ponsonby, I'm his guardian. You, you follow me? No, sir, I don't think I do. <laughs> well, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'm not a poor man, and I'd be a very wealthy one if... Uh, if it weren't for that boy, the whippersnapper is the only person who stands between me and uh, my dead brother's fortune. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be sorry if, <laughs> if anything were to happen to him. Uh, am I making myself quite uh, clear, Doctor? Much clearer, Mr. McLaughlin. <laughs> Another glass of wine? Thank you. Well, it's, it's very good. Mr. McLaughlin, why not put all your cards on the table? So much simpler that way. Very well. Does ten thousand pounds mean anything to you, Dr. Punsonby? You tell me, yes. The scholastic profession is notoriously unremunerative. If my young cousin were to be taken ill, perhaps, shall we say, uh, with pneumonia, if he uh, if he were to to die here at your school, uh, oh, what was I saying? Oh, I'd pay you ten thousand pounds. And uh, now, sir, I, I can't be more expensive. Is it than that? No, 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 can I? I don't think so. <laughs> By the way, Mr. McLaughlin, your Scottish accent is beginning to disappear. Such a pity. 
was quite colourful. This wine's drugged. You, you haven't touched your wine's drugged. I'm a most abstemious man. <laughs> Particularly on occasions like this, Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson, how, how did you know my name? Even in this remote spot, I've seen photographs of you and your friend, the famous Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> I'm just a little hurt that you both thought I was stupid enough to be fooled so easily. Oh, you seem dreadfully sleepy, Dr. Watson. Sleep, yes, I've got to go to sleep. And sleep well, my friend. <laughs> I only hope that you don't have too much trouble waking up. In just a moment, we'll find out just how much trouble Dr. Watson does have in waking up. But first, have you noticed how men are taking a greater interest in their appearance lately? Competition today is keener than ever. And I'm sure you'll agree one of the greatest assets to a man's appearance is well-groomed hair. So men, let me give you this tip about Kremel hair tonic and why it's preferred by so many of America's most successful and prosperous executives. Kremel... K-R-E-M-L keeps dry, ruffled hair neatly in place all day long. It gives it such a handsome, healthy-looking luster, too. Yet Kremel never leaves hair with that offensive, cheap, greasy look. It never leaves hair and scalp full of sticky goo, which feels so dirty. Kremel always looks and smells so clean on both hair and scalp. It gives hair that attractive, natural, he-man look which certainly hits the jackpot with the ladies. And don't forget, Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Let me repeat, Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. It makes hair feel softer, easier to manage. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes and makes the scalp feel so clean and invigorated. Men, use Kremel hair tonic daily. And see if you don't say... My hair never looked better. My scalp never felt cleaner. Well, Dr. Watson, you certainly left me teetering on the edge of my chair. We left you drugged in the schoolmaster's study. What happened next? Well, my first conscious recollection was to find myself with a violent pounding in my head, lying in a small clearing between some trees. Bending over me with a look of deep concern on his face was my old friend Sherlock Holmes. Watson. Uh, Watson, old chap, uh, are you all right? Yes, yes, I, I got a frightful headache, Holmes. What are you doing there in those, those clothes with that droopy moustache? It proved a good enough passport to secure me employment at the stables here. Well, how did you get me out of Punsonbridge study? And the stables command an excellent view of the school building. Your long absence worried me. And when Dr. Punsonbridge finally appeared, alone, I became suspicious. So I took advantage of his absence, slipped through the study window and rescued you. Well, thank heavens you did. He gave me drugged wine. It's a funny thing, Holmes. I was probably delirious, but I swear that I saw a woman's handbag on the table. A pink and black beaded bag, and it was alive and moved. Great heavens! That confirms my worst suspicions. Did you see it too? No, it wasn't there when I came in. Somebody, probably Mrs. Arkwright, removed it. Watson, you were never closer to death. I blame myself for having allowed you to tackle Dr. Punsonby alone. Uh, don't reproach yourself, Holmes. Where, where's Lord Manders? Waiting at the inn for an answer to my telegram. He is to meet us later behind the lodge gates. What's our next move? To go to the stables. Dirty you up a bit and get your change of clothes. Then we'll return to the attack. There's desperate work ahead of us. Here, this way, sir. What, my man? <laughs> Don't look so alarmed, Lord Manders. Dr. Watson, I, I wouldn't have recognized you. What's happened? Trouble. I had to assume a disguise, too. You brought an answer to Holmes's telegram? Yes, in my pocket. Where is he? He went over to the main school building and asked me to... Other things that the second cook, an acidulated woman of dubious charms, is most susceptible to flattery. Over a glass of stout, she quite inadvertently gave me three vital clues. 
What were they? Firstly, that all five of the unfortunate boys died in the same small room. Secondly, that that fatal room is directly under the room of Mrs. Arkwright. And she's capable of anything, if you ask me. The third clue makes our next step an urgent one. A boy by the name of Carruthers Minor was moved into that room yesterday. He's supposed to have an extremely bad cold. Dr. Punsonby is afraid it might turn into pneumonia. Good heavens! Exactly, Watson. I suggest we lose no time in visiting Carruthers Minor. Though I'm sure Dr. Punsonby would consider it unethical, this is one occasion when another doctor's opinion is absolutely vital. <laughs> There, there, Carruthers. This is Dr. Watson. He's come to make you well. You can't make me well. Dr. Punsonby says I've got pneumonia. Oh, nonsense, my dear boy. You've got a slight cold, that's all. If Dr. Punsonby says I've got pneumonia, pneumonia's what I've got. Nothing of the kind, my boy. Nothing of the kind. Watson, you notice this bed is anchored to the floor? It can't be moved. What does that suggest to you? Well, again, it reminds me of Stoke Moran and Dr. Rylant. But I don't see any bell pull. No, Watson. No bell rope is needed, because no murderous snake is involved in this plot. But look up there, directly above the bed. A small trap door. Leading from Mrs. Arkwright's room. <laughs> now the whole picture's clear. The trap door, the strange marks on the dead boys, the beaded bag that you saw. What, what was that? I don't know. Lord Manders is standing guard in the hallway. It's Dr. Ponsonby. He's come to look at my pneumonia. Mrs. Arkwright. I know you were expecting Lord Manders. He's lying in the hallway. He was looking in the wrong direction. Unfortunately for him. Don't let Mrs. Arkwright come near me. Don't let her. Mrs. Arkwright, I'd put that revolver away if I were you. I doubt if you know how to handle it. I assure you that I do. Having used the butt end of it on your friend so successfully should prove that fact. Grab her, Watson. Right, you Get away from Drop me. Drop that revolver, Mrs. Arkwright. That's right. That's the old girl. Have it. Drop that revolver. Do you hear me? Ah, that's better. I say, Holmes, she's fainted. Good. Help me carry up to her room. Well, what about young Carruthers and Lord Manders? We must remove them to a place of safety. And then, Watson, all that remains is to call on the giggling Dr. Punsonby. It's very dark in here, Holmes. I don't like this at all. Quiet. Somebody's coming. Good evening, Dr. Punsonby. <laughs> Let me light your desk lamp for you. You startled me. Who are you? What are you doing in my study? My name is Sherlock Holmes. Dr. Watson, you've already met. Yes, we've met you, scoundrel. Oh, yes. Uh, my friend, the Scotsman. I was expecting you both. Oh, by the way, please put that revolver away. <laughs> Firearms make me nervous. Uh, Dr. Punsonby... I know how those five boys were murdered. I would venture the opinion that you once spent some time for the sake of your health in America. In Arizona Territory, I'd say. I wonder what makes you think that, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> I've never been in America in my life. And yet I'm certain that someone here spent some time in the vicinity of the Gila River. Well, I understand that uh, Mrs. Arkwright was in America a few years ago. Mrs. Arkwright? Dr. Punsonby? Is it possible you're hoping to transfer our suspicions to your accomplice? My accomplice? You talk in riddles, Mr. Holmes. It's most confusing. Then shall we be more specific? You consider Carruthers Minor to be quite ill, I understand. Oh, yes, I'm dreadfully worried about him. Well, then let me tell you, Dr. Punsonby, that I examined the boy only a few minutes ago, and as a medical man, I say that he only has a slight cold. Then obviously we disagree in our diagnosis, Dr. Watson. After all, you're just a general practitioner, whereas I specialize... Yes, we know what you specialize in. Gentlemen, I suggest the three of us go over to Carruthers' room and hold a consultation. It's just possible that his health has taken a sudden turn for the better. But the bed's empty. Carruthers Minor has gone. Yes, Dr. Punsonby. And suppose you take his place. Leave me alone. What are you going to do? Lash you to this bed and see if you can stomach your own filthy medicine. This is outrageous. Of course. I thought that if we were to reconstruct your crimes with you as the victim, we might persuade you to confess. Mrs. Arkwright! 
Mrs. Arkwright's help! I'm afraid she can't help you. She's in her room with the door locked from the outside. Uh, there we are, Holmes. He's lashed up so that he can't move. But you don't understand. Mrs. Arkwright has his instructions. Your... Great heavens! What was that? Mrs. Arkwright. It came from the room above. Come on, Watson. Quick, up the stairs. She's fainted again. Feel her pulse. I just go to... Holmes, there is no pulse. She's dead. The poison works fast. Observe those marks on her wrist. Looks as if some animal had bitten it. It has. And that means the animal's loose in this room. Great heavens. Somehow it must have escaped from its cage and turned on her. Guard the door, Watson. Our lives are not safe until we've found this monster. I don't understand. Look. Look. Under that washstand there. Good heavens, it's that, it's that beaded handbag again. And it's moving. Give me your walking stick, Watson. Here. There. This diabolical creature has done enough damage for one lifetime. It's dead, Holmes. But what in thunder is it? It looks like some sort of lizard. It's all pink and covered all over with black scales. That's what made me think it was a handbag. But I've never seen a lizard as large as that. Of course you haven't. So let me introduce you to the peculiar villain of this piece. His name is Heloderma Suspectum, better known as the Gila Monster, indigenous to the Gila River in America. I've never seen anything like that before. How on earth did you recognize it, Holmes? When Mr. Coffin, the undertaker, mentioned those strange marks on the dead boys, I was reminded of an article I'd read recently on venomous lizards. So that telegram you sent was to the... to the Museum of Natural History. Their answer confirmed my suspicions. The Gila Monster's bite produces almost instantaneous death, and yet it's a poison that would be extremely hard to identify. The fixed bed in the room below us, the trap door directly above it in this room, and the help of an unscrupulous accomplice like Mrs. Arkwright makes the rest of the picture very clear. And now that the monster's dead, how are you going to frighten Dr. Punsonby into a confession? Uh, Dr. Punsonby need not know the animal's dead. Examine the floor, Watson. See if you can find that trap door. Right, draw, Holmes. Meanwhile, I'll see if I can find some cord or string. Uh-huh. Here's a ball of twine on the dressing table, placed there for use in the intended murder of Carruthers Minor, no doubt. Uh, found the trap, Holmes. There's a ring here in the floor and a section of the carpet's been cut out. Good. And now to attach the twine to the body of the healer monster. So, all right, Watson, open the trap door. Very well, Holmes. Well, Dr. Pansonby, have you changed your mind? She is dead, Dr. Pansonby. Your healer monster turned on her. No! No! I'm going to lower the animal, Watson. There we are. Oh, get away from me! I think a few more feet will do the trick, Holmes. Yes. There. Take it away! I tell you anything! Everything! You will sign a confession? Yes, Mr. Holmes, yes, I will! Just take that beast away, I sign anything! We'll be down, Dr. Punsonby. Well, Holmes, thank heavens that's done with. What a shocking affair. Yes, Watson. But not without a note of poetic justice. What do you mean? Well, isn't it poetic justice that a dead reptile should be instrumental in bringing a live one to the gallows? Quite a gruesome finale, Dr. Watson. It certainly was, Mr. Bell. All in all, one of the most unpleasant adventures that Holmes and I ever encountered. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Girls, how would you like a thrilling new experience? Then just listen to how beautiful Powers models glamour bathe their hair. We certainly were thrilled to discover the amazing, beautifying action of Cremel Shampoo. It actually glamour bathes each tiny strand of hair and leaves hair sparkling for days with natural glossy luster. And Cremel Shampoo is so mild and gentle... It positively contains no harsh caustics or chemicals. Instead, it has a beneficial oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Oh, and don't forget how its luxurious active foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Girls, why not follow the advice of these million-dollar powers models and glamour bathe your hair with beautifying Cremel shampoo? It takes only ten minutes right at home. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, how about next week? Well, now, uh, let me see. Next week. Next week, I think I'll tell you the adventure of the genuine Garnelius. 
in which Holmes solved the mystery of Drenko, a famous violinist, who was found dead in a locked room clutching a suicide note, but who nevertheless had been murdered. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Speckled Band. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the genuine Garnerius. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once again, it's time for our weekly visit to Dr. Watson, genial friend and colleague of the great Sherlock Holmes. Good evening, Dr. Watson. I trust I'm not intruding? Not at all, my dear fellow, not at all. Sit down, won't you? Thank you. You know, Dr. Watson, I've been struck by the remarkably large number of signed photographs of titled personages and notables that ornament the walls of your study. Mementos of your active career, I presume? Yes, though I must admit most of them are clients of Sherlock Holmes rather than grateful patience of mine. Well, this picture, for instance. Naturally, I recognize the photograph of the late royal... No, 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 no names, Mr. Bell. I, I, I beg you. Holmes and I always referred to the gentleman question merely as uh, Mr. Edwards. And what did you and Mr. Holmes do to cause his royal... I beg your pardon, Mr. Edwards, to inscribe his photograph in such affectionate gratitude? Oh, nothing of any great importance, I assure you. Merely that Mr. Edwards had become a trifle entangled, shall we say, with a little dancer at Maxim's in Paris, a young lady rejoicing in the appellation of uh, Frou-Frou. <laughs> Quite a delightful little bit of fluff, too. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I gather that Sherlock Holmes settled the matter to Mr. Edwards' complete satisfaction. Uh, very easily and very discreetly. But it led us into one of the most curious and singular affairs of Sherlock Holmes' career, and one which I don't believe would ever have been solved had Holmes not been a distinguished amateur on the violin. I call it The Adventure of the Genuine Guarnerius. Sounds intriguing, Dr. Watson. But if you don't mind a momentary interruption... Not at all, Mr. Bell. Go ahead. Men, there's a famous saying about locking the barn door after the horse has been stolen. Well, the same applies to the hare. Once bald, bald forever, they tell us. But you can make the most of the hair you've got. And you can't begin too early. That's why I want to tell you about Kremel Hair Tonic. Cremel contains very special hair grooming ingredients found in no other hair tonic. Cremel makes the hair stay better groomed longer, with that natural, greatly desired he-man look. Never greasy, never sticky. But Cremel does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome. A massage with Cremel actually helps stimulate circulation in the surface of the scalp. Your scalp always feels so alive, so invigorated after applying Cremel. This highly specialized hair tonic also has an excellent lubricating effect on a dry scalp. It makes dry, brittle hair that breaks and falls feel softer and more pliable. So men, buy a bottle of Kreml hair tonic at any drug counter. You'll be delighted with its extra advantages. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson... How about the adventure of the genuine Guarnerius? Well, the British ambassador to France, Sir Hubert Ashley, had invited Holmes and myself to a reception at the embassy in Paris in order to thank us both for successfully concluding the rather delicate affair of uh, <laughs> Mr. Edwards. The ballroom was a blaze of light. The guests were dancing. By Jove, Holmes, have you ever seen anyone more attractive than our host's wife? I must say that Lady Ashley is really the finest type of English beauty. Sometimes, Watson, I envy you the directness of your mind. What do you mean? 
When you look at a beautiful woman, you see only beauty. Well, what on earth would you expect me to see? In the case of Lady Ashley, my dear fellow, I notice her elderly husband, her many gallant admirers, and I think, what a motive for murder. Oh, really, Holmes? Holmes, I trust our guest of honor is enjoying himself. Very much indeed, Lady Ashley. Uh, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, may I introduce a very dear friend, Monsieur Jacques Merivaux, who has known me more years than I care to remember. Well, How do you do, sir? Good evening. Yes, I think I can claim to be Lady Ashley's most devoted cavalier, having first made her acquaintance when she was just over two hours old. <laughs> <laughs> she wept bitterly the moment she saw me. Yes, but I've been trying to make up to him for it ever since. During the time we're in Paris, Monsieur Merivaux, I've been promising myself the pleasure of a visit to your famous music shop. You should be honored, Monsieur Holmes. I've heard, of course, that you play the violin. Merely as the veriest amateur. Incidentally, I'm looking forward eagerly to hearing Monsieur Drenko play this evening, Lady Ashley. I was unfortunately out of London during the only recital he gave this season. He's a great artist. Yes, he comes from one of those little countries down the right-hand corner of the map, doesn't he? I always heard the fellow's a bit of a bounder. You have an opportunity to judge at once, Watson. Our host is approaching with a gentleman in question in tow. Oh, Holmes, there you are. Monsieur Dranko has been asking to meet you. Monsieur Dranko, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. How do you do, How do, you do Holmes? Hubert, if you'll excuse me, I must see to our other guests. Until later, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Yes, yes, indeed, of course. Of course. Dr. Watson and I are looking forward to hearing you play, Monsieur Drinko. I always enjoy an appreciative audience. Uh, tell me, Mr. Holmes, might I speak with you alone for a moment? Uh, come along, Mariver. You promised me your opinion on that 83 champagne. No, it's a sound vintage, but I, I find it quite dry. Well, Monsieur Drinko? I said alone, Mr. Holmes. I have no secrets from Dr. Watson. Very well, then. It so happens that I find myself in a slight uh, predicament. I thought that with all your experience, you might advise me. As a social favor, Monsieur Drenko? Gladly. If, of course, you would like to come to the tea at my hotel tomorrow and bring your violin to entertain my guests. I beg your pardon. Oh, <laughs> I understand, Mr. Holmes. We professionals must each respect the other's métier, must we not? It would be preferable. Yes, I told you what sort of fellow he was. Nevertheless, Mr. Holmes, I still ask for your advice, and I will expect to pay the customary fee. You see, I find myself a trifle involved. Only a harmless flirtation, of course, but I did write one or two indiscreet letters to one of the girls at Maxim's, and... Now the greedy little thing threatens blackmail. Hardly an unusual situation, Mr. Drenko. For myself, for my reputation, I do not care, you understand. An artist is an artist. But um, there is my wife at home. I must think of her naturally. You're thinking of her a trifle late, aren't you, man? So you can see there might be unpleasant mm. results if Fufu... Fufu of Maxims? You know her. Oh, we're not unacquainted with a young person, eh, Holmes? Now, from my rather brief acquaintance with her, I think the matter may be settled rather simply. Ah, I shall be happy if you will handle the affair. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The theater anchor, whom we're all very happy to welcome here this evening, will now give us the pleasure of his incomparable music. <laughs> You are, gentlemen. Mademoiselle Frufru's dressing room is right here. Oh, Papa. <laughs> I say, Holmes, did you notice that girl just passed? The one wearing just those little, uh, little thing jigs? Quite. I also noticed, Watson, that backstage at Maxim seems to be one place where you not only see, but also observe very closely. Oh, hello, hello, Monsieur Holmes. Good evening. Oh, I have not expected to see you and that cute little Dr. Watson oh, again so soon. <laughs> but perhaps this time it is pleasure, huh? Not business. Oh, I say not, Mademoiselle Frou-Frou. Mademoiselle Frou-Frou, it was only because I thought the gentleman we have agreed to refer to as uh, Mr. Edwards was at least as culpable as you that I persuaded the French police not to prosecute you in that matter of his mother's jewels. But, Monsieur Holmes, that little matter, we have settled it, uh, have we not? The charge is still pending, mademoiselle, and at a word from me could be followed up. 
But why should I you? I also happen to know that the Marsovian embassy is most curious regarding the attraction which brings Prince Danilo so frequently to Paris. That uh, also does not concern me at the moment. Assuming, of course, that you return at once all the letters that were written to you by Monsieur Drenko and that you cease from molesting him in any way. Oh, mais je comprends très bien. Oh, I see. Well, Monsieur Holmes, uh, since you have put it so convincingly, I am rather tired of listening to a soul fully played violin. Monsieur Drenko may have his letters back. Here they are. Thank you, mademoiselle. I knew you were a sensible girl. Good night. Good night, mademoiselle. And now what? And now for a good night's rest. And in the morning, we can report to Mr. Drinko the satisfactory solution of what was perhaps our simplest problem. Well, I hope you charge him a stiff fee, Holmes. I still say that the fellow's a bounder. Good morning. I think Mr. Drinko is expecting us. Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson... What's the number of his room, please? Click, click. Send a message to the police. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Marivaux, what's the matter? It's Drenko. Well, we're on our way up to see him. He's dead. Killed himself. What? Good heavens. Come, Marivaux. Take us up to his room. The man's been dead for more than an hour, Holmes. Yes, no, not more, more than half an hour. Closer to an hour, I should think. I see Marivaux, would you please ask that chap we passed, uh, the one who was painting the hall, to step in here for a moment? But of course. Curious. I wonder what could have been Drenko's motive in committing suicide. There is a painter, Monsieur Holmes. Ah, yes. Tell me, have you been working there all the morning? Uh, oui, monsieur, ever since eight o'clock. For over two hours, in other words. And were you working constantly in sight of this door? Absolutely, monsieur. I heard the gentleman in here practicing the violin for a little while, but he stopped almost an hour ago. Well, that puts the time of death at just about what I thought, Holmes. And you saw no one enter or leave this room during the entire time? No one. Oh, uh, except five minutes ago this gentleman went into the room. A few seconds later, he came running out calling for the police. Thank you. Your statement has been very clear. You may go now, but better not leave the hotel. No doubt the police will want to question you. Très bien, monsieur. I have never had such a shock in my life, monsieur Holmes. I came up to deliver a new violin that Drenko had ordered. And when I opened the door and saw him lying there, with his face all twisted up in agony... Yes, the common appearance of cyanide poisoning. Not very pretty, I'll admit. You'll note the characteristic odor of bitter almonds, Watson? Yes, indeed. And here's the empty bottle. Quite. The poison label on it removes any possibility of accident. Now, nobody could possibly have got in or out of the, the window with the sheer drop of, of four stories to the street. Look, Monsieur Holmes, this torn piece of paper. I found it here on the desk. It's his suicide note. Evidently written under the stress of considerable emotion, to judge from the writing. Hmm. It is intolerable. I utterly refuse to endure it any longer. Signed, Mihai Drenko. It's his handwriting, Monsieur Holmes. I'd swear to it. Hmm, yes. Unquestionably the perfect setting for suicide. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Well, Monsieur Holmes, a pleasure to meet you again, even if under such unfortunate circumstances. How are you, Inspector Bernard? Nice to see you again, my dear fellow. Oh, oh, thank you, sir. Dr. Watson and I have been carrying on for you until your arrival. Oh, thank you. And uh, may I pick your brains to ask what you have learned? A Marivaux here discovered the body only a few minutes ago when he arrived to deliver a violin Drenko had ordered. The painter you'll find out in the hall has had the room under observation all morning and will assure you that no one else entered or left it. And the fellow stopped practicing about an hour before. Set the time of death pretty accurately. Here's the suicide note, Inspector. I'm afraid we're presenting you with rather an open and, and shut case. Oh, well, Dr. Watson, a hard-working officer like myself welcomes the absence of any uh, mystery. And uh, here's the violin that Drenko was practicing on. Let me see it, Watson. Odd. Very odd indeed. You mean uh, odd that Renko should be practicing the violin until just before he killed himself? No, Inspector. That fact by itself would merely be singular. But listen to the violin on which he was practicing. 
Sounds all right to me. I confess, Monsieur Holmes, that I find no mystery in a man playing the violin just before he killed himself. Perhaps, Inspector, you may then be able to explain why a world-famous violinist like Drinko should do his practicing on a violin that is most unmistakably out of tune. But how should I know what a man would do just before he commits suicide? Suicide? This isn't suicide, Inspector. This is murder. <laughs> Men, once you get bald, there's nothing you can do about it. Science tells us it's impossible to grow hair on bald heads. But you can make the most of the hair you've got. And let me tell you, there's nothing better than Kreml hair tonic to do it. In the first place, Kreml does a marvelous job of hair grooming. It keeps every lock neatly in place, yet never looks greasy or sticky. Kreml contains very special hair grooming ingredients, the like of which have never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. But Kreml does lots more than just keep hair in place. A massage with Kreml helps stimulate circulation of the blood in the surface of the scalp. Your scalp feels so clean, so alive, so invigorated. At the same time, it removes loose dandruff. And if your hair is so dry and brittle that it breaks and falls, remember, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer and more pliable. It also has a grand lubricating effect on a dry scalp. So remember, men, make the most of the hair you've got. Use Kreml Hair Tonic daily. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what happened in that hotel room when Sherlock Holmes told Inspector Bernard that Drenko, the violinist, had been murdered and had not committed suicide? Well, naturally, Inspector Bernard was rather surprised. As a matter of fact, it seemed to me that he was a bit huffy about it all. But, Monsieur Holmes, you cannot fly in the face of all the evidence we see before us. The bottle of poison clearly labeled, the suicide note unquestionably in his own handwriting... Dr. Watson's medical evidence that the man had been dead at least an hour, and the final confirmation of the man painting in the oil who tells us that no one entered or left this room until a few minutes ago. And against all this, Mr. Holmes, what have you to offer? A violin that is out of tune. Ah, zut alors. Nevertheless, Inspector, it is the crux of the entire case. But, Holmes, how can you tell what a fellow like Drenko would have done? I can assure you, Watson, that he would have done almost anything in the world except practice on this violin. No, Inspector, this was murder. I'll stake my reputation on it. Uh, it is only your reputation, Monsieur Holmes, that makes me hesitate at all. Give me 24 hours in which to establish how this murder was done and who did it. Since you ask it, Monsieur Holmes... Very well. Thank you. Come, Watson. We have some busy hours ahead of us. Good day, gentlemen. Good, good day, day. Good day. Good day. And where are we off to in such a hurry, Holmes? The British Embassy. The Embassy? Why on earth? You should... evidently failed to notice during last night's reception that Lady Ashley left us very abruptly the moment Drenko joined our party. Her manner to him venged on rudeness. And that's so unlike Lady Ashley that I feel that an inquiry in that quarter may bear interesting fruit. <laughs> May I ask, Mr. Holmes, the purpose behind this unexpected visit? In just a moment, Sir Hubert. I'd like to have Lady Ashley present yes, when Hubert? I... Yes, Hubert? My maid said you wanted to talk... Why, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. I didn't know you were here. I'm afraid our visit concerns a professional matter, Lady Ashley. You see, Dr. Watson and I have just come from the room of the late Monsieur Drenko. The... the late Monsieur Drenko? I, I don't understand. Drenko has been murdered, Lady Ashley. He... Oh. Quick, Watson, catch her. Cynthia. Uh, she's quite all right. It's nothing but a faint. If you will just ring for your wife's maid, Sir Hubert. Yes, I'll get her at once. I must say, Holmes, you certainly broke the news rather brutally. She took it pretty hard. Nonsense, Watson. What caused her to faint was relief. That was my object. I had to find out what her reaction would be. Here, Annette. You and Mary helped Lady Ashley up to her room. And put her to bed. Oh, we, we must Just you. keep her quiet. A cup of hot tea will do her no harm when she comes round. And now, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me. I'm sorry, Sir Hubert, but I must ask you to remain here with us for a few moments. Well, I, I don't understand. Uh, Sir Hubert, 
Lady Ashley's reaction to the news of Drenko's death was a good deal more pronounced than might be expected in the circumstances. I haven't the faintest idea what you're trying to insinuate. I insinuate nothing. I merely state facts. Would you prefer that I question her? Or will you tell me what lies in back of all this? Very well, Mr. Holmes. But I should like to spare my wife as much as possible. My only interest is in any light that she might be able to shed on the matter. Cynthia is a very young and very beautiful woman. Before we were married, she had... Well, how shall I put it? Uh, fallen under the spell of this man, Drenko. I, I asked her no questions, but I know that he continued to have some strange hold over her. I had the impression that she hated seeing him and that he was forcing his presence on her on those occasions when he was a guest in my house. Yes, I still don't believe anyone killed the fellow, but if someone did, it sounds like a good riddance. Unfortunately, Watson, we are not concerned with the equities of the murder, but with its solution. Thank you, Sir Hubert. You've been extremely helpful. Well, justice must be done, Mr. Holmes. But if ever I wish that your great powers might fail, it is now. I have no hesitation whatsoever in saying that I'm infinitely grateful to the murder of that swine drinker. I say, Holmes, will you join me in a cup of tea? No tea, thanks. I'm rather trusting to the inspiration of music to assist me in resolving some of the more puzzling features of this case. Well, at least you can't complain of a scarcity of suspects. First of all, Sir Hubert, for obvious reasons. Possibly Lady Ashley. Great Scott, Holmes. What's the matter? Tea too hot? No, but have you thought of the possibility that Fru-Fru might have killed Drenko? After all, she might have been mad in love the with him. The possibility and... had occurred to me, but I discarded it. Oh, discarded it. By Jove, look at this glass here on the table. It's positively bright breaking from, from that high note. A not uncommon phenomenon. As you must know, certain objects vibrate in harmony with certain notes. Uh, Watson, huh? get your coat. We oh? promised to pay a visit to Marivaux's shop. I think this would be an ideal time to discharge that obligation. Mm. Dingy little place, I must say. Founded 1821, huh? Looks as though they hadn't washed the window since. But full of priceless treasures. As Marlowe said, infinite riches in a little room. I say, where's Marivaux? I don't like the look of that customer over there, the one with that bushy back beard and theatrical cloak. He looks like one of those bomb-throwing fellows. What you call them, uh, nihilists. You must remember, Watson, that music appeals to oddly assorted people. Well, of course, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Moriarty, after all, knows no peer in his interpretation of certain of the Bach fugues. Well, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson, or is this other gentleman waiting? No, 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 I'm in no hurry. It's no wonder the fame of your shop is worldwide, Monsieur Maribaud. I see you have some remarkable instruments. You see about you the fruits of a lifetime of devotion to the violin. <laughs> I must confess, Monsieur Holmes, that it pains me every time I sell one of my treasures. I can well believe it. And uh, have you made any further progress toward a solution of Drenko's death? I feel safe in saying that my investigation has gleaned a few pertinent facts. Would it uh, be indiscreet for me to ask what they are? Not at all. You yourself were present when I made the curious discovery regarding Drenko's violin being out of tune. And only a short time ago, while I happened to be playing my violin, Dr. Watson made a remark which threw further light on the case. Didn't you, Watson? Huh? Oh, yes, 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 of course. Sir. I don't know what kind of a violin you possess, Monsieur Holmes, but I'm sure you'll appreciate... One magnificent example that I'd like you to try. A Guarnerius. The equal of any strad I've ever seen. I'm afraid it would be far beyond the reach of my poets. But you at least owe yourself the pleasure, the great experience of playing it. Here it is. Isn't it beautiful? Exquisite. If the tone's as mellow as that varnish... But of course. Why don't you take it into my private office and try it? Hmm? No one will disturb you here. Thank you. I have never had the good fortune to test the Guarnerius. Dr. Watson, while Mr. Holmes is amusing himself, perhaps you'll be interested in one of these bows. Bows? Oh, yes, yes. Horsehair thing with you, don't they? Bows. Uh, there's more to it than that. 
There is only one family in all Italy, Dr. Watson, that possesses the great secret of making a bow like this one. Yes, it's all very fascinating, Mr. Mellivore, but Holmes must have made up his mind if he likes that fiddle by now. And I know he wants to ask you some questions. I, he told me that... Uh, good heavens, what on earth? He's lying on the floor. He must have fainted. Holmes! I'm afraid he's dead. Quick, Dr. Watson, go for the police. And give you a chance to plant a bottle of cyanide by my side? <laughs> oh, no. Watson, stay here and listen to Maribel confess how he murdered Drenko. You, you're alive? No, thanks to you. I took the trouble to dissect the violin you gave me and then played one of the others here to lure you in. He killed Drenko? But the suicide note... Elementary, my dear Watson. I would hazard a guess that it was torn from the end of a letter to Maribel referring to an unsatisfactory instrument, which was intolerable and which he couldn't endure any longer. But Holmes, Maribel was nowhere near Drenko when he died. Maribel had left a very oddly constructed violin with Drenko, presumably last night, knowing that it was Drenko's habit to practice each morning from eight till ten. Inside the violin, in place of a sound bar, Maribel had put a thin glass vial containing cyanogen, the lethal gas which is identical in odor and effects with the cyanide. Good heavens! When Drenko reached the proper high note, the extremely thin glass vial cracked under the impact of the sympathetic vibration, releasing the deadly fumes through the F-holes in the violin. And the violin that Maribel was delivering to Drenko when he discovered the corpse... Precisely, the... Watson. He merely left that one by the body, planted the note and carried off the fatal weapon and all proof of the crime in his now empty case. He made only one error. He neglected to tune the violin he left. Amazing, Holmes. I've listened very patiently, Monsieur Holmes, to your ingenious and utterly imaginary reconstruction. I suppose you can furnish a motive, too? I'd prefer to spare Lady Ashley the ordeal, Maribel. But I have no doubt that it was in you she confided that Drenko had been blackmailing her on the strength of their earlier romance. But to convict a man of murder, you need something more than words. You need proof. You seem to be overlooking this dissected violin on your desk, with which you attempted to murder me. I fancy that the sample of your handiwork with the vial of gas affixed therein will offer ample proof... You never send me to the guillotine. I'll kill myself first. But I'm going to take you with Drop me. Drop that vial, Maribel. Precisely what I intend to do. Drop it and release the fumes. They will put a speedy end to all three of us. I've got you, Miss Maribel. Give me that vial if you don't want a broken arm. Ah, uh, there. Much better. Good heavens, it's an analyst. I mean, Inspector Bernard. As you noticed when you commented on his beard and cloak, Watson, the inspector's tastes in disguise are a trifle flamboyant. <laughs> and uh, now, Monsieur Holmes, I must extend my thanks to you on behalf of the Sûreté. Not at all, Inspector. Your promptness in acting in response to my message undoubtedly saved Watson's life and mine. Thank you. Oh, no, Monsieur Holmes. Thank you. Oh, well, have it your way, Inspector. <laughs> And now, Marie come along. Phew. Rather too close a shave to suit me, Holmes. I say, that fellow Marivaux was, was very ingenious. Quite. You know, Watson, I have one bitter regret concerning this case. Regret? I find that I have, despite all my protests, ended by acting for Drenko without a fee after all. <laughs> Just a moment, Dr. Watson will tell us something about next week's story. But first, girls, some of the most beautiful women in the world are Powers models. And one of their outstanding characteristics is their shining bright hair. Now, here's how they keep it shining. Powers models use Cremel shampoo. This amazing, beautifying shampoo has been especially developed to actually glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair. Revealing all its natural, glossy luster. My wife says Cremel shampoo is wonderful for washing children's hair. How about that? Oh, yes, it would be. Because there are no harsh caustics or chemicals in Cremel shampoo. And its luxurious active foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Girls, if you could only see how Powers models hair fairly radiates glossy highlights, I'm sure you'd want to try Cremel shampoo right away. You can get a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell you about the adventure of the Sally Martin. The Sally Martin? She was a boat, Mr. Bell. Oh. A luxurious yacht. Holmes and I entered the case when her owner was found lying dead in his bunk with a knife stuck between his ribs. <laughs> The 
Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Illustrious Client. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting to be, you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the Sally Market. is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Now, once again, it's time to keep our weekly appointment with that incomparable host and storyteller, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting us. Of course I am, Mr. Bell. So come in, draw up your usual chair, and make yourself comfortable. <sighs> ah, that's it. Thank you, Dr. Watson. What story are you planning to tell us tonight? Quite an exciting one, I think. Well, the only relic I have of it is this rather mildewed piece of paper. I came across it just before you arrived as I was going over my notes on the cake. Well, this doesn't look very exciting. It's a hotel bill, and all it says is board and lodging for one week, 28 shillings and sixpence. <laughs> then there's an extra item, one pint of ale not paid for, fivepence. And yet that extra pint of ale was ordered at the very moment when Sherlock Holmes and I entered into one of the weirdest experiences we ever had. I call it the adventure of a Sally Martin. Before you begin the story, Dr. Watson, do you mind if I... Uh... Have a word with our listeners? <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course not, Mr. Bell. Men, if you want a successful, prosperous appearance, don't give your hair that cheap, greasy, plastered-down look. Many products advertise that they don't leave the hair looking or feeling greasy. But let's make this test. Run your hand over your hair. Does your hair feel greasy or sticky? Now look at your hand. Is there a greasy film on it? If there is, then you certainly are not using Kremel hair tonic. Because Kremel positively never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. Kremel contains a very special hair grooming ingredient found in no other hair tonic. It makes dry, unruly hair stay in place longer. Gives it such a nice, healthy-looking luster, too. When you use Kremel, you can run your hand over your hair and no grease comes off. Notice, too, how delightfully clean your hair feels. And just see if the ladies don't like that natural, well-groomed look which Kremel always gives. Try it, men. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the adventure of the Sally Market? Well, the story began many years ago in the tiny fishing village of Kingsgate on the Kentish coast. At my insistence, Sherlock Holmes had agreed to take a much-needed holiday. And we were staying for a few days at a small seaside inn known as the Silver Dolphin. The adventure began, I remember, on a foggy, bitterly cold evening. Holmes and I, after a hearty dinner was seated in the public bar of the inn talking to a garrulous old sailor. Little did we think that even in that peaceful village, dark tragedy was stalking us. Tragedy that very soon was to be brought to our attention. Here you are, Albert. Another pint. Thank you, Condy, sir. Ah. Yes, you are very good health, gentlemen. Oh, amazing capacity. That's the fifth. I can't think where he puts it. I see no mystery there, Watson. Go on with your story, Albert. You just reached the point where the shark had turned on you. Well, gentlemen, I ups on the rail and dives into that raging sea. Pulls out me knife... Oh, really? Uh, where did you get the knife? I thought you said that you'd lost your clothes in the hurricane. Stepped to me middle, I was. But I always kept a barry knife stuck in me belt. Oh, really? How uncomfortable. Well, I see the white belly of the shark turning at me. I let him have it. A rip here. A slash there. Ooh, there was blood all over the place. Never saw such a mess. Uh, Storytelling's very dry work, gentlemen. I'll order you another pint, Albert. Yeah, thank you, can't you, sir? Watson, look who's just come in. Oh, it's our old friend Sergeant Dobson, isn't it? Yes, and judging by his expression, the local representative of the law has serious business on his mind. Good evening, Sergeant. Good evening, Mr. Holmes. Evening, Dr. Watson. How are you, Dobson? Can I have a word with you, private-like? 
course you can. Oh, I beg pardon, sir, but uh, you did say something about buying me another oh, pint. Don't worry, Albert. We'll have it sent over for you. <laughs> Please give Albert another pint, Annie. Put it on my bill. Right you are, Mr. Rose. Perhaps you wouldn't mind stepping into the private bar, gentlemen. Very well. Now, Sergeant, sit down and tell us what's on your mind. Murder, Mr. Holmes. Great Scott. Who? Where? Well, have you gentlemen noticed the fancy sailing boat that's been moored out in the cove this past week? Yes. I was informed that it was owned by George Byron, the Lancashire cotton manufacturer. Uh, that's correct, sir. The boat's named the Sally Martin. And right at this moment, Mr. Byron's lying there in his cabin with a knife in his ribs. Deader than a boiled mackerel. Good gracious me. I rode ashore to send a telegram to the police at Canterbury. But I left a constable to guard the people aboard. Good. I, I'm going back now to conduct my investigation. But the Canterbury police can't be here for morning, and I I was hoping that... That we'd help you, Sergeant? Well, sir, a case like this is a little outside of my experience. Well, just a minute, Dobson. Mr. Holmes is still a sick man. It's cold out and foggy. As his doctor, I forbid... Rubbish. Oh, sorry. How can I stay here in the inn while a murder lies waiting to be solved less than a mile away? Come, Watson. The game's afoot. <laughs> How much further is it, Sergeant? About a, about a quarter of a mile, well, sir. If we don't get there soon, I won't answer for the consequences. I'm a rotten sailor. Cheer up, Watson. In the meanwhile, Sergeant, suppose you give me as many facts as possible. How many people are aboard the Sally Martin? Well, there's three passengers, Mr. Holmes, and, and two in the crew. Well, let's have those passengers first. Well, there's, there's Mrs. Byron, the dead man's wife. A lot younger than him, she is, and... And she looks a bit on the flighty side, if you ask me. Even though she was having a proper fit of hysterics, like. And then there's, there's Clarence Byron, the dead man's brother. And what opinion did you form as to his character? Well, sir, you understand I didn't talk to him much. But he acted cool as a cucumber, just, just as if murder didn't mean a thing to him. And the third passenger? Well, he's a young fella by the name of Hodgson. Secretary to the dead man. Very nicely spoken gentleman he is. But it seemed to me as if Mrs. Byron had quite an eye for him, even, even through her tears. That's why I said she seemed flighty-like. You're very observant, Sergeant. Oh, it's, it's just training, sir. How about the two crew members? Well, there's, there's Captain Small. He seemed perfectly above board. And a, a man by the name of Coggins. Arthur Coggins. He's a, he's a deckhand. And a mighty surly one at that. <laughs> He gave me quite a bit of back chat when I questioned them. Holmes, how much further is it? Barely a hundred yards, old chap. Oh, I feel awful. Do hurry up. Move over, Sergeant. Let me take an oar. There's the murdered man, Mr. Holmes. That's just how we found him. Very illuminating. Look at that murderous knife. It's buried to the hilt in his chest. Yes, but more interesting than the knife at the moment is the tableau presented in this cabin. What story does it tell you, Watson? Very simple story. Somebody opened the cabin door, came in, and stabbed him. Oh, come now. Surely our years together have made you a little more perceptive than that. Well, that's what you're driving at? Well, for one thing, in his right hand is an open book. Oh, been reading? Yes, and the sergeant has told us that the oil lantern beside his bunk was still burning when the body was found. Oh, that's right, Mr. Holmes. There's no sign of a struggle. The bedclothes are in there and even rumpled. No cry for help was heard, so let us reconstruct the scene. Mr. Byron was lying in his bunk, reading, as you observed, Watson. Oh, quite easy. The door opens. The murderer comes in, the knife hidden in his or her clothing. The victim has no suspicion of his fate because the murderer was someone who could enter his cabin at will. And suddenly, the fatal blow is struck. Then it must have been one of the three passengers. I think we may reasonably include the captain. The master of a schooner surely would have the ability to enter his employer's cabin without creating suspicion. Oh, you're right, Mr. Holmes. I think we've seen enough here, Sergeant. Where are the passengers? In their cabin, sir. I told them to wait there until they were sent for. The main saloon's empty. You could see them in there nice and private-like. Splendid. Then let's go there. At once. <laughs> Mrs. Byron, my friend's only trying to help you. Oh, how can he help me? 
He can't bring poor George back to life again, can he? No, madam. <laughs> but at least I can try to find his murderer for you. He's right, ma'am. So take it easy, like, and answer his questions. Very well. Uh, what do you want to know, Mr. Holmes? Can you suggest anyone who might have had the motive for murdering your husband? Oh, half a dozen men. George made a lot of money. He was a hard businessman. He had many enemies. But none of his business enemies had an opportunity of killing him tonight. His biggest enemy, though I never could make him believe it, is on this very boat now. His brother, Clarence. Biggest enemy? His own brother? Oh, come, come, it's come, true. madam. It's true. Clarence sponged on him. That's done for years. And ever since our marriage, George, he's tried to be more friendly to me than a brother-in-law should be. Mm -hmm. Just because I was once in the theatre, he seems to think I didn't know how a lady Oh, you, you were in the theatre? I wonder if you knew a girl who was daily's for little finger. Name Watson, was, uh... surely this is no time for your theatrical reminiscences. Oh, well. Mrs. Byron, are you familiar with the terms of your husband's will? Everything he has comes to me. Huh? Well, that's perfectly natural, isn't it? Perfectly. But in that case, your brother-in-law would hardly seem to profit from your husband's death. I don't know what you're suggesting, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Do you think I stabbed him? <laughs> I wouldn't have had the strength. Mrs. Byron, I suggested nothing. But I'm interested to notice that you answer your questions as well as ask them. Well, I'm not staying here to answer any more questions, Mr. Holmes. I'm going back to my cabin. If you want me, that's where you'll find me. No, wait a minute, ma'am. Let her go, Sergeant. And please ask Mr. Hodgson, the secretary, to come in here. Just as you say. Well, her upon the soul, she's a fine little thing, isn't she? <laughs> That's attractive, too. What do you make of her, Holmes? It's hard to say. If one wished to adduce motive, it would be easy. Well, she must be 25 years younger than her husband. And uh, a fortune coming to her. It is death, eh? Precisely. And despite her own statement, a woman would have the strength to stab an unsuspecting man to death. Here's Mr. Hodgson, sir. Thank you, Sergeant. Please sit down, Mr. Hodgson. Yes, Mr. Holmes. This is a shocking business. It is indeed, my boy. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Any questions you like. When did you last see your employer tonight? Mm, shortly after dinner, Mr. Holmes. He was taking a turn round the deck. We chatted for a few minutes, and then I went to my cabin and retired. It was about 9.30 or quarter to ten. You heard no cry for help? No shout in the night? No, none. The first I knew of the tragedy was when the captain awakened me. Can you suggest who might have had a motive for his murder? Mr. Holmes, that's... that's a little hard to answer. Come now, Mr. Hodgson, don't hold anything back. You'll have to talk in a court of law, you know. Yes, I suppose so. Well, gentlemen, in my capacity as secretary, I did know that my employer's brother, Clarence, has been borrowing heavily. Only yesterday morning I was compelled to draw my employer's attention to an irregularity in the monthly bank statement. A 500-pound check had been drawn. The signature was a forgery. And you think that Clarence Byron committed that forgery? Yes, I do, sir. And so did my employer. The two brothers had a terrible row about it. Uh, Sergeant, will you be good enough to ask Mr. Clarence Byron to come here, please? Right you are, Mr. O. One very personal question, Mr. Hodgson. Was the relationship between you and your employer's wife a purely social one? As a matter of fact, Mrs. Byron has been very kind to me. Oh, really? Well. My family are dead, and she's taken an interest in me. But I give you my word that it's been purely platonic. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Sergeant Hobson. Mr. Clarence Byron's lying in his bunk, sir. He says he can't come here. He's got a heart attack. A heart attack? That's rather convenient, eh, Holmes? Yes, Watson. And it's also convenient that there's a doctor aboard. Let's go and see him, shall we? <laughs> Feel any better, Mr. Byron? Yes. Yes, I do, Doctor. That injection you gave me helped. It was did you tell us, I suppose? No, it wasn't. Holmes' his heart perfectly sound. He was simulating an attack. So I gathered. Since an injection of plain water apparently gave him immediate relief. Plain water? Yes, your heartbeat was full and regular, and your color normal. So I decided to try an experiment. And a very successful one. Why did you pretend to have a heart attack, Mr. Byron? I, I wasn't pretending. I do have a bad heart. That I don't doubt. Only a bad heart could prompt you to swindle your brother and then murder him. I didn't murder him. Though, uh, I can tell you who did. Oh? You are very eager to shift suspicion, Mr. Byron. Who, in your opinion, murdered your brother? It's that deckhand, Arthur Coggins. Only a few days ago he threatened my brother's life. You heard him make the threat? Yes, I did. It was his second day aboard. It was early in the morning, and I was strolling on deck when I came on this man Coggins, who was standing by the mainmast, practicing throwing a knife. Uh, 
You're pretty handy with a knife, Coggins. What's that? I said you're pretty handy with a knife. Yes. I know how to use a knife. You uh, think you're going to like being on this ship? No. Not if I don't get treated like a human being. Just yesterday, the owner yells out to me, Yeah, you, whatever your name is, treating me like dirt. Whatever your name is. Can't he find out my name? I'm as good as he is. One of these dark nights, he'll get what's coming to him. That's what he said, Mr. Holmes. And he looked as if he meant business. He's an expert with a knife, you say. Holmes, do you think it's possible that Coggins threw the knife through a porthole into the dead man's cabin? Yes, Watson, it's possible. Your story was interesting, Mr. Byron, though, of course, entirely uncorroborated. I think we'll go and talk to the captain and see if he can supplement your information. Well, Mr. Holmes, I, I can't answer for the passengers. That's no business of mine. I appreciate that, Captain Small. But you'll answer for your crew, no doubt. That I will, sir. And this man Coggins is a no good if ever I saw one. Insubordinate, surly, always talking about how he's as good and better than those who employ him. Then why did you engage him, Captain? I didn't, sir. That was arranged by my employer, Mr. George Barron. If I had my way, Coggins would have gone back ashore the first day he stepped aboard. Where are his... Great Scott, is that a revolver shot? Well, it sounded like it, and it came from the forecastle. Mr. Holmes! Mr. Holmes! This way, Sergeant. Good heavens! Why, it's Coggins! With a smoking revolver in his right hand. He's committed suicide. Yes. Very convincing, isn't it? His head is sprawled on a piece of fool's cap. A confession note, no doubt. Yes, it is. Look at this. I killed him, and with my record, I knew you'd catch me, so I took the quick way out. Case is solved, Holmes. On the contrary, Watson, it's becoming more involved. If you look closely, you will realize that we now have two murders to solve instead of one. And somewhere on this boat, a murderer is still at large, and may strike a third time. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll find out if the murderer does strike a third time. But first, men, if you're bald, you might as well grin and bear it, because science tells us it's impossible to grow hair where the hair roots are dead. But you certainly can make the most of the hair you've got. And men, you can't beat Kreml hair tonic. To help you, Kreml contains very special hair grooming ingredients found in no other hair tonic. That's why Kreml keeps hair neatly in place longer and without that offensive, greasy look. But Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Let me repeat, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A massage with Kreml helps stimulate circulation right in the surface of the scalp. Your scalp feels so alive, so invigorated. At the same time, it removes loose dandruff and has a fine lubricating effect on a dry scalp. And for hair that's so dry that it cracks and falls, remember Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer and more pliable. Men, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. It's such a nice, clean product, you can use it every day so that your hair always looks its best. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Hair Tonic. <laughs> So, Dr. Watson, the apparent suicide turned out to be another of the murderer's victims. Yes, Mr. Bell. Holmes at once sent Sergeant Dobson to check the passengers while the three of us stood in that tiny cabin, an oil lamp swinging above us and shedding a strange glow on the macabre scene. I asked him why he was so positive that it wasn't suicide. You will notice, Watson, that the revolver is in Coggins' right hand. Yes, Holmes, I don't see what... Then the... ignore the right hand and observe the left. A deck hand is accustomed to hard manual labor. Notice the calluses on his left hand and the freedom from them on the right. By Jove, he was left-handed. Yes, he, he was, Mr. Holmes. I, I, I've noticed him at work. Again, you'll observe the shot entered his head from behind the right ear. A remarkable feat of dexterity for a left-handed man. And the murderer had the note ready, shot Coggins from behind, but made the mistake of placing the revolver in the wrong hand. Precisely. But this note, obviously in disguised writing, poses another problem. 
What does the phrase, and with my record, I knew you'd catch me, mean? He must have had a police record. But why volunteer the information? I wonder if the murderer had a reason. Captain, you said that Cockins was engaged by Mr. George Byron. Well, sir, he told me about the new man, but I don't know that he interviewed him personally. Where was he engaged? At the Seaman's Hostel, uh, here in the village. What are you getting at home? Surely it's obvious, Watson. If this man Coggins had a police record, his murderer might have deliberately placed him on this boat knowing he would be suspected. Yes, yes, it's possible. But the question is, who engaged him? Well, Sergeant? All three of them in their cabins, Mr. Holmes, and swore they hadn't left them. And yet we know that one of them must have slipped down here and shot Coggins? Lock them in their cabins, Sergeant. Keep good watch on them. Dr. Watson and I are going ashore. Ashore? Why, Holmes, when the murderer's here on this boat? Because I'm convinced that the clue to his identity lies waiting for us at the Seaman's Hostel. Where is the place, Sergeant? And who runs it? Old Ma Jenkins. It's the house just next to the Red Lion on the quayside. Splendid. Watson, we're taking this note and rowing ashore. Another trip in that filthy rowing boat? Must we, Holmes? It's a fine time of night to rootle a respectable woman out of a warm bed, I must say, and no mistake. But, Mrs. Jenkins, Call you Call me Ma. Everyone calls me Ma. Very well. We've come to you because you're the one person who can help solve two murders that took place on the Sally Martin tonight. Murder? Come into me parlor. I light the lamp. There. Now, what's this you say happened to bother the Sally Martin? The owner, Mr. Barron, was stabbed to death about ten o'clock tonight. Later on, a seaman by the name of Arthur Coggins was killed, too. Arthur was killed. You knew this man, Arthur Coggins? Of course I knew. Over a year he's been staying with me. He couldn't get a ship because of his record. What record was that? He brought his ship's papers to me. They all do when they're out of a berth. The last ship he was on two years ago, it was. He got mixed up in a knife fight. Oh, did he? Alaska was killed and Arthur arrested. They couldn't prove he was guilty, but he hasn't had a birth since because it was written in his papers. Uh, That fits into your theory, Holmes. The murderer engaged him deliberately, knowing his record. Exactly. Mrs. uh, Ma. That's me. Do you recall the name of the man who interviewed Coggins? No. The man who engaged him for the Sally Martin? Uh Uh-uh. No. But, but it's here in my book. It's the last entry I made. Uh, here it is. Clarence Byron. The brother. There's our man, Holmes. Could you describe the appearance of Mr. Byron, Ma? No, I, I can't say I remember much about it. He was all muffled up. He was a nice-spoken gentleman, though. You can recall no clue to his identity? It's uh, worth a sovereign to you, if you can. A sovereign? Well, let me think of it. Y- yes, there's one thing I do remember. He had a gold signet ring on his right hand. Splendid, Ma. Watson, the case is solved. Of course it is. Clarence is the man. May I congratulate you on your powers of observation, Watson? Ma, here are two sovereigns for you. Two? But you the said... The extra one is for the privilege uh, of borrowing this uh, registry book of yours for a few uh, hours. <laughs> no. I'm taking it back to the Sally Martin with us so that we may compare the handwriting in it with that of a murderer. <laughs> But this is ridiculous, Mr. Holmes. Why should you ask Clarence to sign his name? Bear with me a few moments longer, Mrs. Byron, and you'll see why. Lest if I know what you're up to, Mr. Holmes, I know. A little patience, Sergeant, and you'll see, too. Have you any objection to signing your name, Mr. Byron? I uh, suppose not, though I'm just as confused as the rest of them. There. Thank you. And now, Mr. Hodgson, I wonder if you'd mind helping us. Of course not, Mr. Holmes. What can I do? You saw the forged check. I wonder if you'd try and imitate the signature that Mr. Clarence Byron has just written. Mr. Byron's signature? Yes, his writing is extremely individual, but I think you could help prove that under certain circumstances it can be elastic. See how nearly you can imitate it. I think it'll help us to prove that he murdered his brother. Clarence, you did murder George. I knew it. Mabel, you're out of your mind. Will you copy his signature, Mr. Hodgson? Of course, if you think it'll help you. Holmes, Holmes, look, Shh, Hodgson. Sign, please, Mr. Hodgson. Clarence Byron. There. Thank you. That's a remarkably fine gold signet ring you're wearing, Mr. Hodgson. Thank you. 
Watson, give me Mar Jenkins' register book. There you are, Holmes. Sergeant, I want you to compare the signature in this book with that which Mr. Hodgson has just given us. I think you'll agree that they're both written by the same man. They are. Well, blow me down. So he forged Clarence's signature. Exactly. He is quite a specialist in handwriting. Albert, you didn't kill him. You couldn't have done it. It's no good, Mabel, and you know it as well as I do. You knew what I was up to. You helped me. <gasps> you suggested that I use Clarence's name. That's a lie. It's a lie or not, Sergeant, I suggest you take out your notebook. They're talking in front of witnesses, so make the most of the fact. <laughs> The sun's coming up, Watson. Uh, yes, the, the sea's calmer, Hingham. A very satisfactory start to a new day. Confessed murderer and his accomplice, both of them safely in the care of the police. Yes, I was convinced until we found him murdered that Coggins, the, the deckhand, was the guilty body. Exactly what you were meant to think. I thought that uh, as he was an expert knife thrower, he could have thrown one through a porthole into the dead man's cabin. No, Watson. Both portholes were at the head of the bunk. But the knife wound was from the underside of the heart and upwards. It would have been impossible to have thrown the knife through a porthole at such an angle. Yes, yes, I can see it all now. Young Hodgson, coveting his employer's wife, planned a knife murder and then engaged Coggins, knowing that with his record, he'd be the logical suspect. Yes, but like so many murderers, he tried to be too clever. He left enough clues to hang himself half a dozen times over. Why did Clarence pretend to have that heart attack? The nervousness of a person who knows himself to be under suspicion... A futile attempt to escape interrogation. Well, I'm glad it's all over. I'm exhausted and I'm frozen. And I'm delighted to think that this is my last trip in this horrible rowing boat. Whereas I'm feeling very stimulated. And in a distinctly altruistic mood. Altruistic? What do you mean, Holmes? If you'll observe the flurry of excitement at the quayside, the figures in blue surge that are at this moment embarking in boats, you'll realize that the police from Canterbury have just arrived. Well, I still don't see how altruism comes into the picture. I intend to claim no credit in the solution of this crime. And in consequence, I see little reason why our old friend Sergeant Dobson should not very soon be known as Inspector Dobson. <laughs> In just a moment, Dr. Watson will tell us something about next week's story. But first, girls, if you want to really make a hit with a boyfriend, here's a beauty tip right out from here in Hollywood. And one which lovely Powers models were among the first to discover. Give your hair a ten-minute glamour bath with Cremel Shampoo. This amazingly beautifying shampoo has been especially developed so that it actually brings out all the brilliant, natural luster of each tiny strand of hair. Cremel Shampoo leaves the hair fairly teeming with highlights. And don't forget, Cremel Shampoo is wonderful for the entire family. Yes, even in the hardest water, it whips up gobs of rich, luxurious foam, which penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. So, ladies, buy the large family size of Cremel Shampoo. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel Shampoo, the largest selling shampoo with an oil base. Now, Dr. Watson... What about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week. Next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes solved a murder with only one clue. The depth to which the parsley had sunk in the butter on a hot summer's day. I call this bizarre adventure the strange death of Mrs. Abernethy. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Rygate Puzzle. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the strange death of Mrs. Abernethy. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Well, 
Well, once again, it's time to join our good friend and host, Dr. Watson, as he waits for us in his familiar study. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Well, are you all set for tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? Yes, my boy, I'm all set, as you put it. I was looking over my notes on the case before you arrived, and I came across this. It played an extremely prominent part in tonight's story. Well, what is it, Dr. Watson? Looks like a dried leaf of some kind. In its younger days, Mr. Bell, it was a sprightly sprig of parsley. <laughs> oh, Dr. Watson, I know you have the habit of collecting odd mementos from your cases, but a sprig of parsley... And yet, my boy, this withered piece of greenery enables Sherlock Holmes to solve one of the most diabolical murders that we ever encountered. The strange death of Mrs. Abernethy. Well, this I've got to hear, but first of all... Oh, I know, Mr. Bell, I know you have a message for our listeners. <laughs> Every man who wants to get to the top should realize how much neatly groomed hair adds to a man's appearance. And I'm sure he'll be interested in hearing how so many of America's most prosperous and successful men keep their hair looking so attractive. They use Kreml hair tonic. And it's easy to see why. Because Kreml contains precious hair grooming ingredients found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. It keeps it in place longer, too. Yet Kreml never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. Never leaves it feeling stiff as a board. Just make this test, men. After you apply Kreml, run your hand back over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. Notice how no grief grease comes off on your hand. Your hair always looks like a million and feels like a million when you use Kreml. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson... How about the mystery of the withered parsley and the strange death of Mrs. Abernethy? Well, Mr. Bell, at the time I'm talking about, this parsley, just like myself, was a great deal younger. Oh, ho, ho, ho. But to, to get on with my story, Holmes had just concluded his amazing investigation in the affair of the Reading Bicycle Pump murder. And we decided to stay for a few days in the nearby beautiful village of Pangbourne. The weather was surprisingly generous for an English summer, and on our second day, Holmes and I had gone for a stroll along the towpath of the River Thames. Holmes was in an extremely morose mood that day, I remember, as we walked back towards our hotel. Ah, oh, the country's beautiful here, Holmes. Yes, I suppose it is. Oh, come, come. Look at the red and grey roofs of the cottages. And the farms peeping out through the trees over there. So peaceful and, and soothing. I'm afraid it has the reverse effect on me, Watson. That's the curse of having a mind like mine. Oh, how do you mean, Holmes? I observe everything with reference to my own special subject. You look at those scattered houses and are impressed by their peace and beauty. I look at them and think how easily crime may be committed there. Good Lord, who'd associate crime with a spot like that? It's my opinion, Watson, based on experience, that the lowest and vilest alleys in London do not present a more dreadful record of sin than does the smiling countryside. What a morbid thought. The reason is obvious. The pressure of public opinion can do in the city what the law cannot accomplish. There's no lane so dark that the scream of a tortured child or the thud of a drunkard's blow does not obtain sympathy and help from some neighbor. But look at these lonely houses. Think of the deeds of hellish cruelty, the hidden wickedness, which may go on year in, year out in such places and no one the wiser. Oh, upon my soul, Holmes, you're in a particularly depressing mood. Hello, hello, hello. Look at this fellow running towards us. Must be crazy. Imagine galloping along a towpath on a hot day like this. And from his expression, I think we may reasonably assume that he's not doing it for the exercise. Excuse me, Excuse me but if, is uh, one of you gentlemen Dr. Watson? Yes, sir, I am. And this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Oh, how do you do, sir? Holmes? How do you do? Uh, my name is Gareth Abernethy. I heard that you were staying in the village. I went to your hotel and uh, they told me that you'd uh, gone for a walk in this direction. I presume you need a doctor's help. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, Dr. Watson, I know you're on a holiday, oh, but... Oh, well, to... naturally, I'm at your service, sir. What, what is wrong? No, perhaps we could start walking back to the inn. Uh, my horse and trap are there, and uh, I'll tell you about it as we go. My, uh, my mother's just had a bad heart attack. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. live at Homeby Grange, a few miles out of the village. I'd, uh, I'd like to drive you out there at once, but Doctor. But surely, if you live here, you must have a, a family doctor. Well, he's in London for a few days. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, tell me, Mr. Abernethy, uh, what were the symptoms of your, your mother's heart attack? Well, she she said she was taking her usual nap before lunch. 
She started to go to sleep and uh, and suddenly woke up crying that she was she was going to die. Said her heart seemed to stop beating entirely for a few moments. Well, has she had these attacks before? Well, I can't tell you much about it. The family says that for her age, she's been in very good health. Uh, I've been abroad for a few years. In China, I observe, Mr. Abernethy. Yes. Yes, I went out there as a war correspondent covering the Boxer Rebellion. But uh, uh, how did you know? The fish that you have tattooed immediately above your right wrist could only have been done in China. That trick of staining the fish's scale a delicate pink is quite peculiar to that country. That's amazing, Mr. Holmes. Oh, it's not so amazing as all that. It's just a certain facility for observation, sir. For instance, from what you told me of, of your mother's symptoms, I should say that her lips are bluish, that she runs out of breath when walking upstairs, and the veins in her cheeks are unusually pronounced. <laughs> I begin to think I've met a pair of magicians. Oh, why? Uh, but you're right, Doctor. <laughs> I see I put you on your metal, Watson. How did you deduce that? Elementary, my dear Holmes, the symptoms that Mr. Abernethy uh, described were typical of mitral constriction. I shall be delighted to examine your mother and do whatever I can for her. I'm very grateful, Doctor. You're in good hands, Mr. Abernethy. Well, Watson, I shall see you later, no doubt. This is one case in which I'm sure you need no help from me. Dr. Watson, I'm not much of a one for doctors. Stick out your tongue and give me a guinea. That's what most of them say. <clears throat> well, what's your verdict? Well, that there's nothing seriously wrong, Mrs. Abernethy. Just take these drops I'm giving you before each meal and you'll be well in no time. Uh, Lizzie? Yes, ma'am? You heard what the doctor said. Now try and stop your wool gathering long enough to see that I get those drops. Yes, sir. I won't forget. Ah, you'd forget your own name if the butcher's boy was to ring the bell, though, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. I mean, no one. You can leave the room, Lizzie. Yes, sir. Oh, I think you should rest for a while, Mrs. Abernethy. Plenty of time for rest at my age, Doctor. Anyway, I want to talk to you privately. That's why I sent Lizzie out of the room. I want you to bring your friend Sherlock Holmes here to lunch tomorrow. Sherlock Holmes? But how did you know that... That uh... he was in the village? Uh, there's nothing new in the village or anywhere else going on here that I don't know about, Doctor. Now, will you bring him? I've got something very important to discuss with oh, him. Well, ma'am, I don't think of the oh. state of your heart that you... Oh, what was that filthy what? medicine you gave me? Oh. It's made me sleepy. Well, that was its purpose, madam. Uh, my family think I'm going to die. They're waiting for it. Hoping for it. Oh, rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. You're not going to die, madam. We'll fool them, doctor, won't we? We'll fool them. Oh, oh who is Now, it? now, now, Mrs. Abernethy. I'll go to the door. Oh, Doctor, I came to see how Granny was getting along. I'm Rose Abernathy. Oh, I'm Dr. Watson. How do you do, my dear? Oh, who is it, Doctor? It's me, Granny. I came to see how you are. Take the doctor downstairs, Rose. Give him some tea and introduce him to the rest of the family. He's got bad news for them. I'm going to live. <laughs> Uncle Gareth, will you introduce Dr. Watson, please? Of course, my dear Rose. And I appreciate your motive in giving me the privilege. A, a, a shy, retiring girl like yourself would hardly dare make such a descriptive introduction as I will. Uncle Gareth, you've been drinking again. Well, since I was the only member of this heartless Abernethy clan that had the initiative to go and get a doctor, I think I was entitled to a brandy or two. Oh, oh c come on, Watson. Uh, come and meet my noble brothers. They're here in the library, waiting like hopeful vultures for bad news about our dear mother's health. Oh, really, sir, I think perhaps some other time... Oh, no, 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 no. M might as well get it over with. I'm sorry, Dr. Watson. I didn't know I could have been drinking. Oh, that's quite all right, my dear child. Uh, Dr. Watson, uh, let me introduce my brother, 
Ernest. How do you do? How are you, Dr. Watson? Uh, since the success of Oscar Wilde's recent comedy of manners, Ernest has been unbearable. I, I think he took its title too literally. I suppose you're referring to the importance of being Ernest. Well, as you see, Doctor, my brother is a brilliant wit, and Brandy sharpens his perceptions even more. He's been known to launch a whole string of leaden epigrams in the course of one evening. Yes, and he's been known to do an honest day's work in his life, which is more than you can say, my dear Ernest. Darius, I'm sure Dr. Watson has no desire to listen to our dreary wrangling. Why not introduce him to John? I'm going to. Uh, Watson, uh, this is my other brother, John Abernethy. How do you do, sir? How do you do, Doctor? John is the respectable member of the family. He manages the estates here, and at least has the unique distinction of having worked for the money he gets from Mother. Shouldn't talk like this in front of a stranger, Gareth. Bad form, you know. Yes, Uncle Gareth. Dr. Watson's come here to tell us about Granny. Oh, and then let's hear the verdict. It means much more to us than you could possibly imagine, I can assure you. Well, I examined Mrs. Abernethy very thoroughly, considering her age. I'm glad to say that her condition is quite good. I've prescribed you to tell us for her, and she should pull through very nicely. In fact, I see no reason why she shouldn't live to be a hundred. Oh, Uncle Ernest, that was one of our nicest wine glasses. <laughs> look at us, Watson. You give us the best possible news, and look at our faces. Don't you realize that this whole family is waiting for one thing? My mother's death? I tell you, Holmes, it was perfectly nauseating. I must say they sound like a peculiarly unattractive family. Well, except the granddaughter Rose, she's a sweet little thing. But the others are a bunch of good-for-nothings. Undoubtedly. And yet my reaction to what you've told me is one of intense curiosity. As I remarked earlier today, the quiet countryside beneath its external beauty cloaks some of the vilest happenings. Well, I admit the atmosphere in that household is vile, all right. And think of the potential tragedy smoldering there. A wealthy matriarch who controls the purse strings. Four relations living there and praying for one thing, her death. No, Watson, with such a setting, my curiosity is overpowering. Then you will call on her? If you think she's in good enough condition to see me. Attempts may have already been made on her well, life. Normally, I'd suggest postponing it for a day or two, but if you think that she's in danger, Quite. I feel... Watson, tomorrow we shall call upon the lady and see what can be done to help her. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mrs. Abernethy? Before we go into lunch, I should like to tell you why I asked you to come here today. And I want my family to know, too. Children, I want your attention. Oh, Mother, not another lecture, surely. No, Ernest, not a lecture. Merely a statement of fact. I have asked Mr. Sherlock Holmes here today because he is a detective. <laughs> a detective? What's the matter, Mother? Has someone pinched the family silver? Gareth, be quiet. Now, 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 please don't excite yourself, madam. Remember that heart of yours. Yes, Granny, do be careful. Oh, stop fussing over me, Rose, and sit down. Gareth, you mentioned the family silver. How did you know that's what I was going to speak about? Oh, Mother, I was only joking. Were you? Strange joke. Mr. Holmes, I discovered a few days ago that the Abernethy silver has been stolen piece by piece and replaced by imitations. How do you know, Mrs. Abernethy? I recently had occasion to have some of our silver knives repaired. The blades were loose in the handles. The London jeweler to whom I sent them reported that they were not the family silver, but plated imitations. I had him come down here and examine the rest of the set. They're frauds. I want you to find out who's responsible. I know it's one of these four children. That's ridiculous, Mother. Why suggest that one of us is responsible? Because I know your children too well. Personally, I think it's what you deserve, Mother. How dare you? I'm not dependent on you, Mother, but the others are. You've kept them dangling too long. Look at you, Rose. You're still young. Are you going to stay here another 20 years waiting for your grandmother to die? Get it. Leave her home. Now, now, please, Mrs. Abernethy. Lunch oh. is served, ma'am. Oh, Oh, I love you! Quick, Watson! She's having Doctor. another attack! Out of the room, everybody, please! Oh, Doctor Hill! No, 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 don't worry, Mrs. Avenue. You're going to be quite all right. Oh. Are you feeling better, Mrs. Avenue? Yes, Mr. Holmes, I am. Uh, did you tell us? Soon pulled you round, didn't it? 
You must remember not to take another dose until this evening. In the meanwhile, I think you'd better go and lie down. No, Doctor. I want to go into lunch. And afterwards, I have something else to tell you, Mr. Holmes. Something I don't intend the family to hear. And it's much more significant than stealing silver. Mrs. Abernethy, I think if you were to tell me your real problem now, simply and directly, a great deal of time and patience might be saved. After lunch, Mr. Holmes. Doctor! Give me your arm. Excellent lunch, I must say. Mm, And the conversation has had all the sparkle and gaiety of a funeral oration. Well, since you've entirely monopolized the conversation, Gareth, that's not very surprising. Stop the wrangling, you two. Got guests. Bad form, you know. Uh, Mr. Holmes, do you care for some more coffee? Thank you, Mrs. Abernethy. I'd like another cup. Uh, Granny, what's wrong? Your hand's shaking so. Uh, Doctor! Granny! Quick, Dr. Watson! Mrs. Abernethy! Ah! Don't be with Mother. Holmes! Be good, Carol. She's dead. No! Then I must assume a different mission than the one I came here to perform. I suggest that you all leave this room. And that one of you sends a servant for the police. Murder has just been committed before our eyes. Murder? But Holmes, she died of a heart attack. When death is so intensely desired by four persons present? No, Watson. I'm afraid I can't assume a verdict of natural death. In proof, I suggest you notice the depth to which that parsley has sunk in the butter. I repeat, send for the police. Oh, no. Before we find out what the police discover, men, once you get bald, there's nothing you can do about it. But it's never too early to make the most of the hair you've got. That's why I urge you to try Cremel Hair Tonic. Cremel contains very special hair grooming ingredients which have never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. Cremel keeps the hair in place longer, always looking so neat and well-groomed, never greasy or sticky. But this highly specialized hair tonic does lots more than just keep the hair looking handsome. A quick massage with Kreml helps stimulate circulation right in the surface of the scalp, leaving your scalp feeling so alive, so invigorated. At the same time, Kreml removes loose dandruff and has a fine lubricating effect on a dry scalp. And if your hair is dry and breaks and falls, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer, more pliable. Men, I'm sure you'll enjoy the way Kreml always feels so clean on your scalp, looks so clean on your hair, and has such a clean odor. How it helps give you such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. Buy a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, I begin to see what you mean about that withered sprig of parsley. But I still don't understand what it had to do with the death of the old lady. Oh, more did I, Mr. Bell, at the time, but Sherlock Holmes soon explained it to me. As soon as the family left the dining room and the police had been sent for, Holmes and I stood together in that room of death, examining the dining room table. Yes, Watson. I'm certain that she was poisoned before our eyes. But how, Holmes? You'll admit that in her condition a double dose of digitalis would have been fatal? Possibly, yes, but she didn't have an overdose. I gave her some before we came into lunch and told her not to take her usual dose at the table. And she didn't take it. Not consciously, Watson, but I'm convinced that she received another dose in her food. How? She didn't eat the roast lamb that the rest of us had? She simply had two lightly boiled eggs. She cracked them open herself. They couldn't have been poisoned. But she put butter in her eggs. Large quantities of butter. We all ate butter from the same dish, Holmes. True. But once again, I ask you to observe the significant fact. The depth to which the parsley has sunk in the butter. The parsley hasn't sunk perceptibly at all. That, my dear Watson, is the significant fact. Oh, beg your pardon, sir. As you said, as all you thought something was wrong with the lunch. I'm the cook. Something was very wrong with the lunch, my good woman. Oh, I'm sorry. And I hear as our Mr. Abernethy has been took with another of our spells. Yes, she has. Tell me, was this table laid for lunch at one o'clock? Yes, sir, it was. But you didn't come in till half an hour later. While Mrs. Abernethy's attack delayed us in the drawing room, did anyone come through the kitchen into this room? No, sir. Lizzie and me would have seen them if they had. And when you set the table, you placed this butter here? Yes, sir. As you see, it's garnished with parsley. Did you do that? 
No, sir, I didn't. That's funny. Who could have put that on there? Well, Joe Holmes, uh, you're right. But the roast of lamb was, was garnished with parsley, wasn't it? Yes, sir, it was. Splendid. I'm much obliged to you. I hope the mistress finds better soon, sir. Watson, I'm going to take that butter to the village, chemist shop, and have it analyzed. While I'm doing that, I want you to conduct an experiment of your own. What do you want me to do? Obtain a fresh quantity of butter from the kitchen. Place a sprig of parsley on top of it and see how far in half an hour it sinks in. Ridiculous way of spending my time, I must say. Nevertheless, Watson, I think the experiment may give us the vital clue to the murder. Well, Holmes, and what did you find out at the chemist? It was as I suspected, Watson. The butter was thoroughly impregnated with digitalis. And yet we all ate some of it. True. It would not produce any effect on a normally healthy person. In the case of Mrs. Abernethy, however, two doses in quick succession were fatal. Great Scott. What was the result of your experiment, old chap? Well, in half an hour on a blazing hot day like this, parsley sinks quite noticeably into the butter. Therefore, it was placed there shortly before we came in late to lunch. Not when the table was set. But what was the motive? The butter had been shaped by a mold. It was patterned on the top. The murderer used a hypodermic needle to inject the digitalis, and he had to hide the holes made by the needle. So he took the parsley from the roast and placed it on the butter. Who? Who had the opportunity? That's what we have to find out. Have the police arrived? Yes, there's a Sergeant Jenkins in charge. He's out there in the kitchen questioning the servants. Then let's join forces. A murderer's in this house, Watson. Between us, we've got to catch him. Mr. Holmes, I've questioned everybody. The cook, Martha, says nobody came in through the kitchen when lunch was waiting on the table. And yet we know somebody did, sir. Well, perhaps they came through the window. I checked that too, sir. The gardener was working in the rhododendron bed outside. He said no one went in that way. And the only other entrance to the dining room was the door leading into the library. Oh, I checked on that one too, Mr. Holmes. Mr. John Abernethy and his brother Ernest were playing a game of chess there. They swore that no one went through that door. Well, it looks as if no one could have tampered with the butter. Whereas we know they did. Sergeant Jenkins, you've been very thorough in your examinations. But one of these witnesses is lying. We must talk to them again. Martha, when you said no one came through your kitchen and went into the dining room, you meant no member of the family, didn't you? That's right, sir. If it had been one of the other domestics, uh, Lizzie, for example, you wouldn't have noticed it? No, you mentioned it, sir. Lizzie did go in just before they came into lunch. Lizzie did, but... Did Quite, it. Watson. Sergeant, please ask Mr. Ernest Abernethy to step in here for a moment. Yes, Mr. Holmes, Lizzie did go through the library door, but I can't see that fact as of much importance. Uh, possibly you can't. And yet I assure you my question was not an idle one. Was Lizzie uh, carrying anything, do you recall? I really didn't notice. I'm afraid I find the problems of chess, uh, even with Brother John as an opponent, more interesting than the perambulations of the worthy Lizzie. Lizzie. Yes, sir? You did go into the room just before lunch? Yes, sir. I remember that I forgot to put the claret out, so it would be room temperature. Mr. Ernest is most particular about that. Thank you, Lizzie. You may go. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, do you think she did it? Surely there's no doubt of it in your mind now, is there? Well, there is in mine, Mr. Holmes, and no mistake. And yet the case is solved, Sergeant. Let's go into the drawing room and I'll introduce you to our murderer. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you can all see now how the murder was committed. But by Lizzie? But that doesn't seem possible, Mr. Holmes. What motive would she have? Oh, I could understand her motive. Mother's been an absolute tyrant with her. I'd find it hard to believe that with her adult-pated mentality, she'd have the imagination to think of such a plot. Oh, no, Garrett. The man responsible for this murder is you. Uncle Garrett! Oh, this is ridiculous. I did not say the murderer. I said the man responsible. Well, Holmes, what on earth are you driving at? Gareth, by his example in finding a job and going abroad, caused one of his other relatives to become disgusted with the life of a parasite. That person decided to go beyond such petty devices as stealing silver and to turn to murder. An Abernethy? Commit murder? I say, really, a remarkably I mean, brilliant observation. Which one is John? it, Holmes? Surely that's obvious. 
Two witnesses, the cook and Ernest, at first swore no one had entered the dining room. Then, when I asked a question based on one of the elementary flaws of direct evidence, each admitted that Lizzie had entered. Lizzie herself admitted it, Mr. Holmes. Very true. She told us in detail how she had entered the dining room once, but the witnesses had her entering twice. The cook saw her come through the kitchen door, and you, Ernest, admitted that she had passed you through the library door. Someone else had realized that same flaw of evidence, that no employer really notices the actions of a servant. Someone else had entered that room in the maid's uniform. And who is the only suspect who could have done that? I, your Rose Abernethy. Oh, the then. shy and retiring Rose? Yes, I killed Granny. When Dr. Watson said that Grandmother might live another 20 years, I saw that I'd never get away from here. Well, you're getting away from here now, miss. I'm taking you over to the station. I don't care. I'd be an old maid. That and I warn you that anything you say may be used in evidence I'm against glad you. I killed you. What a shocking case. I'm glad we're headed back to our hotel and never have to see that Abernethy family again. We'll have to make a brief appearance at the trial of the girl, I'm afraid. I still find it hard to believe that quiet, shy little thing was capable of conceiving such a devilish murder. Solitude, unhappiness, and the companionship of an evil, maladjusted family and a tyrannical grandmother breed dark fancies, Watson. Mm -hmm. She dressed up in a maid's uniform, convinced that no one would give her a second glance. And then, having poisoned the butter, returned, changed her dress, and sat down at the luncheon table. Precisely. Well, Watson, this has been an unsavory case, but it points a moral. A moral that I hope you, as my self-appointed biographer, will profit well, by. And what moral is that? The extreme importance of observing details. Miss Abernetti would not now be on her way to a prison cell if I hadn't noticed one vital clue. The depth to which the parsley had sunk in the butter. <laughs> Just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us something about next week's story. Girls, have you noticed how men can't help but admire the bright, shimmering highlights in a woman's hair? Then why not follow the advice of the famous Million Dollar Powers models? Girls noted for their glossy, bright hair. Powers models wash their hair with cremel shampoo. This amazingly beautifying cremel shampoo actually glamour bathes each tiny strand of hair and uncovers all its natural, radiant luster. Yes, and cremel shampoo never dries the hair. In fact, it has a beneficial oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Its luxurious active foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. So, ladies, buy a bottle of cremel shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of tantalizing loveliness. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, next week I think I'll tell you about the singular... No, pardon me. It was the singular affair of the Coptic Compass. The Coptic Compass? It sounds intriguing, Dr. Watson. Sherlock Holmes found it so, Mr. Bell. The adventure started one afternoon, and Holmes and I, returning to our Baker Street rooms, found, lying in the middle of our floor... An unclothed corpse. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Six Napoleons. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the singular affair of the Coptic Compass. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, here it is, Saturday night again in time for our weekly visit with that excellent host and incomparable storyteller, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's waiting for us in the old familiar study, so let's waste no time enjoying it.
Good evening, Mr. Bell. You're punctual to the minute, as usual. You bet I am. When it's time for Dr. Watson to tell a new adventure he had with the immortal Sherlock Holmes, I'm not going to miss a <laughs> second. It's nice either. of you to say so, my boy. Drop your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. Before I sit down, Dr. Watson, you mind if I take a look at the old metal case on the mantelpiece? It wasn't there last week. No, I placed it there because it played a prominent part in tonight's story. You see, it's a memento of yet another encounter that Sherlock Holmes and I had with the arch-villain of London crime. Professor Mariotti. But what is it, Dr. Watson? Looks like an old compass. That's exactly what it is, my boy. But there are no numerals on it. Just these strange figures around the dial. Oh, well, those apparent hieroglyphics helped us to solve one of the most diabolical murders that we ever encountered. I call it the adventure of the half-eaten apple, the Coptic compass, and the unclothed corpse. I can hardly wait, Doctor. Well, I'm sure you'll wait long enough to have a word with our listeners now, won't you, Mr. Bell? <laughs> right. Men, aren't you sick and tired of hair preparations which leave your hair looking and feeling greasy? When you run your hand over your hair, does your hair feel sticky and dirty? Does grease come off on your hand? If so, then now's the time to change to Kreml hair tonic. The first thing you'll notice about Kreml is how clean it smells, how clean it looks and feels on your hair and scalp. When you use Kreml, you can run your hand over your hair. And honestly, men, it's a pleasure. Not a trace of that greasy, sticky feeling. Yet you can't beat Kreml to keep hair neatly groomed. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why it keeps hair in place longer, with such a natural, well-groomed appearance. So, men, let Kreml give your hair this handsome, clean-cut look which is bound to make a hit, both on the job and with the ladies. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how's about the compass, the half-eaten apple, and the... And the unclothed corpse? <laughs> well, Mr. Bell, the adventure began on a November morning shortly after the turn of the century. Holmes, seldom one to indulge in exercise for its own sake, had displayed a rare burst of activity and joined me in a stroll through Regent's Park. Just before noon, we retraced our steps, and as we turned the corner into Baker Street, I nearly collided with a tall, well-dressed man walking in the other direction. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Oh, that's quite all right, sir. Excuse me. Aren't you Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am. I'm Major Stanley. Indeed. You're a little, little early for our appointment, Major Stanley. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Dr. Watson. I am early, Mr. Holmes, and when your housekeeper told me you were still out, I decided to take a stroll. Then let's walk back together, and perhaps you can tell me your problem as we go. It isn't exactly my problem, Mr. Holmes. You see, I made the count to the Maharaja of Kasul. Oh, really? It's a very interesting job, I should imagine. Uh, yes, it is. You know, I was in India myself, uh, for Shawa and further north. I was oh, once attacked uh, by... Quite, uh, Watson. Some uh, other time, don't you think? Oh, sorry, Holmes. I'm the Maharaja's problem would seem either. pressing since his emissary has been so eager to reach us. Uh, please continue, Major Stanley. Uh, Mr. Holmes, have you ever heard of the Star of Kasul? A fabulously valuable diamond, isn't it? Yes. It's the treasure of the Maharaja's collection. At the moment, it's in the vaults of the Bank of England. No, it's the best place for it, I should say. There have been several jewel robberies lately. Uh, so I've been told, and that's why I've come to you, Mr. Holmes. You see... The Maharaja has come to England to have his portrait painted by Sergeant. Your problem becomes apparent, Major Stanley. When this portrait is painted, the Star of Kasul will no doubt be set in the Maharaja's turban. And you quite justifiably feel concerned about the jewel's safety. Exactly, Mr. Holmes. It must be cleverly and closely guarded on its daily journey from the vaults to the Maharaja's suite, in fact. Well, hardly sounds like a job for you, Holmes. No, Major Stanley. Without wishing to appear conceited, I may say that such a routine matter is rather outside my scope. The Maharaja insists on having you, Mr. Holmes. I assure you his fee would be princely. Uh, here we are at 221B. Come in, Major Stanley. We'll discuss the matter further, if you like. Mrs. Hudson, we're back. Oh, very well, Doctor. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? Uh, there were two gentlemen waiting to see you. Said they had an appointment, but they've gone. Said they'd come back later. And uh, did they leave their names? No, sir, they didn't. Well, that's odd. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Hi, sir. Let's go upstairs, shall we, Major Stanley? Very well, Doctor. Regarding your problem, Major Stanley, it occurs to me that Humphrey Pedder might be a good man to see. Humphrey Pedder? Yes, I'm not personally acquainted with him, but I'm told that he specializes in the uh, uh, more physical aspects of detective work. The Maharaj will be very distressed if you refuse him, Mr. Holmes. Naturally, I wish to... Uh... 
I'm sorry, Major Stanley. I've made my decision. I can't handle the case. See Mr. Perry, if you will. But, but Mr. Holmes, uh, can, can't we sit down and talk about it at least? Yes, Holmes. After all, there's no need to be rude. I'm afraid not. Good day, Major. Well, I, I've heard you were eccentric, Mr. Holmes, but I, I didn't know how eccentric. Holmes, what on earth's the matter with you? You ask him up, and then you won't even let him in, uh, enter the room. For an excellent reason, Watson. Come inside. Look. There on the floor. Great. I could hardly let the emissary of a Raja walk into a room containing a corpse, and an unclothed one at that. Lift the blanket off the face, Watson. Right, you are, huh? There. Oh, Doctor. The poor man. Is that the face of one of the men that called here? Aye, sir, it is. Cover it again, Watson. I saw the other one leave, sir. He said his friend had already left. Oh, I never dreamed... This one you saw leaving, was he carrying anything? A bundle, perhaps? No, sir, he wasn't. Could you describe him? Well, he was tall and thin, and he had a high forehead. If he was carrying no bundle, where are the corpses' clothes? There's no sign of them in here. What a shocking thing, sir. A murder right in your living room. Will I send for the police? Definitely not, Mrs. Hudson. And please keep this to yourself. Aye, sir. When a corpse is deposited on my own carpet, there's a certain point of honor in being able to present the police with a complete explanation when I do call them in. Uh, that'll be all, Mrs. Hudson. All right, sir. What a terrible thing. Holmes, this is incredible. Why leave a corpse here? And why unclothed? The obvious reason to remove clothing would be to make identification difficult. And how did the murderer get the clothes out of here? Mrs. Hudson said that he wasn't carrying anything. We have many other questions to answer, old chap. The knife wound in the heart gives us no clue, I'm afraid. But observe the singular collection of objects that are lying beside the body. Well, let's have a look at them. A railway ticket, a funny-looking compass... And an apple that has been bitten into. The corpse has protruding teeth. I bet you that he didn't make the bite in this apple. Holmes, these must be the murderer's tooth marks. If you're correct, Watson, our murderer is an extraordinary man indeed. Well, why do you say that? Because if you look closely, you'll notice the interesting fact that this bite was made by two sets of upper teeth. <laughs> You're, you're a one and no mistake, Professor Moriarty. <laughs> Two sets of upper teeth. Well, that was the best touch. Yes, Carter. I must confess it was neat. Simple, of course. You start the bite with your upper teeth, reverse the apple, and conclude the bite. <laughs> yes, simple. But I trust also somewhat disconcerting for the great Sherlock Holmes. Our past encounters have given me an insight into his very unusual mind. I'd like to watch his face when he walked in there, Professor. So would I. But the next 24 hours will give me little leisure, I fear. I must arrange for a certain matter concerning a change of ownership in the Star of Kasul. This should be a fascinating game. But the old compass, the railway ticket. Carter, with your somewhat limited cranial development. It must be hard for you to absorb the subtler points in such a plan, but surely its basic purpose is obvious. Sherlock Holmes is about to be engaged by the Maharaja to guard the jewel. I had to divert his attention, so I perpetrated an intriguing murder on his own doorstep and surrounded the corpse with meaningless and completely unrelated objects which I knew would torment his curiosity and keep him off my trail. And that corpse would take some explaining to the police too, Professor. Yes, that's why I placed it there. It puts him in an acutely embarrassing position. He has to try and solve the case or become the laughing stock of London. <laughs> it's one of your neatest jobs, Professor. Oh, I won't say that, Carter. But I'm quite sure that I've posed a problem that Sherlock Holmes will be totally unable to to resist. I can't resist this problem, Watson. No fee on earth could make me bother with the safety of a mere diamond when such a puzzle presents itself. On my soul, you talk rather as though you were settling down to a game of chess. You've got to solve this problem, Holmes, or else it's going to put you in a ridiculous position with Scotland Yard. And just think if it got into the papers. I shall reserve my imagination for the problem posed. The question of the apple is, of course, obvious. Well, I suppose all you have to do is to find a man with two sets of false upper teeth. <laughs> Very simple. Quite. The only way such an imprint could be left is to take a half bite with the upper teeth. 
Reverse the apple and repeat the procedure. The only question here is, why indulge in such a bizarre performance? Well, whatever the reason, those are the murderer's tooth marks. Unquestionably. You notice the eaten portion of the apple has only just commenced to turn brown. The bite was undoubtedly taken in this room. But to identify teeth marks is a monumental problem and might prove insoluble. Let's turn our attention to the compass for a moment. Well, I've never seen one like it. There are no numerals on it, no points of the compass indicated anywhere. Just a lot of funny little squiggles. Oh, no, Watson. Surely you recall the singular affair of the Coptic patriarchs? Do you overrate my memory, Holmes? In any case, I don't even know what a Copt is. My dear Watson, sometimes you astound me. Well, it seems to me it takes very little to astound you. I repeat, what is a Copt? The Copts are the principal Christian race descended from ancient Egyptian stock. What you refer to as squiggles on this compass, in reality, are letters of the Coptic alphabet. Oh, that makes it more confusing than ever. An apple bitten into by an eccentric and now a compass with ancient Egyptian lettering on it. I just can't see any relation between the two of them. And yet we know there must be. That's what makes the problem so fascinating. Well, what does the compass tell you, Holmes? Two things. The Coptic lettering on the dial is inscribed by hand. Obviously, it was constructed for a Copt who could speak no European language. Yes, the Copt was definitely not of Egyptian origin. I'll wager that he was born not too far away from the sound of Bow Bells. I agree, Watson. And so the problem becomes more confusing. Now, uh, let us examine another piece of this fascinating puzzle. The railway ticket. Well, it's the unused return half of a first-class ticket from the village of Chipping Sodbury to London. Yes, and the date stamped on the back is November the 6th. Today? Yes, Watson, today. Chipping Sodbury is a tiny village. I imagine that the number of passengers that travelled from there to London this morning could be counted on one hand. You're going to Chipping Sodbury? Yes, it shouldn't be too hard to find out who purchased this ticket. And while I'm doing that, I want you to stand guard here. Oh, 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 with the corpse? Yes, Watson. And I suggest that you keep your revolver handy. My revolver? You mean... I mean I... that after what has happened in one short morning in Baker Street, we should be prepared for any eventuality. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll see just what eventualities do develop. But first, if you're smart, you'll take better care of the hair you've got. Let me assure you, men, you can't use a better product than Kremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which no other hair tonic has. That is why Kremel keeps your hair in place longer. Why your hair always has such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never greasy or sticky. And listen carefully to this, man. Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A quick massage with Kreml stimulates the circulation of blood right in the surface of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated, how clean your scalp feels. At the same time, Kreml removes loose dandruff. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls, Kreml actually helps condition the hair by making it feel softer, more pliable. So men... Why be satisfied with a product which merely keeps your hair in place when you can have handsomely groomed hair plus all those extra advantages of Kreml? Buy a bottle as soon as possible at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, it seems to me that Professor Moriarty did quite a job in sending you and Sherlock Holmes off on a false trail. He did, Mr. Bell, and for a while his nefarious plan succeeded. But to take up the story where I left off, while I stood guard in Baker Street over the mysterious corpse, Holmes caught the next train for the tiny village of Chipping Sodbury. He told me that after a talk with the village stationmaster, he had no trouble in tracing the purchaser of the first-class railway ticket that we'd found beside the body. It had been bought by a dignified an elderly clergyman by the name of Russell. And Holmes lost no time in calling on him. The station master told me, sir, that you were the only person to purchase a return first-class ticket to London this morning. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I had occasion to make one of my rare excursions to London this morning. But though it was an unfortunate experience for me, I can't think my humble visit to the city could be a matter of any possible interest to you. I'm very interested in what happened to the return half of your railway ticket, sir. Very odd you should mention that. Regrettable business. Most regrettable. It was stolen from me by a pickpocket, together with my watch and chain. Didn't notice it until I had occasion to look at the time when I was lunching with the Bishop of St. Luke's. You've no idea when or where the theft took place, sir? 
I walked from the station. The crowds were quite dense, and I do recall being jostled rather heavily on one occasion. You reported your loss to the police, I suppose. Naturally. But I have little hope that they'll catch the criminal. Most regrettable business. Cost me a watch and the price of another ticket. An expensive lesson in the frailty of human nature. <clears throat> Do you uh, care for a cup of tea, Mr. Holmes? Uh, no, thank you. I'm afraid I haven't time. I must return to London on the next train. Urgent and unfinished business awaits me there. <laughs> We followed Sherlock Holmes to Paddington Station, Professor Moriarty. Excellent. He caught the train for Chipping Sudbury, no doubt, Carter. Oh, yes, Professor. A fat lot of good, that'll do him. Even if he does find the old clergyman we pinched the stuff from. Mm, but it consumed valuable time. Time during which I can complete our plans regarding the star of Kursul. Before midnight tonight, I think I can safely say that the jewel will be in our hands. <laughs> How very fortunate that Sherlock Holmes has such a devouring curiosity. Any luck, Holmes? A waste of valuable time, Watson. I found the purchase of the ticket all right. The return half, together with his watch, had been stolen by a pickpocket. Oh, Lord, so that means we start all over again. No, Watson. At least one clue has been eliminated. Let us analyze the remaining ones more thoroughly. Now, the problem of the Coptic compass should next engage our attention. A call on the Egyptian embassy might prove illuminating. You know, Holmes, <laughs> while you were away, I, I had a brainwave. Congratulations. It was connected with the missing clothes from the corpse. Where, I asked myself... Where would be the obvious place to hide clothes? Why, in the, in the clothes closet, of course. So I searched both our wardrobes absolutely thoroughly. They weren't there. Interesting, Watson. Of course, I'd already done the same thing. Oh, well. The problem of the missing clothes is still... Numbskull! Yes, Holmes? Why didn't I think of it before? What is it, Holmes? The special wardrobe that I keep for my disguises. In the dressing room. Come on, Watson. Oh. By Jove, yes, I, I never thought of that. Perfect place for hiding the dead man's clothes. Let's see if there have been any recent additions to this raggledy collection of mine. Costa's outfit. And there's the clergyman's suit. You always made a surprisingly convincing clergyman, Holmes. And here's the unfailing passport to many a servant's back door. The stained and roughened worsteds of the English plumber. Yes, these patched and frayed ghosts could tell many a tale of... Hello. Look here, Watson. Plain blue suit in rather good condition. Quite. And it doesn't belong in my collection. I think we've solved the mystery of the vanishing clothes. The labels have been ripped out of the coat. Yes, and the pockets emptied. All possible identification removed. We're getting warm, Watson. We're getting very warm. Wait a minute. What is it? Give me a knife. All right, sure. There's something in the lining of this coat. Feels like paper. Perhaps the murderer didn't remove all identification after all. Here you are. These scissors will do the trick. Splendid. There we are. Piece of paper sewn to the padding of the coat. Yes. Let's see what it tells us. Humphrey Pedder, 118 Montague Crescent, Knightsbridge. That's the private detective you were talking about earlier on today. Do you suppose that Pedder's the corpse? At this stage, Watson, I shall suppose nothing. We'll go to Montague Crescent and find out for ourselves. <laughs> Mr. Pedder, I can't say how glad I am that we found you alive and well. From what you gentlemen have told me, Doctor, I feel glad myself to be here. Is it your custom to have an extra identification label sewn into all your clothes, Mr. Pedder? Yes, Mr. Holmes. A detective never knows what may happen to him. I've always felt such identification might be valuable. A very sound precaution. Thank you, sir. And you say that a suit of your clothes was stolen from your wardrobe last night? Yes. And I can't unearth a clue. Embarrassing situation for a detective, Mr. Holmes. Yes, it certainly is. Though I'm sure in your position, you've never had a thing like that happen to you. I uh, doubt, Mr. Pedder, if you know just how embarrassing a detective's life may become. Yes, indeed. Take our present situation, for instance. Quite, I'm... Watson. 
Mr. Pedder. I oh, can't get word of Edgeworth. Did Major Stanley call on you today? I suggested that you would be eminently suited to the task of guarding the Maharaja's diamond. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I'm going over to the Savoy tonight to talk to the Maharaja. Much obliged to you for giving me the recommendation. Particularly since I've never had the privilege of meeting you. I'd heard very flattering reports of your ability. I'm very glad, Mr. Holmes. Your recommendation means a lot to me. Well, Holmes, we've drawn another blank. Yes, Watson. I fear we must return to Baker Street and see if an ancient compass can point the way to the solution. Where to, sir? The Egyptian Embassy in Grosvenor Square, Caddy. Watch your gimlet. Jump in, Watson. I feel a blasted fool trotting around London with a cockpit compass under my arm. I hope this leads us somewhere. If the excursion proves fruitless, Watson, I'm afraid I shall be compelled to get in touch with Scotland Yard. A few hours delay in reporting a murder can be explained, but beyond that, we may find ourselves in trouble. Well, I think you should have reported it before this. By the way, Holmes, did you notice the brougham and pair that drove up to Pedder's house just as we left? I'm afraid for once I was sufficiently preoccupied to yield to you in observation, my dear Watson. I'm not certain, but I thought that it was Major Stanley who, who stepped out of it. Major Stanley? And yet Mr. Pedder said that... But of course, what an idiot I've been. Cabby, Cabby! Yes, sir? Turn around and drive us to the Savoy Hotel as fast as you can. Right, you are, it? But uh, why the Savoy Hotel, Holmes? Surely the situation is crystal clear now, Watson. It's just about as clear as porridge to me. The whole thing's a plot to fool me. Tell me, Watson, what is suggested to you by the combination of an unclothed corpse, a stolen suit, and a railroad ticket? Well, if I knew the answer, Holmes, I'd have given it to you this morning and saved ourselves a lot of trouble. The answer, Watson, is organization. A group of well-organized criminals who are able to perform these unrelated tasks. And who is the only person in London who can arrange for running the criminal gamut from murder to plain pickpocketing? Moriarty. Professor Moriarty? Of course. Remember Mrs. Hudson's description of our visitor? Tall, thin, and with a high forehead. And if you add organization and Moriarty to Major Stanley, the Maharaj of Kasul, and the portrait painter, the sum total should be apparent. You mean that you've solved the problem of the untold corpse? I mean I know precisely how Professor Moriarty intends to steal the star of Kasul. Master Tabby, there's not a moment to lose. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, it's an astonishing story you've told me. At least it explains my apparent rudeness this morning, Major Stanley. You can appreciate the embarrassing position in which my friend was placed, sir. You, yes, indeed. But, but of course, you understand that Mr. Pedder here is now in charge of guarding the Star of Kasul. Quite, Major. And uh, you're in very excellent hands, I'm sure. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. But your own problem still fascinates me. The unclothed corpse, the compass, and the apple. As a humble exponent of your profession, I'm curious to see how you arrived at your conclusions. I reached them only just in time, Mr. Pedder. If I hadn't, I should at this moment be paying a fruitless visit to the Egyptian embassy. Well, I'm still confused, Holmes. And yet the answer is simple. What was outstanding about the crime committed at Baker Street? What was its uh, individual peculiarity? Well, I suppose the air of mystery that surrounded it. I prefer to use the word mystification. The crime fascinated me, stimulated me, as Professor Moriarty hoped it would, until I realized that it was intended to do precisely that. The whole plan was a decoy, designed to prevent me from accepting your mission, Major Stanley. How could I accept such a commonplace job as guarding a jewel while such a fascinating problem was presented in my own living room? And the apple and the compass Fictional were... clues that led nowhere, but were sufficiently challenging for the criminal to know I wouldn't be able to resist tracking them down. It's an amazing plot. And the railway ticket and the suit of clothes that was stolen from me were all meant to focus your attention elsewhere and away from the diamond. Exactly, Mr. Pedder. Well, Mr. Holmes, I assure you we are very grateful for the warning. Yes. We shall be more than ever on our guard now. We know where the danger's coming from. Professor Moriarty. I'm taking the star across you back to the Bank of England in a few minutes. I assure you that I shall guard it extremely well. I think, Mr. Pedder, that if you don't mind, I'll take charge of the stone. But, Mr. Holmes, I've already been commissioned for the work. That's true, Mr. Holmes. Since you refused the job, I had to make other arrangements. Mr. Pedder was your own suggestion for the assignment. Nonetheless, Major... I think the Maharaja will sleep much more comfortably if I take charge of the stone. Holmes, I don't think it's very ethical. After all, you did refuse to take on the case, you know. This is hardly a time for ethics, Watson. Where is the Star of Kasul, Major Stanley? I just handed it over to Mr. Pedder before you arrived. Then supposing you give it to me, Mr. Pedder. 
By the way, I don't have the pleasure of knowing your real name. But Holmes, he's Humphrey Pedder. Oh, no, Watson. The unclothed corpse of Humphrey Pedder still lies in Baker Street. This is one of Professor Moriarty's most trusted henchmen. You're too smart for your own good. Look out, he's got a revolver. A little slow in drawing it. A beautiful uppercut, Holmes. Send for the police, please, Major Stanley. We have a prize catch for them here. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I can't tell you how grateful I am. I'll take the liberty of removing the diamond from the pocket of our recumbent friend. There we are. Behold, Watson, the star of Kasul. What a magnificent star. Magnificent. And yet one man was murdered for it. I only wish another might hang the cause of it. But Moriarty still goes free. And he killed Pedder. We'll catch him, Watson. We'll catch him. He is getting clumsy. If he'd noticed the credentials in Pedder's clothes, he would have been in possession of this bauble before the night is out. Instead of which, the evidence of this man here may help us to trap him. I hope so, Watson. But Moriarty inspires his henchmen with such loyalty that I doubt if he'll give us much help. The jewel is safe. Our own peculiar problem is solved. And we've captured a prize villain. Next time, we shall capture the master himself. <laughs> Did you, Dr. Watson? Did I what, Mr. Bell? Did you and Holmes finally capture Professor Moriarty, the master himself? No, Mr. Bell, haven't you uh, got a word for our listeners? <laughs> yes, I have. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Girls, here's some advice from one of America's foremost beauty authorities, John Robert Powers. Mr. Powers tells his famous million-dollar Powers models to use only cremel shampoo to wash their hair. And how right Mr. Powers is. Because cremel shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair to its own natural, glossy luster. It leaves the hair shining bright for days. Just a vision of beauty. You know, cremel shampoo is great for washing children's hair, too. Yes. Its luxurious, active foam thoroughly cleanses the hair and scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Cremel shampoo never dries the hair. So, ladies, buy a bottle at any drug counter. See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to its natural shining glory. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, next week I think I'll tell you a story about a dowager dip. A dowager dip? What on earth is that? <laughs> That's a, a slang way of saying that our story concerns... The Dowager Duchess of Penfield, who had the misfortune of being a kleptomaniac. And the story also concerns the strange, and I must admit, embarrassing adventure of the elusive Emerald. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time. When Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the elusive Emerald. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Once again, it's time to keep that weekly appointment with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's waiting for us in his study, so let's join him there, shall we? Ah, uh -huh, there you are, Mr. Bell. And how are you this evening, my boy? Just fine, thanks, Dr. Watson. And yourself? Well, twenty two of gout, but otherwise I'm doing pretty well for an old gentleman of... <laughs> we won't go into the question of my age. <laughs> Draw up a chair and I'll get on with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. From the hints you gave us last week, it sounded like quite a story. It is one that I shall never forget at any rate. 
For once, I played a rather... <laughs> A rather dashing role in the case. Uh -huh. And I have this small gold key on my watch chain to remind me of the fact. A gold key? Given to you, perhaps, by a lady, Dr. Watson? It was given me, my boy, by Her Grace, the Dowager Duchess of Penfield. In gratitude for services rendered, I suppose. Oh, no, Mr. Bell. Not by the wildest stretch of the imagination, could you say that? Let's say that it's a memento of one of the most unusual experiences that the great Sherlock Holmes and I ever had. I call it... The Adventure of the Elusive Emerald. Sounds intriguing, Dr. Watson. But first of all, do you mind if... If you I... have a word with our listeners? No, of course not, Mr. Bell. Most every man today who takes pride in his appearance uses something to keep his hair neatly groomed. And how does the preparation you use measure up to this test? Look in the mirror. Has your hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look? Now run your hand back over your hair. Does your hair feel greasy, sticky, or dirty? If it does... Then be smart, men. Change to Kremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients found in no other hair tonic. That's why Kremel keeps your hair in place longer, with such a handsome, well-groomed look. When you use Kremel, you can run your hand back over your hair, and men, it's really a pleasure. No grease comes off on your hand. And I'm sure you'll enjoy the way Kremel always looks and feels so clean on your hair and scalp. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Let it keep your hair looking handsome at all times. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how's about the adventure of the elusive emerald? Well, Mr. Bell, the story began on a cold winter evening. Um, well, no, it wasn't, actually. It was in the morning, more years ago than I care to remember. Holmes and I, our, our breakfast just concluded, sat on either side of a cheery fire in our Baker Street lodging. A thick fog rolled down between the houses, and the windows opposite looked like dark, shapeless blurs through the heavy yellow murk. A London pea super, eh, Dr. Yes, Wyden? it was, Mr. Bell. Our gas was lit and shone its flickering light on the white cloth and glimmer of china for the breakfast table had not yet been cleared. Shortly before eleven, we heard the old familiar jangle at our front doorbell, and a few minutes later, Mrs. Hudson ushered into our room, Lost Morris Danby. A middle-aged man who seemed to be in a state of great excitement. Mr. Holmes, <laughs> you must help me. I'll do my best, Lord Danby. What's your problem? Well, uh, and this is hard to say, gentlemen. It's connected with my mother, the Duchess of Penfield. Oh, so you're the Duchess of Penfield's son. That's a charming woman. I met her at a house party at the Smythe Parkinson's in Shropshire a few years ago. At the time, she was kind enough to Watson, tell me... Watson, don't she... you think your reminiscences might be more appropriate at some other time? Well, I was only pointing out, Holmes, Quite. that you... Pray continue, Lord Danby. Well, uh, here's the problem in a nutshell. My brother, the present Duke, is with his regiment in India. During his absence, all the responsibilities of the Penfield family have fallen on my unhappy shoulders. For a year now, I've been driven nearly insane by my nephew, Hilary. The boy's 18, and his madcap escapades have caused me many a sleep this night. But now comes the crowning blow. My mother, my own mother has turned thief. The Dowager Duchess of Penfield, a thief. Oh, come, 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 sir. You must be mistaken. Would I make such a shocking statement, Doctor, unless I was sure? I repeat, she's a shoplifter, a pickpocket, a disgrace to our family. Uh, since uh, monetary considerations are surely not involved, I can only assume that her grace is a victim of that unfortunate affliction known as uh, kleptomania. She is, Mr. Holmes. But how can I explain that to shopkeepers, to friends of the family, when Mother decides to pocket some valuable memento of a weekend house party? And though it's petty thefts today, tomorrow it may develop into more serious criminality. Mr. Holmes, you must help me find some way out of this intolerable situation. I'll pay you any fee you name if you can find... What on earth is the commotion downstairs? Well, I see what's wrong, Holmes. Go back to your kitchen. Mind your own business, you stupid woman. It's Mother. Uh, she must have followed me Your here. Grace, how delightful to see you again. Again? Who are you? Oh, don't you remember? We met at the Smythe Parkinson's a few years ago. Never saw you before in all my life. Oh, it was in Shropshire. Fancy to us poor, you know. Rubbish, rubbish. What? Get out of my way. Mm. Morris. Uh, yes, Mama? Get out of here at once. This is a matter for your elders. Do you hear me? Oh, Mama. Get I... out, you old. Yes, Mama. And when you get home, raise in the blue room for me. I shall attend to you later. Yes, Mama. Your Grace, I suggest that... Keep Asia... your suggestions to yourself, young man. Well, uh, really, I do feel... And you'll be quiet, too. Well, I beg your pardon, Duchess. I was only good. Can't understand a word you say. Oh, really? No. Well, sir, now then... Button. Which one of you is Sherlock Holmes? I am, and Why I... Why did that, that idiot son of mine come to see you? I fear that professional ethics prevent me professional from... Professional fiddlesticks! You don't need to hem and haw with me. 
I suppose Morris told you that I was a kleptomaniac. I'm afraid that I can't... Nothing to be afraid of. Oh. Uh, either of you care for a pinch of snuff? No, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Very well. Well. Oh. Can't understand anyone who doesn't appreciate snuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's much better now. Now then, listen to me, both of you. This story that my son undoubtedly told you about my being a kleptomaniac is an unadulterated lie. It's all part of my children's plot to get hold of my money. They're always after me for that. Especially that grandson of mine. And I'm sure he's inveigled my son Marlis into his schemes, and now they're planning to have me declared incompetent. Oh, gracious me, what a shocking... I don't need any comments. Just listen to me. Oh, sorry? No. How much did Morris offer you as a retainer, Mr. Holmes? I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to say I'll anything... I'll double the fee and trouble you both to hear no more of this. That's all. Good day to you. I'll see you downstairs, Your Grace. You needn't bother. I may be your grandmother, but I can still walk up and downstairs by myself, thank you. Oh. Holmes, what a magnificent woman. Yes. Quite remarkable, isn't she? I think she didn't remember meeting me at the Smythe Parkinson's, though. Quite. Luckily, we weren't taken in by the son's story, wasn't it, Holmes? I'm not sure. Watson, you recall that jeweled snuff box I received from this morning's post? It was a token from the King of Morania. Yes, you put it on the mantelpiece. Good Lord, it's vanished. Precisely. The Dowager Duchess of Penfield is so brilliant a kleptomaniac that she has achieved an unnoticed theft at 221B Baker Street. Well, of all the amazing nerve. Watson, we've met a worthy antagonist. Come on, old chap. Grab your hat and coat. I think we'll take the liberty of providing the Duchess with an unobtrusive escort. <laughs> Holmes, this is the twelfth shop that we've been in. My feet are tired. We've been following the Duchess all day. I was anxious to observe her technique. Well, she's obviously had plenty of practice. Yes. She's spent about a hundred pounds in this shopping tour so far. And yet she's succeeded in obtaining some five hundred pounds worth of goods. Brilliant work. Look, 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 Holmes. That small man in the bowler hat stopping her. The shop detective, no doubt. Come on, Watson. I'm sorry, ma'am, but uh, there it is. What utter balderdash are you talking? I must ask you to come and see the manager. Can I be of any assistance, Your Grace? Huh? Oh, 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 it's Holmes and his friends. Yes, yes, you can tell this idiot to stop bothering Well, me. what seems to be the matter? I saw this here lady pick up a silver matchbox and slip it into her handbag. Kennel six. I examined it, yes. But if it's missing, this man was standing near me. Search him. Search Holmes, but that's ridiculous. Of course it is. Mum, I must ask I you am that... the Dowager Duchess of Penfield. Now search this man. Uh, uh, yes, Your Grace. Insufferable insolence. Your Grace, I must ask you... No, you don't. don't. You stand here. I'm going to search you. This is ridiculous, my good yes, man. Of course it is. If you didn't take it, you got nothing to be frightened about then. Hello, hello. What's this in your coat pocket? Great Scott Holmes. It's a silver matchbox. Ah. Quite. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Epp. You've got to explain this to the manager. Mr. Holmes, I'm very embarrassed that my man brought you here. Uh, it's quite all right, sir. It was a perfectly understandable mistake. Yes, but you must realize that this uh, unfortunate habit of the Duchess's must be kept a secret. Quite so, Dr. Watson. And I think the program I've outlined will prove a most satisfactory way of handling any such... Uh, incidents in the future. You follow my plan quite clearly? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. We'll have our shop detectives watching her whenever she comes in. Anything she st uh, uh, doesn't pay for, we're to charge to her account as though they were purchases. Precisely. In that way, your shop will sustain no loss and the Penfield family will be spared public scandal. Yes, a very satisfactory arrangement, I think. Come on, Watson. <laughs> Holmes, a very satisfactory arrangement. Don't you agree, Hillary? Yes, Uncle. I suppose if we can't stop Granny pinching this stuff, at least this will keep it quiet. Hillary. All that remains to be done, Lord Danby, is to make similar arrangements at the other shops your mother patronizes. And in that way, sir, all scandal can be avoided. Yes, yes, it's an excellent plan, excellent. I only wish that since Granny's so free and easy with other people's stuff, she'd loosen up the money bags for me a little. I'm stony broke. We won't go into that now, Hillary. Come along, my boy. I know Mr. Holmes is a busy man. Good day, gentlemen. Good day. Good day. Good day. I'll be communicating with you, Mr. Holmes. Very well, Lord Dandy. 
Well, I suppose that's the last we'll hear of the Duchess's problem. I think not, Watson. Huh? Just before Lord Danby arrived, I was studying the social section of today's Times. Look at the item I ringed in blue pencil. The distinguished Polish nobleman, Count Stephen von Kratzoff, is holding a reception at his Grosvenor Square house tomorrow afternoon, at which time the famous Kratzoff emerald will be displayed. Skim through the list of guests, Watson. I think one name will interest you. General and Mrs. Martin, Lord Leninovic. By George, the Dowager Duchess of Penfield. Exactly. And the combination of the finest emeralds in Europe and the Duchess of Penfield means that this is one reception we must not miss. Uh, where's your friend, Sherlock Holmes? He's over there talking to Count Kratzoff, Your Grace. <laughs> You and your friend have been following me since yesterday, haven't you, young oh, man? Of course not. We, we wouldn't dream of such a thing. Oh, uh, fiddlesticks. I know you have. Oh, we have met, by the way, you said we'd met before somewhere. Where was it? At the Smythe Parkinson's in Shropshire. At a fancy dress done. Oh, you're the Parkinson's. Don't remember you. I was wearing a Pierrot's costume. Oh, really? <laughs> How very original. <laughs> uh, what was I wearing? Something in blue. Uh, blue velvet, I think it was. Uh, you had a white wig, I remember. You, uh, you looked enchanting. It wasn't a wig. It was my own hair. Ooh, my own hair, right. And it wasn't velvet, it was tool. And the dress was red, not blue. However, I'm flattered that you remembered me. Good night, young man. Uh, good night, Duchess. Oh, good night, Count from Pasta. Had a very pleasant evening. Good night, my dear Duchess. I'm so happy that you honored me with your presence. Mm-hmm. How long, Hilda? Oh, yes, Good night, Mr. Hans. Good night, Your Grace. Oh, thank you so much, Count. Good night, young man. Good night. Oh, good night. A most successful evening, Count von Kratzoff. I am glad that so many distinguished guests were present, Dr. Watson. Hey, you were very quiet this evening, Mr. Holmes. I was watching, Count. My eyes hardly left the emerald during the entire evening. I imagined that you had some professional reason for attending. James, he was most insistent that I invite you. But nothing seems to have happened. Is James still lying in his case on the table there? I saw nothing happen. I hope nothing did. Well, what could have happened? There's a stone safe and sound. Now, please examine it, Mr. Holmes. I know you have quite a reputation as an expert on jewels. What a beautiful gem. It is considered one of the finest in Europe, my dear doctor. Uh, Mr. Holmes, what is your opinion? That you've been robbed, Count von Kratzoff. Rob? Yes, this is an extremely fine paste replica. The Kratzoff emerald has been stolen right under my very eyes. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson as they try to solve the mystery of the elusive emerald. Men, it's smart to take care of the hair you've got. And I want to tell you about Kreml hair tonic. You see, Kreml is a highly specialized hair tonic. It contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients found in no other hair tonic. That's why it keeps hair neatly in place longer and gives the hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance. Never greasy or sticky. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking attractive. A quick massage with Kreml stimulates the circulation of blood right in the surface of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated your scalp feels. And men, you like to rub Kreml on your scalp because it's such a clean hair tonic. Never feels greasy or sticky. Its light oils have a fine lubricating effect on a dry scalp, too. At the same time, it removes loose dandruff. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men, for a cleaner scalp, for better groomed hair, change to Kreml. K-R-E-M-L Kreml Hair Tonic So, Dr. Watson, the famous emerald had been replaced by a paste replica? Yes, my boy, it had. Well, I don't have to be a Sherlock Holmes to deduce that the Dowager Duchess was the culprit. Elementary, my dear Mr. Bell, elementary. (laughs) But when the police arrived on the scene, Holmes gave no indication of our obvious suspicion. Later on, when we returned to Baker Street... I don't think either of us were in a least bit surprised to find that Lord Danby was waiting for us. In a state of great agitation. 
Mr. Holmes, you've helped me so far. You've got to find some way out of this mess. You've spoken to Count von Kratzhoff since the last was discovered? Uh, yes. He came over to see me while you and the police were still searching the house. Uh, uh, we're neighbors, you well, know. What did he say, sir? That for the sum of 20,000 pounds, he'd agree to keep the whole matter quiet. Indeed. And why should Count von Kratzhoff assume that your mother was responsible for the theft? I'm afraid he must have heard rumors of her um, unfortunate habits. Uh, do you propose to make the settlement, Lord Danbury? The estate can't afford it, Doctor. Oh, dear me, what will my brother the Duke say when he returns from India? What am I to do, Mr. Holmes? Your problem has many more ramifications than I imagined when you first called on me, Lord Danbury. I think if you'll allow me a few hours, Grace, I can give you a surprisingly satisfactory solution to your dilemma. I'll be eternally grateful if you can. Well, how do you propose to do it, Holmes? The first step is obvious. To find the jeweler who made the paste replica. Unless I'm much mistaken, there's only one jeweler in London capable of such an exquisite piece of craftsmanship. We shall call on him, Watson. We shall call on him at once. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Holmes, I made this replica. I thought you were the only man in London capable of such brilliant work, Mr. Marcus. You are most kind. It was one of a pair of duplicates that were ordered. A pair, eh? Yes. Now the plot thickens, Watson. Of course, you had no idea that the replicas were ordered with any criminal intent, Mr. Marcus. Of course not, Dr. Watson. I was told that they were for a collection of replicas of famous stones. And I was paid handsomely 25 guineas apiece for them. Yes. A small stake for so large a prize. Could you describe the woman who gave you the order? Woman, Doctor? It was a man. A young man. A man? But, yes. uh, but uh, Holmes, she must have an accomplice. I think not, Watson. Though the train of thought suggested is certainly an astonishing one. However, our next move should be obvious. Oh? What's that? We return to Baker Street for certain necessary tools of my trade. And then, my dear fellow, we pay an unannounced visit to the Dowager Duchess and try our hands at a little burglary. Holmes, is that you? Yes, Watson. I hope you're not too cold. Oh, I'm frozen to death. Cowering here in these bushes under the Duchess's window. You must have been gone for three quarters of an hour at least. Nevertheless, it was a very profitable excursion. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. For heaven's sake, take off that stupid moustache. You look ridiculous. And yet this uh, stupid moustache inspired great confidence in the, in the second chambermaid. Under the impression that I was a flirtatious plumber uh, with prospects, she informed me that the Duchess has a small room leading off a boudoir, a room that none of the staff is allowed to enter. You think that that's where her hoard of stolen goods may be situated? It's worth trying, old chap. A stout coil of rope attached to the balcony above should enable us to make an unobtrusive entry. Possibly, but where do we find a stout coil of rope? Even a pseudo-plumber has his tools. You don't imagine this bag contains a pipe wrench or some such useless appurtenance, do you? Look. Great Scott. A coil of rope. Exactly. Now let's see how best we may secure it to the balcony above. But we must work quietly, Watson. If we are discovered, I'm afraid this is going to be a trifle hard to explain. Oh, when I climb up ropes, Holmes, I realize I'm not as young as I used to be. I thought you were surprisingly nimble, my dear Watson. Oh, I don't like this. Supposing somebody discovers his bird in the Duchess's house and calls the police. We then what? We shall probably go to prison. Strike a match, will you? What? But I still don't like it. I like this lamp. There we are. So this is the room where the servants are not allowed, eh? Now, I wonder where the Duchess would... Uh... Ah, I think this wall safe gives us the answer. Oh, of course. Yes, but the safe's old-fashioned. Unless I'm much mistaken, the combination is an extremely simple one. It is. There we are. Look, Watson. This is Pandora's box in Great Scott, a whole collection of silver and jewelry. And prominent among it is the King of Morania's jeweled snuff box. I'll slip that in my pocket. I think His Majesty would prefer that I retain this look, 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 Holmes. There's Count von Kratzhoff's emerald. Yes, Watson. We'll take charge of that, too. The rest of this collection doesn't concern us. I think there's someone in the upper room. Quick, down the rope. Give me a hand off this window ledge. Who's in there? Oh, hurry, Holmes. It's the Duchess. Follow me as fast as you can. Who is it? Oh. Who is it? Who 
way they were. Oh. Why, such young Dr. Watson. <laughs> that's right, that's what young Dr. How Watson. How on earth did you get here? Uh, I get here? I came, got here through, through the window. Through the window? Well, we'll imagine that. Uh, I, I, I climbed up a rope to your balcony, your grace. You, you climbed up a rope? <laughs> My dear boy, you took that risk from me. Oh, you impetuous boy. Who, me? Oh, no, Your Grace. You're uh, no, mistaken. No, no, not I, a word, not a word, my dear boy. I know how you feel. Oh, I'm sure you I don't. realized it tonight when you spoke of the grey sheepon dress I wore at Smythe Parkinson Ball. But you don't understand, I, I don't... do. I understand only too well. Oh, but you dear, dear boy, it hmm? can't be. Don't can't you understand? Be. Think of my family, my grandchildren, my reputation. But really, Your Grace, you're making a very... Good... Not another word, you headstrong boy. Now, one kiss what? and good night. Oh, you're, you're great. I'm great. Oh. 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 My dear boy, now, now you must go. Yes, I certainly must. Uh, good night. Good night, you foolish boy. God, Holmes will be furious. Holmes, Holmes, Holmes. What? What happened? Holmes, see. She thought I was there to see her. Hope springs eternally. Hmm? I trust you didn't undeceive her. No, but uh, she kissed me, Holmes. A martyr to our cause, Watson. Well, well, it's been a most successful evening. The case is solved, and I imagine it's still quite early. What time is it? Well, it's, uh, Holmes. What's wrong? Great Scott, when the Duchess kissed me, she stole my watch. <laughs> the case is solved, Mr. Holmes? Yes, Lord Danby. That's why I asked you and Count von Kratzoff and your nephew to join me here in Baker Street. But where is my emerald? There it is, Count von Kratzoff. How did you make the old girl give it back? I bet it made her furious. I'm supposing you let my friend expend his own good time, young man. Here is the replica count, and here is the real emerald. You will, of course, identify the stone. I, uh, uh, yes, yes, of course. Splendid. Then I'm sure you have no objection to signing this document I prepared. It relieves the Duchess's family of all responsibility. Uh, please sign it uh, here. Very well, Mr. Holmes. There. Yeah. Thank you, Count. And now, Lord Danby, I shall present this paper to you. Well, I'm tremendously grateful, Mr. Holmes, but I'm utterly confused. Then let me clarify the situation for you. I have another visitor here tonight. Please come in, won't you? Yeah, very well, Mr. Holmes. Mm -hmm. Lord, it's that jeweler fellow. Now, Mr. Marcus. Please point out the person who ordered the two paste replicas from you. It was that young man there. Me? But I've never seen you before in my life. It was the man, Mr. Holmes. You mean that my name... I mean, Lord Danby, that the whole theft was part of an extremely cunning plot. Count von Kratzoff, you joined forces with young Hillary here. You displayed a paste replica at your reception and tempted the Duchess to seal it. Which she did, and then the Count substituted the second replica in place of the one that she'd taken. Precisely. And insisted that I examine the stone, knowing that I'd spot it was a fake. And then Count von Kratzoff attempted to persuade the family to settle for 20,000 pounds. For the theft of a paste imitation. Well, Count, it looks as though Sherlock Holmes was too smart for us. Be a fool, Hillary. Admit nothing. A confession is not needed since the guilt is proven. But where's the real emerald? I'm quite certain it's still safe in Poland. The whole plot was perfectly clear to me when Mr. Marcus told me of the pair of duplicates. Yes, a kleptomaniac could hardly indulge in such an elaborate plan. Nor would one work with an accomplice. Well, Lord Andy, what do you say? But I'm shocked. Deeply shocked. My nephew I shall deal with separately, of course. Don't look so grumpy, Uncle. I was only trying to get a little money. Granny wouldn't give me any. Count von Kretzow, you can be prosecuted for fraud and extortion, you know. Only by involving the Penfield family in a great deal of scandal. I assure you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, what do you say, Lord Danby? Do you intend to prosecute? The Count's right. The scandal would be unbearable. Then I'd suggest we merely request Count von Kratzoff's immediate departure for Poland. Now, well, don't try and stop me, my good woman. I'm going upstairs. It's Mother. It's Granny. It's the Duchess. Oh, Lord. My word. How very depressing. I came here to talk to Dr. Watson, and I find his room knee-deep with my relatives. Now, get out of this room, all of you. But, Mama. Now, no arguments, Wallace. Leave the room. All of you, and wait for me downstairs. Very well. Come along. <laughs> Mr. Holmes. I want to speak to Dr. Watson alone. Very well, Your Grace. Holmes, don't leave me. Well, that's extremely ungallant of you, Doctor. Your Grace, you can speak freely, perfectly freely, in front of Mr. Holmes here. Oh, my word. How extremely disappointing. <laughs> well, young man, I realize that I was cruel and heartless to you last night. Here, here's your watch. Oh, thank you, Your Grace. 
What's this gold key on the chain? Uh, well, um, that's a key to my private conservatory in the garden. Oh, dear me. Uh, yes, uh, a man of your weight has no business climbing rope. Uh, good day, Mr. Holmes. Goodbye, Your Grace. Uh, oh, Dr. Watson. Yes, Your Grace. I looked through my wardrobe after you left last night. I found that dress I wore at the Smythe Parkinson's. It was green. Bottle green net. Watson, my dear fellow, you've made a conquest. Oh, a distinct oh, conquest. Oh, I feel so more embarrassed in my life. A gold key, indeed. You know, Holmes, though the case is over, I think Count von Kratzow should be taught a lesson. Undoubtedly, he led that young fellow astray, even though Lord Danby doesn't want to prosecute. I'm not sure that we shouldn't. What um, evidence would we use? The replica uh, emerald, of course. You seem to forget that the Dowager Duchess of Penfield has just left the room. What? You mean she stole it again? Yes, Watson. I'm sure that our evidence will shortly be reposing in that small room off her boudoir. And I have a strong feeling that not even your love for British justice will get you there again. <laughs> Before Dr. Watson gives us a hint about next week's story. Girls, those famous million-dollar powers models you see on magazine covers always have to keep their hair shining bright with highlights. Now, here's how they do it. We glamour bathe our hair with cremel shampoo. And ladies, I must say, cremel shampoo brings out all the hair's natural glossy luster and sheen. More than you may dream ever possible. It leaves the hair simply radiant. And Kreml Shampoo is one shampoo you can buy today that doesn't dry the hair. In fact, it has a beneficial oil base which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry. Yes. And Kreml Shampoo leaves the hair so much softer, silkier, and holds away better. Ladies, buy a bottle of Kreml Shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of beauty. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Shampoo. And remember, a bottle of Kreml hair tonic makes a fine addition to that Christmas stocking. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bell, I shall tell you a strange adventure in which Sherlock Holmes and I fought a losing battle to prevent the murder of a man who, curiously enough, was already on his deathbed. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Musgrave Ritual. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time. When Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the grand old man. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once again, it's time for that weekly visit with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Let's join him, shall we? Ah, oh, there you are, Mr. Bell. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Well, have you quite recovered from your holiday festivities? I think so, my boy. And I was particularly flattered by the number of friends who were kind enough to remember a rather elderly and lonely doctor at this time of year. Well, as long as you keep telling those swell Sherlock Holmes stories, you'll never be lonely, Dr. Watson. Then I'd better get on with tonight's new adventure. <laughs> It involved us in one of the most shocking scandals of the 19th century. A scandal that, had it ever emerged in the light of day, might easily have brought ruin and disgrace to one of the most famous men who ever came a member of the House of Lords. Well, this one I've got to hear. But first, I have a message for our listeners. Today, more than ever before, I think men realize how important it is to keep their hair neatly groomed. And men, may I ask you this about the preparation you use... Does it give your hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look? 
When you run your hand back over your hair, does your hair feel greasy, sticky, or dirty? Does grease come off on your hand or hat band? If it does, then be smart, men. Change at once to Kremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why Kremel keeps your hair in place longer with such a handsome, well-groomed look. When you use Kremel, you can run your hand back over your hair and, men, it's really a pleasure. No grease comes off on your hand. And I'm sure you'll enjoy the way Kremel always looks and feels so clean on your hair and scalp. Let it keep your hair looking handsome at all times. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber's. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the 19th century scandal in which you and the great Sherlock Holmes became involved? Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure began in the very early days of the great man's career. World acclaim and handsome fees were some years ahead of him. And in those times, we spent many long evenings discussing whether a decent living could be obtained by the practice of criminal detection. On the day that this particular story began, we just finished our breakfast. Holmes, a curved pipe clenched between his teeth, was scanning the personal columns of the morning paper. I can almost hear him now, as he said... Demi Watson, the agony column of the Times is more than usually barren this morning. Are you looking for a possible client, Holmes? Naturally. Since we already owe Mrs. Hudson for two months' rent here, and our doorbell has been frighteningly silent during that period, I must see what possible service I might render these unhappy correspondents. Well, I glanced over the column, but I couldn't see anything very promising. No, Watson, it's a rag bag of bizarre happenings. What a chorus of groans, cries, and bleatings. One skims through them, and what does one glean? Lady with a black bow at the Prince's Skating Club wishes to meet gentlemen who was kind enough to... That we may ignore, I think. Yes, she doesn't sound as though she needs your services. Well, here's an item. <laughs> Surely Jimmy will not break his mother's heart. Hmm. That appears to be irrelevant. If the lady who fainted on the top deck of the Brixton bus... She doesn't interest me either, Watson. No, probably anyone else who wasn't on that bus. Every day my heart longs for... Ah, bleak, Watson. All this twaddle is unmitigated bleak. Very disheartening, Holmes. You haven't had a case for over two weeks. Yes. Sometimes I think I chose the wrong profession. What do the public, the great unobservant public, who can hardly tell a weaver by his tooth or a compositor by his left thumb, care about the finer shades of analysis and deduction? As to my own little practice, it seems to be degenerating into an agency for recovering lost lead pencils and giving advice to young ladies from boarding schools. Holmes, come over here to the window. What's wrong, Watson? Uh, look at that man walking down the street. He's looking at the numbers of the houses. Let's hope 221B is the number he's searching for. What do you make of him, Watson? Well, let me see. What do I make of him? Well, I, I'd say that he is a foreigner. Uh, yes, foreigner. Look at those flashy clothes and his pointed moustache. Oh, don't be misled by externals, old chap. Observe the steady, controlled gait. No trace of the light agility of the Latins or the military heaviness of the German. No, Watson. I think an English gate in foreign attire would suggest an expatriate Englishman, only just returned from a stay abroad. He is coming here, Holmes. Meet him on the stairs, Watson. It'll save Mrs. Hudson a trip. Yes, so that you are. It's all right, Mrs. Hudson. Uh, how do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, would you please come along up? That's right, sir. Straight up here. Uh, in, in here, sir. Which of you fellows is Sherlock Holmes? I am, sir. And your name is... Uh... Tremaine. Reginald Tremaine. I'm Dr. Watson. Uh, sit down, won't you, Mr. Tremaine? My business won't take long. Holmes, I need protection, and I'm prepared to pay for it. Protection from what? My life's been threatened. The police wouldn't do a thing for me, so I've come to you. I'm told you detective fellows will do anything for money. Oh, well, then you've been misinformed, sir. My friend... Your friend well... is very interested in Mr. Tremaine's problem, Watson. Pray continue, sir. Holmes, I want you to warn my cousin... Tell him you'll get nowhere by threatening me. Frighten the wits out of him if you can. I'll give you 20 pounds uh, and another 20 if I need you again. And uh, who is your threatening cousin? Lord Darlington. Oh, really? Charming fellow. I He's a him... scoundrel. Oh, but his title impressed Scotland Yard. That's why they wouldn't help me. Well, 
Even a title can be vulnerable. A public scandal would shake him. And that's what is going to happen if he threatens me any more. And you can tell him so from me, Holmes. I've always heard of Lord Darlington as the very model of an English aristocrat. Why should he threaten you, Mr. Tremaine? That's none of your business. Oh, my soul, none of your, your job is to see that he doesn't carry out his threat of thrashing me with an inch of my life. Very well. For twenty pounds, I shall warn Lord Darlington that I stand between you and a thrashing. The fee will be paid in advance, please. I have it in this envelope here. And I expect immediate action, Holmes. You shall have it, Mr. Tremaine. Holmes, the man's insufferable. Why'd you take on the case? He's a bounder. Let him get thrashed. These four crisp five-pound notes persuade me otherwise, Watson. We owe money to Mrs. Hudson, and your medical practice shows little signs of picking up. I must take what fees I can. Oh, how can my practice pick up when I spend half my time chasing all over the country with you? In any case, Watson, ask yourself why such a man as Lord Darlington should threaten Tremaine with physical violence. Obviously, only because Tremaine is himself in some way a threat to Lord Darlington. There may be yet another fee in this case, and a much fatter one. You're going to see Lord Darlington at once? Yes. I'd ask you to come with me, old chap, but after your remark about chasing all over the country, I hesitate to waste your time. Rubbish. I was only joking, and you know it, you silly fellow. Of course I'm going with you, Holmes. Get your coat and hat. The game's afoot. <laughs> Ten thousand pounds, my dear cousin, or the scandal will be spread all over London. It's preposterous, Reginald. And I warn you that if you continue in this vein, you'll get that thrashing, I promise. Oh, no, I won't. I've engaged a detective fellow by the name of Sherlock Holmes. He's going to act as a bodyguard. So you'd better not try any tricks. He should be here any moment. How dare you bring a stranger into this mess? How dare you? That's right, my dear cousin. Bolster up your courage with the brandy bottle. Oh, be quiet, Reginald. It'll cost you ten thousand pounds to keep me quiet. I won't pay it. The scandal will make pretty readings in the newspapers. Before we go any further, Reginald, I insist on one thing. I shall bring Lady Darlington to here, and you must make this shocking accusation to her face. I shall be delighted to. Yes, Jenkins, what is it? Excuse me, Your Lordship. But there's a Mr. Sherlock Holmes and a Dr. Watson to see you. Oh, I told them that you were engaged, but they seem most insistent. Better have them come in, my dear cousin. We may need independent witnesses. Oh, very well. Show the gentleman in, Jenkins. Yes, Your Lordship. And then if you'll ask Lady Darlington to come here, I'll be very glad to make my accusation in public. It's blackmail, Reginald. That's what it is. You will never get away with it. <laughs> Won't I? I think you'll be surprised. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Allow me to introduce my cousin, gentlemen, Lord Darlington. How do you do, How do, you do? Uh, Jenkins? Yes, Your Lordship. Ask Lady Darlington to step in here for a moment. Yes, Your Lordship. Lord Darlington, I greatly admired your speech in the House of Lords on tax reform. I only wish we had met under different circumstances. As it is, it is my duty oh, to... Oh, that's inform... all right, Holmes. I've already told my dear cousin that I'd engaged your services. I want you both here as witnesses. Witnesses? To what? Reginald has made a shocking accusation. As soon as my wife comes here, I'm going to insist that he repeat the statement to her face. Now, oh, there you are, Clara. Well, I'll just put Gordon to sleep, dear. Hello, Reginald. How are you, Clara? My dear, I want to introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do, you do? Well, do sit down, won't you? Oh, <laughs> Albert, what's wrong? You all look so dreadfully serious. Clara, my dear, Reginald has made a shocking accusation. It concerns you, and I insisted that he repeat it in your presence. An accusation against me? Yes, Clara, my dear. You see, I'm requesting a paltry sum for concealing my knowledge of the Darlington substitution scandal. Substitution? What on earth do you mean? Well, who should understand me better than you? The baby asleep upstairs. The supposed heir to the Darlington title is not your child. That's a lie. How dare you say that, Reginald? Lord Darlington, surely you were present at your son's birth? Well, as a matter of fact, I wasn't. I was abroad on government business at the time. My wife went to the country with a paid companion. My son was born there. Oh, no, my dear cousin. A son was born there, and then it was passed off as yours. That's a foul lie. Albert... 
Make him leave this house. I'm afraid, Clara, my dear, that, well, he's threatened to go to the newspapers. We must hear him out. Lord Darlington, surely the matter is not hard to settle. You say your wife had a companion. Confront her with a story. She can establish the truth of the matter. Yes, of course she can, but where is she? I haven't seen Maud Harris since she left me a year ago. Then I have a surprise for you, Clara. She's waiting in my cab outside now. I'll tell Jenkins to send her in. Jenkins? Yes, sir? Ask Miss Harris to join us. She's waiting in my cab. Yes, sir. Albert, I don't know what devil's work Reginald's up to, but you don't believe him, do you? Well, of course not, Clara, darling. Mr. Tremaine, how did you get in touch with this uh, Miss Harris? For an employee, you ask a lot of questions, Holmes. I met Maud Harris at Brighton last week. As soon as she knew I was the black sheep of the Darlington clan, she thought we might profitably put our heads together. And so you organized with the idea of blackmailing this poor lady. And such a valuable secret is surely worth a few thousand pounds, Dr. Watson. Maud. Yes, Lady Darlington, it's me. You're just in time to settle a most important truth. I'll handle this, Reginald. Young lady, as I understand it, you claim to know that the boy lying upstairs is not my son. Who should know better, Your Lordship? He's mine. Maud, how can you tell such a lie? It's no lie, and you know it, Lady Darlington. Your child was born dead. Albert, make her stop saying such things. Here, my dear, control yourself. Let's hear this shocking tale to the end. Well, go on, young woman. You were abroad, Lord Darlington. When her ladyship lost her child, she was terrified. She knew how much you longed for a son, and she made this plan. Oh. I was a widow, and I was going to have a child, too. We fooled the villagers, even the doctor... By giving each other's names. And so my son was born as the Darlington heir. Lord, that's the most shocking lie I've ever heard. I can't stay here and listen to any more of it. Mr. Holmes, I understand you're a man of discretion and ability in such matters. What am I to do? I would like to ask this young lady a few questions. Miss Harris, why have you chosen to reveal the supposed truth now? I thought that money could compensate me for the loss of my boy. But I was wrong. A mother's love can never be stifled. Indeed, and I suppose Mr. Tremaine's plans for blackmail are purely incidental. Oh, keep out of this, Watson. It's no affair of yours. Establishing truth and justice is anybody's business, my good man. Mr. Holmes, I'll pay you any fee you name to disprove this monstrous story. Oh, no, you don't, my dear cousin. Holmes is employed by me. Mr. Tremaine, I've undertaken to protect your physical safety. That pledge I will keep. Otherwise, I'm a free agent. Then you'll accept my commission? Yes, Lord Arlington, on one condition. And what's that? You have asked me to disprove this story. I would prefer that you ask me to establish the truth. Of course, Holmes, and spare no expense. Remember, the honor of the Darlingtons is at stake. Well, Holmes... Little did I think when Tremaine called on us this morning that we'd end up the day tramping a village lane in Surrey, looking for a Dr. Godfrey. And yet, that gentleman must surely be able to give us the final answer. Lady Darlington said that he attended yes, her. Yes, but supposing the companion story was true and they had changed names. Even so, the good doctor will certainly know whether the boy was born to a slight blonde woman like Lady Darlington... Or a brunette Amazon like Maud Harris. Well, here's the doctor's house. They said in the village it was the one with the gabled roof. Hmm. No lights visible. I hope the doctor's not out. Doesn't seem to be any answer. Couldn't find it. I don't believe there's anyone at home. And you will observe, Watson, that this morning's delivery of milk still stands on the doorstep. Curious. Let's explore a little. Well, perhaps the doctor's gone away for a few days. If so, he's a very careless man. Look, that window's wide open. Well, do you think we might go in and look round? We not only might, we will go in. Too much is at stake to stand on ceremony. Strike a match, Watson. Right, you are. Uh, I'll light that lamp. There you are. Holmes! Holmes, look, look, look! The figure slumped over the desk. Someone has reached the doctor before us. He's been shot through the chest. He's dead, Holmes. How long would you estimate he's been dead, Watson? Oh, uh, about 24 hours, I say. So now we become involved in murder as well as blackmail. Well, the answer's perfectly obvious to me. Tremaine came here and shot him. 
He knew that he could never blackmail Lord Darlington while this doctor was still alive. Not necessarily, Watson. If the story of the substitution is true, you must realize that one other person would have an equal motive for murder. Which, Cut Holmes, who? Lord Darlington himself. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes as they endeavor to solve the mystery. But first, they say New Year's resolutions are made to be broken. But here's one which should pay you big dividends to keep. Resolve to take better care of your hair, to keep it better groomed, your scalp hygienic. Start using Kremel hair tonic at once. You see, Kremel is a highly specialized hair tonic. It contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why it keeps hair neatly in place longer and gives the hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never greasy or sticky. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking attractive. Its light oils have a fine lubricating effect on a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes loose dandruff. And a quick massage with Kreml stimulates the circulation of blood in the surface of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated your scalp feels. And men... You like to rub Kreml on your scalp because it's such a clean hair tonic. Never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and looks as if it had some body to it. So men, for better groomed hair and a hygienic scalp, change to Kreml. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, so you went to interview that village doctor and arrived there to find him dead. Yes, Mr. Bell, but before we reported the tragedy to the police, Sherlock Holmes conducted an intensive search of the dead man's room. After a moment, he turned to me and said... Watson, we must see what the inanimate objects in this room can tell us. Aha, here's the doctor's appointment pad. Let's see who his last visitor was. Look, look, there's the name of Darlington. Yes, but that tells us little. If the companion's story is true, the word Darlington could refer to either of the women or to Lord Darlington himself. But what are these letters scribbled before the word Darlington? Why must doctors have such illegible handwriting? Doctors don't have illegible handwriting. I disagree. Hmm? In fact, I've often thought they train you to write badly in medical colleges. Yes. The letters are R-E, re. Re, re Darlington. That means that someone was calling about the Darlington case. A fact we already knew. Yes, oh, sure do. Uh, let's sure do. see what else we can find. Hello. Look over here on the sideboard. Brandy decanter with a stopper left out. And one glass that has been drunk from. The killer must have had a drink after he shot the doctor. And in so doing, I think he gave us the clue to his identity. Oh, how? There's a speck on the rim of this glass. I think it's... Ah, the very thing. The doctor's microscope. Most convenient. What does it tell you, Holmes? Uh, wait a minute. Aha. Uh -huh. I was right. This speck on the glass is wax. Wax? Then that means the murderer used a candle. Oh, no, Watson. Oh, then... Come on. Oh, we must go back to the village and report his death. And then we'll catch the next train to London. Uh, aren't you going to stay here and help the police? Why should I? Beyond telling them the name of the murderer. You mean you know who did it? Of course. And so should you. Well, I don't. But we don't know the answer to the Darlington substitution scandal. That answer, Watson, still lies in London. Nine thousand, nine thousand five hundred, ten thousand pounds. Well, there you are, Reginald. Thank you, my dear cousin. I'll put the money in my bag, Reginald. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Lord Darlington. That sheaf of banknotes in Miss Harry's hand. Surely you didn't pay the blackmail. I discussed the matter with my wife, Mr. Holmes. She's deeply upset. We both agreed that the scandal, once started, would cling to us for life. Even if it was disproved later. That's why I paid the money. You engaged me as your representative in this case, Lord Darlington. Miss Harris, give that money back at once. It was a gift from Lord Darlington, in front of a witness. If you try to touch it, I shall send for a policeman. That won't be necessary. Two of them are waiting in the anteroom now. Police! Oh, Holmes, you shouldn't have done it. I wanted no breath of this scandal to emerge from beyond these four walls. The fact that police are here has nothing to do with the problems of blackmail. 
I brought them here to apprehend a murderer. A murderer? Well, what do you mean? Dr. Godfrey, your wife's physician, was shot dead during the past 24 hours. He was killed before he could tell us the true answer to the parentage of the child upstairs. Murdered? Oh, what a dreadful thing. Have you any idea who did it? Every idea, Lord Darlington. But before I expose the criminal, I'd be obliged if you'd bring Lady Darlington here. And also the child. Oh, very well, Holmes. This is going to be a terrible shock to her. You're suddenly very quiet, Mr. Tremaine. Am I? I was wondering who might have killed Dr. Godfrey. Fortunately, we don't have to wonder. The murderer left a clue. After he'd committed the crime, he made the mistake of taking a drink. Darlington's quite a drinking man, you know. And you have been known to take a drink on occasions too, Mr. Tremaine. For instance, uh, after you'd killed Dr. Godfrey. After I'd... What rubbish are you saying? You see, the murderer left a tiny blob of wax on the glass. Oh, what does that prove? Merely that someone had been carrying a candle. But this wasn't candle wax. It was cosmetic wax, such as you used to wax that pointed moustache of yours. Reginald. All right, all of you, I'm getting out of here. <gasps> He's snatched my bag. Reginald, come back here. I'll go after him. No, no, Watson. The police are prepared to arrest him, but not the young lady. We shall need her cooperation in the last act of this little tragedy. But surely the whole thing's clear by now. If Tremaine killed the doctor, obviously the whole story about the substitution is, is a lie. Not necessarily. Even if it were true, the doctor was still a menace to his plans. How could he and Miss Harris ask the highest price for their secret when the doctor also knew it? No, Watson. Tremaine had a motive for murder either way. In the meanwhile, I must set the stage before Lady Darlington gets here. Where'd I put that parcel? Oh, here it is. What the devil have you got in there, Holmes? A present from a plumber friend of mine. Though the object in this pa package is only a simple tool of his trade, I feel that it may give us the answer to a peer's inheritance. Upon my soul, you're being very mysterious. In a few moments, I propose to conduct a test. You must hide outside the windows. When I turn down the gaslight over the mantel here, Watson, I want you to strike a match, apply it to the object in this package, and toss it through the open window. At the same time... Cry out the word fire at the top of your oh, voice. Fire, I remember that. I think the results of the experiment may prove quite startling. <laughs> Lord Darlington, now that all the principals in this case are assembled, I shall conduct my experiment. Very well, Holmes. I don't see why I had to bring the boy down here. It's long past his bedtime. I assure you, Lady Darlington, that his presence is absolutely essential. Please place him in the bassinet on the sofa. All right. Uh, that's it. And you, Miss Harris, will you be good enough to place your handbag on the table? Mm, very well, Mr. Holmes. But no funny business now. The police took it away from Reggie and gave it back to me. That money's mine. Each of you ladies claim to be the mother of that boy. Since scientific tests of parentage are notoriously unreliable, I shall conduct a simple experiment which I think may give us the truth in this matter. Now... I want both you ladies to come toward me with outstretched hands. That's it. I turn down the gaslight over the mantel. So. Ah! Ah! Oh, 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 it's all right. It's all right. If you look closely, you'll observe that this object is a perfectly harmless plumber's smoke rocket. Ah! Oh, ah! You can drop the masquerade, Watson. The case is solved. Ah! Oh, is it home? Holmes, what on earth are you up to? You'll notice that on the cry of fire... Miss Harris ran for her handbag containing the 10,000 pounds. Lady Darlington instinctively rushed to her son. I think, Lord Darlington, that there can no longer be any question of the child's parentage. Midnight. <laughs> been a long day, Holmes. Yes, but uh, profitable, Watson. A very profitable day's work indeed. Here's a thousand guineas from Lord Darlington. And uh, don't overlook the 20 pounds that Mr. Tremaine oh, gave me. Sean, he retained you for protection and you end up by sending him to the gallows. A fate that he richly deserves. I only wish I could have persuaded Lord Darlington to prosecute Miss Harris. Blackmail is a devilish crime. It's funny to think that a simple plumber's rocket smoked out the truth. Yes. Though, you'll remember, I've had occasion to use the instrument before. When a woman thinks her house is on fire, her impulse is at once to rush to the thing she values most. It's a perfectly overpowering instinct. Well, you certainly took advantage of the fact. Ah, well, Watson, you may remember the old Persian saying, there's danger for him who taketh the tiger cub. 
and danger for whoso snatches delusion from a woman. Oh, really? Oh, yes, Watson. There's as much sense in Hafiz as in Horace, and as much knowledge of the world. Well, Dr. Watson, that was a very exciting story. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bell. Incidentally, don't you think you'd better tell our listeners about the change of day and time for our next meeting? Yes, of course. Ladies and gentlemen, our next broadcast will be on Monday, January 13th, over these same stations. And better consult your newspaper for the time. Girls, have you noticed how men can't help but admire the bright, shimmering highlights in a woman's hair? Then why not follow the advice of the famous Million Dollar Powers models? Girls noted for their glossy, bright hair. Powers models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. This amazingly beautifying Cremel Shampoo actually glamour bathes each tiny strand of hair and uncovers all its natural, radiant luster. Yes, and Cremel Shampoo never dries the hair. In fact, it has a beneficial oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Its luxurious active foam thoroughly cleanses the hair and scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. So, ladies, buy a bottle of Cremel Shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of tantalizing loveliness. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, how about next week? It's not next week, uh, Mr. Bell. It's a week from next Monday. Yes, of course. Well, what story are you going to tell us a week from next I Monday? I think I'll tell you about the Devil's Foot. The Devil's Foot? What was that? I won't tell you now, Mr. Bell, but I will say that Sherlock Holmes and I never encountered a more gruesome or a more horrible mystery. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Scandal in Bohemia. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo and inviting you to be with us one week from Monday. That's January 13th when Dr. Watson will tell us about the devil's foot. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now suppose we begin by calling on Mr. Holmes' biographer and friend, the genial Dr. Watson. We find him in his comfortable, firelit study, leaning back in his easy chair, ready to begin his story. The fire feels good tonight, doesn't it, Dr. Watson? Indeed it does, but sit down, Mr. Bell, sit down and let's get on with the story. You are in a hurry, aren't you? Well, I suppose I am. As a matter of fact, the adventure I'm going to relate was one of the most gruesome experiences I ever hoped to encounter. Perhaps I'd better not tell it after all. It's Brings up memories. Oh, to... come now, Doctor Watson. You're not going back on us now. You promised last week to tell us. Uh, what was the name of the story? The Adventure of the Devil's Foot, or the Cornish Horror. The very thought of it makes my blood run cold. I can hardly wait, Doctor Watson. But first, men, I'd like to remind you about this famous modern trend in hair grooming, which is preferred among top-flight executives and America's most successful men. It's called Cremel Hair Tonic. One of the many reasons Kreml has become such a nationwide favorite is that it never plasters the hair down with sticky goo, which makes your hair and scalp feel so dirty. It never gives hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look. You see, Kreml is a very highly specialized hair tonic. It contains a unique and utterly different combination of hair grooming ingredients, which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why Kreml keeps unruly hair so neatly in place longer with such a handsome, healthy-looking luster. 
What I especially like about Cremel is that after you use it, you can run your hand back over your hair and your hair never feels sticky or dirty. No greasy film comes off on your hand. Yet Cremel hair keeps hair in perfect order throughout the busiest day. Always looking so handsome and well-groomed. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the devil's foot or the Cornish horror? It was the spring of the year 1897. Holmes's iron constitution had shown some signs of giving way due to a particularly arduous and nerve-wracking winter. In March of that year, Dr. Moore Agar of Harley Street gave positive injunctions that Holmes get out into the country for a protracted rest. Well, the third week in March found us settled in a small cottage near Poldu Bay at the further extremity of the Cornish Peninsula. Isn't that rather a bleak country for a convalescent, Dr. Watson? Bleak is putting it mildly. I've never known such grim surroundings, but it suited Holmes admirably. He seemed to blossom in that weird and foreboding fog-swept district. Just as natural perversion as I suppose. Oh, I dare say. Our little whitewashed cottage stood on a grassy headland. From its windows, we looked down upon the whole sinister semicircle of Mounts Bay, that old death trap, with its fringe of black cliffs and surge-swept reefs. In every direction there were traces of some vanished race which had left as its sole record strange monuments of stone. Holmes spent most of his time pottering round these weird ruins. Everything was going along peacefully until one morning our simple and healthy routine was violently interrupted. We were precipitated into the middle of a series of gruesome and nerve-shattering events. Quite a surf this morning, eh, Watson? You can see the spray flung up against our windows, and we're a good hundred feet above sea level. I don't think I shall venture out today. Hmm, bad weather. Old boy is certainly lashing himself into a fine frenzy. What do you mean, the old boy, Holmes? The devil, Watson. The devil himself. What are you raving about? Didn't I tell you that the natives hereabouts refer to that seething death trap down there as the Devil's Cauldron? They think the old gentleman himself lives there. How unsettling. Yes, a very interesting superstition. You know, Watson, this locality is supposed to have been the last resort of devil worship in England. Oh, really? Really? Many scientists believe that those huge prehistoric monuments of stone were part of a temple given over to the Prince of Darkness. Preposterous. Oh, I don't know. It's as logical as most of the theories that endeavor to explain their existence. The superstition goes on to say that when the devil was finally driven from his temple, he took refuge in the bay down there. Yes, they claim that on stormy nights you can hear his hoofbeats as he races up and down the rocks. Holmes, what are you trying to do? Give me a case of nerves. Hello, what's this? What's this? Someone is running up our path, his cloak flapping about like a giant bat. Why, it's that Tregenis fellow, the one who boards with the vicar. Mortimer Tregenis, eh? I wonder what's happened. Face as white as a sheet. Couldn't look more upset if he'd seen Beals above himself. Open the door, Watson. Mr. Holmes, thank heaven I find you at home. The most terrible thing has happened. I can scarcely believe it. Oh, sit down, my dear fellow, sit down. That's better. Now, perhaps you can tell us what has happened. My family, my, my sister, we were playing cards. Oh, slowly now, take your time. My family, my sister and my two brothers, it's too terrible. Why, just last night I was with them at the house. Tredanic warfare, it's called. All well and happy. We played cards. And now, without warning, I can't believe it. Easy, Tregenis, easy, there's a good fellow. I, I left them last night. My sister Brenda... My two brothers, Owen and George. What time was that? The, the, the clock in the church steeple over at Polo was chiming ten o'clock as I closed the front door behind me. I'd left them all in the card room, laughing and in good spirits. And? This morning, being an early riser, I was out taking a walk before breakfast when Dr. Richards overtook me in his carriage with the news that he'd been sent for and a most urgent call from Tredanic Warfare. Something terrible had happened to my family. I jumped in beside him and he whipped up the horses. And what did you find? Oh, Mr. Holmes, it was terrible, ghastly. My two brothers and my sister, there in the card room, just as I had left them. But what a change. What a ghastly change. Yes? Brenda lay back stone dead in her chair. And my two brothers sat on each side of her, laughing and shouting and singing. The senses stricken clean out of them. And all three of them, my poor dead sister and my two demented brothers, 
retained upon their faces an expression of ghastly horror, a, a convulsion of terror. How terrible. Yes. Dr. Richard was so overcome at the sight that he fell fainting into a chair. Hmm. Anyone else in the house besides your sister and brothers? Only Mrs. Porter, the old housekeeper. I presume it was she who found them this morning. Yes. She always goes through the house in the mornings, airing it out before the family comes down. When she reached the card room, the shock was too much for her. She's had a nervous collapse. We had to put her to bed. No, no wonder. An exceptional case. Most exceptional. That's what we thought. We could find no traces of strangers in or around the house. Nothing was stolen, nothing touched. The vicar believes you are the only one who can solve the case, Mr. Holmes. He insisted I come to you. I shall be only too glad to handle the matter, of course. But uh, first I must ask you a few questions. Anything, Mr. Holmes, anything. To begin with, Mr. Tregenis, why do you live with a vicar separated from your family? Well, as a matter of fact, we had a slight argument a few years ago about some property it was... But that was all settled long ago. We were on the best of terms. Now, Mr. Tregenis, about last night. Uh, do you recall anything, uh, anything at all, that was out of the ordinary? There was one thing that occurs to me. As we sat at the card table, my back was to the window. George was facing me. Suddenly, I saw him look hard over my shoulder out of the window. I turned quickly, and just for a moment, I thought I caught a glimpse of something, something moving. Man or animal? I don't quite know. My brother said he had the same feeling. It's uncanny, that's what it is. Something came into that room, and that something killed my sister and dashed the light of reason from my brother's mind. Something devilish it was. If that should prove to be the case, I fear I shall be of very little assistance, Mr. Tregenis. But short of wrestling with his satanic majesty, I think perhaps we can solve your problem. Come, Watson. We'd best go down to Tredanic Water at once. <laughs> This is the house, Mr. Holmes. Whose carriage is this coming down the drive with the blinds down? There's somebody in it. Listen. <laughs> My brothers. My poor brothers. It, it's Dr. Richard's carriage. He's taking them to Helston Asylum. It's too awful. My poor brother. Easy, Tregenis, easy. Pull yourself together. I, I'll do my best. Good man. Which are the windows of the card room? Uh, this one here. Oh, look out, Holmes. You've upset the washing can. Dear, dear, how clumsy of me. Sorry, Tregenis. I'm afraid I've drenched your boots. But no matter, Mr. Holmes, no matter. Shall we go in? Yes. I have seen all I need to see out here. This way. The card room is over here. Do you notice anything, Watson? No, I can't say that I do. This is the card room. Hmm. I see the window's still open. The housekeeper left it that way, I presume? Yes, she says it was locked on the inside when she came in. Quite so. I think we may close it now. Well, I'll do it, Holmes. No, let me. Candle's quite gutted out. Yes, card's still on the table. They have not risen from their chairs, I take it, and you left at ten. That sets the hour of death at some time before eleven. Hmm. Fire burned out. Why fire? Had they always a fire in this small room on a spring evening? It was cold and damp last night, Mr. Holmes. The fire was lit shortly after my arrival. I see. Well, that seems to be about all. No disturbance of any kind. Strange. Oh, come along, Holmes. Come along. The room gives me the jumps. There's something about the atmosphere. As though death was still hovering in the air. I wonder. Come, Watson. We will return to our cottage. Should uh, anything occur to me, Mr. Tregenis, I shall communicate with you. It won't do, Watson. It won't do. All the facts are negative. Well, do you think Mr. Tregenis' account of his actions last night was truthful? Quite, Watson. Quite. You remember the incident of this spilt watering can? I did that to obtain an impression of his foot. I take it you succeeded? I did. With that print as a sample, I was able to trace his movements last night. His story is correct. He left the house at about ten, went straight back to the vicarage and did not return. Nor did anyone else enter or leave that house. Then it... 
must have been the man or, or animal they, they thought they saw in the bushes. He must have returned and frightened them to death. There was no such man or animal, Watson. Last night was a dark night. Anyone who had the wish to frighten these people would be compelled to put his face against the glass before he could be seen. Well? There is a three-foot flower border outside the cardroom window. But there are absolutely no footprints there. Yes, but, but, but that means... It means that... Mr. Tregenny's sister and her two brothers were alone when death struck the sister down and drove the brothers insane. But, Holmes, that would be supernatural. I hope not, Watson. Look, look, here I comes another not. visitor up our path. Stranger this time. Big, savage-looking fellow. That, my dear Watson, is none other than the famous Dr. Leon Sterndale. Sterndale, the lion hunter and explorer? Exactly. Oh, that's what he doing in this neighborhood. Oh, I've heard he owns a little cottage about five miles down the coast. They tell me he lives there absolutely by himself when he isn't off on one of his expeditions. Never mind, Watson. I'll do the honors myself. Come in, Dr. Sterndale. Come in. Mr. Holmes? Yes. And this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Holmes, I've come to you about the tragedy to Danick Walther. The police are utterly at a loss. You have a keener brain. Pardon me, Dr. Sterndale, but why are you so concerned in this affair? Well, you see, during my many residences in this locality, I've come to know the family of Tregenis very well. I see. Their, their horrible fate has been a great shock to me, Mr. Holmes. I am so sorry. As a matter of fact, I was on my way to Africa. I got as far as Plymouth when the news reached me this morning. I came straight back to help in the inquiry. But uh, that would make you lose your ship. One sailed for Africa this afternoon, if I'm not mistaken. I can take the next. When did you last see the Tregenis family, Dr. Sterndale? I saw Brenda, uh, Miss Tregenis, three days ago. Just as I was leaving for Plymouth. Oh, so, you have been in Plymouth for the last three days? Yes, in Plymouth. But how did you get the news so quickly? Surely the Plymouth papers didn't carry an account of the matter in this morning's edition? I received a telegram. A telegram? Might I ask from whom? You're very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business, Dr. Sterndale. Very well. The telegram was sent by the vicar, Mr. Roundkey. I see. And now, Mr. Holmes, have you reached any conclusions? Conclusions? No, that would be a trifle premature. But I have every hope of bringing this matter to a satisfactory termination. Satisfactory to me, that is. Would you mind telling me if your suspicions point in any particular direction? I, uh... I do not feel that this is the moment to answer that question, Dr. Sterndale. Oh, and I see that I've been wasting my time. I need not prolong this visit. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hmm. Close mouth fellow, Dr. Sterndale, isn't he, Holmes? He told me more than he realized, Watson. But he knows even more. How could he if he was in Plymouth? But was he, Watson? That statement is something for us to look into. Just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes as he endeavors to solve the strange mystery of Tadanic Water. But first, men, remember if you want to keep your hair handsome and healthy looking, one of the first requisites is a hygienic scalp. So why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of a highly specialized hair tonic like Cremel? Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why it keeps unruly hair neatly in place longer with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kreml never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. It never leaves hair feeling sticky, gummy, or dirty. Your hair and scalp always look and feel so clean with Kreml. And if your hair is so dry it breaks and falls when you comb it, start using Kreml at once. Let it make your hair feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. Cremel is also fine to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes. A quick massage with Cremel helps stimulate the cutaneous circulation of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated your scalp feels. So for better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp, change to Cremel at once. Buy a bottle of Cremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. K-R-E-M-L... Kreml hair tonic. 
I say, Holmes, must you go on smoking that foul pipe? The atmosphere's so thick I can hardly see across the room as it is. Oh, dear, I feel depressed. Who knows what evil thing is talking abroad in, in this neighborhood? Light the lamp, Watson. It's the gathering twilight that makes it gloomy. Rubbish. Look here, Holmes, what about that Dr. Sterndale? Do you think he did it? No, Watson. I've been in communication with his Plymouth Hotel. His story was correct. He had been there for the past three days, and he did receive a telegram from the vicar this morning. Oh, and he couldn't possibly have had anything to do with the Tugenes tragedy last night. Quite. I didn't think he had a connection with the tragedy. But there is a connection with... Now what? Mr. Holmes! Oh, Mr. Holmes! Open the door, Watson. Ah, my dear vicar, come in, come in. Dear me, you look as though you'd seen a ghost. It's tracked him down. The curse of the family. He's dead. Dead with that same look of terror on his face. Who's dead? Mortimer Trichenis. In his study at the vicarage. Great Scott. My servant found him there, sitting beside his table, his face turned toward the window, and distorted with that same convulsion of fear that marked the features of his sister. Oh, my poor Paris. Satan himself is loose among us. We are devil-ridden, Mr. Holmes. Devil-ridden. <laughs> This was his study, Mr. Holmes. Mm, depressing atmosphere. It was worse. I had the servant open the window. He's quite ill from shock, poor fellow. What a terrible look on Tregenis's face, Holmes. The whole body is contorted and convulsed in a very paroxysm of fear. You've never seen death in this form before, Watson? No, never. You know of no poison that would have this effect? Good heavens, no. Hmm. Lamp is lit... It's burning over an hour. Notes the oil consumed. And yet, darkness has just set in. Did anyone call at the vicarage this afternoon? No. I was out myself, but my servant says he let no one in. Then Trigenis was alone when he... I wonder. The window was shut at the time of his death, but the lamp was lit. Curious. The window. Let's see. The window. Yes, by Jove, I think I found something. What's that you're putting in your pocket, Holmes? And the lamp. Of course, the lamp. Notice this powder which has been spilled on the base of the lamp? Red brown powder. Give me an envelope, Watson. I must have these specks of powder. Why are you so excited about the powder, Holmes? Because it contains the solution of our mystery, Watson. It is the source and the solution. <laughs> Holmes, you haven't touched your supper. Mm. What a foul night. The wind's rising again. Oh, have another cup of tea and be quiet. Watson. I don't want to be quiet. I want to talk. I'm tired of waiting here listening to that blasted wind and the roar of the water down there below. Why did you send for Dr. Sterndale? Because he is an authority on obs obscure African poisons. Poisons? Why are you interested in poisons? Watson... There are two striking points in common in both cases under observation. Yes? In both cases, the atmosphere of the room had a curious effect on the persons who first entered it. The housekeeper and the vicar's servant were both overcome, as was the doctor who was called That's in. That's right. I hadn't thought of that. The room was still stuffy when we entered it. Right. And in each case, there was combustion going on in the room. The fire in the first case, the lamp in the second, and the lamp was not necessary. It was still daylight when it was lit. Yes, but I still don't see... Uh, what... Something was burned in each case which produced an atmosphere causing strange toxic effects. An unknown poison. Good heavens! I believe we have a sample of that poison in the brown powder spilled on the base of the lamp. Well, how are you going to prove it? I'm going to burn some of that powder. Notice its effect. Just a small pinch of powder. Yes. Uh, perhaps you'd better leave the room, Watson. And... Leave you alone in here? Certainly not. I warn you, it's risky. Confound that wind! Come along, come along. Let's get it on with it and get it over. Very well. Uh, place your chair opposite mine. Then we can watch each other for developments. If anything alarming happens, we can end the experiment. All right. Come on. I'm ready. Good. I put a pinch of the powder into our lamp. Oh, I say, what a... What a filthy smell. Hmm. Musky, subtle, nauseous... Listen to the wind, Holmes. I'm afraid. I don't know why. 
That wind. I can feel my hair rising. Holmes, do you see it? That cloud bank, whirling, black and sinister. It's monstrous. It's concealing something, something too wicked to imagine. Holmes, it's coming nearer and nearer. Can't you smell it? Sulfur and brimstone. You hear that, Holmes? It's hoofbeats. Hoofbeats. I know what it is. I can see it. I can't stand this. It's too terrible. Holmes! Watch it for the love of heaven. Don't get in. Don't breathe. I'll smash the window. I'll smash it. Yeah. That's better. Oh. Breathe in, oh. Watson. Breathe it in. It's good, clean air. Oh. Why, Joe, what an arrow's cape. I had no idea it was oh, so powerful. I thought I... I thought I saw... I thought... I know. I, uh... It's a poison that affects the nerve centers of the imagination. The strain is enough to kill a man or drive him crazy. Hello, there's someone knocking at the door. Oh, so, so that's what I heard. The air seems cleared out. Good thing there was a high wind. I'll close the shutters oh, and draw the curtain. Watson, can you open the door now? Yes, I think so. Phew, my, my knees are still shaking. Good evening, Mr. Holmes. You sent for me? Yes. Come in, Dr. Sterndale. Come in. Hmm. You, you look rather pale, both of you. Yes. We've uh, just been conducting a little experiment with the poison that killed Trugenis. You? Yes, Dr. Sterndale. Perhaps you'd like to tell us why you killed Mortimer Trugenis. I? Preposterous. You can't prove it? No. Let me tell you how you did it. You came over to the vicarage late this afternoon. You didn't want anyone to know you'd visited Trugenis. He was to let you in himself. But how could you attract his attention? You brought some pebbles with you, pink pebbles from a heap beside your house. You threw these at the study window, where you knew Trugenis was working. I found some of these pebbles on the windowsill. Trigenis came downstairs, let you in himself. You had a talk with him, made him light his lamp, placed a pinch of the poison powder in the flame, and left. You're... You're right, Mr. Holmes. I did kill Mortimer Trigenis. But I'm not guilty of the other atrocity. I swear I'm not. I believe you, Dr. Sterndale. But you know who did it. Perhaps you'd better tell us about it. Very well. It was Mortimer Trigenis. What? He admitted it before I... before he died. Mr. Holmes, I've been in love with Brenda Trigenis for many years. We were to have been married when my work in Africa was finished. I've lived so long in places where man is a lord unto himself. He... He killed Brenda in cold blood. He killed her. I have nothing else to live for. By heaven, I do it again. How did Mortimer Trigenis get hold of the poison? It was something unusual, almost unknown. Yes, it was powdered pes diable. Pes diable? Devil's foot, eh? Yes, a root found in Africa. Shaped like a foot, half human, half goat-like. I have the only specimen in England. And you showed it to Trigenis? Yes, he came over the other afternoon when I was packing. He was interested in my African curiosities, particularly this powder. How he took it, I can't say. I thought no more of the matter until I had received the vicar's telegram and learned how they died. I returned at once. I, looking into the tragedy, I was convinced Mortimer Trigenis was the murderer, that he'd done it to gain control of the family fortune. There was the crime, but what was to be his punishment? What jury would believe such a fantastic story? No. I decided to take the law into my own hands. Perhaps if you ever loved anyone, you'll know how I felt. Hmm. Dr. Sterndale, what were your plans when you set out for Plymouth? I had intended to bury myself in Central Africa. My work is only half finished. Go and finish the other half, Dr. Sterndale. I do not feel called upon to prevent you. What a gruesome story, Dr. Watson. Yes, next to the famous Hound of the Basketball Adventure, that was the most gruesome experience that we ever had. There's just one thing I'd like to know. What did you think you saw in that cloud of smoke? Mr. Burl, you'll have to believe me when I tell you it was too horrible to mention. Just to think of it is enough 
to make my blood run cold. Ladies and gentlemen, in a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Girls, Powers models are famous for their beauty and charm. And one of their most outstanding characteristics is their glorious, shining, bright hair. Now, here's how they keep it so shining. Powers models use cremel shampoo. This amazing, beautifying shampoo has been especially developed to actually glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair, revealing all its natural, glossy luster. Yes, and don't forget cremel shampoo is wonderful for washing children's hair, too. Of course it is, because there are no harsh caustics or chemicals in cremel shampoo, and its luxurious, active foam thoroughly cleanses scalp and hair of all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Girls, if you could only see how Powers Models hair fairly radiates natural glossy highlights, I'm sure you'd want to try Cremel Shampoo right away. You can get a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week. Next week, I think I'll tell you about the adventure... Of the unfortunate brides. Well, it sounds intriguing, Dr. White. It was, Mr. Bell. It was indeed <laughs> intriguing. It concerned a honeymoon in Scotland and a bridegroom who turned out to be a cold-blooded and ruthless killer. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was adapted by Edith Miser from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Devil's Foot. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the case of the unfortunate brides. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time to keep that weekly appointment with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Draw up your chair and settle down. Thank you. That's it. All ready with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, Dr. Yes. Watson? Yes. Well, and as I was going over my notes on the case, I, I came across this. I think it might interest you. Well, what is it? It looks like an ordinary piece of clay. It is clay, but I assure you it's very far from ordinary. This piece of dried earth enabled Sherlock Holmes to solve one of the most diabolical murders that we ever encountered. I call the case The Singular Affair of the Babbling Butler. I can hardly wait to hear the story. <laughs> I'm sure that you'll wait long enough to have a word with our listeners now, won't you, Mr. Bell? Yes, Dr. Watson, but it won't take me a moment. In a recent poll, women picked the ten best-dressed men in America. These men were all men at the top. Statesmen, governors, movie stars, producers, and millionaires. And I know you'll be interested in hearing how a recent survey showed that Kremel hair tonic is preferred among America's top flight executives and most successful men. But why shouldn't Kremel be? Kremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kremel gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. Such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. Kremel also keeps hair neatly in place longer, with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet it never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. After you apply Kremel, you can rub your hand over your hair and your hair feels so delightfully clean. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or on your hat band. Just use a little Kremel in the morning, and at night your hair looks as neatly groomed as when you combed it in the morning. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the singular affair of the babbling butler? Well, that adventure began on a November evening many years ago. 
For four days, a dense yellow fog had virtually marooned Holmes and me in our Baker Street lodgings. The first day, the great man had spent in cross-indexing his huge book of references. The second and third had been patiently occupied upon a subject which he had recently made his hobby, the music of the Middle Ages. But when on the fourth day, we still saw the heavy brown swirl drifting past us and condensing in oily drops upon the window panes, my old friend's active and impatient nature began to assert itself. He started to pace restlessly about our room in a fever of suppressed energy. Confound this part. Oh, do stop pacing up and down, Holmes. No good getting angry with the weather. That's one problem even you can't do anything about. It isn't the weather, Watson. It's the infernal dullness of the London criminal these days. Come over here to the window. Oh, what is it, Holmes? Look out there. See how the figures loom up, are dimly seen, and then blend once more into the fog. What a night for a thief or a murderer, Watson. He could roam London as a tiger does the jungle, unseen until he pounces. It's fortunate for this community that I'm not a criminal. Yes, it is indeed. Suppose that I were Brooks or Woodhouse or any of the 50 men who have good reason for taking my life. How long could I survive against my own pursuit? A summons, a bogus appointment, and all would be over. What a depressing thought. The only thing that depresses me is an inactivity. Why doesn't something happen? Why doesn't someone come to me with a problem? <laughs> it sounds as if your prayer's been answered. I hope so. See who it is, Watson, will you? It'll save Mrs. Hudson a trip. Yes, of course. It's all right, Mrs. Hudson. Ask the, the gentleman to come up, please. This way up, sir. You wish to see Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Uh, yes, sir, I do. Then come along in. My name's Watson, Dr. Watson... And this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson? Uh, my name is Jenkins. I'm butler to Sir Roderick Martin. Sir Roderick Martin? Indeed. Sit down, Jenkins. No, thank you, sir. Sir thank Roderick you. Martin, isn't he the theatrical producer? Yes, Watson. And he is quite famous in his own circle for his cynicism and a certain mordant wit. Your master needs my services, I presume, Jenkins? Uh, yes, Mr. Holmes, he does. He's in desperate trouble, and he'd like you to come over to his house at once. Well, what kind of trouble is he in? Oh, please don't ask any questions, sir. Just come to the house and see for yourselves. I've long wanted to meet Sir Roderick. I believe it was he who gave currency to that pun. Though he might be more humble, there's no police like Holmes. That's not a pun, eh? No police like Holmes. <laughs> I'm glad it amuses you, Watson. Oh, sorry. Oh, I implore you to come with. Please, gentlemen, come with me. Whatever your master's problems may be, I think I would enjoy a discussion with him. Perhaps on the topic of humility. Yes, Jenkins, we'll accompany you at once. <laughs> This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, sir. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, Jenkins. Oh, how very odd. Now, why should Jenkins make such a meteoric exit? I presume, Sir Roderick, he wished to leave us alone. Indeed, what a singularly depressing thought. Well, so now that he's gone, you can talk quite freely. My dear Dr. Watson, I've been in the habit of talking freely ever since I had the pleasure of insulting my nurse at the age of four. She was a peculiarly revolting female by the name of Pearl. After 44 years, I still can't think of a more inappropriate name for her. Sir Roderick, your childhood reminiscences are fascinating, but supposing we get down to business? Very well, Holmes. To what do I owe the, uh, well, for lack of a better word, the pleasure of this visit? Your butler came to fetch us. He said that you were in desperate trouble and needed our help. Jenkins told you that. I can only assume that he stole more than his usual quota of brandy today. I've noticed in the past that alcohol seems to give him the quaintest delusions. Then uh, you don't wish to consult me professionally? No, Holmes, I don't. Nor do I wish the services of a doctor. Therefore, I suggest you both retire and ask Jenkins for your hats and an explanation. Good evening, gentlemen. It's one of his stupid jokes, Holmes. The bounder's trying to make a fool of you. I think not, Watson. It'd be a singularly pointless joke and far below his standard. No, I believe there's some other game afoot. Though Sir Roderick dismissed us somewhat unceremoniously, I think we may still be reasonably certain of a welcome in the servants' quarters. You're going to talk to the butler? Yes, Watson. I'm certain he's neither been drinking nor suffering from delusions. I'm convinced that the man is in mortal terror of his life.
Oh, thank heavens you came to see me, Mr. Holmes. Well, how could we resist it when Sir Roderick told us that your entire story was a lie? Oh, you must forgive me, gentlemen. I, I was desperate with fear, and I, I had to attract your attention. But why? You've accomplished your purpose now. You've thoroughly roused my curiosity. But I repeat, why? Because I'm in terror of my life, sir. Someone's trying to murder me. Well, what reason have you for saying that, Jenkins? Last night an attempt was made to kill me. Oh? Please describe the circumstances. Well, sir, I, I was carrying a keg of wine down into the cellar. I slipped from my arms and hit the stairs, and then the stairs collapsed. When I examined them, I found that they'd been sawed almost through. Hmm. I assume that you are the only member of the household who ever visits the wine cellar? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That was a deliberate trap to break my neck. Well, if I'd stepped down, it would have been the end of me. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I, I'm only a servant. I couldn't pay you much, Oh, but... my dear Jenkins, I assure you that Mr. Holmes is as interested in preventing the murder of a servant as he is, is in saving the life of a prime minister. Uh, Jenkins, have you any idea who might want to kill you? There's only one person on earth with a motive for killing me, sir. And that's my master. Mr. Roderick Martin. Oh, come, 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 my dear man. You're surely mistaken. What reason do you have for suspecting him? Oh, it's this way, Mr. Holmes. A year ago, a certain lady killed herself when Sir Roderick jilted her. Good gracious. Well, the affair was all hushed up, and huh? nobody knew Sir Roderick was even involved. But her brother swore to avenge her death. That brother is a very close friend of Sir Roderick's. He has never suspected him. Complicated situation, eh, Holmes? Yes, Watson. I take it, Jenkins, you are the only person who knows that your master was guilty? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And if I were dead, his secret would be safe. Oh, Mr. Holmes, please, what can I do? I, I know he's planning my death. You've got to save me, sir. Jenkins, my advice is this. Write a full statement of the circumstances in this case. Sign and seal it and hand it over to me for safekeeping. Inform your master that if anything happens to you, I shall make public the contents of the statement. That's a very good idea, huh? I'll do that, sir. I'll do that. I'll bring it to you in the morning. Splendid. Come on, Watson. Oh, uh, by the way, Jenkins... What's the name of your doctor? A doctor, sir. I, I never said that. You never said what? Oh, oh, oh yes, doctor. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. David Stanley in Wimpole Street. Dr. David Stanley. I see. Well, good night, Jenkins. We shall expect you in the morning. But why are we going to see Dr. Stanley? Firstly, because I want his physician's opinion as to whether Jenkins might be suffering from hysterical delusions. Well, as a doctor myself, I say that's more likely. I must say his actions tonight hardly seem the behavior of a sane man. When a man is badly frightened, Watson, it's sometimes hard to judge his actions by uh, more rational standards. Incidentally... Did you notice the way he started when I asked him the name of his doctor? Almost certainly, Dr. David Stanley is the vengeful killer. Hi, George. Now that you mention it, I do remember hearing some gossip in Harley Street about Stanley's sister killing herself. But uh, nobody seemed to know the motive. Well, here's the house, Watson. Well, let's hope the doctor's at home. If he isn't, we haven't come very far out of our way. Want me to wait for you, Governor? No, thank you, Cabby. Here you are. Oh, thank you, Governor. Get I can hear a piano playing. Someone is at home. That seems an eminently logical deduction. There's no need to be funny, Holmes. Good evening. My name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? I'm Mrs. Stanley. How we do? wondered if we might have a few words with your husband. With David? Come in, won't you, gentlemen? Mr. Holmes... You're a detective, aren't you? Yes, Mrs. Stanley. I hope you haven't come here to talk to David about his sister's death. Not directly, madam. Though my mission is not uh, unconnected with that tragedy. Then I can't let you see. Well, really, Mrs. Stanley, my friend only no, wishes to... No, gentlemen. For the sake of his sanity, I daren't let you talk to him. Ever since his sister died, he's been like a soul tormented. Spends most of his time in there playing those frightening compositions of his on the piano. I can't let him be subjected to any more questioning about his sister. Even I daren't mention her. Sylvia, I heard voices. I, uh... Oh. oh. Who are these gentlemen? It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, dear. How do you do, Dr. Turner? I hope we're not intruding, sir. The great Sherlock Holmes and his friend Dr. Watson intruding? Well, of course not. I'm flattered. Come in, come in, gentlemen. 
please don't say anything about his sister's death. Don't worry, Mrs. Stanley. We won't. No, 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 of course not. Holmes, I, I believe you're something of a musician. I, I'd like your opinion of this. David, dear, they haven't come here to listen I to you. I don't care what they came here for. This is what they're going to hear. <laughs> How'd you like it? A strange, savage melody, Dr. Stanley. Yes, indeed, sir. Rather depressing, if you don't mind me saying so. No. Why shouldn't it be? When it's finished, I call it, uh, a threnody for a dead sister. And that's what you've come to see me about, isn't it, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Now, David, dear, you must... Sylvia, I should prefer that you leave us alone. Yes, but, David... I said alone, Sylvia. Very well. Uh, Sylvia's a girl who can't face up to facts. But I can. Tell me, Holmes, what have you found out about my sister's death? Dr. Stanley, I'm afraid you're laboring under misapprehension. I know nothing of your sister. I came here to talk about Jenkins, Sir Roderick Martin's He told us that you were his physician. Oh, Jenkins, eh? Hmm. Uh, What do you want to know about him? Has he been uh, ill recently? Well, a few months ago, he had a bad attack of enteric fever. Why do you ask? Enteric sometimes leaves bad after effects. Would you say, Doctor, that Jenkins has suffered no lasting damage? Hallucinations, for instance? No, well, at the time, he was out of his head for a while, but uh, I'd say he's perfectly sound now. Thank you, Dr. Stanley. That's all we wanted to know. You mean to say that you came here simply to find out about the state of Jenkins' sanity? Just that, sir. Good evening. Good night, Dr. Stanley. I think you had something else on your mind before you talked to Sylvia. Well, Jenkins may be sane, but that man's on the edge of a mental collapse, if I ever saw one. I quite agree, Watson. Hmm. Stanley seems to have gone upstairs. I think we'll let ourselves out. Well, Holmes, that was rather a fruitless trip. We didn't learn much there, except that Jenkins is compass mentis. I disagree, old chap. We learned a great deal more than that. Tomorrow morning, I shall lose no time in calling on Sir Roderick again. That horrible fellow? For heaven's sake, why? Because he's the focal point in a grim tragedy. Inevitably, either he will kill Jenkins, or Dr. Stanley will kill him. My dear Holmes, I'm accustomed to facing two brown eggs at breakfast. Two brown eggs lightly boiled, followed by a leisurely perusal of the Times... I see no reason why this day should commence any differently. Sir Roderick, I've explained to you You've explained I... nothing, including your own presumption, Holmes. I can see no cause for your meddling, even if I understood precisely what you were driving at, which I don't. Well, surely, Sir Roderick, you must see that my friend is trying to protect you. Dr. Watson, I once had the acute misfortune to read one of your shockingly florid stories. What? Uh, I what? can only assume that your gross imagination oh, has yes. infected your daily life. Since your own safety seems to be a matter of indifference to you, Sir Roderick, I may point out that I know too much if you plan on being a danger yourself. Holmes, you're impertinent, a quality which is attractive only in a younger person and of a different sex. What is even more unpardonable, you're boring. Please leave and take this bumbling veterinary surgeon with you. It's extremely offensive. Before I leave, I insist on knowing one thing. Where is your butler, Jenkins? A new man opened the door just now. Jenkins? Jenk... Oh, yes, yes, yes. I omitted to tell you. Um, Jenkins has left my service. You discharged him, I suppose. Not exactly, though it is my invariable rule to discharge any servant found guilty of a crime. A crime? And what was Jenkins' crime? He committed suicide. just a moment, we shall hear more about this ironic crime of suicide. But first, men, nice-looking, attractive hair means so much to a man's appearance. And one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So start at once. Take better care of the hair you've got. Change to Kremel hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly in place without looking or feeling greasy. But men, Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Its light oils have a fine lubricating effect on a dry scalp. 
At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff. Notice how alive, how invigorated your scalp feels. And men, you like to massage cremel on your scalp because it's such a clean hair tonic. Never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, cremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. So men, for handsome groomed hair and a more hygienic scalp, use cremel daily. Buy a bottle of cremel at any drugstore. Ask for an application at your barber's. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel hair tonic. That famous modern hair tonic preferred among America's most successful men. Well, Dr. Watson, this story really has me on the edge of my chair. So the butler Jenkins had committed suicide? Well, that's what Sir Roderick told us, Mr. Bell. Although we had great difficulty in persuading him to let us examine the, the dead man's room. Finally, after Sherlock Holmes had pointed out that if we couldn't handle the case... And Scotland Yard certainly would. We were allowed to visit that uh, room of death. The evidence of suicide was apparent. After a brief examination, Holmes turned to me and said... What do you make of it, Watson? Obvious signs of strychnine poisoning, Holmes. And quite clearly, a suicide. Yes. The other servants told us that they had to break the door down to get in was locked and bolted from the inside. And your examination proved that there was no sign of the lock having been tampered with. Precisely. And he drank the poison from this glass here by the bed. Yes, I'd say that there's been nothing in this glass but strychnine and water. Hello. What's this on the carpet? It looks like a piece of clay. It is. And it bears the imprint of a heel. From a man's boot. Look at the size. And observe the color of the clay, Watson. This particular specimen is quite rare. I shall take it back to Baker Street and examine it. I can't see any logic in this case, Holmes. After all, people terrified of murder don't go committing suicide. In patience, old fellow. I'm convinced that this is one case where an arm in the laboratory may aid the solution more than all the logic in the world. <laughs> your tests with the microscope tell you? First of all, that the glass contained nothing but strychnine and water. And nobody could drink that without knowing it. That proves that it was suicide. Not necessarily, Watson. I've also tested the clay. In addition to being a very rare clay, it's oddly impregnated with certain acids and chemicals. Exactly as it might be if a doctor picked it up on his heel outside his house and later went into his laboratory. A doctor? That would explain the poison. Exactly. Jenkins was under his doctor's care. Supposing the physician prescribed a draft to be taken on retiring. Why question its peculiarly bitter taste? Jenkins was a frightened man. Undoubtedly, he bolted and locked his door last night and then, trustingly, drank the fatal poison. All of which points to Dr. Stanley. Quite. But I don't understand it. He had a motive for murdering Sir Roderick and Sir Roderick had a motive for murdering Jenkins. But all the evidence points to the fact that Dr. Stanley murdered Jenkins. It doesn't make any sense. But it does, Watson. Precise, accurate, and terrifying sense. We must return to Sir Roderick's house at once. There's not a moment to be lost. Holmes, you and your friend here are positively pachydermatous. Twice I've told you to mind your own business, and yet you come back for more insults. Am I to assume that you find my personal charm so utterly irresistible? On the contrary, sir, you can assume that your personal charm utterly escapes us. Sir Roderick, the only reason we've returned is because I'm convinced you're in grave danger. As I told you before, Holmes, I'm eminently capable of taking care of myself. In any case, I'm expecting Dr. Stanley, my physician, here in a few minutes. Sir Roderick, by all you hold sacred... I I hold nothing sacred, Holmes, save human life. By which, of course, I mean my own. Then, for the sake of your own life, sir, allow us to slip behind that tapestry while your doctor visits you. Behind the arras, eh? (laughs) The proper place for rats, if I remember my Hamlet correctly. Oh, that's undoubtedly the doctor now. Then please let us hide. You won't regret it, I promise you. Very well, you may hide. Scurry away. Come on, Watson. Right, you're home. Come in. Roderick, I had to see you. Yes, so it would appear... 
Sylvia, if you have to come making dramatic entrances in my house at an hour that virtually represents the crack of dawn, I do wish you'd take a little more pains with your ensemble. Roderick, you... Your dress is only suitable for tea and crumpets with the vicar's wife at Tooting Beck. Oh, Roderick, stop trying to be facetious. I came here because I had to talk to you before David got here. Well, I'm expecting him at any moment. Yes, I know that. You're his closest friend, Roderick. You've got to do something for him. He's ill. He's mentally unbalanced. All he thinks about and talks about and dreams about is Angela. He's even composed a horrible piece of music that he calls... Sylvia! David! What are you doing here? Everyone's being extraordinarily melodramatic this morning. It's a pity, David, but you have not caught your wife and me in a compromising situation. Uh, chiefly, I admit, because I find her somewhat uh, colorless. Roderick, how dare I you? I suggest that you leave us, my dear. You... Uh, you... I believe the word you're groping for is beast. You beast! Hmm. Roderick, you put up a convincing caricature of being the inhuman man of the world. But if people only knew how you'd stood by me during the past year... Now, now, I... now, David, this has been a most emotional morning. For heaven's sake, don't you become lachrymose. I'm not. I'm just saying that if you hadn't stood by me since Angela's death, I don't know what I'd have done. You'd probably been back on your feet long before this, but uh, you came here this morning in your uh, professional capacity, David. Yes, yes, I know, Roderick. How are you feeling? Hmm. I... Uh... Don't like your color. I don't like my symptoms. I can't sleep. My nerves have been more than usually on edge for the past three weeks, David. You promised me some medicine, you know. Uh, I brought it with me. It's in my bag here. Do uh, you have a glass and some water? Yes, on the sideboard. Though. Good. Well, this will steady you up quite a bit. Now I add a little water. So, uh, here you are, Roderick. Drink this. I wouldn't, Sir Roderick. It won't do much good to the only thing you hold sacred. Sherlock Holmes. What are you doing here? Your opening conversation begins to become somewhat monotonous, Dr. Stanley. I'm here because I don't like to see murder committed, even Sir Roderick. You mean that Dr. Stanley just tried to poison him? Certainly. Just as he poisoned the butler, Jenkins. Mr. Holmes, he has really no are. motive. I tried to protect Jenkins against Sir Roderick. I was stupid enough not to see the other motive at first. Uh, riddles are fascinating, Holmes, but not when they become personal. What are you talking about? It's a simple equation, Sir Roderick. Dr. Stanley attended Jenkins during his bout of enteric. He told us himself that the butler was delirious. It was then that he must have learned Jenkins' secret, that Jenkins was the only human being who knew that Sir Roderick was responsible for Angela's suicide. Logically, he had to die first. But I still don't see that... Dr. Stanley does, despite his silence. Jenkins was the only human being who knew that Dr. Stanley had a motive for killing Sir Roderick. This is very melodramatic, Holmes, but I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. Nor have I, except that you seem to be laboring under the delusion that I killed Jenkins. Of course you did. You had to, before you could kill Sir Roderick. Had Jenkins lived, he would have been suspicious of his master's death. But if he were out of the way, no one would have connected Sir Roderick's close friend and physician with his murder. The cellar stairs attempt failed. But last night's poison did not. And now he's trying to repeat the pattern. The glass over there contains strychnine and water. Of course it does. I assure you, this medicine is perfectly harmless. To prove it, I shall drink it myself. Stop him, Watson. Put that down. Put it down, I say. <coughs> it's too late. That was meant for you, Roderick. It was too good for you. <sighs> Considering the way you treated my sister, Angela... Angela. He's dead, Holmes. Yes. And you, Sir Roderick, have escaped a brother's vengeance. I'm almost sorry that I insisted on trying to save your wretched life. Well, just because you have saved it, don't expect anything as conventional as thanks or remorse. My only regret is that during the past few minutes, you've enjoyed an experience granted to very few men on this earth. And what is that, may I ask? You have seen me speechless. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Ladies, here's some very important beauty advice from some of the world's most divinely beautiful women, Powers Models. Girls who are famous for their shining, bright, lustrous hair. Powers Models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. This amazingly beautifying shampoo has been especially developed to actually glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural, dazzling highlights. Cremel shampoo leaves the hair simply abundant 
with natural glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. And doesn't Cremel Shampoo do a wonderful cleaning job on your scalp? Removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Yes, and it's wonderful to soften dry, brittle ends. Cremel Shampoo leaves your hair so much softer, silkier with a satin smoothness. Your hair holds a wave better, too. So, ladies, buy a bottle of glamorizing Cremel Shampoo at any drug counter and see how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of beauty. How easy it is now to have naturally lustrous, glossy hair. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. And now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell you about the greatest shock that Sherlock Holmes ever gave me. Well, that must have been quite a shock, Dr. Watson. It was, Mr. Bell. I call it The Adventure of the Dying Detective. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Bruce Partington Plan. The music was composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the dying detective. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time to keep that weekly appointment with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Draw up your chair and settle down. Thank you. That's it. Already with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, Doctor. Yes, Watson. Mr. Bell. And as I was going over my notes on the case, I, I came across this. I think it might interest you. Well, what is it? It looks like an ordinary piece of clay. It is clay, but I assure you it's very far from ordinary. This piece of dried earth enabled Sherlock Holmes to solve one of the most diabolical murders that we ever encountered. I call the case the singular affair of the babbling butler. I can hardly wait to hear the story. I'm sure that you'll wait long enough to have a word with our listeners now, won't you, Mr. Bell? Yes, Dr. Watson, but it won't take me a moment. In a recent poll, women picked the ten best-dressed men in America. These men were all men at the top. Statesmen, governors, movie stars, producers, and millionaires. And I know you'll be interested in hearing how a recent survey showed that Kremel hair tonic is preferred among America's top-flight executives and most successful men. But why shouldn't Kremel be? Kremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kremel gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. Such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. Kremel also keeps hair neatly in place longer, with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet it never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. After you apply Kremel, you can rub your hand over your hair and your hair feels so delightfully clean. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or on your hat band. Just use a little Kremel in the morning, and at night your hair looks as neatly groomed as when you combed it in the morning. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the singular affair of the babbling butler? Well, that adventure began on a November evening many years ago. For four days, a dense yellow fog had virtually marooned Holmes and me in our Baker Street lodgings. The first day the great man had spent in cross-indexing his huge book of references. The second and third had been patiently occupied upon a subject which he had recently made his hobby, the music of the Middle Ages. But when on the fourth day we still saw the heavy brown swirl drifting past us and condensing in oily drops upon the window panes, my old friend's active and impatient nature began to assert itself. He started to pace restlessly about our room, in a fever of suppressed energy. Confound this fog. Oh, do stop pacing up and down, Holmes. 
No good getting angry with the weather. That's one problem even you can't do anything about. It isn't the weather, Watson. It's the infernal dullness of the London criminal these days. Come over here to the window. Oh, what is it, huh? Look out there. See how the figures loom up, are dimly seen, and then blend once more into the fog. What a night for a thief or a murderer, Watson. He could roam London as a tiger does the jungle, unseen until he pounces. It's fortunate for this community that I'm not a criminal. Yes, it is indeed. Suppose that I were Brooks or Woodhouse or any of the 50 men who have good reason for taking my life. How long could I survive against my own pursuit? A summons, a bogus appointment, and all would be over. What a depressing thought. The only thing that depresses me is inactivity. Why doesn't something happen? Why doesn't someone come to me with a problem? <laughs> it sounds as if your prayer's been answered. I hope so. See who it is, Watson, will you? It'll save Mrs. Hudson a trip. Yes, of course. All right, Mrs. Hudson. Ask the, the gentleman to come up, please. This way up, sir. You wish to see Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Uh, yes, sir, I do. Then come along in. My name's Watson, Dr. Watson, and this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson? Uh, my name is Jenkins. I'm butler to Sir Roderick Martin. Sir Roderick Martin? Indeed. Sit down, Jenkins. Oh, thank you, sir. Sir thank Roderick you. Martin, isn't he the theatrical producer? Yes, Watson. And he is quite famous in his own circle for his cynicism and a certain mordant wit. Your master needs my services, I presume, Jenkins? Uh, yes, Mr. Holmes, he does. He's in desperate trouble, and he'd like you to come over to his house at once. Well, what sir. kind of trouble is he in? Oh, please don't ask any questions, sir. Just come to the house and see for yourselves. I've long wanted to meet Sir Roderick. I believe it was he who gave currency to that pun. Though he might be more humble, there's no police like Holmes. That's all funny. No police like Holmes. <laughs> I'm glad it amuses you, Watson. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm for you to come with. Please, gentlemen, come with me. Whatever your master's problems may be, I think I would enjoy a discussion with him. Perhaps on the topic of humility. Yes, Jenkins, we'll accompany you at once. <laughs> This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, sir. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, Jenkins. Oh, how very odd. Now, why should Jenkins make such a meteoric exit? I presume, Sir Roderick, he wished to leave us alone. Indeed. What a singularly depressing thought. Well, so now that he's gone, you can talk quite freely. My dear Dr. Watson, I've been in the habit of talking freely ever since I had the pleasure of insulting my nurse at the age of four. She was a peculiarly revolting female by the name of Pearl. After 44 years, I still can't think of a more inappropriate name for her. Sir Roderick, your childhood reminiscences are fascinating, but supposing we get down to business? Very well, Holmes. To what do I owe the, uh, well, for lack of a better word, the pleasure of this visit? Your butler came to fetch us. He said that you were in desperate trouble and needed our help. Jenkins told you that. I can only assume that he stole more than his usual quota of brandy today. I've noticed in the past that alcohol seems to give him the quaintest delusions. Then uh, you don't wish to consult me professionally? No, Holmes, I don't, nor do I wish the services of a doctor. Therefore, I suggest you both retire and ask Jenkins for your hats and an explanation. Good evening, gentlemen. It's one of his stupid jokes, Holmes. The bounders try to make a fool of you. I think not, Watson. it would be a singularly pointless joke and far below his standard. No, I believe there's some other game afoot. Though Sir Roderick dismissed us somewhat unceremoniously, I think we may still be reasonably certain of a welcome in the servants' quarters. You're going to talk to the butler? Yes, Watson. I'm certain he's neither been drinking nor suffering from delusions. I'm convinced that the man is in mortal terror of his life. <laughs> Thank heavens you came to see me, Mr. Holmes. How could we resist it when Sir Roderick told us that your entire story was a lie? Oh, you must forgive me, gentlemen. I, I was desperate with fear, and I, I had to attract your attention. But why? You've accomplished your purpose now. You've thoroughly roused my curiosity. But I repeat, why? Because I'm in terror of my life, sir. Someone's trying to murder me. Well, sir. what reason have you for saying that, Jenkins? Last night an attempt was made to kill me. Oh, Please describe the circumstances. Well, sir, I, I was carrying a keg of wine down into the cellar. It slipped from my arms and hit the stairs, and then the stairs collapsed. 
When I examined them, I found that they'd been sawed almost through. Hmm. I assume that you are the only member of the household who ever visits the wine cellar? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That was a deliberate trap to break my neck. Well, if I'd stepped down, it would have been the end of me. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I, I'm only a servant. I couldn't pay you much. Oh, but... well, my dear Jenkins, I assure you that Mr. Holmes is as interested in preventing the murder of a servant as he is, is in saving the life of a prime minister. Jenkins, have you any idea who might want to kill you? There's only one person on earth with a motive for killing me, sir. And that's my master. Sir Roderick Martin. Oh, come, 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 my dear man. You're surely mistaken. Well, what reason do you have for suspecting him? Well, it's this way, Mr. Holmes. A year ago, a certain lady killed herself when Sir Roderick jilted her. Good gracious Well, me. the affair was all hushed up. and huh? Nobody knew Sir Roderick was even involved. But her brother swore to avenge her death. That brother is a very close friend of Sir Roderick's. But has never suspected him. Complicated situation, eh, Holmes? Yes, Watson. I take it, Jenkins, you are the only person who knows that your master was guilty? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And if I were dead, his secret would be safe. Oh, Mr. Holmes, please, what can I do? I, I know he's planning my death. You've got to save me, sir. Jenkins, my advice is this. Write a full statement of the circumstances in this case. Sign and seal it and hand it over to me for safekeeping. Inform your master that if anything happens to you, I shall make public the contents of the statement. That's a very good idea, Holmes. I'll do that, sir. I'll do that. I'll bring it to you in the morning. Splendid. Come on, Watson. Oh, uh, by the way, Jenkins, what's the name of your doctor? My doctor, sir? I I never said... I, you uh, never said what? Oh, oh, oh yeah, doctor. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. David Stanley in Wimpole Street. Dr. David Stanley. I see. Well, good night, Jenkins. We shall expect you in the morning. <laughs> But why are we going to see Dr. Stanley? Firstly, because I want his physician's opinion as to whether Jenkins might be suffering from hysterical delusions. Well, as a doctor myself, I say that's more likely. I must say his actions tonight hardly seem the behavior of a sane man. When a man is badly frightened, Watson, it's sometimes hard to judge his actions by uh, more rational standards. Incidentally... Did you notice the way he started when I asked him the name of his doctor? Almost certainly, Dr. David Stanley is the vengeful killer. Hi, George. Now that you mention it, I do remember hearing some gossip in Harley Street about Stanley's sister killing herself. But uh, nobody seemed to know the motive. Well, here's the house, Watson. Well, let's hope the doctor's at home. If he isn't, we haven't come very far out of our way. Want me to wait for you, Governor? No, thank you, Cabby. Here you are. Oh, thank you, Governor. Idiot! Up. I can hear a piano playing. Someone is at home. That seems an eminently logical deduction. There's no need to be funny, Holmes. Good evening. My name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? I'm Mrs. Stanley. How we do? wondered if we might have a few words with your husband. With David? Well, come in, won't you, gentlemen? Mr. Holmes... You're a detective, aren't you? Yes, Mrs. Stanley. I hope you haven't come here to talk to David about his sister's death. Not directly, madam. Though my mission is not uh, unconnected with that tragedy. Then I can't let you see Well, me. really, Mrs. Stanley, my friend only no, wishes No, gentlemen. To... For the sake of his sanity, I daren't let you talk to him. Ever since his sister died, he's been like a soul tormented. He spends most of his time in there playing those frightening compositions of his on the piano. I can't let him be subjected to any more questioning about his sister. Even I don't mention her. Sylvia, I've heard voices. I, uh... Oh. Um, who are these gentlemen? It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, dear. How do you do, Dr. Turner? I hope we're not intruding, sir. The great Sherlock Holmes and his friend Dr. Watson intruding? Well, of course not. I'm flattered. Come in, come in, gentlemen. Please don't say anything about his sister's death. Don't worry, Mrs. Stanley. We won't. No, 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 of course Holmes, I, I believe you're something of a musician. I, I'd like your opinion of this. David, dear, they haven't come here to listen I to music. I don't care what they came here for. This is what they're going to hear. Well, how'd you like it? A strange, savage melody, Dr. Stanley. Yes, indeed, sir. Rather depressing, if you don't mind me saying so. No. Why shouldn't it be? When it's finished, I call it uh, 
A threnody for a dead sister. That's what you've come to see me about, isn't it, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? No, David, dear, you must Sylvia, I should prefer that you leave us alone. But, David... I said alone, Sylvia. Very well. Now, Sylvia's a girl who can't face up to facts. But I can. Tell me, Holmes, what have you found out about my sister's death? Dr. Stanley, I'm afraid you're laboring under misapprehension. I know nothing of your sister. I came here to talk about Jenkins, Sir Roderick Martin's He butler. told us that you were his physician. Oh, Jenkins, eh? Hmm. Uh, what do you want to know about him? Has he been uh, ill recently? Well, a few months ago, he had a bad attack of enteric fever. Why do you ask? Enteric sometimes leaves bad after effects. Would you say, Doctor, that Jenkins has suffered no lasting damage? Hallucinations, for instance? Well, I time. He was out of his head for a while, but uh, I'd say he's perfectly sound now. Thank you, Dr. Stanley. That's all we wanted to know. You mean to say that you came here simply to find out about the state of Jenkins' sanity? Just that, sir. Good evening. Good night, Dr. Stanley. I think you had something else on your mind before you talked to Sylvia. Well, Jenkins may be sane, but that man's on the edge of a mental collapse, if I ever saw one. I quite agree, Watson. Mm. Mrs. Stanley seems to have gone upstairs. I think we'd let ourselves out. Well, Holmes, that was rather a fruitless trip. We didn't learn much there, except that Jenkins is compass mentis. I disagree, old chap. We learned a great deal more than that. Tomorrow morning, I shall lose no time in calling on Sir Roderick again. That horrible fellow? For heaven's sake, why? Because he is the focal point in a grim tragedy. Inevitably, either he will kill Jenkins, or Dr. Stanley will kill him. My dear Holmes, I'm accustomed to facing two brown eggs at breakfast, two brown eggs lightly boiled, followed by a leisurely perusal of the Times. I see no reason why this day should commence any differently. Sir Roderick, I've explained to you... You've explained I... nothing, including your own presumption, Holmes. I can see no cause for your meddling, even if I understood precisely what you were driving at, which I don't. Well, surely, Sir Roderick, you must see that my friend is trying to protect you. Dr. Watson, I once had the acute misfortune to read one of your shockingly florid stories. What? Huh? Uh, I can only assume that your gross imagination has infected your daily life. Since your own safety seems to be a matter of indifference to you, Sir Roderick, I may point out that I know too much if you plan on being a danger yourself. Holmes, you're impertinent, a quality which is attractive only in a younger person and of a different sex. What is even more unpardonable, you're boring. Please leave and take this bumbling veterinary surgeon with you. It's extremely offensive. Before I leave, I insist on knowing one thing. Where is your butler, Jenkins? A new man opened the door just now. Jenkins? Jen oh, yes, yes, yes. I omitted to tell you. Um, Jenkins has left my service. You discharged him, I suppose? Not exactly, though it is my invariable rule to discharge any servant found guilty of a crime. A crime? And what was Jenkins' crime? He committed suicide. <laughs> In just a moment, we shall hear more about this ironic crime of suicide. But first, men, nice-looking, attractive hair means so much to a man's appearance. And one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So start at once. Take better care of the hair you've got. Change to Kreml hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly in place without looking or feeling greasy. But men... Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Its light oils have a fine lubricating effect on a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff. Notice how alive, how invigorated your scalp feels. And men, you like to massage Kreml on your scalp because it's such a clean hair tonic. Never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. So men, for handsome groomed hair and a more hygienic scalp, use Kreml daily. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drugstore. Ask for an application at your barber's. 
K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. That famous modern hair tonic preferred among America's most successful men. Well, Dr. Watson, this story really has me on the edge of my chair. So the butler Jenkins had committed suicide? Oh, well, that's what Sir Roderick told us, Mr. Bell. Though we had great difficulty in persuading him to let us examine the, the dead man's room. Finally, after Sherlock Holmes had pointed out that if we couldn't handle the case, and Scotland Yard certainly would, we were allowed to visit that uh, room of death. The evidence of suicide was apparent. After a brief examination, Holmes turned to me and said, What do you make of it, Watson? Obvious signs of strict poisoning, Holmes. And quite clearly, a suicide. Yes. The other servants told us that they had to break the door down to get in. It was locked and bolted from the inside. And your examination proved that there was no sign of a lock having been tampered with. Precisely. And he drank the poison from this glass here by the bed. Yes, I'd say that there's been nothing in this glass but strychnine and water. Hello. What's this on the carpet? Looks like a piece of clay. It is. And it bears the imprint of a heel. From a man's boot. Look at the size. And observe the color of the clay, Watson. This particular specimen is quite rare. I shall take it back to Baker Street and examine it. I can't see any logic in this case, Holmes. After all, people terrified of murder don't go committing suicide. In patience, old fellow. I'm convinced that this is one case where an arm in the laboratory may aid the solution more than all the logic in the world. <laughs> What do your tests with the microscope tell you? First of all, that the glass contained nothing but strychnine and water. And nobody could drink that without knowing it. That proves that it was suicide. Not necessarily, Watson. I've also tested the clay. In addition to being a very rare clay, it's oddly impregnated with certain acids and chemicals, exactly as it might be if a doctor picked it up on his heel outside his house and later went into his laboratory. A doctor? That would explain the poison. Exactly. Jenkins was under his doctor's care. Supposing the physician prescribed a draft to be taken on retiring. Why question its peculiarly bitter taste? Jenkins was a frightened man. Undoubtedly, he bolted and locked his door last night and then, trustingly, drank the fatal poison. All of which points to Dr. Stanley. Quite. But I don't understand it. He had a motive for murdering Sir Roderick and Sir Roderick had a motive for murdering Jenkins. But all the evidence points to the fact that Dr. Stanley murdered Jenkins. It doesn't make any sense. But it does, Watson. Precise, accurate, and terrifying sense. We must return to Sir Roderick's house at once. There's not a moment to be lost. Holmes, you and your friend here are positively pachydermatous. Twice I've told you to mind your own business, and yet you come back for more insults. Am I to assume that you find my personal charm so utterly irresistible? On the contrary, sir, you can assume that your personal charm utterly escapes us. Sir Roderick, the only reason we've returned is because I'm convinced you're in grave danger. As I told you before, Holmes, I'm eminently capable of taking care of myself. In any case, I'm expecting Dr. Stanley, my physician, here in a few minutes. Sir Roderick, by all you hold sacred... I, I hold nothing sacred, Holmes, save human life. By which, of course, I mean my own. Then, for the sake of your own life, sir, allow us to slip behind that tapestry while your doctor visits you. Behind the arras, eh? <laughs> the proper place for rats, if I remember my Hamlet correctly. Oh, that's undoubtedly the doctor now. Then please let us hide. You won't regret it, I promise you. Very well, you may hide. Scurry away. Come on, Watson. Right, you're home. Come in. Roderick, I had to see you. Yes, so it would appear... Sylvia, if you have to come making dramatic entrances in my house at an hour that virtually represents the crack of dawn, I do wish you'd take a little more pains with your ensemble. Roderick, you... Your dress is only suitable for tea and crumpets with a vicar's wife at Tooting Beck. Oh, Roderick, stop trying to be facetious. I came here because I had to talk to you before David got here. Well, I'm expecting him at any moment. Yes, I know that. You're his closest friend, Roderick. You've got to do something for him. He's ill. He's mentally unbalanced. All he thinks about and talks about and dreams about is Angela. 
He's even composed a horrible piece of music that he calls... Sylvia! David! What are you doing here? Everyone's being extraordinarily melodramatic this morning. It's a pity, David, but you have not caught your wife and me in a compromising situation. Uh, chiefly, I admit, because I find her somewhat uh, colorless. Roderick, how dare you? I suggest you? that you leave us, my dear. You! Uh, you! I believe the word you're groping for is beast. You beast! Hmm. Roderick, you put up a convincing caricature of being the inhuman man of the world. But if people only knew how you'd stood by me during the past year... No, no, I... no, no, David, this has been a most emotional morning. For heaven's sake, don't you become lachrymose. I'm not. I'm just saying that if you hadn't stood by me since Angela's death, I don't know what I'd have done. You'd probably been back on your feet long before this, but uh, you came here this morning in your uh, professional capacity, David. Yes, yes, I know, Roderick. How are you feeling? Hmm. I... Uh... Don't like your color. I don't like my symptoms. I can't sleep. My nerves have been more than usually on edge for the past three weeks, David. You promised me some medicine, you know. Uh, I brought it with me. It's in my bag here. Uh, you have a glass and some water? Yes, on the sideboard. Though. Good. Well, this will steady you up quite a bit. Now I add a little water. So, uh, here you are, Roderick. Drink this. I wouldn't, Sir Roderick. It won't do much good to the only thing you hold sacred. Sherlock Holmes. What are you doing here? Your opening conversation begins to become somewhat monotonous, Dr. Stanley. I'm here because I don't like to see murder committed, even Sir Roderick. You mean that Dr. Stanley just tried to poison him? Certainly. Just as he poisoned the butler, Jenkins. Mr. Why? Holmes, he had no motive. I tried to protect Jenkins against Sir Roderick. I was stupid enough not to see the other motive at first. Uh, riddles are fascinating, Holmes, but not when they become personal. What are you talking about? It's a simple equation, Sir Roderick. Dr. Stanley attended Jenkins during his bout of enteric. He told us himself that the butler was delirious. It was then that he must have learned Jenkins' secret, that Jenkins was the only human being who knew that Sir Roderick was responsible for Angela's suicide. Logically, he had to die first. But I still don't see that... Dr. Stanley does, despite his silence. Jenkins was the only human being who knew that Dr. Stanley had a motive for killing Sir Roderick. This is very melodramatic, Holmes, but I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. Nor have I, except that you seem to be laboring under the delusion that I killed Jenkins. Of course you did. You had to, before you could kill Sir Roderick. Had Jenkins lived, he would have been suspicious of his master's death. But if he were out of the way, no one would have connected Sir Roderick's close friend and physician with his murder. The cellar stairs attempt failed. But last night's poison did not. And now he's trying to repeat the pattern. The glass over there contains strychnine and water. Of course it does. I assure you, this medicine is perfectly harmless. To prove it, I shall drink it myself. Stop him, Watson. Put that down. Put it down, I say. <coughs> it's too late. That was meant for you, Roderick. It was too good for you. <sighs> Considering the way you treated my sister, Angela... Angel. He's dead, Holmes. Yes. And you, Sir Roderick, have escaped a brother's vengeance. I'm almost sorry that I insisted on trying to save your wretched life. Well, just because you have saved it, don't expect anything as conventional as thanks or remorse. My only regret is that during the past few minutes, you've enjoyed an experience granted to very few men on this earth. And what is that, may I ask? You have seen me speechless. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Ladies, here's some very important beauty advice from some of the world's most divinely beautiful women, Powers Models, girls who are famous for their shining, bright, lustrous hair. Powers Models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. This amazingly beautifying shampoo has been especially developed to actually glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural, dazzling highlights. Cremel shampoo leaves the hair simply abundant with natural glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. And doesn't Cremel shampoo do a wonderful cleaning job on your scalp? Removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Yes, and it's wonderful to soften dry, brittle ends. Cremel shampoo leaves your hair so much softer, silkier with a satin smoothness. Your hair holds a wave better, too. So, ladies, buy a bottle of glamorizing Cremel shampoo at any drug counter and see how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of beauty. 
How easy it is now to have naturally lustrous, glossy hair. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell you about the greatest shock that Sherlock Holmes ever gave me. Well, that must have been quite a shock, Dr. Watson. It was, Mr. Bell. I call it The Adventure of the Dying Detective. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Bruce Partington Plans. The music was composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the dying detective. <laughs> ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Now, once again, we find ourselves in Dr. Watson's comfortable book-lined study. A blazing log crackles cheerily on the hearth. The cordial smile of welcome beams on the good doctor's friendly countenance. Well, good evening, Mr. Bell. Sit down, sit down. Thank you. Ah, it isn't often you find such a perfect combination as this. Cozy room, cheerful fire, comfortable armchair. Not to mention an expert storyteller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bell. You're very kind. A setup like this takes your mind off your worries and troubles. So don't be surprised if I just sit back and relax and let you carry on. Well, that's what I'm here for. I've always said there's nothing like a good detective story for mental recreation. Most of our great men of affairs have been addicted to them, you know. Presidents, prime ministers, scientists, and businessmen. And the Sherlock Holmes adventures still head the list of all detective stories. What's it going to be tonight? Well, tonight, as I said last week, I'm going to tell you about the greatest shock that Sherlock Holmes ever gave me. The greatest shock? It must have been some voltage. You'll, you'll find that out, Mr. Bell, as soon as you had your little talk with our listeners. <laughs> God. Men, well-groomed hair helps so much in giving a man that prosperous, clean-cut appearance. And I'm sure you'll be interested to hear why Kremel Hair Tonic is preferred among America's top-flight executives by men at the top. Kremel never plasters the hair down with sticky goo, which makes your hair and scalp feel so dirty. It never gives hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look. You see, Kremel is a very highly specialized hair tonic. It contains a unique and utterly different combination of hair grooming ingredients that's never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. That's why Kremel keeps unruly hair so neatly in place longer, with such a handsome, healthy-looking luster. What I especially like about Kremel is that after you use it, you can run your hand back over your hair and your hair never feels sticky or dirty. No greasy film comes off on your hand or your hat band. Yet Kremel keeps hair in perfect order from morning till night, looking so healthy and handsome. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the greatest shock Sherlock Holmes ever gave you? Well, it was in the second year of my married life. I hadn't seen Holmes for almost a month due to having successfully resumed my medical practice. When one day I received an urgent note from Mrs. Hudson. Mrs. Hudson, she was Holmes' landlady in Baker Street. She certainly was, and a long-suffering woman she was, too. Why she stood for Holmes, I never could fathom. His habits were calculated to try the patience of a saint. Yes, he was easily the worst tenant in London, and yet Mrs. Hudson adored him. A case of the king can do no wrong. Exactly, and yet she stood in the deepest awe of him and never dared interfere, however dangerous his proceedings might seem. So you can imagine my feelings when our note said that Mr. Holmes was in a dreadful state, and she considered it serious enough to disobey his commands and to send for me. Well, I snatched my hat and medical case and set out for Baker Street post-haste. A terrified Mrs. Hudson greeted me on the doorstep. Her face stained with tears. Oh, Dr. Watson, thank God you got my note. Come in, sir, come in. Well, Mrs. Hudson, what's up? 
What's happened to Mr. Holmes? Oh, Dr. Watson, it's terrible just to see him lying there like that. I, I can't stand it any longer. He's breaking my heart. Oh, now, 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 Mrs. Hudson, this won't do you now. Put yourself together. What's the matter with Mr. Holmes? Oh, he's dying. What? Yes, sir. For three days he's been sinking. Hasn't taken a mouthful of food. I, I doubt if he'll last the day out. Well, why didn't you send him for me before? He, he wouldn't let me. Oh, you know what he's like, Dr. Watson, when he's got his mind set against anything. Yes, indeed I do. But this morning, when I went in and saw him there, his bones sticking out of his face, his great eyes all bright with fever, and his lips with that awful crust oh, on them, and his hands twitching and twitching, I couldn't stand it any longer. I couldn't stand by and watch him die, could I? I thought to myself, orders or no, I'm sending for you. Yes, I should hope so. So I said to him, but Mr. Holmes, this is an extremity. He didn't say anything. I don't think he even heard me, doctor. He's out of his head most of the time, croaking and moaning to himself. Oh, Dr. Watson, it's a pitiful sight. Poor Mr. No, Holmes. No, 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 perhaps it's not as bad as you think. <laughs> I pray heaven it's not. Well, I'll go up and see what's to be done. Oh, yes, sir. But I'm afraid he's not long for this world. Poor Mr. Now, now, Mrs. Hudson, you pull yourself together. He mustn't know how you feel about him. It'd upset him. He hates to be pitied. I'd, uh, I'd better go in alone. Yes, sir. Holmes? I say, Holmes? I, I doubt if he can hear you, sir. you better go right in. Very well. Oh. Oh. Good heavens. He is sick. Oh, Dr. Watson, you must save him. Shh, Mrs. Hudson, you, you stay outside. Running round and round in a circle. Faster, faster, he's catching up to us all. Holmes. Holmes, old fellow, it's me. Eh? Holmes, it's me, Watson. Don't you know me? Watson? Watson? Oh, yes. I seem to remember. Watson, of course. So she sent for you after all. I... I wondered how long she could hold out. Holmes! Uh, my poor fellow! Yes, we seem to have fallen on evil days. Hey, Watson? Never thought you'd see me in this shape, did you? Oh, I fall bear at your funeral, and now look at me. <laughs> it's all right, old chap. We'll fix you up. Have you about again in no time. Just let me take your pulse. Uh, stand back, Watson, stand back. If you're really alive, don't touch me. Don't touch me. But Why? Because I was, wish it. Isn't that enough? Well, I only wanted to help. Then do as I say. I, I know what's wrong with me. I, I'm the only man in London who does it. It's a terrible disease. and Contagious, that's it, Watson. Contagious. By touch. So keep your distance or you'll catch it, too. Great heavens, Holmes. Do you suppose that matters to me at a time like this? It wouldn't affect me in the case of a stranger. Do you imagine it prevent me from doing my duty to, to my best friend? Stand back, Watson. It's out of your power. You could do nothing. You stand where you are. I'll talk you. You mustn't excite me. It, it might be fatal. Very well. I must, but uh, what is this sickness? A colic disease from Sumatra. Only a few men understand it. I, I contracted it down along the docks from the Oriental sailors. I've been doing some recent research down there. It had a medical criminal aspect. Very interesting, Watson. Very interesting Asiatic diseases. Asiatic cruelty. Strange pathological possibilities. But water doesn't run uphill. <laughs> it's funny, eh, hey, Watson? Water? You, you can't write in water. I, I've tried. I, I've tried, but you, but you can't. Holmes, you're not yourself. A sick man is like a child. You could be master elsewhere, but when it comes to the sick room, it's time for me to take charge. I'm going to examine your symptoms and treat you. Stop it. If I've got to have a doctor, at least get me one I can trust. Holmes, don't you trust me? As a friend, certainly, but facts are facts. You're just a general practitioner of not very much knowledge or experience and very often muddled. Yes, decidedly muddled. Holmes, that remark is unworthy of you. It shows the state of your nerves. Very well. What do you know about Tapanuli fever? Or the black form of the corruption? Well... I've never heard of either of them. You see? Very well, let me call in Dr. Ainstree. He's the greatest living authority on tropical diseases. And he happens to be in London now. I can get him here inside half an hour if you'll just... No, no, I won't have him. I won't have him. I'm the one who's sick. I'll be cured my way or not at all. There's only one man who can save me. Oh. Oh, dear. I, I'm exhausted. I wonder how a battery feels when it 
was electricity and a non-conductor. Holmes. Holmes, you're wandering again. Let me at least pour you a glass of water. What a mess this table is in. Don't want water. Give me the moon. Hello. What's this curious little ivory box? I've never seen that before. Don't touch it, Watson. Don't touch it. But Holmes... It's mine. I won't have it touched. Give it to me. Handle it with tongs. Like this. Uh, that's better. It's mine. Yeah. Mine. Holmes, Holmes. Get back into bed this instant. And, and give me that box. No, no, you can't have it. It's, it's mine. I'm going to take it to bed with me. It's mine. My own little ivory box. Nobody shall take it from me. Very well. Now, now keep covered up. Uh, that's better. You'll kill yourself if you aren't careful. Watson. I say, Watson. Yes? Have you any change in your pocket? Yes. Any silver? A good deal. How many half crowns? Half crowns, One, two, three, four, five. Not enough, Watson, not enough. However, they'll have to do. Place them in your watch pocket, Watson. Very well. Now, put the rest of your money in your left hand trousers pocket. Hmm? Thank you. Yes, but why? It will balance you so much better that way. Holmes, this is the end. You're wondering. You're delirious. I'm going to get Ains still, or the man you mentioned. I don't care which. Very well. If you must, let it be Mr. Calverton Smith. Calverton Smith? I never heard of him. Possibly not, Watson. It may surprise you to know that the only man on earth who understands this disease isn't a medical man. He's a planter. A planter? Yes, millionaire rubber planter. An outbreak of this malady on his plantation in Sumatra caused him to study the disease. He's now in London. Good. What's his address? 13 Lower Burke Street. 13 Lower Burke Street. Very well. I'll fetch him at once. I warn you, he may not come. There's no good feeling between us. His, his nephew died, you see, Watson. I, I had suspicions of foul play. I, I told his uncle so. But the boy died horribly. <laughs> You must soften him, Watson. Describe my condition. Be beg him. Pray him. Get him here by any means. He he's the only one who can save me. You will bring him to me, Watson. Don't worry, old fellow. I'll bring him here and have to knock him unconscious to do it. No, you must persuade him to come. But be sure to return ahead of him. Not with him, Watson. Ahead of him, you understand? Very well. It's vital, Watson, vital. One thing more. Yes? I'm worried about oysters, Watson. What? They're so Why prolific. oysters? They're so prolific. Pretty soon the world will be overrun by oysters. Oh, Holmes, you're off again. There was I. <laughs> Strange how the brain controls the brain. You still here, Watson? I, I thought you'd gone long ago. Well, I'm going at once. I'll be back in no time. If you want anything, ring for Mrs. Hudson. First, the ocean will be overrun with them. millions of them, millions of oysters. Oh, Dr. Watson, how is he? Here's Mr. Listlard of Scotland Yard. He dropped in to inquire about Mr. Holmes. Hello, Dr. Watson. How do things stand? How's the old boy? He's a very sick man, I'm afraid, Lestard. Uh, yes, yes, I heard some rumor to that effect. Lestard, you're a cold-blooded fish. Ah, uh, possibly. But I think I'll stay around until you return. How about a dish of tea in the back parlor? Hey, Mrs. Hudson. Oh, you. Speaking of tea at a time like this, I'm ashamed of you. With Mr. Holmes lying upstairs practically on his deathbed. All right, I'll bring you a cup. But I hope it chokes you, that I do. <laughs> Eleven, thirteen. Ah, here we are. Oh, suppose he's not at home. He must be. He must be. Yes, sir. Is Mr. Calverton Smith in? Yes, sir. Will you take my card in to him at once and tell him it's it's urgent? Yes, sir. But uh, he's in his study working. He don't like to be disturbed. But it's a matter of life and death. Don't you understand? I must see him. Here, here. Perhaps uh, this will help. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> I'll do my best. Will you step inside, sir? Hold me a minute. A gentleman to see you, Mr. Smith, sir. Says it's urgent. Who is he? What does he want? Here's his card, sir. Watson? Dr. Watson? I don't know him. 
How often have I told you, Staples, I'm not to be disturbed when I'm working in my study? But he says he must see you. It's a matter of life and death, he says. Tell him to go to blazes. I'm not at home. I won't see him. Tomorrow morning... Oh, but you must, sir. It can't wait. I won't leave until I've told you What's the whole... What's this? What's the meaning of this intrusion? I said tomorrow, didn't I? I'm sorry, Mr. Smith, but I'm see you now. It's about Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes? Sherlock Holmes, did you say? Yes, I've just come from him. Well, well, what about Holmes? He's desperately ill, dying. That's why I've come to you. Holmes dying? Oh, dear, dear. I'm sorry to hear it. I only know him through some business dealings, of course, but I have a great respect for his talents and his character. You see, he is an amateur of crime, as I am of disease. Uh, for him, the villain. For me, the microbe. Uh, yes, I, I believe my offenders are even more deadly than his. Mr. Smith, it was because of your special knowledge of Eastern diseases that Sherlock Holmes has sent for you. Eastern diseases? Eastern diseases, dear me. Don't tell me that he's contracted some oriental disease. Yes, Mr. Smith. He's been making some professional inquiries on the docks, working among the oriental sailors. Oh, so that's it. Oh, dear, dear, I, I trust the matter is not as grave as you suppose. How long has he been ill? About three days. Uh, Delirious? Yes, from time to time. Oh, dear me, this does sound serious. Yes, it would be inhuman not to go to his aid, wouldn't it? The case is certainly exceptional. I'll come with you at once, Dr. Uh, Watson. With me, well, uh, you see that... Uh, well, I'm afraid I, I can't return with you, sir. I, I have some other appointments, uh, uh, patients that I must see. I'll, uh, I'll see you later. Oh, yes, 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 I quite understand. I'll go alone. Oh, yes, that would be better in any case. We must avoid too much excitement, too many people. Uh, yes, Dr. Watson, you can rely on my being with Mr. Holmes within half an hour. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Sherlock Holmes and find out if Mr. Culverton Smith is able to... to cure the detective's strange malady. But first, more and more men today are beginning to realize they should take better care of the hair they've got. Remember, if you want your hair to look healthy and handsome, you need a hygienic scalp. So why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Kremel hair tonic? Kremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day long. And always gives it such a natural, well-groomed appearance. Never sticky or greasy. But men, Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A quick massage with Kremel stimulates circulation right in the surface of the scalp, leaving your scalp feeling so alive, so invigorated. At the same time, Kremel removes loose dandruff. It's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, remember Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men, buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kremel to keep your help scalp more hygienic. Your hair always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L. Kremel Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, I see what you meant by the greatest shock Sherlock Holmes ever gave you. And I can hardly wait to hear the rest of the story. What happened after you'd seen Mr. Culver? Well, I hurried back to Baker Street as fast as I could, just as Holmes had instructed me to. Mrs. Hudson met me at the door. Any change, Mrs. Hudson? Has anything happened while I was gone? No, Dr. Watson. He called me in to light the gas a few minutes ago. He won't have a tap full. He says it hurts his eyes. How did he look? Oh, a little better, I should say. He's awful weak, but he's not delirious anymore. Good, good. Where's Lestrade? Oh, he's about somewhere. Down in the kitchen, annoying the cook, most likely. I never did see such a man for eating. Heartless brute. Well, I'll go up to Mr. Holmes. Here I am, Holmes. Did you see him? Yes, yes, he's coming. Admirable, Watson. Admirable. I knew I could count on you. What did you tell him? I told him about the sailors in the East End and uh, that you were delirious. Quite right. Yes. You can now disappear from the scene. What? I'll do no such thing. I'm going to wait and hear his opinion. So you shall, Watson, so you shall, but not where he can see you. There's no hiding place in the room. He 
except the space behind the head of my bed. Suppose you crawl in there. Crawl in there? Watson, I'm a sick man. I must be human. It's got to be behind the bed or not at all. I don't want you discussing the case over my dead, inert body. You can hear what he says perfectly from your hiding place. There he is now. What's it to be, Watson? Behind the bed or out of the room? Oh, very well, if you insist. I'll... I'll wedge myself in there. There's not much room in here. Quick, Watson, quick if you love me. Oh, it's a tight fit. I can't... I can't move muscle. Good. Don't speak. Don't move. Whatever happens, don't budge. Just listen. Listen to every word. Don't move. Don't move. It's a gentleman by the name of Smith, Mr. Holmes. He says you sent for him. It's all right. I understand the case. You can leave us. Yes, sir. So there you are, my fine fellow. Pretty bad fix, eh? Holmes. Holmes, can you hear me? It's me, Smith. You? I... I hardly dared hope you'd come. I should think not. But here I am. Coals of fire, Holmes, huh? Coals of fire. Very good. Very noble of you. You're the only man who can save me. You realize that, eh? Do you know what is the matter with you? The, the same the same thing that killed your nephew. Yes, dear Victor. He was dead on the fourth day. Strong, hearty fellow he was, too. Surprising that you should both contract such a strange, out-of-the-way disease in the heart of London. A disease, too, of which I had made a special study. Very smart of you to notice that in Victor's case, but rather uncharitable to suggest that it was cause and effect. Oh, I... I, I knew that you did it. Oh, you did, did you? Well, you can't prove it. You've got a fine nerve spreading reports like that about me and then crawling to me for help when you're in trouble. Oh, don't... Don't hold it against me. Let bygones be bygones. I'll put it out of my head. Oh, only cure me and I'll forget it. Forget what? About Victor Savage's death. You were as good as admitted it, but... I, I'll forget it. I, I swear I will. It'll make little difference whether you forget or remember. You'll never see the inside of a witness box. Oh, no. Quite another shape box, my dear Holmes, I assure you. I'm not interested in my nephew anymore. It's you I'm after. So, you think you contracted this disease among the sailors, eh? That's the only way I can account for and it. And you think you have brains. Consider yourself smart, don't you? Well, I'm smarter than you are, Mr. Holmes. Think back. Think back. Can't you remember any other way you could have got this thing? I can't think. My mind's gone. For heaven's sake, help me. Yes, I'm going to help you. I want you to understand how this happened to you. I want you to know before you die. Oh, oh it's terrible. Give me something to stop the pain. I... Oh, so now it's painful, eh? Yes, the natives used to do some squealing toward the end. Now listen, can't you remember any unusual incident in your life just before your symptoms began? Uh, no, no, nothing. Something came by post. Remember that? I'm too sick to remember. Then I'll help you. You hear me? You shall hear me. Uh, yes, I... Oh, oh, the pain, it's, it's killing you me. You remember a box? A little ivory box. It came by post on Wednesday. Do you remember? Yes, yes, it... It had a spring inside. I, I cut myself. It, it drew blood. It, it was a joke. That was no joke, you fool. That spring was covered with the germs of this disease. Who asked you to cross my path? You've got what was coming to you. I sent that box and it has killed you. I, I remember the box, the, the little ivory box. There it is on the table. Ah, so it is. Yes, by George, the very one. Well, it may as well leave the room in my pocket. Here, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Here goes your last shred of evidence. Oh, you can have it only save me. Save me. Now, at last, you know the truth. You know I've killed you. You knew so much about the fate of Victor Savage that I've sent you to share it. Now, now what are you going to do? Do, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Why, now I shall sit here and watch you die. I... I can hardly see the, the light. The, turn up the gas. The shadows begin to fall, do they? Very well. I'll turn it up so that I may see you better. There. 
Uh huh. And now, is there any other little service I can do for you, my friend? Yes, you can give me a match and a cigarette. You. What's the meaning of this? You're not sick? You've been malingering. You're not sick at all. Not sick, just weak. Yes, the best way to act a part is to be it. I give you my word that for three days I haven't touched food, drink, nor tobacco. It, um, it has been rather irksome. Ah, yes, here are the cigarettes. Ah, that's better. Very much better. I hope it chokes you. I've a mind to do it myself. Not so vindictive, my dear Mr. Smith. I fancy I hear Lestrade step on the stair. When you turned up the light, that was his t- signal to come and get you. Why, you... Come in, Lestrade, come in. Oh, you've trapped him, Mr. Holmes. Yes, here's your man. You can arrest him. On what charge, may I ask? The murder of one Victor Savage. And the uh, attempted murder of one Sherlock Holmes. Take him away, Lestrade. Take him away. Oh, no, you don't. I'll knock your head in. Look out, Lestrade. It's all right, Mr. Elm. I've got the handcuffs on him. A nice trap this is, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. It'll bring you to the dock, not me. You asked me to come here to cure you. I was sorry for you, so I came, and now you make charges against me. Insane charges for which you have no proof. My word is as good as yours, Holmes. Remember that? Good heavens, I'd totally forgotten. My dear Watson, a thousand apologies. You can come out now. Uh, about time, too. I'm just about numb crouching behind there all this time. Uh, Mr. Smith, allow me to present my witness, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he found your conversation most enlightening. Well, that settles that. Come on, you. Keep moving. Well, now you're pulling my leg. The, the spring didn't really prick you, did it, Holmes? No. Uh, Well, you see, my dear Watson, uh, a thing you have to understand is that neither you nor Mrs. Hudson are particularly convincing when it comes to acting. So it was necessary to impress you with the reality of my condition in order to obtain results. And then, you may believe that I poo-pooed my your professional ability, but you can put that down as a part of the delirium. I have the highest regard for your talents, both as a doctor and as an historian. Oh, now you're pulling my leg. Look here. You didn't, as I said, really get to... Prick with that spring, did you? Oh, certainly not. I always handle strange packages with suspicion. Well, what I want to know is how you managed to assume that ghastly appearance. A three days of fasting does not improve anyone's beauty, Watson. For the rest, a bit of Vaseline on the forehead, belladonna on the eye, rouge on the cheekbones, and a crust of beeswax on the lips all produce a rather satisfactory effect. Only, I couldn't afford to let you get too good a look at it. Or take your pulse and temperature. Quite. And now, if you will tell Mrs. Hudson that her invalid has recovered sufficiently to desire large steak with plenty of fried onions, ah, I've been promising it to myself for hours. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Watson will be back in just a moment to tell us about next week's story. But first... Girls, many of those beautiful powers models come out here to Hollywood to become movie stars. And I must say, one can't help but be impressed with their gorgeous, lustrous hair. Now, here's how they keep it so shining bright. Powers models use Cremel Shampoo. This amazingly beautifying shampoo has been especially developed to actually glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair... Revealing all its natural glossy luster and highlights. Yes, and remember, Cremel Shampoo is wonderful for washing children's hair, too. Most emphatically, yes. Because there are no harsh caustics or chemicals in Cremel Shampoo. And its luxurious active foam thoroughly cleanses the scalp and hair of all loose dandruff, as well as the dirt. Girls, if you could only see how beautiful Powers Models hair radiates natural glossy highlights, I'm sure you'd want to try Cremel Shampoo right away. Remember, no other shampoo leaves the hair more shining bright and sparkling clean. Get a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, next week, I think I'll tell you about the strange case of the persecuted millionaire. Persecuted millionaire? Sounds intriguing, Dr. Watson. It was, Mr. Bell. In fact, I don't believe that Sherlock Holmes and I ever encountered a problem with such a bizarre and such a fantastic solution. And 
Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was dramatized from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Dying Detective. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the strange case of the persecuted millionaire. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Well, once again, it's time to keep that weekly date with our old friend and genial host, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting us, so let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. As you can see, I'm quite ready for you. The crackling fire in the grate, some port in the decanter over there, and although I've smoked a pipe myself, I think you'll find those cigars rather special. All the fixings for a session of storytelling, eh, Dr. Watson? Well, which particular Sherlock Holmes adventure have you selected for tonight? The story that I call The Strange Case of the Persecuted Millionaire. It sounds promising. In some respects, my boy, I think it was one of the one of the oddest adventures that we ever had. It was a case in which Sherlock Holmes narrowly prevented a shocking tragedy, and yet, at the conclusion of the affair, he appeared in a most unusual role. The role of a rather lean and elderly Cupid. This I've got to hear. But before you begin, Dr. Watson, do you mind if I... Uh... Have a word with our listeners? Of course not, Mr. Bell, of course not. Men, neat looking well-groomed hair does so much to give a man that air of success, to say nothing of adding to his good looks. And I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing more about this modern trend in hair grooming, which has become such a nationwide favorite. It's called Kremel Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Yes, that's exactly why Kremel gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look and keeps it in place longer, keeps every lock in perfect order from morning till night. Yet Kremel never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. Kremel keeps hair looking mighty handsome with a rich, healthy-looking luster, yet it always feels and looks so clean on your hair and scalp. Men, if you aren't already using a hair tonic, try Kremel. If you're using some other hair dressing... Change to Kremel. Just see if your hair doesn't look much better than it ever did before. Better groomed, better looking. K-R-E-M-L. Kremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, I want to hear about the strange case of the persecuted millionaire. Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure began in Baker Street on a gray November day at the turn of the century. Sherlock Holmes and I had just finished our lunch, I remember... And we're sitting each side of a blazing fire, just like you and I are tonight. The great man, his feet thrust out before him, was lying back in his chair, his long, thin hands locked behind his head, and a curved pipe jutting out the corner of his mouth was emitting great clouds of grey-blue smoke. After a few moments, I noticed that he was gazing at my boots with very marked attention. But why Turkish, Watson? The boots are English. I got them at Latimer's in Oxford Street. And not the boots, the bath. Why the relaxing and expensive Turkish bath rather than the invigorating homemade article? Well, because for the last few days I've been having some nasty twinges of rheumatism. By the way, I'm sure the connection between my boots and the Turkish bath is perfectly obvious to you, Holmes, but uh, I'm completely mystified. You're in the habit of doing up your boots in a certain way. I observe that on this occasion they are tied in a double bow. You have, therefore, had them off. Who has retied them? A bootmaker or the boy at the Turkish bath? But your boots are nearly new. Then what remains? The bath. Absurdly simple, isn't it? <laughs> when you explain it. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson. It's a note for you, Mr. Holmes. A messenger boy just brought it. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. 
Who's it from, Holmes? I swear that only reigning royalty can be as presumptuous as an American businessman. Read it for yourself. I shall be at your lodgings at two tomorrow. Be there. Let's sign John V. Harden. Be there. Huh. Sounds an extremely arrogant fellow. What makes you think that he's an American? The use of the initial for the middle name is peculiar to that country. Oh. I do. It's, it's nearly two o'clock now, Holmes. Yes. Let's see what we can find out about the gentleman. Where's that Cyclopedia of American Biography? Ah, here it is. H-H-A. Hanley, Hanson. Harden. Here's our man, Watson. John Vincent Harden. What does it say about him? Born in Chicago, 45 years old, unmarried. Chiefly noted for his tremendous tobacco interests and his addiction to fishing. It's an odd combination. And this is odder. He made his professional debut as a violinist 30 years ago. A millionaire musician. Ah, that must be him now. Yes, there's a most impressive broom and pair outside. Then, since my client is a violinist, I think I'll welcome him appropriately. Hand me my instrument, will you, old chap? Uh, uh, Holmes, funny way to start a business interview, I must say. Uh, Mr. Harden sounds like an aggressive man. <laughs> and uh, music hath charms to soothe. Come in. Mr. Harden to see you, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Come in, Mr. Harden. I'm Sherlock Holmes, and this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How do you do? If we're to do business, Mr. Holmes, for heaven's sake, put that violin away. I heard you scraping away as I came up the stairs. <laughs> so you, you don't care for my friend's playing, sir? <laughs> I don't care for anyone's playing. I loathe the fiddle. Curious. I was under the impression Listen, that... Mr. Holmes, I haven't come here to discuss your musical impressions. I've come here to talk about my personal safety and my sanity. Then pray talk about it, Mr. Harden. I'm being persecuted. Somebody's trying to drive me crazy. Oh, really? Just what form does this persecution take, Mr. Harden? Yeah, it began about a month ago. My horse ran away in Rotten Row and threw me. Maybe it was an accident, maybe not. I've heard of burrs under saddles. And then, last night... Something else happened? Someone destroyed Methuselah. Methuselah? An old retainer of yours, Mr. Harden? Or a pet? No. Methuselah was the finest, largest, oldest tarpon ever caught. A stuffed fish? You ask Sherlock Holmes? Quiet, well, Watson. Well, 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 I'm well, sure that a great deal more <laughs> lies behind this. Please continue, Mr. Harden. Everything was going fine, Mr. Holmes, until these persecutions started. Early this year, I bought a fine old house in Cavendish Place. I'm engaged to be married to Alicia Edwards, uh, the Honorable Alicia Edwards. She's Lord Brentwood's daughter. My life was perfect until I began to get these notes. What sort of notes, Mr. Harden? Uh, they kept turning up in odd places. My coat pockets, under my pillows at night. I found them on the upholstery of my carriage. You brought these notes with you? Of course. Hmm... All in the same handwriting, and all the messages seem to have the same theme. Oh, what do they say, Holmes? The first one says, you thought he had no one to avenge him, didn't you? And this one says, you murdered him, you will pay for it. And this is curious. It will have blood. They say blood will have blood. That quotation is from Macbeth. Oh, then that means the note was written by an Englishman. Not necessarily, Watson. It's possible that they've heard of Shakespeare in America, you know. Oh, I suppose they might have. Mr. Harden, all these messages threaten your death. Can you think of anyone who might wish to kill you? No, I can't. I've never hurt anyone, much less killed a person. The notes don't make any sense. Do you recognize the handwriting? I've never seen it before in my life. You mentioned that your prize tarpon was mutilated. What members of your household might have had the opportunity of performing that uh, act of vandalism? Mm, three people. My secretary, Margaret Bates, Stephen, my brother, and my fiancé. They were all at the house last night. There seems to be a clear pattern to this case, Mr. Harden. I suggest that you return to your home and obtain for me samples of the handwriting of the three people you've mentioned. When I've examined those, I shall be in a better position to advise you in this matter. <laughs> Um, 
means you've spent three hours with a magnifying glass and those samples of handwriting that Mr. Harden brought back. Have you found a clue? Nothing positive, Watson. It's quite curious. The handwriting of the threatening note seems to be that of a male with an American education. Oh, why do you say that? Observe this note. Who dies unavenged can never sleep with honor. You'll notice that honor is spelt without a U. That's the American way. Then that means that his fiancée didn't write him. She might have deliberately spelt it that way to remove suspicion from herself. No, I'm afraid these samples prove nothing. Then we're no nearer finding out who's responsible. Well, at least we've ruled out an obvious possibility. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson. It's a telegram, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Better get your coat and hat, Watson. It's from Mr. Harden? Yes. He says, a worse blow has fallen. Come at once. I'm Margaret Bates, Mr. Harden's secretary. How do you do? do? What happened, Miss Bates? We left as soon as we received his wire. I don't know what happened, Mr. Holmes, but I'm terribly worried... He rushed out here, dictated that telegram, and then went back and locked himself in the study. He says he'll see no one but you. Hello, Margaret. Oh, Stephen, you startled me. What's the matter? Do you think I was listening at the keyhole? Oh. Introduce me to our visitors, won't you? This is Stephen, Mr. Harden's brother, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? Uh, Sherlock Holmes and his friend, huh? I've heard about you. Don't tell me Brother John has fallen foul of the law. No, sir. He needs its protection, I fear. <laughs> Don't be too sure. I'm thinking of taking him to court myself on a charge of woman stealing. Your brother a kidnapper? Great. Cut. No, no, Dr. Watson. It's perfectly legal. It's just that I saw Alicia Edwards first, but then, of course... I don't control the hardened millions. Let's go to the study, shall we, Mr. Holmes? An excellent idea. Perhaps we'll see you later, sir. Perhaps. And don't take John too seriously. Oh, he's hateful. Always making fun of John, uh, his brother. And yet Stephen's never done a day's work in his life. This is the door to the study. Who is it? Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson are here. Of course, sir. Come in. Thank you, Margaret. I'll see you gentlemen later. What form did the new attack take, Mr. Harden? This time it's theft. My safe was rifled last night. What was stolen, sir? An extremely valuable document. It was the key to my agreement with the British Tobacco Trust. The loss of the paper represented a million dollars to me. But that isn't what upsets me most. Money I can afford to lose, but my sanity is more valuable. In the safe, I found another note, Holmes. May I see it, please? Here. Hmm. The coffin is made, the funeral parlor is ready, the time is ripe. The croaking raven doth bellow for revenge. Good Lord, what a frightening message. And once again observe the odd combination of Shakespeare and American idiom. Funeral parlor is what we refer to as an undertaker's, and the croaking raven comes from Hamlet. Holmes, I'm not a weak man, but I'm frightened. You've got to protect me. I shall do my best, Mr. Harden. Who was here last night? My secretary, Margaret Bates. My fiancée. She went back to London this morning. I uh, met your brother, Stephen, just now. I noticed that he was carrying a valise. Was he leaving the house or returning to it? Returning. He went out of town last night. Oh, then that rules him out. Not until we investigate his alibi, Watson. Mr. Harden... I'm a constant and thorough reader of the Times. The engagement of a peer's daughter to a prominent American would be striking news. And uh, yet I've read nothing about it. We're announcing it formally tomorrow. I'm giving a party at Claridge's to celebrate the event. Then I think it would be a wise precaution if Dr. Watson and I attended that party. I was about to suggest the same thing, Holmes. I need to have men about me I can trust. I think this is a deliberate plot to drive me mad. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I want you to meet my fiance, Miss Alicia Edwards. Alicia, my dear. Yes, John. I want to introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you How do? do? You? May I congratulate you on your engagement? Yes, indeed. 
A union between the old world and the new is an encouraging sign of the times. I wish you could convince Papa of that, Mr. Holmes. Whenever he meets John, he always behaves as if he expected him to be wearing feathers and carrying a scalping knife. <laughs> feathers and a knife. That's very funny. <laughs> I don't find it so. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Excuse me. I want to talk to the officer. Dear me. Now I've upset John again. He's ridiculously sensitive. Americans are really rather touchy. And yet you're going to marry one? Papa's estates have eaten up a lot of money. And that's a commodity with which John seems well endowed. I think you understand me, Mr. Holmes. I'm sure I do. Personally, I may say that I'm always glad to meet an American. I'm one of those who believes that the folly of a monarch and the blundering of a minister in far gone years should not now stand between two nations... Mr. Holmes, I find you pompous and dull. Goodbye. Oh, my soul, what an unpleasant heart, this young woman. She's obviously marrying Harden for his money. Obviously. Though I don't think she has an aversion to uh, all Americans. Oh? Why do you say that? She has been dancing with Mr. Harden's brother, Stephen, most of the evening. At this moment, he joined her at the door, and uh, they're leaving together. Wait, Scott, you think that the... Uh, Hello. What's happening up there on the orchestra? John Harden, he's arguing with one of the violinists. A musician. I won't take any more of it. Look, look. He snatched the instrument out of his hand. Ah, get out of here. You're not fit to fiddle at an Irish wake. I'll play you. The rest of you, go on and play. Holmes, he's behaving like a madman. He's rushing after the musician and brandishing the violin as if he's, if he's going to brain him with it. Yes, Watson. But that quarrel with the violinist was not a totally sane act. If the anonymous correspondent's motive is to undermine Harden's reason, he may be succeeding. But who has a motive? Might be the brother, Stephen. He's obviously jealous of the girl. And he probably is next in line for the Harden million. But I checked his alibi for last night. He was out of town. Stop the music! Stop hey! What the devil's wrong now? Holmes. Holmes, where are you? Here I am, Mr. Harden. Well, come with me at once. What's wrong, sir? It's Alicia. I found her in the car, though. She's been strangled. In just a moment, we'll find out what happens next in the strange case of the persecuted millionaire. Hair specialists constantly advise us to take better care of the hair we've got. And men... Don't forget that if you want your hair handsome and healthy looking, one of the first requirements is a hygienic scalp. So why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of this highly specialized Kremel hair tonic? Kremel contains a unique combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair preparation. It keeps hair attractively groomed at all times, looking so neat and orderly. But Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A Kremel massage stimulate circulation right in the surface of your scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so alive and invigorated, as fresh as a daisy. At the same time, Kremel removes dandruff flakes. It's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men, take better care of the hair you've got. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kremel daily for better groomed hair. For a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L. Kremel hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, so the Honorable Alicia Edwards had been strangled at her engagement party. What happened next? Well, I applied first aid, Mr. Bell, and found that the girl was not dead. We rushed her to the hospital, and a few hours later, we were able to talk to her, and uh, but we found that she could give us no clue. <clears throat> when we left the room, Harden was waiting for us in the corridor. How is she? Is she going to be all right? Oh, don't worry, Mr. Harden. She'll be all right, but she's she had a very narrow escape. But why attack her? Why not me? The pattern becomes increasingly clear, Mr. Harden. Your enemy has struck uh, at your fishing, your business, and now at your fiancé. So every blow is at your wealth and position. And my sanity. Mr. Holmes, you've got to find out who's behind all this. On the occasion of the mutilation of the fish, three people have the opportunity. 
Your brother Stephen is clear on the second attack, and on this last one, I think we may reasonably assume that your fiancée did not strangle herself. Yes, I'll wager my medical reputation on that fact. And that means that only one person who was present on all three occasions was... No, you, you can't mean... Your secretary, Miss Bates? Where is she? In the waiting room. Splendid. Then Dr. Watson and I will take her back to Baker Street. I have an idea that she can be of invaluable help to us. A little more tea, Miss Bates? No, thank you, Dr. Watson. Then please go on with your story. As I was saying, Mr. Holmes, I've known John, Mr. Harden, all my life. My father was the Harden coachman. And as I grew up, I thought John Vincent Harden was the most wonderful man in the world. Well, I imagine that he was quite different then, my dear. Very different. He was young and romantic, and he loved music. He took violin lessons, and it turned out that he was a prodigy. I understand that he made his professional debut at the age of 13. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I was only a little girl then. But he used to tell me that... He wasn't John Vincent Harden, the heir to the Tobacco Millions. He was Giovanni Vincenti, the great violinist. Giovanni Vincenti? Odd. Uh, pray continue, Miss Bates. For five years, it seemed that he would be a great musician. Then, on his 18th birthday, his father gave him a lecture on his family obligations, told him that it was his duty to go into the business. John broke his violin across his knee, Mr. Holmes, and... He's never played since. Miss Bates, I don't need to be a detective to deduce that you, uh, that you love him. Of course I do. Or at least I love Giovanni Vincenti. And maybe he's still there. Somehow. Somewhere. Of course. I've been an idiot. A numbskull. What do you mean, Holmes? The case is solved. Come, Miss Bates. We must return to Mr. Harden as fast as we can. I only hope we're not too late. But why doesn't he answer? The servant said he locked himself in the study again. The yeah, door's locked. I don't like the look of this. Oh. Come on, Watson. We'll break it in. Once more. Oh! Look! He's lying crumpled over his desk. There's a revolver beside him, Holmes. Oh. Miss Bates, please leave us. Oh. My friend's a doctor. He'll take care of him. He's only wounded. Yes. Just raised his scalp. Oh, thank heavens. I'll be waiting outside. Well, obviously this was attempted suicide. They finally succeeded in driving him mad. Did they? Read this note lying here. It's in the same handwriting as the other messages. I might try to fool another detective, but not you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I admit I shot John Vincent Harden. I'm sure you'll have no difficulty discovering how I escaped from a locked room. Good Lord. You'll observe that the note was written and blotted on this desk. Watson, I'll see to getting Mr. Harden to bed and summoning his own doctor. I want you to return to Baker Street. To Baker Street? Why? Though the case is solved, I have some heavy thinking to do. And I must do it here. So be a good fellow and go back to our lodgings and get me two ounces of shag tobacco. And uh, my violin. <laughs> How are you feeling now, Mr. Harden? Weak, Holmes. But I'm all right. You still can't remember anything, sir? No. I've felt half out of my mind since that attack was made on Alicia. They told me she'd be all right. I, I do faintly remember coming home from the hospital and locking myself in the study. Oh, the rest is a blank. What did happen, Mr. Holmes? I'll give you the complete answer very shortly, Mr. Harden. Come on, Watson. Very well. Try and rest, Mr. Harden. You've been through quite an ordeal. I'll try, Doctor. I'll try. Holmes, you left your violin in Harden's room. Did you mean to? I meant to. And in the meanwhile, we must talk more seriously to Miss Bates. Well, she's down here in the sitting room. Yes. And Brother Stevens you with her. The first to know the good news, Margaret. And may we inquire what the good news is, sir? Oh, didn't see you fellas coming down the stairs. Well, there's no reason why you shouldn't hear it, too. I've just come from the hospital. 
Alicia has broken off her engagement to John. She's going to marry me. Indeed. My congratulations. Yes, sir, but I suggest you don't tell your brother the news. He's a very sick man. Oh, I won't. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to celebrate. From the sparkle in your eye, Miss Bates, I can see that you're just as excited as Stevens is. Of course I am. But tell me, Mr. Holmes, have you found out who attacked John? Yes, Miss Bates. At last, I know the name of Mr. John Vincent Harden's enemy. On the incident of the mutilated fish, you or Stephen or Alicia might have been guilty. On the stolen document, you or Alicia. And on the attack on that lady, you or Stephen, which seemed to leave only you. But I was having tea with both of you in Baker Street when John was shot. Precisely. As perfect an alibi as I've ever known. Then no one person was responsible. There must have been accomplices. No, Watson. Oh, sir. Remember another fact. The note, supposedly written after the attempted murder, was blotted at the very desk which the wounded man was slumped over. Isn't it clear? Frankly, no. The persecutor and the would-be murderer of John Vincent Harden is Giovanni Vincenti. <gasps> but they're one and the same man. Miss Bates told us so. They were the same man. But Harden forced the dominant part of his character into annihilation. When he destroyed his violin, he thought he had destroyed Giovanni Vincenti. But his alter ego was still dormant. Yes. And after the shock of the riding accident in Rotten Row, Giovanni Vincenti emerged, hunting for revenge. You mean that poor John really has a dual personality, Mr. Holmes? Yes, my dear. No one person seemed to have the opportunity of committing all the attacks. But we left one person off our list. John Vincent Harden himself. But why, Holmes? For heaven's sake, why? Giovanni Vincenti struck at the fish, the document, and at the fiancé. All symbols of what Harden had gained for himself. Finally, he attacked Harden's life. <gasps> but, Mr. Holmes, what will happen now? He's out of his mind, but they won't send him to an asylum, will they? I think not, Miss Bates. There's a possibility that this second shock, this uh, self-inflicted wound on the skull may cure him. Uh, don't you agree, Watson? Yes, I do. It's perfectly possible there'll be a complete reintegration of personality. Listen. It's John. And he hasn't touched a violin for ages. So that's why you left your violin in his room, Holmes? Exactly. Now, Giovanni Vincenti and John Vincent Harden are again one man. One whole and sound man. I trust he may create a new life for himself. And I'm convinced that he has here the woman who will help him. Ladies, you certainly must notice how men are attracted by bright, shimmering highlights in a woman's hair. Then why not follow this beauty tip from the famous Million Dollar Powers Models, girls noted for their glossy, bright hair. Powers Models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. This amazingly beautifying Cremel Shampoo has been especially developed so that it actually glamour bathes each tiny strand of hair and uncovers all its natural radiant luster. Yes, and Cremel Shampoo never dries the hair. In fact, it has a beneficial oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Its luxurious active foam thoroughly cleanses the hair and scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. So, ladies, buy a bottle of Cremel Shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of tantalizing loveliness, hair shimmering with natural brilliant luster. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I'll tell you about one of the most exciting adventures that Holmes and I ever had. I call it The Adventure of the Haunted Bagpipes. Haunted Bagpipes, huh? Where did you hear them? In Edinburgh, Mr. Bell. In the same room with three naked corpses. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Solitary Cyclist. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time. And Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the haunted bagpipes.
This is Boy Scout Week. Let's all back our scouts and their themes. Scouts of the world, building for tomorrow. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, here we are once more in Dr. Watson's study. And maybe we're not glad to get here. If we hadn't had a Sherlock Holmes story waiting for us at the other end, we'd have never ventured out on a night like this. Uh, pretty bad weather out, eh, eh, Mr. Bell? Indeed it is, Dr. Watson. There's a cold wind that chills you to the bone. I had one hand holding my coat collar and the other holding my hat all the way over. I felt as though some malignant deity were determined to keep me from reaching your door. You hear that wind? Hmm. Reminds me of what I just escaped from. Oh, it's typical Edinburgh weather, Mr. Bell. Perhaps you've heard that there's no language richer in terms of reproach against the howling wind than the Scots, darling. Snell, bligh, nearly, scouthering, to mention just a handful. All of them words that carry a shiver with them. Yes, as Stevenson so aptly puts it, Edinburgh pays cruelly for her high seat and commanding views in one of the vilest climates under heaven. She's liable to be beaten upon by all the winds that blow. To be drenched with rain, to be buried in cold sea fogs out of the east, and powdered with the snow as it comes flying southward from the highland hills. The weather is raw and boisterous in winter, shifty and ungenial in summer, and a downright purgatory in the spring. It sounds like a pretty unattractive place, Dr. Watson. Oh, there you're entirely wrong, Mr. Bell. Nowhere will you find such stark magnificence, such grim beauty. Edinburgh, the great granite sphinx of the north, crouching high on a towering rock, looking across the intervening plains to the waters of the Forth and to the North Sea. Fascinating, regal, splendid, and cruel. Yes, I think this is just the night to tell the story of the haunted bagpipes, one of the weirdest and most gruesome adventures that Holmes and I ever shared. The setting was Edinburgh, and the motivating character, Professor Moriarty. Professor Moriarty, the man Holmes called the Napoleon of Crime. Exactly. I wondered when we were going to have another of your famous bouts with Professor Moriarty. They're always pretty hair-raising. Yes, and I think I can safely promise you that this is the most hair-raising of the lot. In fact, it's so unbelievably macabre and gruesome that I've never told it to any but to my closest friends, those who know that I'm a truthful man. In fact, sometimes, in the same light of day... I doubt myself that this adventure really happened. But a night like this brings it all back to me in all its horror. Yes, Mr. Bell, on a night like this we realize that anything is possible. Ladies and gentlemen, before Dr. Watson begins his story, men, I have a friend who used to comb his hair with water. After the water dried, his hair would get out of place and he didn't look neatly groomed. Well, I ran into him last Saturday, and he said he'd heard me talking about Kreml hair tonic and decided to try it. He should see the big improvement Kreml made in his appearance. Why, he looked like a different man. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why it keeps every hair in place all day, just as you combed it in the morning. Kreml gives hair a healthy-looking luster, too. Yet it never leaves hair feeling greasy or dirty like some of those sticky preparations you want to wash right out. Kreml always feels and looks so clean on your hair and scalp. It always gives hair such a clean-cut, prosperous appearance. Why not try it? Spelled K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, won't you please go on with the story? The shivers run up and down my spine in anticipation. Well, I certainly will. As I look back on that particular visit to Edinburgh... It seems that a cold fear settled into the very marrow of my bones from the moment we got off the train late one winter afternoon and caught our first glimpse of Edinburgh Castle rising bleak and menacing out of a cloud of fog and rain. There it is, Watson, in all its austere majesty, Edinburgh Castle. <laughs> nice, impressive pile of stone. Nice and grim. No grimmer than its history, Watson. 
Part castle, part fortress, part prison. Wars have been plotted there. Dancing has lasted deep into the night. Murder has been done in its chambers. Oh, well, this is no time to stand here chatting. Let's get out in the this confounded rain. Rain, Watson? You are getting soft. This isn't rain, it's just a good scotch mist. Mist, my, my grandmother. I'm, I'm soaked to the skin and my, my teeth are chattering like castanets. Thank heaven the town has a has a few modern hotels. A nice hot toddy at the Royal, eh? I'm sorry to disappoint you, Watson, but this is not a pleasure trip. We must uh, forego the luxuries of Princess Street and take up our quarters in the old town. The old town? Holmes, you mean that we're going to live in one of those crumbling greystone houses all huddled together on the slope leading up to the castle? Exactly. Why, they're nothing but tenements. Those lands, as they are called, once housed the flower of the Scottish nobility. In the old days, this was a walled city, and space was at a premium. That is why those crazy buildings tower eight and ten stories into the yes, air. Yes, the days of the nobility are over. Those tenements are full of goodness knows what. True. What more suitable dwelling place could one imagine for our friend, Professor Moriarty? Professor Moriarty? Quite. You may have noticed, Watson, that London has been singularly free from crime during the last few months. And for a very good reason. Professor Moriarty was not in residence. Oh, you mean that you think we've succeeded in driving him out? No, Watson. Let us not underrate the professor. He is not in London because he has business elsewhere. But where? I confess I was in complete ignorance until the day before yesterday morning, when I received a telegram informing me that one of Moriarty's chief assistants had been seen prowling through the graves of Grey Friars. Then I remembered that Professor Moriarty has a particular reason for hating Edinburgh. He's not a man to forget his grudges, Watson. The question is, shall we be in time to prevent his revenge? But here... Get into this cab before you catch pneumonia. Professor Moriarty in Edinburgh. Huh. I thought the place looked even more forbidding than usual. Oh, cabby, let us out in front of St. Giles. Ah, hi. Hey, Holmes, why St. Giles? You're not going in for sightseeing this time of day? No, Watson. We must go from there on by foot, I'm afraid. By foot in this weather? The gutters are fairly running with muddy water. Oh, no one asked you to walk in the gutters, Watson. Here you be, St. Giles. And so it is. Come along, Watson. Oh, gracious me, this rain. I say, Cabby, where's Hangman's Lane from here? Lush, you'll no be going there. Why not? It's where we hope to spend the night. It is an unchancy spot, gentlemen. You'll never find me going up Hangman's Lane after dark. As bad as that, huh? I'll no stand here arguing with you. It's the first land back of the kirk, if you must go. Thanks. Here, drink to our health. A cone. There you stand, two fine upstanding gentlemen, hale and hearty, with a black shadow of death looking over your shoulder. What? Oh, death? Ah, well... Then I say I didn't warn you. Come along, Beatrice. Hmm, huh, cheerful individual. Holmes, what do you say? Let's go back and spend the night at a good hotel. We can't possibly find any lodgings in a place like Hangman's Lane. But we shall, Watson. We shall. They're expecting us. Come along. What do you mean, they're expecting us? I mean the owner of most of the tenements in Hangman's Lane has arranged that we should be taken care of. He is uh, most anxious to have us inspect his property. Mm, very well, I don't see what that has to do with our search for Professor Moriarty. Whenever anything curious and inexplicable happens in the professor's neighborhood, the chances are he's mixed up in it. Ah, here's Hangman's Lane. Narrow, steep little byway, eh, Watson? Oh, I don't like it, Holmes. No lights in any of the windows. Usually these tall houses are overrun with inhabitants. Several flam families to, to a floor. Look, look, the buildings in the street look positively deserted. They are deserted, Watson. That's the most interesting part of it. Oh, really? One particular house hasn't been open for several hundred years. But during the last month, the rest of the tenements have been vacated too. Their inhabitants have fled from them like rats from a sinking ship. The rents have been lowered to the vanishing point and still there are no takers. The people hereabouts seem to think the whole street is haunted. Well, uh, uh, couldn't, couldn't we come up here and look the place over in the daytime, Holmes? 
Look, already the, the light's beginning to fade. Unfortunately, Watson, the phenomena we're going to investigate occur only at night. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Ah, here's the house where to stay in. There should be a bell somewhere. Yes. Well, perhaps there isn't anyone to let us in. I think there will be, Watson. Yes, I hear footsteps. Oh, be uh, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, the Lord be thanked. One moment, gentlemen, I'll unbar the door. Oh, be pleased to enter. Go ahead, Watson. Good Lord, it's dark in here. And if you'll kindly step this way, there's a bra blazer burning and candles are lit in the back parlor. Oh, the canny gentleman. This corridor is not so smooth as once it was. Yeah, so I discovered. Yeah, this is the place. Please send her. Oh, well, this is more like it, eh, Holmes? What a magnificent old room. Just look at that fireplace. Aye. For once a blight beat this old house. Full of lords and their ladies, they say. But here, gentlemen, will you be standing in front of the fire and dry your, your bricks? Not a bad idea. We're pretty wet, eh, Watson? <clears throat> wet? There's a brandy on the shell of your what now we drop it. That tasty cockle pie in the pot. And no, you'll forgive me. I'm on shock myself away. I'm going so soon. But uh, we've just arrived. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I dare not stay at the sundown. I'm late to let you alone, but I dare not stay. But in a fash yourself. I'll return the morn early. But what is there to be afraid of? The neighbors. Neighbors? Aye, the neighbors in the old hurly host other side of this wall. But no one has lived in that house next door for years. Not humans, no. No living man has crossed the door staying this hundred year. But there be others. Fogles. You can hear the rattle of their going and coming every night through the war. Have you ever heard these ghosts, or bogles, as you call them? No, I certainly have not. I will not stay at her sundown. But the bogles, there's no the worst of it. Really? Aye. Be times you can hear the sound of doodling. Sound of bagpipes, eh? Aye. And that's when they be entertaining old horny yourself. The devil himself? Aye. Hmm. The ghosts next door move in very high society, eh, Watson? Mm. Uh, 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 what was that? Just the wind in the chimney. You would have swore with the devil's door, sucker. No, I don't think so. I'll not be waiting to find out. When the skirling begins, this is the house that sells dirge like it was singing a dirge. Good night, gentlemen, and God help you. Oh, say. Oh, she was frightened, all right. I wish that chimney would stop moaning. But those two legends... The house next door, the haunted bagpipes. They're famous Edinburgh superstitions. I'd like to hear more about them. Well, I've heard more than I want to already. Confound that chimney. That building next door is one of the so-called fatal houses. Fatal houses? Houses marked generations ago by the Great Plague. Discipline in the time of pestilence was sharp and sudden. The houses having the disease were marked by a large cross. No one dared enter or leave. Furniture was destroyed and houses sealed up. In those houses, of which one or two still remain, the plague is supposed to lie ambushed like a basilisk, ready to escape and spread sickness and death through the city once the doors are open. Oh, but that's ridiculous, Holmes, ridiculous. Germs can't sustain themselves like that. Oh, at least we've no medical evidence that they can. Oh, should we go to Nutel? The other legend is not quite so gruesome. Well, I'm delighted to hear it. It's about a secret passage that is supposed to have existed in the time of Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, between Edinburgh Castle and Holyrood Palace, which uh, lies at the other end of town. About a century and a half ago, a piper made a bet that he could walk the length of it. He started at the castle, piping merrily. The crowds were able to follow him through the streets above by the sound of the skirling. Everything was going smoothly. They followed the sound down from the castle along the top of the hill... Just about here, the piping stopped suddenly in the middle of a note. And that was the last that was ever heard of the piper. Noxious gas, most probably. Uh, some say the devil was so captivated by his playing that he carried him off to hell. Well, what of it? As long as he stays there and doesn't go about waking up the neighbors? Uh, but that's just what he has been doing for the last month or so. Oh, nonsense. It's just a, a noisy chimney like this one. Why should a ghost who's kept quiet for over a hundred years 
suddenly decide to return and annoy people. That, my dear Watson, is what I'm anxious to find out. Holmes. Holmes. Do you hear that? By Jove. Then it's more than just a superstition. Holmes, it's a, it's a piper. The devil's bagpiper. He's playing in the house next door. Splendid. Well, what are we going to do? Want me to inform the authorities? And have them put the devil in jail? No, Watson, I have a better plan. I suggest we go over and call on the old gentleman himself. In just a moment, we'll find out what Sherlock Holmes discovers in the mysterious house next door. Men, if you're wise, you'll start right away and take better care of the hair you've got. Remember, handsome, healthy-looking hair needs a hygienic scalp. So why be content with just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Kremel hair tonic? This highly specialized hair tonic goes in for modern, natural-looking hair grooming. It keeps hair perfectly groomed all day long, looking so neat and attractive yet never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. But Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kreml is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And at the same time, it removes dandruff flakes and leaves the scalp feeling so alive and tingling. And if your hair breaks off and falls when you comb it because it's so dry, use Kreml, which actually helps condition hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer and more pliable. And since Kreml is never sticky or gummy and because it's such a nice, clean product... You can use it every day and your hair will always look its very best. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about the ghostly bagpiper? Did Holmes ever... No, no, really... no, not so fast, Mr. Bell. Holmes insisted that we investigate the house next door at once. And I must admit that it was with some misgivings I followed him into the street. Come along, Watson. Oh, another little bit of local superstition I forgot to mention. They say that the corpses of people who died here of the plague sometimes come to life and wander about the house. Well, Holmes, I wish you wouldn't talk like that. Oh, this, this sleet cutting into my face like a knife. Oh, here's the doorway. I'll find out if the key still works. Yes, it looks more like a crowbar than a key. I only hope the lock isn't too rusty. Hmm. Won't budge. Thank heaven. Let's go back. Oh, give me that oil can. Perhaps a few drops of oil. There you are. Ah, confound this lock. No good trying to break the door in. It's as solid as Gibraltar. A good deal more solid than the house itself, judging by that long crack over the archway up there. Hmm, yes, that is a crack. The building is settling, Watson. That crack... Hello, I turned the key. Locks decided to work. The door sticks now. Hinges rusty. Come on, Watson, get your back into it. Uh, it's, it's moving, Holmes. Yes, so is that crack. Hurry, help me close the door before the archway falls on us. Huh. Isn't it quiet? Can't even hear the wind. It smells like a tomb. Yes, but there's something else. Something unhealthy. Like a disease I smelt once in the tropics. Oh, you don't think it's true that the plague is still... Uh... Nonsense. You yourself said it wasn't possible. Better light that dark lantern we brought along. Yes, indeed. I hate pumping about in the dark. Uh, I can't say that it's much more cheerful in the light. Look at those great dirty cobwebs. That old tapestry hanging in shreds. Yes, nothing has been moved since the plague first touched the house. Look there in that room. That old oak table set for a meal. One of the goblets overturned. It gives me the creeps up and down my spine. Nothing else of interest here. Let's get on to the next room. How hollow uh, our footsteps sound. Yes. This must have been the living room of the house. Ashes of a bygone fire still on the hearth. Holmes. Holmes. Look. There's some people seated in those chairs over there. Nonsense. Give me the lantern. Why? Jove, I think you're right. That smell is stronger in here. We'll soon find out. Watson, hold the lantern. Holmes, it's a body. A naked body. A corpse, Watson. A cadaver. Holmes, don't touch it. For the love of heaven, don't touch it. Why, Watson? Can't you see? The swollen eyes, the froth of the mouth. 
The flesh turned black. I've never seen it before, but those are the symptoms, Holmes. That's the Black Plague. What? That's not possible. That's crazy. Here, look. Let me look at the other chairs. Yes, you're an old man and you're a woman. All victims of the Black Death. Holmes, these are the bodies of people who died in this house centuries ago of the plague. But they're not decayed. It's not possible. We must be going mad. Tell me quick, Watson. Did women do their hair with fringes at the time of the last plague? Fringes? Now I know that we're crazy. Quiet, Watson. Do you hear that? It's the devil coming with his piper. He's going to make him dance. The old woman was right. The house does vibrate to the sound of those pipes. He's coming, Holmes. He's coming. Good evening, gentlemen. Dear me, if it isn't our friend Professor Moriarty, I uh, had no idea you were a musician. You admire my piping, eh? Yes, I wondered how long it would take you to find me. Allow me to congratulate you, Mr. Holmes. You're very prompt. Most flattering, Professor. But I assure you, it was simplicity itself. You didn't think I'd overlook anything as obvious as a sealed house and the haunted bagpiper who so conveniently came back to life in the past month? Yes, I might have known my little roost to get rid of my superstitious neighbors wouldn't keep Sherlock Holmes away. Perhaps it's just as well. You've been getting in my way quite a bit lately, Mr. Holmes. I shall have to continue my experiments begun on these three poor devils. On yourself. And Dr. Watson. You mean the plague? You're going to give us the black plague? I really must try my serum on two healthy specimens before I pronounce it perfect. After all, these three, an old beggar, a thief dying of starvation, and a woman of ill repute, they could hardly be expected to resist the disease. That's very interesting. I was just assuring Dr. Watson that these uh, corpses were quite recent because I was sure that women didn't wear fringes during the last pestilence. Mm. And Dr. Watson was afraid they might be victims of the original plague. <laughs> but in a sense, he's right. The uh, <clears throat> victims are recent. But they were killed by the germs of the original Black Death. <laughs> Most amusing, isn't it? Fascinating. Tell me, how did you discover those germs? They were in this house. I found a nice little culture of them in a glass of calf's foot jelly, which was on the table in the front room. How they ever survived as long as this, I can't imagine. Uh, but here, gentlemen, come into my laboratory. I want to show you what I've done with them. Oh, what should we do? The black plague. It's a terrible thing. The man's mad. Humane, Watson. Humane. Oh, yes, Sir. Here we are, gentlemen. Quite a nice modern little outlay for such an ancient house. Uh, yes, it is an ancient house, Professor. But here, uh, this little test tube. It contains enough of the Black Plague to wipe out the entire city of Edinburgh. Yes, I rather thought that was your purpose. You've never forgotten how they drove you out at the time of the Burke and Hare scandal. You know about that? Quite. Your name wasn't Moriarty then, huh? What of it? You were Dr. Knox's young assistant at the time. Together, you were carrying on some exciting experiments. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Experiments that might have saved the world a great deal of suffering. But you were short of cadavers. It wasn't you, by any chance, who suggested to Burke and Hare, those two body snatchers, that a body did not have to be legally dead to be acceptable? Well, what if I did? They only killed the refuse of the city. Beggars, scum. Quite. But they met the hangman nonetheless. Aye, the fools... What price the death of a few when we might have discovered a cure that would have saved all humanity? Humanity. Bah, I hate it. Ever since then, I'd sworn I'd get revenge on humanity. And the law-abiding citizens of Edinburgh in particular. And now, the time has come. Tomorrow, the contents of this test tube will spread destruction throughout the city. But in the meantime... You, Mr. Holmes, and you, Dr. Watson, you know too much. You shall be the first of the law-abiding citizens to feel the prick of my little needle. Just a moment till I prepare my instrument. Stop him, Holmes! Stop him! Do not move, gentlemen. One drop out of this test tube, even in its present state, is enough to cause death. I quite agree. By the way, Professor Moriarty, while you are preparing your solution, you uh, have no objections if I play a tune on your bagpipes? I used to be rather good at them in my younger days. Not at all, if it'll amuse you. Right. Watson, stand here beside me against this wall. No, no, quite Don't argue. Uh... Oh, 
sounds. It's the house. It's vibrating. I can feel the wall quiver. That's the note that does it. Hold on there. You're shaking the house. The foundations. I can hear them cracking. Look out, man. You'll bring the house down. Well, that's what we intend to do. The walls. I've got to get out of here. We can't. The, the front door's blocked. The secret passage in the basement. If I can reach it in time. Holmes, he's dropped the test tube. It's spreading across the floor. Watson, step back into the fireplace. Hurry. <laughs> And so, Mr. Bell, Holmes played that note on the bagpipes until the house crashed in upon itself. But, Dr. Watson, weren't you killed? <laughs> Not quite, Mr. Bell. No, no. Holmes had deduced from that crack above the front door that the house was weak. And he also guessed which way it would fall if it did cave in. The wall that we were standing against and the fireplace alone were left standing. If you've seen any ruined castles, Mr. Bell, you'll notice how frequently that seems to happen. And Professor Moriarty, did he escape? Unfortunately, he did, Mr. Bell, through the secret passage in the basement which he had mentioned. But the Black Plague and those corpses, what did you do about that? We left them where they were. No use informing the authorities, they wouldn't have believed us. And besides, it would have been too dangerous to go poking about in the ruins. No, Holmes simply poured the spirits from our lantern on the old rafters and started a fire. The wood was as dry as tinder, and there was quite a blaze. And fire, Mr. Bell, is a great purifier. And so you prevented an outbreak of the Black Death. <clears throat> That's a gruesome story. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Watson will return in just a moment to tell us something about the thrilling Sherlock Holmes mystery he has for us next Monday night. Ladies, those beautiful powers models whose photographs you see in magazines always have to keep their hair shining bright with dazzling highlights. Now, here's how they do it. Powers models were among the very first to discover how cremel shampoo brings out all the natural sparkling luster of each tiny strand of hair. How it keeps hair simply radiant for days. Yes, and those lovely Powers models told me that no other shampoo gives their hair more natural, glossy luster. It never dries the hair or makes it brittle. Well, that's because cremel shampoo has such a beneficial oil base. It actually helps hair, and it keeps the hair from becoming dry. Then, ladies, why not take a tip from Beauty Wise Powers Models? See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of tantalizing beauty. Buy a bottle of Kreml shampoo at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. I wonder. Next week. Next week... I think I'll tell you the story of an experience that Sherlock Holmes and I had with something I was convinced was an invention of the devil. I call it the invention of the adventure, rather, of the horseless carriage. Horseless carriage? You mean one of the early automobiles? One of the very earliest, Mr. Bell. Holmes was called in to protect the inventor and, in the end, had to solve the mystery of his murder. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo, inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the horseless carriage. <laughs> ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.
Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now let's drop in again on Sherlock Holmes' famous colleague, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. I was watching from the windows you drove up. Do my eyes deceive me or... Haven't you a brand new car? I'm glad to say I have, Dr. Watson. You want to come out for a spin? No, thank you. Some other time, perhaps. <laughs> I can't help thinking of the first time I ever accepted such an invitation. I sent a story, Dr. Watson, and judging from the reminiscent expression, one in which you and your friend, Dr. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, were both concerned. Oh, hardly, Doctor. You're <laughs> quite right, my boy. Sherlock Holmes and I took our first ride in a motor car together back in the autumn of 1903. When Holmes had just concluded the affair of the, the creeping man. I refuse to listen to any more hints, Dr. Watson, unless you're going to tell us the whole story. Oh, of course, Mr. Bell, as soon as you've had your word with our listeners, I'll relate the strange account which I've entered in my case book as the adventure of the horseless carriage. Men, if you want to be a success in life, remember that well-groomed hair means a lot to a man's appearance. I've heard so many men complain lately that the hairdressing they use is too greasy or too highly perfumed. That's why I urge you to try Cremel Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed. Every lock in place with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet Cremel never, never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you apply Cremel, just run your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. So tempting for the ladies to touch. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Cremel always gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut look. As if you just combed it. And it keeps it that way all day long. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, you have my undivided attention. How about the adventure of the horseless carriage? It all began one morning when Holmes and I were breakfasting in our rooms in Baker Street. Holmes was opening his mail. If you can tear yourself away from the kidneys and bacon for a moment, Watson, I'd like to read you a letter. It's a bad habit, Holmes, burdening your mind with problems at breakfast. It appears a suggestion, told you so a hundred times, but go ahead. My dear Mr. Holmes... My friend, Mr. Alexander Holder, of the banking firm of Holder and Stevenson of Fred Needle Street, informs me that you recently were of great assistance to him in a highly confidential matter. Oh, I'm therefore taking the liberty of calling upon you at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, Tuesday, in the hope of obtaining your assistance and advice. Yours faithfully, Austin Grierson. Grierson? Austin Grierson? Seems to me I've heard or read about that name somewhere like that. That's more to you. Thank you, no. Take a look at his letter and see if you can form any conclusion from it. While I have a glance at what our reference book can offer on Mr. Grierson. <clears throat> Mailed yesterday, postmarked Southampton. Mr. Grierson is presumably well-to-do. The notepaper is of expensive quality. Capital, Watson. What else? <laughs> nothing else, I can see. My dear Watson, nothing else but you observe, you mean. Mr. Grierson has evidently written under the stress of strong emotion. Notice how the pen nib has dug into the paper at several points. He is evidently a man who is used to having his own way. The manner in which he appoints the art which he will call upon us today indicates that. He is obviously mechanically minded and, despite his wealth, still interests himself in machinery. Oh, now, Holmes, how can you tell that? There are faint traces of two fingerprints of the writer's left hand, where he held the paper with fingers that were a trifle oily. And your nostrils should enable you to identify the very faint odor of machine oil. Oh, no, not my nostrils. <laughs> the light is better over here near the window. Let's see what our reference book says. Well? Austin Grierson, Chairman, Board of Directors, Southampton Machine Works, patentee of Grierson's internal combustion engine for motor cars. Ah, that's where I saw his name in a newspaper account concerning a race of some of these idiotic new horseless carriages. Quite so. And furthermore, Watson, I can tell you that Mr. Grierson is fond of animals, and especially a large Airedale. Now, oh, Holmes, I absolutely refuse to believe that you can deduce that from the fellow's letter. I never said I could. But it's precisely ten o'clock, and Mr. Grierson, complete with Airedale, has just been ushered in our front door by Mrs. Hudson. Amazing deduction, I must say. You saw it out of the blasted window. Come in. 
Good morning, Mr. Grayson. Good morning, gentlemen. I'm Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do, sir? How do you do, sir? Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I'm glad to meet you. <laughs> ah, quiet, <laughs> Jeff, quiet there. <laughs> this is my colleague, and a very good guardian, too. Well, sit down, Mr. Grayson, and tell me why you feel the need of a watchdog. The newness of his collar and lead would indicate that you've only recently acquired him. You're quite right, Mr. Holmes. Well, I'll get to the point at once. I made all my money in machinery... I don't mind saying it, I'm a pretty wealthy man. Hmm? Well, during the past three years, I've devoted all my time and most of my fortune to developing the coming wonder of the world, sir. The motor car. Wonder of the world, eh? Never replace the horse, Mr. Gresson. Never. Hmm? You sound like my nephew Edward, Dr. Watson. He shares your opinion. <laughs> but I assure you, sir, that if my new motor car can only win the forthcoming endurance test, of which you may have read, I shall have no difficulty in selling a car a week. Fifty-two cars a year... That's uh, Nevertheless, it is the case, Dr. Watson. In fact, Mr. Holmes, it is the very excellence of my prospects that has brought me to you. How's that, Mr. Gresson? I have just recently completed and been testing the first model of my new car. Two cylinders instead of the old-fashioned one. Tremendous power, Mr. Holmes. The endurance test is to be held tomorrow over a course from Southampton to Alton and back. A distance of over 40 miles. 40 miles? Mm -hmm. And I feel certain that my new car will win. And as you can easily imagine, gentlemen, the ensuing publicity will be invaluable. In fact, Mr. Holmes, I have no hesitation in saying that I must win. I see. At least one of the backers of the other three cars that are entered in this contest feels the same way. And the last two weeks have been one very definite attempt to damage my new car. And yesterday, a second attempt almost resulted in my death. Mm -hmm. Evidently, some people do take these horseless carriages seriously. Yes, Dr. Watson. Unlike you and my nephew Edward, who feels that I'm dissipating the family fortunes in a mad scheme, some people do. Only the fortunate fact that I was driving slowly at the moment saved me from death when the testing apparatus broke. It could not have been an accident, Mr. Grasson. Did the mechanism show definite signs of being tampered with? Beyond any doubt, Mr. Holmes. There were file marks on the steering yoke. And you are certain that these attempts are being made by outside sources, not by members of your own family or persons uh, associated with your venture? My family and fellow workers are above suspicion, Mr. Holmes. So I hope that you will undertake to guard both the car and myself during the next 24 hours until the race is over. Under one condition, Mr. Gerson. Name it, sir. I'm always anxious to experience a new sensation. My condition is that you take Dr. Watson and myself for a drive in your racer as soon as we can get to Southampton. What? Done, Mr. Holmes. Not I. You'll never get me to risk my life in one of those wretched things. Holmes, I can't breathe. How fast are we going? Better than 16 miles an hour. Well, the dust's enough to choke you. Oh, thank him. That's better. Had to slow down. Wouldn't do to frighten that farmer's hey, horse if he passed Whoa, Bess. Whoa, steady, girl. Just found your stinking motor car. <laughs> Useful vehicle if you have to slow down almost to a standstill every time you see a horse. <laughs> Don't worry, Doctor. The horse will get used to it. Not if they show horse sense. <laughs> you like that, home? Appalling, my dear Watson. Gentlemen, here we are, safely home again. Most interesting experience, Mr. Grayson. Oh, phew. I feel better when I've washed off some of this dust. I got to the house in a moment, Dr. Watson. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry there's no place to wash up down here in the barn. I've been keeping the car here for the past couple of weeks instead of down at the machine works. At least this old barn is near the house. I wonder where that fellow Simmons can be. Just a moment, gentlemen. I'll hang up your dusters in this cupboard. Here, yeah, now, now, get away from that car, you two. If you don't, your scars will be bashed in with this uh, Just a moment, my good man. There's no need for you to be a friend. I know who you are. You're someone of those uh, hold on, people. Hold on, hold on. These gentlemen are friends of mine. This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, uh, this is Joe Simmons, gentlemen. Oh, good morning, Simmons. Simmons. The foreman of my machine works and the best motor car mechanic in the world. You'll understand my suspicions, Mr. Grierson, when I tell you that Mrs. Charles saw some bloke hanging about here while you were up in London. What, did you catch him? No, I'm sorry to say I didn't say. We chased him, but the flight got away. Hello, Uncle Austin. How did she run? Perfectly, Charles, perfectly. You and Joe have a tune to a hair. 
Uh, a gentleman. My nephew, Charles Gresson, who helped me design my car. Charles, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? She's a beauty, isn't she, gentlemen? Come, uh, let's go up to the house for some tea. Uh, Simmons, you will be here on guard tonight? You bet I will, Mr. Gresson. And uh, keep Jeff with you. Uh, stay here, Jeff. Oh, oh, dog. Oh, oh. Oh. It was rotten luck, that fellow getting away, Uncle. I was gaining on him till I climbed the fence near the road, and then I gave my ankle a twist that ended all hope of catching him. Oh, too bad, Charles. Tell me, Mr. Grierson, have you or your nephew any suspicions that might indicate uh, which one of your competitors is behind these attempts? No, not a thing. I wish we had, Mr. Holmes. Have you taken any precautions? We've rigged an alarm bell from the barn to the house. Simmons has only to touch a lever, and the gong will ring in the main hall. What of Simmons himself? There's such a thing as bribery, you know. I'd stake my life on Joe's honesty. He's been with me 20 years. Ah, now that I've washed the dust off the outside, I'm glad to see that you gentlemen have something that'll do the job in two. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you are, Doctor. Oh, thank you. Hello, Uncle Austin. Good evening. Oh, Helen, my dear. This is Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. My ward, Miss Helen Lacey, and her fiancé, my other nephew, Edward Gress. How do you do? I'm glad to see you gentlemen survived your ride in my uncle's infernal contrivance. To my surprise, we did. I gather that you agree with my low opinion of the hostess carriage. I've told my uncle often enough that I regard it in the same light as the South Sea bubble. Oh, 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 now, Edward, don't get started on that again. <laughs> Just you wait until we won the race and are turning out cars by the dozen, Edward, and you'll find yourself with plenty of legal work on your hands. <laughs> Taking care of damage suits, probably. By the way, I ran across a rather odd thing today in a letter of inquiry from America. Did you know that in all countries except England, people drive on the wrong side of the road? What? Do you mean to say that in other countries they don't keep to the left? Absolutely not. They drive on the right. <laughs> Barbaric. Uh, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson are going to be staying with us, Helen, until... The alarm. Uh, good Scott. Simmons, the car. Oh, yes. Something's happened. Hurry. <laughs> Let us in. Are you all right? I'm all right. Why did you ring the alarm? Well, look at that, Mr. Holmes. Jeff! What? It's the dog. He's dead. Of all the rotten things. And from the rigor of the limbs, I have no doubt he was poisoned. Uh, no question of it, Holmes. The scoundrel must have been frightened off by the alarm bell before he could tackle Simmons. What do you think, Mr. Holmes? I think, Mr. Grierson, that Dr. Watson and I will stand guard over the car until race time tomorrow. I wouldn't like to see Jeff's fate visited upon a human being. Mr. Grayson. Uh, you've done your job, Mr. Holmes. Now I'll do mine. Careful of that curve here, Petersfield, Uncle. Be careful, Uncle. Uh, good luck. Come back all in one piece. Car number four. Go. I tell you, Chuck. What's the time, Helen? One hour and 46 minutes. With luck, the first car should be finishing soon, shouldn't it? You're overlooking the time necessary for changing tires, Mr. Holmes. After all, covering better than 40 miles at top speed, they have to make two or three changes. Yes, I never heard of having to change a horse's shoes two or three times in 40 miles, did you? Oh, quiet, Watson. <laughs> the day will come, Dr. Watson, when you'll see tires that will go as much as 500 miles without requiring replacement. Don't mind him, Dr. Watson. He has the same delusions as my uncle of the future of these dreadful machines. Yes, there he comes! There he goes! What color's the car? What can you see? So much dust on I just think I have red. The person's red. It's your uncle. I do, yes, so it is. We won! We won! I told you we'd win. Oh, come on. Let's be the first to congratulate Uncle. Well, Holmes, our little job is finished now. I hope so, Watson. I hope so. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
I will. I, I'll admit the way Mr. Grierson took the bridge outside Alton, my heart was in my mouth. But it was a great race. Hello, everybody. <laughs> hello, Charles. Hello, Charles. Where's Mr. Grierson, Charles? Oh, I left him down in the barn. He's crooning over the car like a mother. <laughs> you don't think, Mr. Holmes, that the twisters who've been causing this trouble would try any tricks now that the race is over, do you, sir? I hardly think anyone will make any attempts on the car. Oh, here's a telegram for you, Mr. Holmes. It's just arrived. Thank you. Is Uncle Austin still down at the barn? Just passed by there. Oh, I heard a motor running. Uncle's promised to let me drive the next race. Oh, I bet it's you and not Edward who likes motors. I say, Holmes, where are you going? Down to the barn. You don't think that there's anything wrong, do you? I told you, Watson, I was no longer concerned about the car. <laughs> Give me a hand with this door, Watson. Seems to be stuck. Here, let me get my shoulder again. Now. Uh, push. Push. Back, Watson, back. What is it, Holmes? What's wrong? What's the matter? Don't go in there. That boat is still running. Those tunes are deadly sharp on the north side. Oh. Edward, take Helen back to the house. No, no, Holmes, don't. I've got to get close enough. Uh, all right, I'll help you. No, you don't, Dr. Watson. If you go in, there'll be three of you, Mr. Greyhound. Here. Get your hand. <laughs> Oh, yes. That's better. <laughs> Take care of it, Watson. It's no use going on with that artificial respiration, Charles. I'm afraid there's nothing further that we can do for your uncle. Will you get in touch with the police, Charles? I'll send someone to town right away. I'd best get down to the factory and tell them what's happened. There'll be no party over the victory tonight. Uh, there's another devilish thing that you can charge up to the motor car homes. Grierson evidently stayed in the closed barn with a motor running. Was overcome by the deadly fumes, fell, and died of suffocation. And Hyde, how do you account for that deep wound at the back of his head? Well, obviously, when he fell, he struck his head against the metal bonnet of the car. You saw the blood on the edge of the bonnet, didn't you? Quite so. And I also noticed that Grierson's face is extremely pale. Did you notice that, Watson? Yes, of course. What of it? Simply that carbon monoxide victims invariably show a cherry red discoloration of the face. What do you mean, Holmes? This is no accident, Watson. This is murder. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes as he endeavors to solve the mysterious death of Austin Grierson. Every man who takes pride in his appearance should know that handsome, healthy-looking hair needs a hygienic scalp. That's why when you buy a hair tonic, be sure to get your money's worth. Don't just settle for any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains an amazing combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Cremel keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day. And always gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance. Never sticky or greasy. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kreml leaves your scalp feeling so alive. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes. It's simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry it breaks and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Let Kreml help keep your scalp hygienic. Your hair always looking its very best. K R E M L Kreml hair tonic. Now, Doctor Watson, what happened after Sherlock Holmes discovered Mister Gerson had not died accidentally, but had been murdered? Well, I was still the only one to whom Holmes had revealed the shocking discovery, and he had cautioned me to say nothing of it. As we walked back to the house a few minutes later. I suggested a theory. And on what do you base your suspicions of Edward Watson? Well, it's obvious. Pearson told us last night that his two nephews would inherit equally. And Edward has made no secret of the fact that he felt his uncle was throwing away the family fortune in this wild venture. Besides, he had the opportunity. What do you think, Holmes? I think, Watson, that the libel laws being what they are, and Edward being a lawyer, you had better not air your opinion where he can hear you. Oh, really? Ah, Edward. How is Helen? She's resting upstairs, Mr. Holmes. One of the maids is staying with her. This horrible affair has shaken her badly. Of course. I've sent Joe Simmons to town with a message for the police, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Charles. I'm afraid it'll be the better part of an hour before we can expect them. 
I wonder, Watson, if you'd be good enough to take care of this little matter that I've noted down on the slip of paper. Huh? Oh, 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 oh right. Um, I'll see to it at once, Holmes. Gentlemen. I gathered from what your uncle said last night that you will now be the joint owners of the Southampton Machine Works and of his uh, motor car patents. Yes. Do you intend to carry on as before? Of course not, Mr. Holmes. My uncle knew how I felt about all this expensive foolishness. I've agreed to buy out Edward's share, and he's going up to London to carry on his legal career. Well, if you don't need me for anything further, Mr. Holmes, I think I'll sit upstairs and see how Helen is doing. Of course, Edward. I hope you'll find her bearing up under the shock. Mm, thank you. Charles, there are one or two minor points that I'd like to get clear in my own mind before the police arrive. Anything I can tell you, Mr. Holmes, I'll be glad to. Now, Charles, when you left, uh, when uh, we left you and your uncle, he was about to have you check some question regarding the sparking plugs in the motor. Is that right? Quite, Mr. Holmes. I opened the bonnet and removed the sparking plugs for uncle's inspection. Meanwhile, he refilled the petrol tank. So that there would be sufficient petrol to allow him to test the motor, I assume. That's right. The tank was almost empty after the race. Precisely. You uh, didn't help him refill the tank then, did you? No, I was busy removing the sparking plugs. And when you were finished? Uncle told me not to wait for him, that he wanted to run the engine for a few minutes and that I should join you others up here. And you came straight from the barn to the room in which we all were? Why, yes. You stopped nowhere on the way? Nowhere, Mr. Holmes. Well, that all seems simple enough. Yes, I took care of that little matter, Holmes. Is uh, everything satisfactory? Quite, quite. Excellent. If you and Charles will excuse me, Watson, I'll be back in a few minutes. Why, certainly, Mr. Holmes. Uh, by the way, Charles, Dr. Watson and I will be returning to London as soon as the police have been here. Very well. I suppose, Dr. Watson, that this tragic accident confirms your distaste for the motor car. Yes, it does, Charles. Or rather, it would if uh, Holmes hadn't convinced me that it wasn't an accident. What do you mean? Oh, uh, just something I couldn't... Uh, I uh, thought Holmes had told you that... Uh, told me what? Uh, uh, nothing, 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 nothing. I insist on knowing what you're hinting. Well, uh, Are you implying that my uncle's death was not accidental? Well, uh, of course it didn't occur to me. But Holmes pointed out that in the case of monoxide poisoning, the face and lips would be congested. And your uncle's face was pale. Holmes seemed to think that I'll he... see for myself what Holmes thinks. I won't stand for any insinuations. That... Holmes seemed to think that your uncle was... Oh, gone. Watson, did he take the bait? <laughs> Swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. Good work, Watson. You evidently carried out my instructions in the note to perfection. Yes, I think I convinced him that I left the cat out of the bag quite accidentally. He said he was going off to have it out with you at once. He must have changed his mind rather suddenly, judging from the way he hurried down the hall and tiptoed out of the I front door. Understand. To prove that Austin Grierson was murdered, Watson, would be a matter of utmost simplicity. But my certainty that it was Charles who murdered him rests upon so slender a bit of evidence that I'm sure no jury in the world would convict him. It was necessary to make Charles betray himself, and he fell into our trap. His very flight is a confession of guilt. Ah, listen... Well, that's why you tell me to remove those things, sparking plugs, you call them, from the car. Right. So that Charles would be forced to make his escape on one of the horses once he'd discovered that the car would not start. But Holmes, undoubtedly, he'll take the fastest horse. How on earth are we going to catch up with him? In the motor car, of course. The motor car, but Simmons isn't here. Who on earth is going to drive the infernal thing? I observed Mr. Grierson's actions rather closely yesterday. I feel quite certain that I am competent to operate the machine. Oh, this is the end. Come on, Watson. Show me where you hit those sparking plugs. <laughs> Slow down. It's so dark I can barely see the road. Keep your eyes open, Watson. We should be overtaking him any moment. And keep your service revolver ready. Hello, there's something up ahead now. Just caught a glimpse of it against the skyline. There he is. Brace yourself, Watson. I'm going to shut in ahead of him. Stop or we fire. Good shot, Watson. You killed me, you devil. Take a look at him, Watson. Cut him through the shoulder. Painful, but not fatal. Blast you, Holmes. You had the devil's own luck. I can assure you it wasn't luck that gave you away and revealed your whole scheme. You thought that once your uncle was out of the way and you had bought out your brother's interest, you would have sole control of a business that would prove a gold mine. You can't prove it. A gold mine? Why, Edward told me that Mr. Grierson had sunk a fortune into his experiment. So he had. But what Edward did not know, but Charles had evidently learned, was that the banking firm of Holder and Stevenson had offered Mr. Grierson a hundred thousand pounds for his patents. 
Sir Arthur was dependent upon his winning the race. The telegram I received yesterday from Holden Stevenson was an answer to m- uh, my inquiry. You devil! Good heavens and Holmes! All those previous attempts at sabotage... Those were designed to make us think that some competitor was responsible. All meant to point away from the real murderer. The dog! Why poison the dog? Another attempt to lead us off the track by making us believe strangers were responsible. But Holmes, what was it that made you realize that it was Charles who killed his uncle? As I've often told you, Watson, you see, but you do not observe. You may remember that when we returned from our drive, Mr. Austin Grierson, when you wanted to wash off the dust, told you that there was no place in the barn where you could do so. What on earth that got to do with it? When this fellow here had removed the sparking plugs after the race at his uncle's request, his hands must have been covered with dirt and grease. But when he joined us at the house, his hands were quite clean. He told me when I questioned him that he had not stopped anywhere on the way. Obviously, it must have been he that filled the petrol tank so that the engine would keep running after he had killed his uncle. Nothing but petrol would have washed off the oil and dirt from his hands. Good heavens, Holmes, and that was a slender clue which told you that he'd killed Grierson. So slender a clue, Watson, that it was only your excellent performance that betrayed this fellow into the flight that will convict him. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> when I did what you told me, Holmes. <laughs> Just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Ladies, of course you use a shampoo to wash your hair. But just a word of caution. There are many popular shampoos today which leave the hair lustrous but have a tendency to dry the hair. And here's why I advise you to always use Cremel. Lovely Powers models were among the first to discover the amazing, beautifying qualities of Cremel shampoo. Yes, Mr. Bell. The girls claim no other shampoo leaves hair with more brilliant, glossy, natural highlights. Yet, under no circumstances does Cremel shampoo ever dry your hair. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's entirely different. It really is different, Mr. Bell. After a Cremel shampoo... The hair actually radiates natural, brilliant luster. But Cremel Shampoo has a built-in oil base, which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. So, ladies, be smart. Always wash your hair with Cremel Shampoo. It leaves hair a vision of shining beauty, yet in no way hurts the texture. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell you a story I always referred to as Q for Murder. Q for Murder? That sounds as if it concerned the theater, Dr. Watson. That's why you're wrong, Mr. Bell. Oh? This adventure took place in the depth of Limehouse near the docks and concerned a particularly unpleasant and fiendish murderer. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Barrel Coronet. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at the same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about Q for Murder. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Tonic and Kreml Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's Monday night and time to keep that weekly date with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Let's join, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Draw up your usual chair. Ah, that's it. 
the tobacco jar in the, the jar that was there, just. Thank you, Dr. Watson. And now, how about tonight's new Sherlock Holmes? Oh, adventure? my boys, I told you last week. The story took place in the fetid depths lurking behind the wharf, which lie on the north side of the river near London Bridge. Sounds like good old Limehouse to me. <laughs> it was, Mr. Bell, though I prefer to call it bad old Limehouse. But it's a neighborhood where human life was held cheap. And a scream in the night or the sickening sound of a criminal's bludgeon were almost commonplace. That, Mr. Bell, is the setting of the weird adventure that I call Q for Murder. Dr. Watson, you're beginning to make my hair stand on end. Oh, speaking of hair, Mr. Bell, haven't you a, a message for our listeners? <laughs> yes, Dr. Watson, I have. Naturally, most any man who takes pride in his appearance uses a hairdressing to keep his hair in place. And men, what about the product you're using at present? You find it too greasy, too highly perfumed? Does it make your hair feel sticky and dirty? Then here's a tip. Change to Cremel Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed. Every hair neatly in place with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet Cremel never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you use Cremel, just run your hand back over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Cremel always gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut look. As if you just combed it. And it keeps it that way all day long. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, I'm eager to hear the new Sherlock Holmes story, Q for Murder. Well, Mr. Bell, that strange adventure began in the small hours of a foggy November morning. An emergency call at midnight had roused me from my warm bed, and a rattling horse cab had taken me to the Limehouse district, where an old patient of mine lay desperately ill. For hours, I did my best to save a life that flickered in the balance. Finally, I decided that an ambulance was necessary. The sick man needed the resources of a hospital. Accordingly, I left the house and began to walk the cobbled streets looking for policemen. The slime house at three in the morning is a deserted and frightening district. I could hear the ghostly tooting of the fog horns on the riverboats in the distance. As I walked along, eyes alert, my hand was on the trusted revolver in my pocket, for I was no stranger to the risks involved in walking the streets of Limehouse at such an hour. Suddenly, under the flickering gas light ahead of me, I saw the blurry outline of a London policeman. So I called out, Constable! Constable! The man didn't hear me, for he suddenly turned abruptly and disappeared down the steep flight of steps, his bullseye lantern dancing away like a fading will-o'-the-wisp into the encircling blue. I decided to follow that vanishing figure, and I quickened my footsteps. After a moment, I saw where the policeman had gone. Between a shop shop and a gin shop, I noticed a steep flight of stairs leading down a black gap that looked like the mouth of a cave. I walked down them. The steps were worn hollow in the center by the ceaseless tread of stumbling feet. I reached the bottom. A door faced me, and above it, a flickering oil lamp winked warnings at me. I found the latch of the door, lifted it. The door squeaked open protestingly, and I entered. There was a tinkle of glass-beaded curtains as I walked towards a long, low room. A strange sight met my eyes. Through the gloom, thick and heavy with a filthy brown smoke of opium, I thought the room was terraced with wooden berths. Bodies lay in strange, fantastic poses, bowed shoulders, bent knees, and heads thrown back. Suddenly an attendant walked up to me with a pipe and beckoned me to an empty berth. This way, please. I haven't come here to smoke that foul drug. I saw a policeman enter this place a few moments ago. I want to speak to him. No policeman here. I'm carrying a revolver, so you'd better not argue with me, my good man. Where'd he go? He in back room. My sick there. Follow me, please. In here. Well, bless my soul if it ain't Dr. Watson. All right, Wong, you can leave it. Yes, sir. 
I do. Well, you seem to know me, Constable, but I don't recall meeting you before. Oh, I've seen you and Mr. Holmes at Scotland Yard, Doctor. My name's Merry- Merriweather, Constable Merriweather. You couldn't have arrived at a better time, sir. This man needs a doctor, bad. Well, well, a patient of mine nearby needs an ambulance. That's why I followed you down here. Oh, I'll examine this wretched fellow first. How did you know he, he was here, Constable? They sent a message to the station. They uh, said he was in trouble here. He's in trouble here. Yes. He's in trouble, all right. The poor devil's coughing his eyes in there. Nothing I can do would make his dying a little more comfortable. Here you are. Um, hand me my bag, Constable, will you? Here you are, Doctor. Yes, I'll give him a sedative. At least it'll keep him out of pain. Who oh, are you? What do you do? I'm a doctor, my man. Here, yeah, this will ease your pain. There. You good man, doctor. You help me. Now you help me kill devil who brings opium to my people. Brings opium? What are you talking about? You good man. You find doctor Sturgeon. He bad man. He brings opium. Sturgeon. I've heard of a Dr. Sturgeon. What's his address? He's asleep, Doctor. Uh, this poor devil's eyes are numbered, I'm afraid. You know, Dr. Watson, this is a great honor for me. I read every story you've written. To me, Sherlock Holmes is almost like a god, you might say. Oh, thanks so much. One of these days, I hope to be a detective myself. Indeed, and I think if you study me, you might learn a few pointers. I shall lose no time in investigating this matter. I may be able to expose a, a shocking scandal. Hadn't you better leave that to Mr. Sherlock Holmes, sir? That's more in his line, isn't oh, it? Oh, rubbish, my good man. This is one case that I'm more than capable of handling myself. I shall call on Dr. Sturgeon as soon as his office opens in the morning. <laughs> Dr. Surgeon's secretary. And I'm afraid you can't see the doctor now. His first patient is due at any moment, and you haven't got an appointment. But I'm a doctor myself. My name is Watson. Nevertheless, you'll have to make an appointment. Now, look here, my good woman. I'm I am not... not your good woman. And you cannot see Dr. Surgeon. But, uh, Sturgeon and I were friends at, at medical school together. Sturgeon the surgeon. We <laughs> saw him. <laughs> That's funny, don't you think, Mr. Stark? <laughs> not at all. Oh, huh? And what medical college did you attend, Dr. Watson? The University of London. Odd that you should have met Dr. Sturgeon. He studied at the University of Glasgow. Oh, well, I was at Glasgow, too, for a while, now that you mention it. You've wasted enough of my time. I don't know what you're after, but I think you'd better leave. Good, good heavens. What was that? It came from the doctor's office. Come along. Dr. Sturgeon. He's choking. I'll loosen his oh. colour. Dr. Sturgeon. What is it? He's trying to say something. Uh, But he's dead. Look. Look at the marks on his belt. Great heavens, he's been strangled, Miss Stark. Stay here and guard the body. I'm going to fetch Sherlock Holmes at once. back again. Yes, Miss Stark. This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, no one's been here since I left? No. Patient came into the outer office, but I sent her away. Splendid. Tell me, Miss Stark, is there another entrance to this office? Yes, Mr. Holmes. The doctor had a private door from the outside leading into the laboratory in there. He always let himself in that way. Did he ever admit patients by that private door? Why should I answer your questions? You're not the police. I appreciate your loyalty, Miss Stark, but I assure you that if you're trying to protect your dead employer, you'll find me to be more understanding than Scotland Yard. Very well. What do you want to know? I repeat my question. Did Dr. Sturgeon admit patients by his private door? Yes, he did, Mr. Holmes. Sometimes. I never saw them, but I hear voices in there. Hmm. Perfect way of distributing drugs without anybody knowing. Are you implying that Dr. 
dead. Quite. <gasps> you say that as he was dying, he kept pointing to a pad on his desk, Watson? Yes, his arm's lying across it now. Hmm. Let's see if there's any message written on the pad. Ah, there is. It's an address. 116 Upper Swandham Lane, Millwall. That's in the heart of Limehouse. Precisely. An odd address to find written on the desk pad of a Harley Street physician. Watson, you're convinced that as the man was dying, he uttered the word peace? Well, that's what it sounded like to me. Peace. Well, perhaps he meant that death would bring him peace after his mortal sin. Possibly, Watson. And now to examine the marks on the dead man's throat. I think I'll wait in the other room, if you don't mind. Hmm. Looks as if he was strangled with a piece of rope. Look more closely. Observe these traces of oil on the throat. And look. Look at this. I do. The long black hair. That means a woman did it. Oh, no, Watson, I think not. The combination of long black oily hair and a limehouse address would point to one obvious conclusion. Dr. Sturgeon was strangled with a Chinese cube. Strangled with a cube? How would that be possible? That, my dear Watson, is our next problem. Tell Miss Tuck to send for the police. Our work here is done. We're going to Limehouse? Certainly. As soon as we have adopted suitable disguises, we shall investigate the mystery of 116 Upper Swandham Lane. I pray that the answer to murder lies there. <laughs> On my soul, Holmes, you make the most convincing-looking dock hand. Thank you, Watson. Now, let me see. One, one, six. It's the next house. There's a policeman staring just outside it. It's Constable Merriweather, the one I met last night. Hello, Constable. Something happened? Never you mind. Just keep moving Oh, along. we ain't doing now, mate. We, we now, if we're just going down in a pig and whistle for part of the mill, the mill model villa. Ain't it right, Alfie? Of course it is, Betty. Then off you go, both of you. Oh, can't a bloke stop and pass the time of day? Ain't you been a bit narky, chum? Aye, uh, here, what's, uh, what's happened here? Murder. That's what's happened. Now move along there. Murder. And at the address on Dr. Sturgeon's pad. Here, here, who are you? Oh, it's all right, Merriweather. It's... Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Well, blow me down. I'd never have recognized you, gentlemen. But what brought you to this address? I'll explain that later, Constable. Who has been murdered? A Chinese gentleman got himself done in. Was he strangled? I don't rightly know, sir. What do you mean you don't know? Surely the evidence of strangulation is perfectly easy to detect? Well, I suppose it is. But you see, in this case, Mr. Holmes, the corpse ain't got no head. <laughs> Just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Leading hair specialists in this country constantly advise us to take better care of the hair we've got. And men, don't forget, one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So why buy just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra benefits of this highly specialized Cremel hair tonic? Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which has never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. That's why Kreml keeps hair in place longer, always looking neat and orderly. But Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kreml is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes and leaves your scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. And men, if your hair is so dry it breaks and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. So men, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kreml daily for better groomed hair, for a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, what happened next? Well, my boy, we quickly entered the house and examined the scene of the latest tragedy. Constable Merriweather seemed to be in a seventh heaven of delight to realize that he was working on a case with the great Sherlock Holmes himself. I'm glad you're here and no mistake, Mr. Holmes. 
I'm a little out of my depth in a case like this, and I don't mind admitting it. Well, Merriweather's a great admirer of yours, Holmes. He's, he's read every story that I've written. Indeed. You have a strong constitution, Constable. Though I will admit that this case presents as bizarre problems my friend has ever included in his rather sensational accounts. What I can't understand, sir, is why they took the head. For that matter, how was it stolen? Before we theorize, let us assemble the facts. Has the body been identified, Constable? Uh, yes, sir. You see, he had a missing finger on one hand. Then, obviously, the head was not stolen in order to make identification of the corpse difficult. Who is the victim? A Chinese merchant by the name of Li Ming uh, ran a shop downstairs in the basement. Please describe the circumstances under which you discovered the crime. Well, gentlemen, I was on my beat and I saw the dead man walk up the stairs from the basement and go into the house. That passed the time of day with me, he did. Two houses down, I stopped to talk to the fishmonger outside his shop. I must have talked to him for 15 minutes or more. What time was this, Merriweather? Just after 10 o'clock, sir. I see. Please continue. Well, sir, all the time I was watching this house. Suddenly, there was an oaring and a yelling, and I runs back to find the man lying in here with his head gone. You were watching the house all the time, you say, Merriweather? Yes, sir, just idle-like. But I'll swear no one went in or out. Oh, which means that somebody inside the house must be the killer. That's what I think, Doctor. Who are the other tenants? Well, Mr. Holmes, on this floor there's an old Chinese lady. A servant to the dead man, she was. But she's half crippled with rheumatism, and I swear she couldn't have done it. But upstairs there's a Chinese gentleman. Prince Fu Sen. A prince? <laughs> in these surroundings? He's got quite a place, too. Then you've already interviewed him? Oh, yes, sir. He and his nephew are up there. Swore they didn't have nothing to do about it, but the young fella acted mighty suspicious-like. Perhaps you'd like to go up there, sir. I know you'd handle these foreigners better than me. Very well, Constable. Let us visit Prince Fu Chen at once. Come on in there. Come on. Open up in the name of the law. I'm afraid the name of the law doesn't appeal to them. Unless I'm much mistaken, they're barricading furniture on the other side of the door. Yes, well, three good shoulders can take care of that, Holmes. Good idea, Watson. Come on. Mm. One, two, three. Oh. There you go. Once more, Mr. Holmes, and we'll do it. Oh. Oh, dear. Chief, you, you have no right to break in like this. Oh, yes, we have, Mr. Adult Fu. You're under suspicion of committing murder. I've already told you that I know nothing about it. Then in that case, Mr. Fu, why barricade the door? Who in blazes are you? I am Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. Why, may I ask, is that partially packed Gladstone bag lying on the settee there? Were you uh, thinking of leaving? Of course I was. You say you know nothing about this, then why admit guilt by running away? Because I know this policeman suspected me. They call me a Eurasian, but I'm Western by instinct and education. Because the color of my skin compels me to live in this part of London, I... I knew that I was bound to be associated with a Chinese crime. Despite your instincts and education, Mr. Fu, you seem to have a very poor opinion of British justice. Huh. Where is your uncle, Prince Fu Chen? In the study. Uh, you can lead the way if you don't mind, Mr. Fu. I'd like to keep my eye on you. Oh, very well. Follow me. I must say it's a sumptuous flat, Holmes. Some of these oriental furnishings must be priceless. Yes, Watson. Quite incongruous in such a district. Uncle, that policeman's back again. And there's some other men with him. Won't you come in, gentlemen? Prince Fu, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? Uh, welcome do you do? Uh, to my humble abode, gentlemen. And uh, perhaps I may be permitted to ask why two such famous men should be dressed like riffraff from the quayside. We're investigating a murder, Prince Fu. You have come to speak to me of murder, Mr. Holmes? But I have already told the constable that I have no knowledge concerning the tragedy of which he spoke. Possibly, Prince Fu, but uh, as we came in just now, the door was barricaded and your nephew's bag was packed. He admitted that he was going to leave. Harold, my boy, what uh, prompted you to such an action? You have no knowledge of the crime. How could I prove it? You know as well as I do, Uncle, that a Eurasian hasn't got a chance. Quiet, Harold. Uh, Mr. Holmes, you must forgive the boy. He is young. Young and bitter. But he will learn in time that he is neither English nor Chinese. 
He is something far greater. He is a man. Oh, the devil with your moralizing, Uncle. Prince Fu, you are a man of intelligence, and I'll put our cards on the table. The dead merchant downstairs and a certain doctor in Howard Street who was also murdered today were undoubtedly both involved in peddling narcotics. I believe they were both killed by an associate who was afraid they might implicate him. That associate, from the constable's evidence, must be someone in this house. Prince Fu, I'm sure that you're wise enough to appreciate your position. Mr. Holmes, in my own country, I devoted my life to fighting the ravages of drug traffic. Uh, am I then to partake of its profits here in England? Hello, hello, look here. Oh, what is it, Constable? On the desk. It's a doctor's visiting card. Hmm. Henry Sturgeon, M.D., 86 Harley Street. Great, Scott. How do you account for this, Principal? I, I am completely bewildered. I have never seen that card before. Nor have I ever heard of a Dr. Sturgeon. I suppose the wind must have blown it in, eh? Funny coincidence and no mistake. Shall I arrest him, Mr. Holmes? No, Meriwether, though I would like you to remain here on guard. In the meanwhile, Watson and I have one vital task to perform. What's that, Holmes? We must search this house from basement to chimney top. We've got to find that missing head. <laughs> I've searched the house with a fine tooth comb. I swear the missing head isn't here. But so will I, old chap. That's why I gave you the job of searching for it. Why the blazes waste my time while you go careering all somewhere else? Oh, don't be angry with me, Watson. I needed you to create a diversion to cloak my real activity. Oh, huh? where have you been? I've been having a most illuminating talk with a certain tradesman by the name of Albert Bloggs. Now I know who our double murderer is. Good Lord. Who? I suggest that we return to Prince Fu Tsen's flat upstairs. There, I shall make the matter clear to you. Mr. Holmes, am I to understand that you have solved this shocking crime? Yes, Prince Fu. Which one of them was it, Mr. Holmes? Meriwether, you've been on this case from the beginning... You've been remarkably astute in some of your deductions. Thank you kindly, sir. That's real praise coming from you, Mr. Holmes. Surely you can see the obvious link between the two murders? I think I can, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Sturgeon got himself strangled with a Chinese cue. Now, we know one of these two men did it. But Mr. Harold Fu wears his hair short like an Englishman. Only the prince has a cue. It must have been him. It seems logical to me, Holmes. And, uh... Singularly lacking in logic to me, my friend. I quite agree, Prince Fool. You see, Watson, you and Constable Merriweather are overlooking the stolen head. Why was it stolen? What more likely reason than for the sake of its cue? And if the merchant's head was the weapon used to strangle Dr. Sturgeon, then the murderer wished to create the imaginary figure of someone wearing a cue. Therefore... The murderer did not have a cue. Then it was Harold Fool. Yes, it must have been. That's utterly ridiculous. Of course it is. You're overlooking one vital point. Limiting our suspects to the prince and Mr. Harold Fool depends entirely on Constable Merriweather's testimony, which means that we have three suspects. And the third is the constable. Me? Oh, you're joking, Mr. Holmes. Murder is not a subject for levity, Constable. But Holmes, what motive could he have had? The reason is obvious, Watson. Why did the murders occur immediately after you stumbled into this trafficking in narcotics? Because Merriweather himself was involved with the criminals. He overheard the man last night tell you about Dr. Sturgeon. And so Dr. Sturgeon had to die. You mean that Merriweather was a member of this ring? Of course. And a dishonest policeman could be a very valuable ally. Mr. Round, you, you got hold of the wrong end of the stick and no mistake. No, I haven't, Constable. You killed the merchant downstairs, decapitated the poor devil, and then used his cue to strangle Dr. Sturgeon. You lied about the time you'd seen him enter. You said it was after ten o'clock. Well, how can you prove it wasn't that time, Mr. Holmes? I just talked to Albert Bloggs, the fishmonger. He saw you for a moment at 8.30 this morning. He did not see you at ten. Great Scott and Merriweather killed the merchant first, went over to Dr. Sturgeon and strangled him, probably dropped the head into the river, and came back here and lied about the time. Precisely. And on his first visit to this flat, he carefully planted one of Dr. Sturgeon's cards, knowing that it would incriminate Prince Fool. As cold-blooded and horrible a crime as ever I encountered. You're a disgrace to the force, man. Oh, wait a moment, wait a moment. You've still got no proof. My word's as good as that stinking fishmonger. I doubt it. 
In any case, another word pins the crime on you. One from beyond the grave, the dying word that Dr. Sturgeon uttered. He uttered the word peace. And why should he say peace when he was pointing at the address and trying to indicate to us his murderer? No, he died while he was saying what sounded like peace. What he was trying to say was PC, which stands for police constable. He died as he tried to accuse his murderer, police constable Merriweather. You'll never get me on the end of Grab him, grab him, he's heading for the window. Must be 40 feet down into the street. It'll be a miracle if he hasn't broken his neck. I'll go down and see what I can do for him. A doctor will save a man's life so that he may lose it on the gallows. A quaint custom. Prince who? I must apologize to you and your nephew for the embarrassment and humiliation to which you've been subjected. Mr. Holmes, I must confess that I never expected that my quiet sanctuary, my haven from the outside world, would be brushed by the wings of violence and sudden death. But I have seen justice done. And for the remainder of my poor life, I shall always revere the name of the man responsible, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Ladies, one of the greatest beauty authorities in this country is John Robert Powers. And the first beauty advice Mr. Powers gives his lovely Powers models is to use only cremel shampoo to wash their hair. And isn't he wise, Mr. Bell? Because cremel shampoo is one shampoo that can be bought today that leaves the hair fairly teeming with natural, brilliant highlights. Yet never under any circumstances does cremel shampoo ever dry the hair. You see, cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's entirely different. How right you are, Mr. Bell. Why, after a cremel shampoo, even dull, lifeless-looking hair actually radiates all its natural glossy luster. And cremel shampoo has a built-in oil base, which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. In fact, it's wonderful to soften dry, brittle ends. So, ladies, be smart. Always wash your hair with cremel shampoo. It leaves the hair a vision of shining beauty, yet in no way hurts the texture. No matter how often you use cremel shampoo, or over a long period of time, it's always so mild and gentle on your hair. And remember, ladies, no other shampoo leaves the hair sparkling with more natural, glossy luster. It's K-R-E-M-L, cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see what I tell you next week. Next week... Uh, next week, Mr. Bell, I think I'll tell you a story about some strange deaths that happened, of all places, in the British Museum. I call it the singular affair of the ancient Egyptian curse. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Man with the Twisted Lip. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Stanger. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo. Inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the singular affair of the ancient Egyptian curse. <laughs> ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, owing to Mr. Conway's illness, the part of Sherlock Holmes will be played by Mr. Ben Wright. <laughs> Now 
time for our weekly visit with Sherlock Holmes' famous colleague, your friend and mine, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. I'm glad to see you. Make yourself at home. Thank you, Dr. Watson. You know, I've been waiting eagerly all week to hear about the singular affair of the ancient Egyptian curse. And the most singular affair it was, to be sure. It had its beginnings in the august halls of the British Museum. I've been looking over my old records to refresh my memory, and even after all these years, it sends what in Scotland they call a cow grew down my spine. <laughs> I can hardly wait, Dr. Watson. Recently, in a poll conducted throughout the country, women picked the ten best groomed men in America. These men were all men at the top, statesmen, governors, motion picture stars, producers, and millionaires. And men, I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing how a recent survey showed that Kreml hair tonic is preferred among America's top flight executives and most successful men. But then why shouldn't it be? Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. Such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. Kreml also keeps the hair neatly in place longer with a healthy-looking luster. Yet it never leaves your hair looking or feeling greasy. After you apply Kreml, you can rub your hand over your hair and your hair always feels so delightfully clean. Notice, too, how no greasy film comes off on your hand or on your hat band. Just use a little Kreml on your hair in the morning, and at night your hair looks as neatly groomed as when you first combed it in the morning. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about the singular affair which began in the sacrosanct confines of the British Museum? Well, I must admit that I was not a frequent visitor to those gloomy halls, but on this particular morning, Holmes had been insistent. All the scientists in London, especially the archaeologists, were agog over the arrival of Lord Cranwood's sensational Egyptian discoveries. For several days, Holmes had been deeply immersed in research among the Cranwood antiquities, so that now I find myself in the Egyptian gallery of the British Museum. I say, Watson, look here. This notation definitely proves the use of stringed instruments as well as flutes as early as 3000 B.C. Hmm? Very interesting, Holmes. Very interesting indeed. If you please, sir. The smoking is absolutely forbidden. Huh? Oh, all right, all right, all right. Oh, hello, Holmes. Oh, Watson, I don't think you know Professor Halliday of the British Museum. Professor, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson? Not the eminent Dr. Eustace Watson, the well-known archaeologist of Edinburgh. I'm honored. No, sir. Dr. John H. Watson of Baker Street. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is Dr. Watson's first visit to all your magnificent new acquisitions, Professor Halliday. It's a veritable treasure house, gentlemen. The late Lord Cranwood's excavations at the site of ancient Abydos have given the museum a priceless mine of information. And yet the price in human lives has not been inconsiderable. First Lord Cranwood himself, only a few days after the shrine of Har Shafit was opened. A man of almost 80, Mr. Holmes. The strain and excitement of the discovery were too much for him. No doubt. And then a month later, Dr. Duma, disappearing mysteriously from camp, only to be found hopelessly insane and babbling madly before he died. And young Wilson, vanished into thin air and assumed to have been lost overboard from the ship that was bringing the expedition back to England. Oh, it was a calm, moonlit night. Don't tell me that you, of all people, believe this newspaper talk of Hasha Fitz's curse, Mr. Holmes. I believe nothing that is not susceptible of proof, Professor. Evidently, the new Lord Cranwood is quite undisturbed by any threats of a curse upon his family. I've seen him working here every day this week. Oh, is that Lord Cranwood? Yes, the uh, heavy-set, middle-aged man over there, just beyond that fifth sarcophagus. Fifth which? The chap with a rather florid face, just packing those notes into his briefcase. Oh, looks fit enough, I must say. Judging from his appearance, I should think that the curse of a watcher's name wouldn't have much luck with him. Oh, you'll excuse me, gentlemen. I want a word with Lord Cranwood before he leaves. Oh, Sir Holmes, supposing I run along, I'll meet you at the club for lunch and... Uh... Oh, Lord Cranwood, what's the matter? Why, well, he's collapsed. Quick, Watson. I, I don't understand. He just seemed to keel over. Well, let me take a look at him. You were standing right beside him, Professor. Just what happened? Well, I was speaking to him. He clutched his throat, tried to say something, and collapsed. Holmes. Yes, Watson? The man's dead. Impossible. Cause of death, Watson? Well, I should have said heart, but... But uh, the I... curious rigidity of the muscles of his hands and throat aren't consistent with that diagnosis. Is that it, Watson? Quite correct, Holmes. He would better notify Scotland Yard at once, Professor Halliday. Scotland Yard? Mr. Holmes, are you suggesting... I suggest nothing, Professor Halliday. But Lord Cranwood has died extremely suddenly. 
In view of the three previous deaths which have occurred among the members of the expedition, I feel that this is definitely a matter for the police. I'll send for them at once. I'm certain, Watson, that a second look at Lord Cranwood's body will suggest to your mind a cause of death with which you cannot be unfamiliar. After your army career in India, the congested eyeballs, the rigid neck muscles. You mean snake bite? Precisely. The bite of some venomous and highly poisonous snake is the only cause consistent with these appearances. But there are no snakes here in the British Museum? That, Watson, is why I sent for Scotland Yard. You've been pacing up and down now for two solid days, Holmes. Would it be too much to ask you to be seated for at least five minutes? I'm sorry, Watson. The lack of any satisfactory solution to the problem of Lord Cranwood's death has driven me almost out of my mind. You find the problem insoluble, then? <sighs> so far. Come in. Ah, Inspector Lestrade. I've been expecting a call from you. Yeah, this thing's fair got me beat, Mr. Holmes. Oh, sit down, Inspector. Can I get you a drink? Thank you, Doctor. I'll be glad of one. <laughs> well, we've got the coroner's verdict, Mr. Holmes, and much good it does us. Death by misadventure from unknown causes. Well, you could hardly expect a coroner's jury to say more. Did the Home Office pathologist confirm my opinion? Uh, here you are, Lestrade. Well, Holmes. thank you, Doctor. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. All the appearances of death were consistent with the bite of some deadly snake. But did we find any snakes running around? Were there any snake bites on the deceased body? No. <laughs> Why, you yourself, within a few yards of the man, Mr. Holmes, and you know as well as I do that if a man gets bitten by a snake, he's going to let out a yell. I know exactly how you feel, Lestrade. Yeah, and have you seen the papers? <laughs> Scotland Yard battled by 5,000-year-old curse. Death strikes again from Egyptian tomb. You can't blame the journalist, Lestrade. It's a newspaper editor's dream. And Scotland Yard's nightmare. <laughs> well, I must be off. The commissioner wants to see me this afternoon. You can be thankful this isn't one of your cases, Mr. Holmes. I think this one would be too much even for you. Phew. Never seen a Strad quite so worked up before. And I can't say that I blame him, Watson. Well, come along. Since the late Lord Cranwood's funeral is to take place at two o'clock, we might well stroll over to Hanover Square. Perhaps a brisk walk may serve to blow the cobwebs from our brains. It's the first time I've known you stand about outside a church at a funeral, Holmes, peering at the relatives of a dead man. I'm anxious to see the new Lord Granwood, as well as his relatives. He was a nephew of the late lords, you know. And the family's interest in Egyptology has been inherited by him, along with the title. Here they come. And there's them, the new Lord Cranwood. I wouldn't want to be in his boots with a curse hanging over me head. There's Lord Cranwood, Watson. Fusty looking young chap. Looks as though it'd take more than a family curse to get him down. Who's that coming after him, the pale young fellow in the wheelchair? His cousin, a Mr. Neville Robertson, I believe. Been hopelessly paralyzed ever since boyhood. Horse rolled on him while hunting. Yes, the lines of pain and suffering are very evident in the poor fellow's face. That must be Robertson's older brother, Mr. Oliver Robertson. That rather heavy set young man just coming out. I assume that's his wife with him, the, the girl with the black veil. Well, it's rather rough on them, all these curious people staring. Come along, Holmes. Let's be off. Very well, Watson. I've seen all that I. I beg your pardon, sir. But aren't you Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Yes. Well, my name's Oliver Robertson. <laughs> Fortunate coincidence, my seeing you here. I'd intended sending you a message this evening. A message? Yes, I... I wanted you to... Well, this is hardly the place to discuss such matters. Look, I'm staying at my cousin, Lord Cranwood's house. I wonder if you'd be good enough to come there this evening. Would nine o'clock be satisfactory? Excellent, Mr. Holmes. Good day, sir. Good day, Mr. Roberts. <laughs> Come in, gentlemen, come in. I don't think you know my wife. Dear, may I introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes? How do you do? And this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? I'm very happy to see you here, Mr. Holmes. And you too, Dr. Watson. Mr. Holmes, my wife and I, well, to put it frankly, have asked you to come here because we're afraid. And not for ourselves, but for my cousin, the new Lord Cranwood. Mr. Holmes, 
Neither Oliver nor myself is of a, a nervous temperament. If you have read the accounts of the Cranwood expedition, you must appreciate my feeling that we are contending against more than mere ill fate. Four members of the same small group, dying mysteriously or by violence within a few weeks of each other. Well, so you don't put any stock in all this talk about an ancient Egyptian curse? No, I don't really know. Uh, tell me, Mr. Robertson, does the new Lord Cranwood share your fears? I regret to say he does not. He laughed when I told him I'd asked you here. Am I interrupting a council of war, or may I be permitted to be present? Oh, come in by all means, Neville. Here, let me give you a hand with your wheelchair. I can manage, I can manage. My brother Neville, gentlemen, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do, 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 do? I assume that the presence of the celebrated sleuth of Baker Street is not unconnected with the curse of the Cranwood. Please, Neville, don't make fun of us for being frightened. Oh. After all, it's Derek we're worrying about, not ourselves. Time enough for you to worry, Oliver, when the curse catches up with Derek. Then you'll be Lord Cranwood yourself, and it'll be my turn to start worrying. I gather, Mr. Robertson, that you are somewhat skeptical regarding the efficacy of Harshafit's 5,000-year-old curse. My granduncle died of heart failure after the excitement of discovering the tomb. Dr. Dumas' death was certainly not the first case of sunstroke that's ever been heard of in Egypt. And Wilson, who fell overboard from the ship, was notoriously fond of the bottle. Does that answer your question? Ingenious, Mr. Robertson, but it leaves out of account your uncle's death in the British Museum the other day. I could offer you a dozen theories to account for that, but I doubt if they'd be sensational enough to please you. Mr. Holmes, regardless of what my cousin may say, and I know he'll agree with my brother, I wish to engage you to prevent any repetition of the tragedies which have already struck this family. Do say you will, Mr. Holmes. I will do my best, Mr. Robertson, to keep Lord Cranwood safe from harm, but without his cooperation, I greatly fear that I... Stimson said he wanted to see me, Oliver. Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't know you had guests. I very much want to see you, Derek. This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. My cousin, Lord Cranwood, gentlemen. How do you do? I'm sorry, gentlemen. I have no sympathy with my brother's fears, nor do I see any necessity for dragging detectives into this matter. I trust you'll excuse me. Good night. Well... You see, Mr. Holmes, it's just as I told you. But I do hope you'll do your best anyway, Mr. Holmes. I promise you I shall. Your task won't be made any easier, Mr. Holmes, by my cousin's stubborn determination to continue working at the museum. He's arranged with Professor Halliday to work there at night in the future, uh, beginning tomorrow. He wishes to avoid the stairs of the curious. Hmm, interesting. Great Scott, my watch must have stopped. 9.30 and I haven't as yet fed my snakes. Snakes? Did you say snakes? Why, yes, Doctor. Since my affliction debars me from digging in Egyptian tombs and similar active pastimes, I amuse myself with a small herpetarium. Would you care to see my collection? Good heavens, no. Or oh, some other time, perhaps, Mr. Robertson. Dr. Watson and I must be off. Good. Snakes. <laughs> say, Holmes, that I find that sinister crippled Neville and his nasty collection of poisonous reptiles highly suspicious. Well, there's no doubt that Neville's personality has been warped by his affliction. And the availability of snake venom is, of course, significant. And look at his motive, Holmes. Look at his motive. The Cranwood title and the Cranwood fortune. But there's one thing you've forgotten, Watson. Even if the new Lord Cranwood were to die, it would be Neville's older brother who would inherit Oliver and his wife would become Lord and Lady Cranwood. Are you trying to tell me that a murderer who'd killed two men would boggle at a third? If Cranwood dies and Oliver gets the title, he'd be the last barrier in Neville's way. I don't like to say it, Holmes, but for once you seem to be singly obtuse about the facts of this case. Possibly, Watson. At any rate, I intend that you and I shall be present, although concealed, when Lord Cranwood visits the Egyptian galleries tomorrow night. You mean that you anticipate an attempt upon his life? As I have told you on previous occasions, Watson, it's a great mistake to theorize ahead of one's data. Sir Holmes, you, you, don't, uh, you don't really put any faith in all this talk about the supernatural curse. Do you, Watson? I, I, uh, oh, gosh, no, no, of course not. Good. Well, then I trust that tomorrow night you will arm yourself with your service revolver. Oh, really? Yes, Watson. I should like to be in readiness for anything we may encounter at the British Museum. Supernatural or otherwise. Empty. 
ghostly place at night, isn't it? Carved humanity? Yes. What do you mean? Merely that the relics of the past are all about us. Oh, yes, yes, yes of course, sir. Oh, on this way, through the northern vestibule. I say, Holmes, what's that thing? Looks like a coffin. That's what it is. Oh, good, good. Ah, here we are. Ah, he'll no doubt work at that long table. It has the only decent light in the room. Now, you take that side of the table, Watson. I'll take this. And make certain there's no one and nothing concealed. You're, you're, you're not expecting to find a, a snake anywhere, are you, Holmes? I don't expect to find anything. I merely wish to make certain that there is nothing to find. Yeah, I'll careful, Watson. Don't knock over that little figure. What the devil is it? And the Egyptians call those little statues the answerers. They were buried in the cedar coffins within the sarcophagi to accompany the dead and to obey their orders. A pleasant idea, I must say. Well, there's nothing hidden on this side of the table. Nor oh, here. Yeah. Now, now, there's an excellent spot to conceal ourselves. Over here, Watson. Great. God, what a horrible sight. What sort of a nightmare is that? And appropriately enough, it's a statue of Hashafit, a ram-headed god. Oh, excellent, Watson. Now, this will do perfectly. We can see everything in the room from behind here. Uh, just what uh, are you expecting, Holmes? I don't know. Quiet. Someone coming. It's Lord Cranford. Yes, he's taking his papers out of his briefcase. Oh, now that he's turned the lamp up, I can see the better. He's all right so far. He's settling down to work. <laughs> what? Something's wrong. Quick. He must have fainted. Here's the antitoxin. Give him the injection. Hurry. It's too late, Holmes. He's dead. <laughs> Just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson as they endeavor to solve the mystery of the ancient Egyptian curse. Men, if you want to be a success in life, remember that well-groomed hair adds a great deal to a man's appearance. And one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So start at once and take better care of the hair you've got. And if you're smart, you'll use Cremel hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly in place without looking or feeling greasy. But men, Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Cremel's light oils have a grand lubricating effect on a dry scalp. At the same time, Cremel removes itchy, loose dandruff. Notice how alive and tingling your scalp feels. And you like to massage Cremel on your scalp because it's such a clean product. It never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair, like so many men's, is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, Cremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. So men, for handsome groomed hair and a more hygienic scalp, use Cremel daily. Buy a bottle of Cremel at any drugstore. Ask for an application at your barber's. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Hair Tonic. That famous modern hair tonic which has become such a nationwide favorite. And now back to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson and our story. I say, Holmes, if you won't have any lunch, you at least take a cup of tea. No, thank you, Watson. I'm not hungry. You've been saying that ever since that poor fellow Derek was killed the night before last. You simply must eat, Holmes. My appetite will return when I have a solution for this case, Watson, and not before. Well, I've, I've hesitated to say it, Holmes, but uh, if that man had died by any natural means in front of our very eyes, I'm perfectly certain that you would have solved the riddle. Well, if your hypothesis is correct, Watson, this case is not a matter of the mortal's minds. And that I refuse to admit. Well, we saw him come in, we saw him open his briefcase, he turned up the lamp, sat down... Thank and... you, Watson. Thank me for what? You've just given me some remarkably interesting food for thought. Oh, really? Come in. Why, Mrs. Robertson? Oh, I, I beg your pardon. It's Lady Cranwood now, isn't it? Makes me unhappy to say that it is, Dr. Watson. Won't you sit down, Lady Cranwood? 
I've already expressed to your husband my deep feeling over the tragedy I failed to prevent. Let me assure you, Mr. Holmes, that neither my husband nor I feel that you were in any way to blame. I appreciate your kindness, Lady Cranwood, but I still blame myself for having failed to reach a solution. And that is why I've come to see you this morning, Mr. Holmes. I... I hardly know how to say it. My suspicion is such a horrible one. Oh, there, 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 my dear. I'm convinced that Oliver is in deadly peril. And... And from his own brother. Do you, you hear that, Holmes? You felt it too, Dr. Watson. Oh, I've been fighting down a horrible thought, denying it even to myself. But I felt I had to tell you, Mr. Holmes. Well, have you any proof, Lady Cranwell? Anything definite on which to base such an accusation? Only Neville's sneers and his jealousy of my husband. And those horrible snakes of his. Perhaps you may be able to assist me in confirming or disproving your suspicions of Neville. Lady Cranwood. Anything I can do, Mr. Holmes. Anything. I imagine that the entire family, and the servants as well, will all be attending the funeral this afternoon. Yes, of course. Then, if you will be good enough to leave me your key to the house, I shall take advantage of everyone's absence to go there and investigate one or two possibilities that have occurred to me. Of course, Mr. Holmes. Head us the key. Thank you. And one other thing. I should appreciate it if you would ask your husband to meet Watson and myself at the museum tonight. About nine o'clock. At the museum? Yes. I feel that a reenactment of the late Lord Cranwood's death may bring us to a solution. If you think it's necessary, Mr. Holmes. I think it is vitally necessary. Very well. I will ask my husband to meet you at the museum at nine. I must go now. Goodbye. Goodbye, Dr. Watts. Uh, goodbye. Poor woman, no wonder she's overwrought. Come, Watson. Your hat and stick. We have work to do. Cranwood's house, you mean? Well, I shall go there this afternoon. But meanwhile, I want you to take a note to Lestrade at Scotland Yard and personally see to it that he gets it. And then? Meet me at nine o'clock tonight at the British Museum. I must say, Holmes, that as long as we had to come back to this chamber of horrors, I'm glad that you insisted on a decent amount of illumination. Since we won't be concealing ourselves this evening, Watson, I asked Professor Halliday to leave the Egyptian gallery fully lighted. Now, you sit here, Watson. Well, as long as none of the professors are about, Holmes, I don't suppose the museum will be shaken to its foundations if, if I smoke the pipe. Ah. Oh. Huh, that's better. Good evening, Lord Cranwood. Good evening. Lady Cranwood? Uh, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Good evening. Well, I fail to see what purpose will be served by a reenactment of my cousin's tragic death, but well, I'm willing to do anything within my power that will offer any hope. I insist on in coming with Oliver, Mr. Holmes. I'm afraid every moment I'm away from him. And now, Lord Cranwood, let us try in every way to duplicate your cousin's actions of two nights ago. I have here his briefcase, and I'd like you to enter through those doors... Carrying the briefcase in your left hand and humming a tune. All right. Ready? All right, go ahead. <clears throat> now, uh, put the briefcase down on this table. Take off your hat and coat and put them on the table. Any particular place you want them? I oh, just place them on the table as your cousin did. Now, open the briefcase. Oh, I thought I... What were you about to say? Uh, nothing. You were about to say, Lord Cranwood, that you thought the ingenious adaptation of the Borgia's poison needle had been removed from its mount in the briefcase lock. What on earth are you talking about? I found that fiendishly clever mechanism in your study this afternoon. Mr. Holmes, what do you mean? I mean that this briefcase was fitted with a poison needle, which was removed after Derek's death. Oh, no! And which I replaced when I found it at your house this afternoon. How horrible! How utterly vile! I also found some of the poison, Lord Cranwood. And I greatly fear that when I remounted the needle in the briefcase after my experiments, some of the venom may have remained on it. It was, Neville. Bluff, Holmes. It's sheer bluff. You wouldn't dare. If you think I'm bluffing, Lord Cranwood, why is your face going so pale? You're clutching your arm with your other hand. Why? Fiend, it was poison. Oh, no. My arm's swelling. It's going down. There's no feeling left in my hand. No, 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 Oliver. Mr. Holmes must be mad. Must you, Holmes? You've killed me. All right, I did it. I killed the others, but... You'll never hang me! Oliver! 
Lestrade. All right, Lestrade. Oh. Here's your confession. It's a confession, all right, oh. Dr. Holmes, but all you've given us is the corpse of a murderer. He's dead. You killed him. Not a bit of it. He's only collapsed from fear. Holmes, the pain in his arm, the symptoms. Merely a harmless, though painful solution, which I placed on the poison needle. Oh. Catch her, Watson. She's fainting. And Oliver's a fiend, Holmes, an absolute fiend. Oh, unquestionably. But you must admit that his hiring us was an ingenious attempt at a novel method of removing all possible suspicion from himself. And now he'll pay the penalty for murdering at least two men. A good thing, too, although I'm sure I don't know how you ever found out about the briefcase. Why, you gave me the clue, Watson. You yourself. I did? Back in Baker Street when you were talking about the second death, you mentioned that we had seen Lord Cranwood enter the room. Open his briefcase. Well, we did. Exactly. But until you mentioned it, the significant fact had escaped me that the only object common to both deaths and handled by both men was the briefcase. Good gracious me. Well, that solves the mystery of the ancient Egyptian curse. Does it, Watson? Have you forgotten the three who died previously under such strange circumstances after they had opened Harshakit's temple? You, uh... You don't mean that you really believe in that stupid curse? Those three deaths have still not been explained, and I doubt that they ever will be. There are powers, Watson, higher powers, of which we poor humans still know nothing. <laughs> Ladies, the poet who said a woman's hair was her crowning glory certainly knew what he was talking about. That's why you ladies should take the very best care of your hair, especially in shampooing. I'm glad you brought that point up, Mr. Bell, because many popular shampoos have a tendency to dry the hair. Well, here's one shampoo that will never dry the hair, never under any circumstances, and it's Cremel Shampoo. Yes, Cremel Shampoo is simply wonderful. It actually glamabays each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural, dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural, glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's entirely different. Cremel shampoo never hurts the texture of your hair. You can use it as often as you wish, over a long period of time, and it'll never dry your hair. In fact, it has a beneficial built-in oil base, which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Remember, ladies, that Beautiful Powers models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves their hair more shining bright, yet never dries the hair. Why not try it? K-R-E-M-L Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, next week, I think I'll tell you a story about the strange and ferocious behavior of Professor Presby's dog. And the even stranger behavior of the professor himself. I call it The Adventure of the Creeping Man. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Study in Scarlet. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tonight, the part of Sherlock Holmes was played by Mr. Ben Wright. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the creeping man. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, let's...
let's drop in for our weekly visit to Sherlock Holmes' friend and ours, Dr. Watson. Well, Dr. Watson, how are you this evening? Uh, never better, Mr. Bell, thank you. And you? Fine, thanks. Uh huh. I see you've kept your promise to open your dispatch box and bring out your files in connection with the adventure of the Carpathian Horror. Indeed I have, Mr. Bell, just as I promised. And a most macabre adventure it was, too. I'm eager to hear it. So you shall, Mr. Bell, so you shall. But first, uh, am I correct in deducing that you have, you'd like to have a word with, uh, with our listeners? <laughs> a most accurate deduction, Dr. Watson. Men, if you want your hair to look handsomely groomed from morning until night, use Kremel hair tonic. Kremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This wonderful, natural-looking hairdressing has just enough light oil to keep hair perfectly groomed with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kremel never gives hair that offensive, cheap, greasy look. Kremel always looks and feels so clean on both hair and scalp. Try it, men. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about the adventure of the Carpathian horror? It all began with this very letter which I have here in my hand, Mr. Bell. A letter from a most prosaic firm of solicitors. Holmes and I were at breakfast one spring morning in June 902, shortly after the end of the South African War. Holmes had been bored and restless since the conclusion of our last case, and this was the first time that I'd heard him laugh for days. I must say, Watson, that the Morning Post has brought at least one unusual communication. For a mixture of the modern and the medieval, of the uh, practical and the wildly fanciful, this letter is really the limit. Oh? Why, Holmes? Listen. 24, Gray's Inn, London, June the 4th. Re-vampires. Re-what? Re-vampires. The legal mind is always precise, no matter how odd the subject. The letter goes on as follows. Uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Sir. Our client, Count Paul Romani of Grasnia in Carpathia, whose trustees we are has made inquiry from us in a communication of even date concerning vampires and demoniac possession. As our firm specializes entirely in trusteeships and chancery work, the matter hardly comes within our purview, and we trust that you will be able to take the matter in hand. We hope you will call upon us at your earliest convenience with a view toward undertaking the case. Please ask for our Mr. Atterbury. We remain, sir, faithfully yours, Wilkinson, Wilkinson, Entwistle, and Dodd. <laughs> Scott Holmes, that's the weirdest farrago of legal jargon and sheer nonsense that I've ever heard. I wonder, Watson, the mention of Carpathia is most significant. Significant of what? And for one thing, that remote and mountainous section of southeastern Europe has been the stronghold for centuries of all the legends of vampirism. Oh, rubbish. Oh, come, come, Watson. Where's your spirit of adventure? After weeks of lying in the doldrums, here's a fresh breeze from the unexpected uh, environs of Gray's Inn. Come on, it's a beautiful morning for a walk. Well, where to? Wilkinson, Wilkinson, Entwistle and Dodd. And then, I hope, Carpathia. Really, Holmes, of all the forsaken spots that I've ever seen, this is the worst. Not a light in sight, not a sign of human habitation. And you've dragged me two-thirds of the way across Europe on what will unquestionably prove a wild goose chase. At least we have our fishing rods with us, my dear fellow. And we can always console ourselves with the promise of some of the best trout streams to be found anywhere. And you must admit that this mountainous Carpathian country offers some superb scenery. <laughs> I might admit it if I could see it, as it's uh, black as the ace of spades, to coin a phrase. <laughs> ah, there we are. Here, look out of the window on this side. And there are the lights of the castle. Cheerful looking place, I must say. When did that fellow Atterbury say that it had been built? The first Count Romany built it in 1410. 1410. That's given it almost 500 years in which to disintegrate. A gloomy pile of stone, if ever I saw one. Look at all those turrets and battlements. Probably damper inside than out. Well, we'll soon see. Aye, careful with that luggage driver. Careful. And here you are, my man. Well, let's follow that driver. You think the devil was after him the way he drove off? He shut up the moment he heard our destination. Evidently, the Count's local reputation is not an enviable one. Well, I can't say that we're getting a very warm reception. They must have heard us, driver. Well, here's the door, but I can't see any sign of a bell. And they seem a trifle short of modern conveniences. Let's try the knocker. Oh, I really think this is perfectly outrageous, Holmes. Why the devil's a... Yes, the name. 
What's it, sir? It's the name. Oh, foreign house. Uh, do you speak English? What do you want? Nobody can come in. Count Romania, see nobody. Uh, Count Romania is expecting us. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. You got letter? Yes. Here. Come. Tell you, Holmes, look at these walls, simply oozing dampness. You, uh, wait here. There, Watson. That's better, isn't it? That fire will take the chill out of your bones. Yeah, I need something to counteract the effect of all those family portraits. <laughs> Rum-looking lot, aren't they? Remarkably interesting collection. Curious how the family likeness remains unmistakable through so many generations. Well, judging from the looks of that fellow in the wig... Cirrhosis of the liver must have been another of the family's inheritances. Hard drinking crew, probably. Servo, Mr. Holmes. I'm Count Romani. I can't tell you how glad I am to see you. Thank you, Count Romani. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Dr. Watson, it was good of you to come so far. Uh, something to drink, gentlemen? Oh, a little something to go very well, thank you. Good. <laughs> I don't know just how much my solicitors in London may have told you, Mr. Holmes. A very little, Count Romani. Uh, so little, in fact, that I must confess my surprise at your perfect command of our language. Oh, well, my father had me educated in England. Very sound, sir. Couldn't do better. <clears throat> sit down, gentlemen, sit down. I... I hardly know where to begin my story. The whole thing so horrible. Perhaps that... it will make it a bit easier for you if I tell you that Mr. Atterbury showed me your letters to him. Then you know that... that I believe I'm going mad. Or worse. Oh, Dr. Watson will bear me out, Count Romany, when I tell you that uh, people who really are on the verge of insanity never think it of themselves. Oh, no, that's quite so, quite so. I wish I could share that belief. But you see these portraits of my family. There have been strange legends coming down through the years of occasional weird and nameless horrors that have taken possession of each fourth generation. The fourth Romany died mad. The eighth lived out his life in a locked and guarded tower of the castle. And I am the twelfth, Romany. All old families have legends. That's uh, hardly a basis for any fear. I, I quite agree with you. But some months ago, my father died, and I became the twelfth count. A few weeks later, I retired to bed one evening after reading quietly here in the library. Only to undergo a dream of such vividness that I shall never forget it. A dreamt of brightly colored corridors. Their length stretching endlessly into the distance. There are walls echoing with strange, unworldly music. In my dream, I hurried from empty room to empty room. Through floods of brilliant, very colored light, I saw no people, no living thing. Only the rooms of ruby and gold and jet and sapphire and emerald. At times, the music seemed to be far away. Thin and cold, as though coming from the depths of interstellar space. And then again, it would seem so near that, that I was certain I would find its source in the next room that I entered. In my endless search for I knew not what. At last, after a ounce of time, I awoke to find myself in my own bedroom. Oh, but my dear fellow, my dear fellow, a vivid dream's nothing unusual. It wasn't a dream, Doctor. It was what I saw upon awaking in my room. My door was still locked. But the rug bore the imprint of wet and naked feet. And across the foot of my bed there lay, still dripping, some strands of weed from the moat of the castle. Surely there's a natural explanation for that. Yes, my boy. Are you by any chance subject to walking in your sleep? No, Dr. Watson. And even if I were, I could not have walked through a locked and bolted door. And the windows? The windows of my room give on the wall of the castle that drops sheer for 60 feet. Nothing but a fly could go up or down. Well, Mr. Holmes, the next morning, a dog belonging to one of the local woodcutters was found dead in the castle moat. And with no blood left in his body. And the next time, time, Count Romany, I'm certain there must have been repetitions to bring you to your present fear. The next dream came a few weeks later. Again, I saw the brilliantly colored rooms. Again, I heard the unearthly music. And when you awoke? I was in my bed. And for a moment, I thought that nothing was wrong. Then... When I turned up the lamp, I saw streaks of gray across my bedspread. 
and grayish footprints upon the rug. Dust? Dust, Mr. Holmes. And a moment later, I received horrible confirmation of its source. For lying beside me on the pillow was the heavy, ancient, wrought iron key which unlocked the burial vaults of the Romany. Oh, extraordinary thing. Since your action in sending for me shows that you don't lack for moral courage, Count Romany, I'm certain that you paid an immediate visit to your family vaults. Quite right, Mr. Holmes, quite right. In the company of my cousin Peter and several of the servants, and with torches to light our way, we visited the subterranean vault which is cut into the mountainside under the castle. And you found? We, we found that the coffins of the 4th and 8th Count Romany had been opened. Their lids shoved aside, and the bones of my ancestors tumbled out upon the stone. Lord. Here, 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 my boy. Here. Drink this. You'll feel better. Thank you, Doctor. Well, now you understand, Mr. Holmes, why I sent for you. I do indeed. I consulted doctors. They gave me pills to make me sleep when sleep was the one thing I dreaded. The local priest spoke learnedly of exorcism and its possession by the devils. But it could not put an end to my dreams. The servants have run away in superstitious fear. Oh, except old Anton, who admitted you. The peasants flee at the sight of me. Only my cousin Peter Hallis, who has stayed bravely and loyally at my side, still remains with me. Mr. Holmes, am I mad? Tell me, am I mad? Or am I cursed by some fearful family taint? All that I can tell you at the moment, Count Romany, is that the priest was not mistaken when he said the devil has been at work here. I must apologize, gentlemen, for our limited cuisine. But with all of the staff gone except old Anton, our meals are rather scratchy. Oh, my dear Count Romani, your wine cellar more than makes up for it. Well, you know, if you would take my prescription, Paul, and get out on a horse every day for a few hours of hunting, you would have a better appetite. <laughs> My cousin Peter is quite a materialist gentleman. He believes that all the evils of the flesh and the spirit can be cured by enough exercise. <laughs> and I will wager that Dr. Watson agrees with me, eh? And eh, Dr. Well, there's a good deal to be said for your theory, Mr. Hellish. Men sana in corpore sana, you know. <laughs> your cousin is, of course, familiar with the events you described to us earlier, Count Romanian. Of course, Mr. Holmes. I've no secrets from good old Peter here. And what is your opinion of these strange events, Mr. Halash? Too much reading, too much thinking, too much brooding about the sins of our ancestors. I only hope that you and Dr. Watson can persuade Paul that all these dreams of his are just a lot of nonsense. Well, I hope so, too, I assure you. Uh, and now, gentlemen, I imagine you're ready to retire. I've had a long and wearying trip. A ring for Anton. Should there be a recurrence of your dreams, Count Romani? Please call me the instant you awaken. Good. Well, damp walls or no damp walls, I shall have no trouble sleeping tonight. I'm afraid you will, Watson. Huh? I intend that one of us shall keep the Count's door under observation all night. For heaven's sake, why? There's no doubt in your mind the poor chap is definitely unbalanced, is there? Is that your opinion? Well, certainly. Oh, it's a cake of delusions I ever heard. Poor chap, absolutely certifiable. Nevertheless, Watson, we shall keep watch. I'll take the first, and I shall call you at midnight. What's the matter? Watson, wake up. Uh, what's up? I thought you were on watch. Oh, I must have dropped off. I can't understand Let how. wait. Uh, what is it? The Count. Come quick. Look, Mr. Mr. Holmes. My cousin. There in his bed. Good heavens, Holmes. There's blood smeared all over his hands and on the bed curls. But no sign of a wound. Just a minute. I can feel his pulse. He's only fainted. Now, what happened? I, I heard him cry out. Ran down to his room. The door was half open and Paul was lying across the bed. Just as you see him now. It is the curse of the Romans. Anton, stop that nonsense. No nonsense. Priests say my master possessed by evil spirit. What's that? Sounds like someone riding hard. Coming this way. 
I will go to the door. Uh, you were right, Holmes. I can't find any sign of a wound on his body. I can't imagine where the blood came from. I very much fear that I can. What do you mean? Holmes. Holmes. Count Romany. Oh, my dream, Holmes. My dream. I had it again tonight. Holmes. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. That's the police inspector from Grazdia. A young girl was murdered tonight. Oh, no. And the prints of a man's naked feet led directly here to the castle. In just a moment, we'll find out what happens next in the strange case of Count Romany. Men, when you buy a hair tonic, get your money's worth. Enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly groomed and attractive looking. But Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. You simply can't beat Cremel to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy loose dandruff and leaves the scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. No wonder Cremel is preferred among America's most successful men. Buy a bottle of Cremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Cremel daily for better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what happened after Count Romani's third and most terrible dream? Well, Romani was such a, in such a state of profound shock over the horror that had taken place that I thought it best to administer a strong sedative, leaving Anton to watch over his master, Holmes and I, with Mr. Peter Hallish, to act as interpreter, drove down with the police inspector to the home of the murdered girl. Ask the inspector to bring that lamp a little nearer, will you, Mr. Halash? Jose de Olympiad. Shocking, Holmes. Simply shocking. Her injuries look as though they'd been done by a wild animal. You're quite right, Watson. <laughs> My poor cousin. Oh, no court could hold him legally responsible. He'd have to be put away, of course. Hello, what's... It's all that shouting outside. It's the peasants. The news must have spread. They are shouting, To which our fellow Kosh, they burned the castle. Palalo Vampira. Death to the vampire. Hakazuk cell. Hang him. Well, Holmes, we'd better drive back to the castle immediately. That mob's in an angry temper. They mustn't be allowed to wreak their vengeance on that poor mad boy. Quite right, Watson. I've seen all I wish to hear. Come, Mr. Hellish, we'd better be getting back to the castle just as fast as we can. As a medical man, Dr. Watson, do you think that there's any chance that my cousin, under proper treatment and care, might eventually be brought back to normality? Well, I'm afraid not, Mr. Hellish. In fact, these cases generally grow progressively worse. Well, here's the poor fellow's room. He's probably still asleep from the effects of the sedative that I gave him. Ah, Anton, is the Count still asleep? Well, speak up, man. The dead, it's empty. He's gone. Gone? Gone? He's gone where you never find him. My master, no way for you to lock him up like animals. What shall we do? Where has he gone? Those peasants will be here then in an hour. Holmes? What are you looking for? There's something that should be here on the desk. Something the Count showed us last night. The key to the Roman burial vault. But, but why should he... Why should he take that, Mr. Holmes? Gone right enough. Bring that lamp, Watson. We may yet be in time to avert the final disaster. Careful, Doctor. Steps ahead here. The floor is very slippery. This passageway must have been cut out of the very heart of the mountain. It was. They're deep in the rock itself. If all these twistings and turnings haven't confused my sense of direction, we must be almost under the castle. That's right, Mr. Holmes. The burial vault. Oh, 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 oh. You heard, Watson? My feet simply went right out from under me. It's broke the lamp, I'm afraid. I know the passageway. Not much farther to the burial chamber. We will have to go slowly, though. Make what speed you can. I'll keep my hand on your shoulder. Watson, do the same with me. I only hope it hasn't occurred to him to lock the door of the vault after he entered it. If it did, we're beaten. Be careful now. The passage bends sharp to the right. Just a bit farther along. Oh, wouldn't it be more merciful, Holmes, to let the poor fellow take his own way out? After all, the best we can save him for is a living death in a madhouse. Ah, there's a glimmer of light just ahead. The door to the vault. Jar. He must have a lamp inside. 
Let me go first. So faint, I don't see much. What are all those big, bulky shapes? The stone coffins of our ancestors. There's something moving over there in the shadow behind that stone pillar. It's Count, he's got a knife. He's... Don't go, Robin. Be careful, Holmes. He's mad. Let me go. Let me finish. Let's go. 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 let us go 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 let us
Mrs. Uh, Wilkinson, Wilkinson, Entwistle and Dodd. Grays in London, England. How do you spell Dodd? Two Ds, Watson. Re-vampires. Gentlemen, I take pleasure in informing you that I have brought the matter of your client, Count Paul Romagny, to a satisfactory conclusion. Trusting to be favored by you with any further such commissions that uh, may arise, I remain your obedient servant, Sherlock Holmes. And now, friends, here is specially transcribed for you as a famous celebrity, that great authority on feminine beauty, the king of glamour, John Robert Powers himself. Mr. Powers. Thank you, Joe. Well, that was quite a send-off. I thought it might be of interest to our audience tonight if I brought along one of my Powers girls. As you know, these lovely Powers girls appear on magazine covers, they star in exclusive fashion shows, and very appropriately are called long-stemmed American beauties. So tonight I'd like you to meet Miss Maria Morton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mmm, that's a very attractive spring hat you're wearing, Maria. Like it? Yes, very much. But how about removing it so we can see those lovely shining locks? Why, of course. I'd love to. Mm, Maria, your hair certainly looks like a million dollars. Thanks to you, Mr. Powers. To me? Yes. The first advice you gave me when I became a Powers model was to always wash my hair with Cremel shampoo. And I must say, never in my life have I used any shampoo that left my hair more radiant. Yes, I'm completely sold on Cremel shampoo. You see, Cremel Shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair to reveal all its natural, brilliant luster. And don't forget to mention the built-in oil base. And that's what helps keep the hair from becoming dry and brittle. The Powers girls tell me that after Cremel Shampoo, their hair holds a wave and curl much better. In fact, I certainly recommend Cremel Shampoo not only to the Powers girls, but to every woman who wants to bring out the radiant, shining beauty in her hair. Thank you very much, Mr. Powers, for this beauty tip. And many thanks to your beautiful model. And now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, next week, I think I should tell you about the strange death of a young Sussex schoolmaster. And how Holmes solved one of the most bizarre and most terrifying mysteries that we ever encountered. I call it The Adventure of the Lion's Mane. <laughs> Tonight's adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Sussex Vampire. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell, speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time, when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure... Of the lion's mane. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>